Here's Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. It's five o'clock in New York City, and the big neon signs light up the dark office that overlooks Broadway on the corner of 53rd Street. Behind a second-hand mahogany desk, relaxing in a swivel chair, is the leading figure of the Diamond Detective Agency, combination stockholder, office boy, and clue chaser. He is Richard Diamond, and his mind is on a lovely redhead named Helen Asher, as she sits on a couch talking about things he likes to hear. At this moment, however, another scene is taking place in the wealthy district of Long Island. A long black convertible is just pulling up to an old English mansion, and a curvaceous blonde steps from the car. She is met at the door by her brother. Well, good evening, my dear sister. You're looking simply ravishing. How would you know the difference? Oh, drop dead. You disgusting excuse for a man. Why don't you sober up for five minutes and take a look at yourself? I did once. Oh, by the way... Our dear stepfather would like to see you in the study. Tell him to go to... I already did. Now it's your turn. I don't want to. Now get out of my way, Chris. Mm, suit yourself. But Murray Lang's in there with him. Murray? Hmm? Did I start your heart going pity pat? Oh, shut up. <laughs> you better go in and protect your money, darling. Bye, jailbird. Sot. I don't care what your plans are. They can send my daughter and that's enough for me to put a stop to them. You're not going to put a stop to anything. You can't intimidate me, Lang. You're just a cheap, no-good gangster, and your methods are too well known to frighten me. Come in. Oh, hello, Liz. Hello, Murray. I'm glad you're here, Elizabeth. Mr. Lang and I were just discussing your future. I'm surprised you put up with it this long, Murray. Come on. Let's leave my dear stepfather until he simmers down. Elizabeth, I want to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. Let's go, Murray. Listen to what he has to say. Maybe you'll get a laugh out of it. Well, what is it? I've just been talking with Lang about your intention to marry him. I have advised him that if such a thing were to take place, it would result in the most serious of consequences. Is that all? No, that is not all. When you got into your trouble with the police, my dear stepdaughter, you were paroled in my custody. If I should report to the board that you had violated the terms of your probation, you would most certainly go to prison. Why, you... What's the matter? Aren't you satisfied with the salary you collect for taking care of Mother's estate? How dare you, you little sit down. You look bigger behind a desk. Well, just yell and scream all you want to. After Monday, you better start looking for another source of income. You know very well it's not the money. But your greasy boyfriend here would certainly like to get his hands on it. Look, you, I don't give a hang if you are a midget. I'm not going to stand here and listen to you. Murray. No, baby, I won't take it. I'll wring his scrawny little neck. Go on, Lang, go on. It would give me the greatest of pleasure to call the police and have you locked up. I'll fix it so you won't have a head to call anyone with. Murray, leave him alone. Can't you see that's what he wants? Yes, well, Mr. Lang. Come on, Liz, let's get some fresh air. I want to say one more thing. Just remember, Father, my probation expires Monday. After that, you won't control any part of my income, so you better start getting packed. And if I report you to the probation board in the morning... I wouldn't. If you do that, you'll not only stop being my guardian, but you'll stop breathing. Get out. Get out, both of you. Come on, Murray. Try to intimidate me. I'll make them both sorry. Detective. Detectives. Private detectives. Yes, yes. Yes. Ah, here's one. Full page ad. Must be doing very well. Richard Diamond, private detective. If you've got a case, share it with me. Richard Diamond. Seven, seven, Mr. Diamond? That's right. I want to hire you for a few days. Oh, you saw the ad. Well, it just so happens I'm available. I can't tell you much over the phone, too many extensions in the house, but it's about my daughter. I'm afraid she's going to get herself into some serious trouble. Well, how old is she? Twenty. Tell her to wait a year. My name is Chase, Ralph Chase. I live at 82 Maple Drive, Sands Point. Will you come out this evening? A hundred dollars a day and dibs on the icebox. I'll see you about eight. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. What was that all about, Rick? Oh, I got a job, baby. When do you start? Oh, yes, you're right. No, Rick. You can start it in the morning. You can't break another one tonight. Now, come on, Helen, baby. A job's a job. And a date's a date. I won't let you break this one. Your car downstairs? Yes, but I can drive myself home. Please, Rick. You promised you wouldn't break another one. Keys in it? Yeah, look. I want to hire you to protect me for this evening. Mm. I've been receiving mysterious phone calls, and I'm in fear of my life. Really? You've got to take the job. 
old friends come first. I'll have to get home and shave before I start working. You mean you'll take it? After 12.30. Bye, baby. You beast. Oh, you must be getting tired from driving that big car around all day. Grab a cab, honey. It'll give you some rest. I'll take good care of your car. What? Want a buck for the cab? Huh? No, no. On second thought, you only live about 25 blocks. Walk will do you good. Rick. Deep breathing all the way up Fifth Avenue. Nothing like it. Bye, baby. Oh! On the way to the car, I thought about Helen. The most wonderful girl in the world. Money, looks. But she had one bad fault. She wanted to get married. I got into the big sedan and headed for my apartment. I'd been up late the night before with the blonde singer, and I was feeling tired. Funny how things change. My nights in college were just as busy, but at one o'clock the next afternoon, I was out playing football. I faced facts pretty well, so when I got home, I took a nap. I slept until seven and got up and dressed. I drove Helen's car out to Long Island, and at eight o'clock sharp, I was ringing the doorbell of the Chase Mansion. It was a big house, all right. If they built another one like it, Long Island would sink. Well, to someone at me chamber door. My name's Chris. Boo. Blow your booze some other direction. Your breath would wither a lung. My alcoholic exhalations are composed of the finest ingredients. You must have a weak stomach. Look, if you'll just stagger out of the way, I'd like to see Mr. Chase. Dead or alive? What? Nothing. I was just thinking out loud. Well, go right ahead. And after your talk with my stepfather, you can find me in the bar. <laughs> You'll probably wind up like I am. That's a sweet thought. Where can I find your stepfather? Probably in the library, lying in my money. I left him leaning against the front door, gagging on the fresh air. I wandered down a long hallway and a big sitting room, furnished with enough antiques to make the Metropolitan Museum give up in shame. There was something about the place... A heavy quietness, like a bar of gold in a dark room. The shot had come from up ahead, and I tried a couple of doors before I found the room. Mr. Chase! Mr. Chase! In here! In here! Mr. Chase? Yes, yes. Come in and shut the door. I looked over at Ralph Chase crouching behind a desk. He got up slowly, all five feet of him. And I tagged him for a guy who would give a thousand dollars for every inch you could put on his legs. He looked like he could afford to be a mile high. The tall French windows were open at the back of the room, and you could still smell burning cordite. Someone tried to shoot me from the garden. Yeah, I heard the shot. You must be diamond. That's right. Don't you think you better shut the French doors and pull the drapes before someone takes another shot? Yes, yes, very good idea. Uh, you pull the dime, the shade diamond. Hey, you can start earning your money right now. You're a little excited, but I'll start to work. All right. Oh, be careful, he might still be out there. Well, I doubt it. I can't see anyone out here. Oh, he just missed me. You can see where the bullet hit the wall. I jumped and hid behind the desk. Didn't you hear him on the porch? No, he must have stood in the soft grass that surrounds the garden. That's a good ten feet from the house. You're lucky he didn't move in closer. He probably wouldn't have missed. Got any idea who it was? Of course, it was Murray Lang. Murray Lang? The gambler? Yes, do you know him? Well, I used to be on the force. Set him up six years ago on a larceny rap. Then you know what he's like. He was in the house this afternoon. We had an argument and he threatened me. An argument with your daughter? Yes, about my daughter. How'd you know? Well, you told me she was getting herself into trouble. She couldn't have picked a better playmate than Lang to get there with. Father, we heard a shot. Not really. Oh, let's go. He's not dead. My stepchildren, Mr. Diamond. Oh, well, lovely. I'm quite alive, so you can both stop looking so unhappy. Does it show? Come on, sis. Let's find the guy who fired that shot. I want to give him a few pointers. Where's Murray Lang, Miss Chase? Yes, he's the man you want. I'm sure he Don't tried... be absurd. Murray left three hours ago. What are you, a cop? Does it show? You're wearing too much cologne. Come on, Chris. <laughs> oh, she's nice. That's Elizabeth. The boy's her brother, Chris. I'd hate to draw straws. I married their mother and raised those two brats after she died. The courts appointed me executor of this state. They don't like you handling their money, is that it? Yes. Since they've been old enough to ask for 50 cents to go to a movie, they've condemned me for watching their interests. You, uh, you said you were worried about your stepdaughter. 
Tell me about it. I'll make it brief. Hate long explanations. Elizabeth got into some trouble with the police. Hit and run. She'd been drinking. The man died. Liz was sentenced to a year in Fulton. But I got her off on probation. Oh, what do you want me to do? Drive around with her and spoil her aim? Monday the probation expires. She says she is then going to marry this hoodlum, Murray Lang. And you don't want that because you think he's after her money? Exactly. When she marries, the will reads that I shall, as executor, turn over half of the estate to Elizabeth. What about Christopher? He looked irresponsible when he was born. His mother left instructions that he should not receive his share until he is 35. That's another eight years. Well, your uh, stepdaughter's old enough to know what she's doing. I can't see how you can stop her. That's what I want you to do. And if I do, you'd be in a pretty good spot. What do you mean, Mr. Diamond? You continue as executor. I can understand you thinking something like that, but believe me, as much as I dislike my stepchildren, I wish to keep them in line for their late mother's sake. Oh, Well, Mr. Chase, I'll I'll take a look around outside. Maybe I can come up with something that'll point out the would-be killer. If it was, Lang, you can stop worrying uh, about Elizabeth. Sing Sing doesn't boast a wedding chapel. I went out through the French doors and started looking around on the soft grass that bordered the garden. I had a fat hunch, so I stopped looking and started wandering. I was halfway through the rose bed when I spotted them. It was Elizabeth and the man. In the darkness, I couldn't make him out, but Murray Lang was my best guess. They went up a narrow path to one of those Chinese pagodas at the far end of the garden, and I stepped up close enough to give my ears a workout. It was Lang, all right. I don't care what you think. I didn't take a shot at the old man. Then who did? He's got a policeman in there now, and he's going to start trouble. Let him. I'm clean. If it was that lushed-up brother of yours. Chris hates him, but he'd never try to kill him. Well, then stop hounding me. Maybe you took a shot at the old boy. Murray! Well, you got a good reason tired trying to buck the whole Chase household. If if you love me, let's take off tonight and get married. Tell the old man to go to the devil. You can certainly wait till Monday. Yeah, but he won't. He's going to cause some kind of trouble and get you tossed into Folsom. He's not going to give up all that money just because you're through with your probation. He probably cooked up that shooting just to get the cops here. Murray, what's going to happen to us? Oh, ask your stepfather. He's been doing your thinking for you. I don't have to. We'll get married Monday. Okay. I'm staying clear of this place till then. But what if there's more trouble? I haven't got anyone to turn to. You worry about it, baby. I got a police record that makes yours look like a merit badge. I was too good a target in the moonlight, so I started back up the walk to the house. As I passed a hedge, I noticed a funny-looking plant that was shoving its way out of the foliage. I'm sorry I did that. It was the Johnny Jump-Up variety. Black... The guy on the other end of the sap gave it to me right over the eyes, and I went down like a crapshooter making a pass. I rolled over and watched the moon melt and run down in my eyes. Something warm and sticky spread over my face and turned the night red. Yeah, I was bleeding again. I guess I showed signs of recovering, so he started all over. This time, he used his foot in my side. Oh. Oh. Oh, a couple more kicks in the ribs and in the right place, and he could have whipped up a fast course of Nola. I felt tired, so I rolled up in an old rose bush and went to sleep. When you finally start coming around, it's like swimming your way out of an acre of mud. If you've taken enough beatings before, you diagnose things in a hurry. The pain in your head is where you got sapped. The ache in your ribs is where he booted you. And the thought in your mind is... Oh, it's something about an eye for an eye, if you've got one left. I sat up slowly and looked around. No one in sight. My watch said ten o'clock. I'd been out for an hour, and I was feeling lonely until I started to get up. I made it to one knee and looked down at the best reason I could think of for staying home nights. It was Murray Lang, and you couldn't blame him for staring... He wasn't impolite, just dead. Something on the walk beside him gleamed in the moonlight. I took out my handkerchief and scooped it up. It was a little nickel-plated thirty-two. You could still smell the fresh powder in the barrel. I put it in my pocket and stumbled back to the house. Chris opened the door. Well... You shouldn't drink so much. I never get so loaded I look like that. Well, try it sometime. It might be an improvement. Boo. I... I told you once before not to do that. 
Now, tell me, where were you ten minutes ago? I was in the bar. Who was with you? Red and green midgets. Now, let go of my collar. Okay. Where's the phone? In the hall. Hey, what's going on? Who beat you up? Nobody. I always bleed like this on warm nights. Huh? Big pores. Homicide, Sergeant Otis talking. Who taught you how? Did you sit up nights with a parrot? Oh, very funny. Only one guy could think up a lousy joke like that. What do you want, Diamond? A picture of you. I'm going to show some doctors that mercy killing has its points. Now, let me speak to the lieutenant. Comic. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Hello, Walt. This is Diamond. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get the bicarbonate. What's the matter? I get stomach trouble every time you call. Go ahead. All right. I got a killing for you. I know it. I know it. Why can't you be a good boy and stop finding corpses? I'm out at Sands Point, 82 Maple Drive. I think I've got the murder weapon in my pocket. Who's dead? An old friend, Murray Lang, and you better step on it. There's a drunk staggering around the place, and he's liable to spot the body and put it in a cold shower to sober it up. Oh, all right. We'll be right out. Hold the fort. So Mr. Lang's dead. Hmm? You better stop sneaking up on people, Buster. And you'd better stop telling me what to do in my own house, Mr. Diamond. You sobered up pretty quick. I heard what you said about finding the murder weapon. May I see it? No. It stays in my pocket until homicide gets here. Whose gun is it? It's a 40-pound broadsword. Now, stop trying to look like a Chicago muscle man or I'll start oh, slapping you... Oh, there you are, Diamond. I've been looking for you. I... Wait, Scott, what happened to your face? Someone was giving away hints. Please, did you have something to do with this? <laughs> Hardly. Mr. Diamond has a decided advantage over me. He has muscles. I'll be in the bar. What's happened? Where's Elizabeth? I don't know, but her boyfriend's got troubles. He, he can't explain the hole in this chest. Lang, what do you mean? He's out in the garden. Someone shot him. Is he dead? Well, if he's not, he's trying awful hard. Well, then we'd better call the police. That's been taken care of. What kind of a gun do you own, Mr. Chase? You don't see... No, I don't. I just dig around till I come up with something. What kind of a gun do you own? Why, you're 45... Now, wait a minute, Diamond. If you've got any ideas about this murder, you'd better wait until the police get here. Now, look, Chase, I've been insulted in your house, had the air let out of my ego by your beautiful stepdaughter, and beat up in your garden. That's a full night's work, and now I'm on my own time. Where can I find Elizabeth? I don't know. She may be up in her room. Oh, where is it? End of the hall, head of the stairs, first door. Thanks. Beginning to rain. What about Lang's body? Well, if he catches cold, call me. I went down the long hallway to the foot of a massive staircase. The only light was the one burning in the room I just left. I looked over at my sh- over my shoulder and saw Mr. Chase framed in its dim glow, watching me. In that moment, I thought who Chase reminded me of: a triangle hat, his hand in his vest, and Napoleon had a twin. I went up the stairs two at a time. Yes? Pardon me for barging in, but some guy in the garden just beat all the bashfulness out of me. How dare you? You get out of my room. You better put on something a little warmer, honey. That thing would start a Harry Carey epidemic in Boston. What do you want? Yeah. What did you do after Lang left you in the garden? What? Big ears. I overheard everything you said. I see someone pushed your face around. It's an improvement. Did Murray catch you eavesdropping? Well, if he did, he won't have much time to gloat. What do you mean? If you've done anything to Murray... Aren't you getting ready for bed a little early? I don't know what you want. I don't have to answer any of your ridiculous questions. Now, if you don't turn around and get out of here... What's the matter, baby? The drawer empty? Hmm. Lose something? No. Maybe this is it. Where did you get that gun? It was lying in the garden beside your boyfriend's body. Beside... That's it, lover. Now sit down and relax. Is Murray dead? Like Jimmy Fiddler's gossip column. Didn't you hear anything after Murray left you? Oh, no. I was crying. I ran back to the house and came up here. Is there another way back to the house besides the path that Murray took? It's one that leads to those outside doors. I, I came right to my room. Please leave me alone. This is your gun, isn't it? Yes, but I didn't do it. I didn't. Murray and I were going to be married Monday. Ballistics will probably show it's the one that did the job. You better tell me everything you know. I don't know anything. I didn't shoot Murray. Someone stole my gun from the drawer. Oh, please find out who did it. If they hold me, I'll go to prison anyway. Please, Mr. Diamond, please. It's going to be tough if this is the gun. I'm pretty sure it is. You could still smell the powder when I... The powder. What's the matter, Mr. Diamond? Huh? Oh. Oh, nothing, nothing. Look, uh... 
You stay in your room. Maybe I can do you some good. I promise you'll stay here. Sure. I'm not going anyplace. Ah, and try and snap out of it. Sometimes you keep losing until there's nothing left to play with. It breaks the jinx. I went downstairs and started looking for Chase. As I passed the doors leading to the garden, I stopped cold. A flash of lightning turned the garden flat white. Someone was standing over what was left of Murray Lang. Well, like the view? Oh, Diamond. I was just looking at the body. I talked with your daughter. She says the gun that killed Lang was hers. What? Claims they had an argument, but won't admit she shot him. Oh, no, I can't believe it. Certainly she had no reason, unless... Unless what? Well, unless she found out Lang was just after her money. Well, that's, uh, that's possible. Anyway, if she did do it, I still can't figure who worked me over. Maybe it was Lang. You told me yourself he didn't like you. Maybe it was Elizabeth. Oh, no. It would have to be somebody very strong. She might have kicked you, but never could she have hit you hard enough to crack your head open like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tommy, when does Elizabeth come into her money? Why, at the end of the probation. The court set it aside until she was cleared of all charges. Who gets it if she goes to prison? Well, I'm the sole executor of the state, but she's not going to jail. She didn't do this thing. I'll get the best counsel in the country. I'm sure you will. Uh, tell me something, Chase. It's pretty obvious that my face got pushed around, but uh, how did you know my ribs got the same treatment? What? It doesn't show. It just hurts. Why, I... Uh, well, you told me. Uh -uh. What are you getting at, Diamond? You'd have to reach pretty high to sap me, but if you were mad enough, you could make it. This is absurd. I'm going inside. And when I get grouchy, it's better to listen. I'm liable to use you to make the flowers grow. Go ahead, Mr. Diamond. I'm listening. Well, everybody in this house has some sort of motive for killing. With Elizabeth, it could be the old story of a woman scorned. With your lushed-up stepson, he could want to put the blame on his sister so he'd get more than his share of the estate. And we certainly know you stand to profit if Elizabeth goes to prison... Because you retain custody of the family fortune. I'm getting wet, Mr. Diamond. Everybody's story's weak, but only one of them doesn't stand up. You said earlier this evening someone tried to shoot you from outside your library. Of course they did. You have the shot and saw the bullet hole. That's right, I did. But you told me he was standing outside the room by a good ten feet. Nothing to say, Chase? You're trying to catch me up in something. Oh, you are so right. Now, when I walked into that room, I could still smell burning cordite. To smell fresh gunpowder like that, the gun would have have to have been fired outside the room. You staged it, so I'd think someone was trying to kill you. Is that all, Mr. Diamond? Outside of the slip you made about kicking me in the ribs. Now, let's go inside. I don't think so, Diamond. Oh. Oh, that the forty-five you were telling me about? Yes. Go ahead, make a try for it. I'm going to show you how it works. You kill Lang with your stepdaughter's gun, and you're going to collect the money if she goes to prison. Oh, you're a slob. My stepdaughter could easily kill two men tonight. Now, you're in a spot. You can't shoot me with that forty-five and make it look like the same person killed Lang, too. So you've got to get the thirty-two in my pocket. Give me Elizabeth's gun, Diamond. You try and get it, Chase. Why, you... Rick! Rick, are you out there? Better give it up, Chase. That's the law. He eats little men like you. Rick! Stay right there, Diamond. Another killing won't matter if you try and stop me. For Pete's sake, if you're out there, Rick, answer me. I'm getting soaked. Just keep your mouth closed, Diamond. I'm getting out of here. You'll never make a chase. They'll pick you up inside of an hour. Not if you're too dead to tell them. Yes, that's it. If I kill you, I'll eat at least have a You should watch your step, Chase. Keep your head down, Pat. Somebody's mad. Shut up, Otis, and get out from under that bench. Rick! Over here, Walt. What's going on, Rick? Who's doing all the shooting? Oh, well, we took turns. He was just going to kill me when he tripped over the body of his first victim. I used this thirty-two in my pocket, shot him twice. He's dead, Lieutenant. Give me my baking soda, Otis. Yeah, yeah, Lieutenant. Don't look so unhappy, Rick. He was going to kill you. Oh, I'm not unhappy. I I'm just sore that I didn't have time to take the gun out of my pocket. I ruined a darn good coat. <laughs> The three of us went back in the house, and Otis took Christopher up to bed so he could sleep it off. Walt listened to the story as I told it to Elizabeth. She cried a little and thanked me with her eyes. Walt went downstairs to clean things up, and I sat by her bed and until she went to sleep. She didn't even wake up when I kissed her goodbye. <laughs> oh, I guess it was better that way. 
I said goodbye to Walt and Otis and headed for 975 Park Avenue. I was late, and my face could use a mile of bandage. I hoped Helen wouldn't mind. Yes? Oh, my goodness. Hello, Francis. Tell Miss Asher I brought a car back. Oh, how bad a wreck was it, sir? Give me a glass of the backbone, will you, Francis? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Uh, Miss Asher's in the study. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Well, it's about... Oh, Rick, not again. Mm Mm-hmm. Your poor little face. Yeah, my poor little face. Well, you just stretch out on the couch and I'll get you a nice tall drink. Francis is already on his way. Oh. Feel better? Yeah. Oh, yes. Got a pillow? I'll hold your head up. How's this? Mm-hmm. Like some music to go with it? Sure. Turn on the radio. You comfortable? Mm-hmm. How about you? Uh-huh. That music sounds like San Francisco. Remember the top of the mark? Yeah, fun too. Mind if I turn off the light? The glow from the fire is enough. You're cute. Better? Much. The snow is snowing, the wind is blowing, but I can weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Mm-hmm. Me. I can't remember a worse December. Just watch those icicles fall. What do I care if icicles fall? I've got my love to keep me warm. I like your singing, too. Off with my overcoat, off with my glove. I need no overcoat, I'm burning with love. My heart's on fire, the flame grows higher. So I will weather the storm. Why do I care how much it may storm? I've got my love to keep me warm. Oh, that was nice. Hey, why did you turn the radio on? This is nicer. Come here, Rick. Oh, honey. Honey, you're reading my mind. Here's your drink, Mr. Diamond. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You have just heard the fourth of a new series, Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Betty Moran, Jay Novello, Jack Edwards, and Tal Avery. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Even here in America, we're liable to have a few misconceptions about freedom. Many of us regard it as an outright gift with no strings attached. Well, that isn't quite so. All of us have received a heritage of liberty, a legacy of freedom forged in other days. Remember that the liberty you enjoy is a precious legacy, a legacy that can be lost through disuse. Don't ignore freedom. Work at it. For freedom is everybody's job. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Here's Dick Powell, transcribed as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. My name's Diamond, and like a lot of working people, at five o'clock in the afternoon, I get pretty anxious for six o'clock to roll around, especially if I haven't had a client for the last three days. But even if I don't expect anyone to drop in before six, I can't take a chance, so I stare out of my office window on 53rd Street just to kill time. I see the night starting to muscle in on the Broadway bright lights, and I wonder just how many prospective clients are out in the city. Who's getting in trouble? What kind of trouble? And will they come to Richard Diamond for guidance? Now, take the two hard-looking thugs in a downtown hotel room as they watch a pretty blonde hurriedly get into a flashy mink coat. They're going to need plenty of guidance. Where are you going, Dottie? I got an appointment. Uh, don't you think you ought to stick around just in case the contact comes in? If it ain't here by now, it won't be until tomorrow. Now stop looking like a couple of anxious bloodhounds. Relax. Sure, Dottie, sure. Uh, but you really cannot blame us for being a little disquieted. <laughs> don't she look classy, Al? Hey, who are you going to roll tonight, doll face? Your grandmother. Oh, ain't she out of Alcatraz yet? Hey, I, I don't like no cracks about my family. Well, what are you going to do, Stan? People stop by the zoo every day. Yeah. Now, please, no logomachy. Yeah, no log. Yeah. You keep running off at the mouth like that, baby, and you'll be spitting out all your teeth. Yeah, well, when you kick off, Stan, don't try to sell your body to science. I'll never get both heads in that bottle. Oh, you... Please. Please. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hit... Please. Yeah. Please. Leave us, Dottie. And Stanley, you shut your big mouth before I shove my foot in it. We... Go on, Dottie. I think you had better make a hurried percolation. What? Beat it. Um... Oh, Al, why didn't you let me mess her up a little? She's always acting like she's got a family background. I do not know whether her family had anything to do with it, but it is a very nice background to gaze at. Now shut your ugly face and let us start tailing her. Yeah, tailing her? What for? I think she is up to something. Yeah, well, sure she is, but I don't want to get booked as a peeping Tom. <laughs> Stan, you are a melon head. I think she is going to try a cross. Florida has not never been late with the numbers before. Yeah. You think she's going to pick up the bundle and skip? No. I just want to see what she does with her evenings. Oh, well, I can tell you that. She... Stanley, please. You arouse my irascibility. Oh, I'm sorry, Aloysius. <laughs> Evening, Glenda. Oh, hello, Horace. Times. You look tired. Hard day at the office? I stayed home. My wife's swell. Mm. Here's the Times. Yeah, thanks. Good night, Glenda. Good night. Papers. Evening papers. Have you got a light edition? Why, yes, right here, dearie. You got it? Yeah, in the purse. Put it down on the counter and look through the paper. Okay. Paper. Evening paper. What do you want me to do with the purse? Keep it till I meet you at the train. Sure, honey. It's good to be working again, ain't it, Dottie? I gotta go. They usually got a tail on me. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Relax. We're in the chips. Paper! Evening paper! Uh, paper, sir? No, but I will take that purse. Purse? Oh, why, that nice young lady must have left it on the counter when she looked at the paper. Please, just extend your agent index and shove it over here. Why, I can't do that. It belongs to that young lady. Oh, look, it would make me very unhappy to have to shove all those nice old wrinkles around, but I am in need to possess one patent letter handbag. Now, if you will kindly move it to my approximate latitude, you old bat, we can dispense with all... Why, you poor excuse for a low-brow gun if... Madam. For two cents, I'd wrap a lead sap across your flat head. Well, hello, Glenda, hello. How's, uh, how's business? Oh, Officer Quine, aren't you on a little late? <laughs> yes, uh, I've been changed to the six o'clock beat. Well, good evening, sir. Uh, yeah, lovely. Uh, good evening, officer. Say, haven't I seen you somewhere before? Uh, hardly. I reside in Flatbush. Well, thank you, Mother. I do not see anything I want. There. Goodbye. <laughs> he doesn't see anything he wants. What does he think you're running, at? A, a drugstore there? <laughs> hey, Al, I saw a cop. Mm, I am proud of you, Stanley. Huh? Now let us hurry around this corner. What, you think Dot and the old dame are cooking up something together? Stop here so we can watch the old dame. Stanley, to put it in your words, yeah. I think they are cooking up something. Oh, you figure she slipped the old girl the numbers? Your perception astounds even my astute. Hey, 
Abzai. Oh, yeah. Your grandma is taking off and leaving the cop behind to watch the papers. Yeah, she's going in that building. She has got the purse. Stanley, yeah. stay here and await my return. Okay, but uh, my feet are beginning to hurt. Go in a drugstore, purchase some Blue Jays. I shall be right back with the purse. <laughs> Mr. Diamond. Well, hello, Glenda. Come in, pull up a rocking chair. Well, that's the way it begins. Sometimes when you wait around until the last minute, you get a customer. I wasn't too happy about this one because I knew she didn't have enough money to hire a tramp to spot cigarette butts. I haven't got much time. I've got Officer Quine watching my paper stand. Officer Quine? Hmm. You should be happy you aren't selling fruit. He's already got his thumbprint and every apple in Yonkers. Mr. Diamond, I found this purse. Ah, uh, found it, Glenda? Oh, you know me, Mr. Diamond. I'm going straight now. I remember a snake that said that once. He broke his back. Honest, I haven't been doing that kind of business since I got out. Well, what can I do for you, Glenda? I'm broke. Oh, it's not a touch. I want you to find the owner of this purse and return it. Why don't you give it to Officer Quine? Well, there's no money in it. And with my record, he'd sure run me in for purse snatching. No money, huh? Oh, no. No, I didn't touch a thing. Just uh, took a peek, maybe. Uh, oh, yeah. A young girl left it on my counter. If you find her, you can ask her. I didn't touch a thing. Okay, I'll see what I can do. Oh, thank you, Mr. Diamond. Goodbye. Keep your nose clean. Oh, I will. She'd keep her nose clean, all right, in a glass of gin. I'd known old Glenda ever since she started working bunco rackets and got put away for two to five. I was sure she'd lifted the dough from the purse, but I opened it and went through it anyway. I was just kicking myself for telling her I'd try to dig up its owner when the door opened and an ugly-looking mug wearing alligator spats walked up to my desk. You should be ashamed looking in someone else's purse. It's a bad habit, like not knocking on doors. Oh, it said on the door to come in. How long did you have to wait before someone came by to read it to you? May I please have the purse? Oh, is it yours? Yes. Well, I didn't notice the wedges. Give up high heels? You are a very poor comic. Now, may I have the purse, or must I make you bleed? Oh, oh, it's like that. Well, sure, here it is. Thank you. <gasps> and something to go with it. <gasps> I caught him with one that made my arm feel good clear up to my shoulder. His eyes rolled back, and he went down faster than the celluloid collar on the flagpole. I looked at the black purse and started getting that lousy feeling again. I'd gotten into something, and it was beginning to smell already. So I called the 5th Precinct Police Station and an old friend, Lieutenant Levinson. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Hello, Otis. Let me talk to the lieutenant. Is this Diamond? No, it's platoon number three of the Brownies, 300 strong. Now let me talk to the lieutenant. Hey, what are you going to do with all those tired jokes and you run out? Give them away to idiots. You want to start a collection? Uh, nuts. Lieutenant Levinson. Hello, Walt. Diamond. Oh, wait a minute. Otis! Otis! Hello, Diamond. Where'd you put the bicarbonate? Oh, uh, hold it a minute, Rick. Get me some water, Otis. Yellow gun. Go ahead, Rick. I can stand it for a second. Well, if you didn't get so excited, you wouldn't have to take that stuff. Here you are, Lieutenant. Never need this stuff until you call. Now, who's dead? Uh, nobody, but there's a guy in my office lying on the floor. He's dead. He's got to be. No, he isn't, Walt. I just belted him in the mouth when he tried to get rough. Oh. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's trying oh. to wake up. Groan for the nice policeman. Oh. You hear him, Walt? Okay, so some guy got tired and went to sleep on your floor. What do you want me for? Uh, hold it a second, Walt. He's getting a little too active. What did you do? I kissed him goodnight. What did you do that for? Well, I've seen him somewhere. I think he's wanted. Oh, well, hang on to him. I'll send the wagon down. The door will be open. I'll fix it so he doesn't get away. Wait a minute, Rick. Where are you going? Well, about five minutes ago, an old dame hands me a black patent leather purse and asks me to find the owner. Right afterwards, this cultured gorilla wanders in and says the purse belongs to him. Oh, what's in it? Nothing much. A compact, book of matches, and a handkerchief. Mmm, smells nice. No money? No. Oh, uh, I gotta stop by Helen Ashes for a minute, and then I'm gonna find out what makes this purse so valuable. I'll say hello to Helen for me. Sure thing. Bye, Walt. Be a good boy. Goodbye. <laughs> I got a rope out of my desk that I hung my socks on when I had time to wash them and tied the sleeping Garneth to a chair. I didn't know much about pocketbooks, but I knew someone who did, 
So I headed for 975 Park Avenue and a beautiful redhead named Helen Asher. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Good evening, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the study. Shall I announce you? No, just dig up something that'll get me back on my feet. I'll let myself in. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yes, Francis? If you'll pardon me for saying so, sir... I just love the way you talk. Well, thank you, Francis. Eaton, 98. Majored in Sloyd. Oh, oh, my goodness, you're pulling my leg again. Anyone home? Rick, you got here. Hi. Hi. Well, since when did you start carrying a purse? Like it? Matches my complexion. Oh, you idiot. Take a look. Whose is it? Mm, Gotta find out. It's worth something. One guy already tried to get it the hard way. Cigarette? Oh, thanks. It's got some initials on it. D.K. There's nothing valuable in it. I know. That's what I can't understand. Got a match? Here's some in the purse. Thanks. Here. Hmm. Adams Hotel. Flop house with sheets. Compact's never been used. My darling. Well, thanks. Oh, the perfume and the handkerchief, silly. It's my darling. Oh. Ah, oh, don't look so hurt. So are you. Well, come here. <laughs> Rick. Here's your drink, Mr. Dab. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's all right, Francis. I was just trying to convince your boss we should take in the wrestling matches. Why, Francis, you're blushing. Oh, <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> Miss Asher's residence. Yes, sir. One moment, sir. It's for you, Mr. Dab. Oh, thank you, Francis. I'll see if the dinner is ready, Miss Helen. Hello? You get right down here. What? Lieutenant Levinson. Get down here to the station, Diamond. You're in trouble. Diamond? Wait a minute. Slow down. Not dead, huh? My stomach starts getting back to normal and you have to knock some guy off. Knock some guy off? I don't know why I should waste time with explanations. I ought to just send notice over there with the wagon, but I like your girlfriend too much. What are you babbling about? I thought you said the guy in your office was still kicking. What? Yeah, somebody made a punch board out of his chest and I like you for a suspect. Now get down here. Wait a minute, Walt. Somebody shot him? Yeah. That wasn't what killed him. He died of fright when he saw the bullets coming. Now, I'm not talking anymore till you get here. Make it ten minutes or I'll have a warrant out for you. Oh, swell. Rick, what's the matter? Oh, that crazy Walt Levinson's got me in line for a murder rap. I gotta go down and square myself. Murder? Rick! Yeah? I'll see you later, baby. But, Rick... I can't wait. I'll get back as soon as I can. If we were married, this wouldn't happen. Rick, you forgot the purse! Francis! Francis! Yes, Miss Asher? Francis, Mr. Diamond forgot this purse. See if you can catch him. He's gone to Lieutenant Levinson's police station. Yes, Miss Asher, my best. Rick just has got to stop this foolishness. He... Oh. How did you get in here? Well, who are you? I come in a back way, lady. Uh, where's the shamus? You get out of here. No, just just relax, baby. One yell out of you and you get hurt pretty bad. What? Uh, where's the shamus? He went down to the police station. Okay. Where's the purse? I saw him bring it in. Uh, I don't know. Oh, come on, baby. Or do I shake it out of you? You you stay away from me. You... Hood. Hood? Where's the purse? I told you I don't know. No, stay away. Okay. But you're making it tough on yourself. Stay away. You stay away from me. Tucked underneath her arm, she walks the bloody tower with the red tucked underneath her arm at the midnight hour. Pardon me, sir. Uh, uh, Yes, madam? I believe you have my purse. I beg your pardon, but this purse is the property of Mr. Diamond, private detective. Yes, I know. I gave it to him to hold for me. Well... I'm very sorry, madam, but you'll have to claim it from Mr. Diamond himself. Oh, yeah? Help! Police! Oh, madam. Measure! Madam! Help! This man is trying to steal my purse. Uh, madam, uh, let go of my coat. Let's try giving you trouble, mother. He's trying to steal my purse. Help! Oh, yes, huh? Looks just the type. This will learn you, Romeo. Oh, my. <gasps> Gonna know, lady, will you? Come on, get up and fight it. Hey, lady! Lady! How do you like that? Didn't even say thanks. Now, look, Rick, 
I don't care what you say. You told me you had a guy in your office. When my men got there, they found him tied in the chair with three bullet holes in his chest. He was making noises when I left. Some guys do that when they get shot. Oh, stop being an idiot. You know I didn't kill him. Yeah, I know it, but what do I tell the commissioner? That I let you go because you're a friend of mine? Used to be on the force? No, but you don't have to act like I rubbed out the whole west side. Well, I'm mad. I want to retire in five years, and I want to do it with a healthy stomach. Yeah? Lieutenant, Murphy's got some guy out here he picked up for purse snatching. Says he's a friend of diamonds and wants to see him. Send him in. This can't get any screwer than it is already. I got a purse snatcher who says he knows you. Purse snatcher? Francis. Yes, Mr. Diamond. I, I don't feel so well. That's all, Otis. Isn't he your girlfriend's butler? Yeah. What happened, Francis? Well, sir, I was bringing that purse down to you. That's right. I left it at Helen's. Yes, sir. Well, a little old lady approached me on the street and claimed it belonged to her. What did she look like? She had white hair and she was wearing an old shawl. I think she'd been drinking gin, sir. Cheap gin. Glenda. Glenda Bergen? Is she the one who gave you the purse? Yeah. And then what happened, Francis? When I wouldn't give her the purse, she started yelling and called me a masher. And some enormous gentleman arrived and clouted me in the jaw. Oh, it was disgusting, sir. And the old lady got the purse? Yes, sir. She ran off, and the enormous gentleman sat on my chest until an officer came and carted me off to this place. Was Miss Helen all right when you left her? Why, yes, sir. You don't think... I don't know. But if they knew I had the purse and spotted me going into Helen's... Here, Rick, use his phone. Thanks. Don't you see, Walt, this whole thing has something to do with that purse. Purse, purse. I've still got a stiff on my hands. Oh, my goodness, Hello, honey. You all right? Oh. What's the matter? Hi. Please come home. What happened? A man broke into the house looking for that old purse. I told him I didn't know where it was, and he started slapping me. He did, huh? Yes, and I need comforting. Well, honey, I've still got something to do. Lock all the doors until Francis gets back, and I'll be over as soon as I can. All right. Did you get the purse? Francis will tell you all about it. Bye, baby. Bye. Rick, some louse shoved Helen around. Francis, get over there and take care of her. It's all right if he goes, isn't it, Walt? I guess so. Otis, I'm releasing the guy that was picked up for purse snatching. And don't say, yeah, Lieutenant. Okay, Rick. Oh, thank you, sir. Step on it, Francis. Miss Asher needs someone to take care of her. Yes, sir. Walt, give me two hours to find out what this is all about. Are you going after Glenda? Yeah. If she's tied up with this killing, I'd better send some of the boys along. Give me two hours alone. I want to find the guy who shoved Helen around. Okay, Rick. Two hours, and I put in a general alarm for you and the old dame. You know where she lives? I got a shack over near the East River. Thanks, Walt. Otis, let Diamond go and bring me a tablespoon and some water. And Otis, shut up. I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was standing at the edge of the East River. The fog was rolling in, and pretty soon it would be so thick you could put it in bales. Below me, next to the water, was a line of weather-beaten shacks, and one of them belonged to old Glenda. You want something, Mac? Huh? Oh. Oh, I didn't see you. Uh, does uh, old Glenda live in one of those shacks? Yeah, that one. Got a match? Oh, yeah, yeah. Here, yeah, keep them. Thanks. Forget it. No, uh, wait a minute. Huh? Let me see those matches. Hmm. I've forgotten all about them. What's the matter? You collect them or something? These I do. Sorry, pal. You'll have to get some others. Okay, sporty. The inside of the shack looked like a hardware store after a good earthquake. Someone had torn it to pieces, and old Glenda had gotten the same treatment. She was lying on the wooden floor, staring up at me. She couldn't close her eyes because a rope around her neck was squeezing them open. Is she dead? Huh? I followed you down. Well, hooray for you. The next time you sneak up on somebody, you'll probably end up with a skull fracture. Just wanted to see what was going on. Is she dead? Unless she can breathe through her feet, she's been strangled. Going to call the cops? No, no. I thought I'd rub her wrists for a while. Now, here's a buck. Call Lieutenant Levinson at the 5th Precinct and tell him what's happened. Sure. Got a nickel? Yeah, here. And tell him I've gone over to the Adams Hotel on 28th Street. My name's Diamond. Good for you. Now step on it. He left in a hurry, and I reached in my pocket and took another look at the book of matches I'd gotten from the black handbag. They were from the Adams Hotel on 28th Street, so I went over there fast. A sleepy night clerk showed me the register, and I found what I was looking for. 
I remembered the initials on the handbag were D.K. A Dorothy King was registered in room 306. I went upstairs. Yeah? I got a message for you. Slip it under the door. I'm not that skinny. What is it? It's from Glenda. Oh, wait a minute. All right, the door's open. All right, now shut it and come on in. Huh? Oh, what a lovely gun. Glad you like it. Now, what do you want? I just left Glenda. She's dead. What? Yeah, strangled. How'd you find me? Matches in your purse. They were from this hotel. I checked the initials on the bag with the register. D.K., Dorothy King, room 306. Holmes would call it elementary. You must be the shamus Glenda gave the bag to earlier this evening. That's right. How did you know? Well, she called me. She tell you she got it back? I feel a quiet streak coming on. I usually like women who don't talk much, but right now you'd better start talking as fast as you can. Funny thing, this gun I got makes me lazy. Now get out of here. Baby, baby, I got a big fat surprise for you. Yeah? Yeah. My gun makes bigger holes than yours. Huh? What do you think I'm doing with my right hand, keeping it warm? Oh, don't give me that. You ain't got nothing but a big finger in that pocket. Oh! Surprise. Next time I make it count. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Sure. Drop it. Now, that's better. Kick it over here. All right. Please. I didn't kill Glenda. Where's the purse? I ain't got it on us. Well, who has? Now, look, baby, I'm in a bad mood. Honest, I don't know. That's right. She don't, mister. Stan. Well, you certainly know some pretty ugly company, Dottie. I don't know if I like that. You don't? Maybe I can word it a little different. Stan, he's a private cop. He come up here and tried to shove me around. Well, you should have done it, Shamus. Would have saved me the trouble. What do you mean, huh? Why, you're no good cheap double-crosser. Al and me saw you slip the bag to that old dame, and Al got killed trying to get her from the Shamus. I didn't kill Al. No, nah, the old dame did it. I went up to the office and found him dying. He told me she'd done it. What are you going to do? Well, the organization don't like being crossed. I got the purse from the old dame and paid her off for killing poor old Al. Now I gotta pay you off. I got a surprise for you too, Stanley. Yeah, you try anything, you'll have more holes in you than a fishnet. He's got a gun in his pocket. Well, look at his pocket, wise guy. Oh, gee, I wish Al was here. He'd know what to do. Come on, shoot him. Shoot him. Stan's got it coming. Looks like it's a tie. No sense in both of us getting killed. Yeah, yeah. You, you plug me, and I'll nail you before I go to. Don't listen to him. I think he's got a point. What are you gonna do? That's up to him. Well, as Al would say. A hurried departure is in order. I'll take care of you later, Doc. Huh? Uh, goodbye, all. Yeah, it's pretty good. Al would like that. Don't let him get away. Stop him. You stop him. All right, baby. Where is he going with that purse? If I tell you... Will you give me a chance to get out of town? I can't do anything about that. When I leave, you're on your own. Technically, you haven't done anything the law could hold you for. I haven't? No. But that won't stop me from pushing you around. Now, let's have the story. If Stan hasn't been there already, he's headed for a locker in the subway station at 34th Street. What's in the locker? $100,000 in counterfeit bills. Oh. Oh, baby. Counterfeit. You have been naughty. Now, Papa, we'll have to keep you on ice for the cops. Get in the closet. Oh, please, give me a break. Sorry, honey. Get in. Ouch, you're hurting me. I went down to the night clerk and told him to tell Lieutenant Levinson when he got there about the blonde in the closet of room 306. The subway wasn't far, but Stanley had a head start and he was in a hurry. I ran the rest of the way. I went down the steps. A train was just pulling out when I spotted him. He'd just taken a bundle out of one of the lockers, and as he turned to go, I walked up behind him. Hello, Stanley. What? What you got in the box? The shamus. Here, you take it. Oh. He tossed the package in my face and started running for the exit. But a crowd of people blocked his way, and when he saw me come up with my gun, he changed his mind. He turned and vaulted the turnstile, and I ducked behind the row of lockers. He had a gun, too. I tried to get a clear shot at him, but there were too many people. And then the frightened little guy did a stupid thing. He jumped down on the tracks and started running up the tunnel. Oh, look at that fool man! He's jumped down on the tracks! Stanley, come back here. You can't get anywhere that way. You said it, Mac. He's running up town on the downtown side. Here's a corny line. Stop or I'll shoot. You won't get me! Stan! Look out, there's a train coming. Look out. Oh, 
Mr. Diamond. Come in. Hello, Francis. Is Miss Asher all right? She's better, sir. She's lying down in the study. How's the jaw? Oh, I feel better, sir. This ice bag is helping the swelling. I'll be in the pantry if you need me, sir. I'll try not to. Hi. Hi. Well, poor little baby. Yes. Poor little baby. You're lucky he didn't knock you out. Oh, I'll get it. Francis is nursing his face. Asher residence. Let me talk to Diamond if he's there. He is. Rick? Mm Mm-hmm. Now, you listen to me. I've been chasing your conquests all over town. I end up down in the subway station. I notice gets stuck in the turnstile. Don't you think it'd be nice to let the police department in on something once in a while? Oh, sure, sure. Right now, I'm at 975 Park Avenue, nursing a beautiful redhead back to health. Oh, did you find the blonde in the closet? Yeah, I got the whole story from her. You want to hear it? I guessed most of it. She was fencing for a counterfeit ring as she tried to cross them. The key to the locker was in that purse. Yeah, in the compact, under the pancake makeup. She and old Glenda used to do a duet together before they both got sent up. When the blonde got out, she started working for a counterfeit mob. They'd stash the dough in different subway lockers around town and used her to make the contacts. So she figured she could use the 100000 Well, nothing like being in business for yourself. Well, she was afraid to pick it up herself, so Ricky. she stuck the purse to Glenda like she'd just forgotten it. Ricky! Yes, dear? Are you listening to me? I just stopped. Bye, Walt. What? Now, wait a... What is it, baby? I want some sympathy. Sure, sure. What would you like, lover? Sing something. Oh, come on, baby. We can do without that. No, I want you to. I'm sick, and invalids should be pampered. Oh, let me rub your head or something. Mm, afterwards. I want you to sing. Oh, but it's late, baby. Well, then sing softly. Sing me to sleep. Oh, honey. I'll get mad, and you'll have to buy me a present. Ah, okay. Lullaby and good night with roses be dyed. That's wonderful. With lilies be dyed. Hey, you on the board for your tonsils! Shut up! I'm trying to sleep! Well, what is that? Oh, it's that grouchy new neighbor. Oh, it is, huh? Mm -hmm. Hey, you want something, bud? Yeah, shut your big bezel. Oh, is that right? Out of your face with sunshine. Oh, no! Put on a great big smile. Make up your Rick, eyes that's with too laughter. Loud. You Please, will all... Rick. Yeah, okay. That guy gets shell-shocked if you fried potatoes. Rick. What is it, baby? Come here. Oh. You do need pampering. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Betty Lou Gerson, Jane Morgan, Jack Crucian, High Averback, Herb Butterfield, and Wally Mayer. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. My name's Diamond, and I'm in business for a very simple reason. I like money. Oh, sure, I could do better, but I don't believe in straining myself. I might make a few bucks more, but so what? You work harder, your back gets weaker... And you take that extra couple of bucks and spend it for a brace to keep you from folding in the middle. 
No, I got a little one-room office that leans out over Broadway, and I'm very happy. Sometimes I get a case that lasts a week, a hundred bucks a day in expenses, and I make enough to pay the rent. Take my girl Helen Asher to dinner a couple of times and rest my feet on the desk like a prosperous businessman. I'm in partnership with a shill called Human Nature. And with him on my side, it just figures that people are going to get in trouble. Like the character who's ringing the doorbell of an apartment on the east side. He's built just right for more trouble than he can handle. Hello, Mrs. Moran. You say that like you're really glad to see me. I'll let you know as soon as we can talk business. Did you bring a rubber hose along? Why? Are you going to be hard to get along with? This time, yes. Where's your husband? He went out. I tried to convince him the window was the quickest way to the street, but he's old-fashioned. He took the elevator. You're drunk. You can't get a vet out of me. Want a drink? Just get the 500. I don't want to be around when your old man gets back. You couldn't afford that, could you? No, and I don't think you could either, baby. Now let's stop playing games, Mrs. Moran. I've got a big, fat surprise for you, Mac. Keep it in small bills. That's not funny. That's your surprise. Yeah? Yeah. You don't get the money. You get something else. Stop yelling. You'll have the whole building up here in a minute. They'll be up anyway, Mac. A gunshot makes people curious. Now, wait a minute. You don't have to pull a gun. I don't have to do anything. And I'm breaking myself of one habit right now. I'm through paying your dirty blackmail. Now, you know I got my orders. If I don't collect, someone else will be around. Come on, give me the gun. Sure. A piece of the time. I need a drink. Well, here's to nothing, Betty, old girl. Extra, extra, read all about it. Matt Grayson shot to death in blackmail plot. Socialite Betty Moran kills gangster, then takes own life. Read all about it, paper. I can't. Oh, paper, mister? Yeah. Hey, uh, the chair. Oh, thanks. Wealthy wife of William Moran kills... Well, I have to call Mr. Moran. No sense to lose a good source of income. Yeah, come in. Mr. Diamond? Over here. Oh, this clothesline, I, I couldn't see you. Do you always do your laundry in your office? Free soap. Pull up a chair, Mr. Uh, Moran. Uh, William Moran. Oh. Mm. Nice pair of Argyles. One of my old clients. Sends them down from Sing Sing. Have you read the morning papers, Mr. Diamond? I haven't had time. I took some throw rugs down to the laundry mat before I started on the socks. My wife died last night. What did you eat for breakfast? Why, uh, Pancakes and eggs? Why? You must eat a whole pig when you're not in mourning. How did she die? She was shot to death. Couldn't she get two people for a pyramid club? She was being blackmailed. It's usually the other way around. The victim shoots the blackmailer. She did that. His name was Mac Grayson. Hmm? I want you to find the other man behind this blackmail ring. Oh, what makes you think there was more than one? I received an anonymous phone call this morning. It was from a man who said he was a friend of Mac Grayson. He made it perfectly clear that he was going to continue with the blackmail. You uh, know what they had on your wife? She was a very wealthy woman, Mr. Diamond. Before she married me, she was rather... uh, wild. Well, they get that way sometimes. There were some letters. Why don't you go to the police? As far as they're concerned, the case is closed. They say it's a murder and a suicide, and that's that. But I want to get the people who drove my wife to suicide. Okay, Mr. Moran, but if you want me to try and dig up your blackmailers, my fee is rather high. I want to start sending my laundry out. Money is no object. That's the nicest thing you could have said. $100 $100 a day and a fifth of plasma. Plasma, Mr. Diamond? A hundred proof. I never know what I'm going to run into in a case like this. I may bleed a little. You can reach me at Evergreen 45021. I'll write you a check. Here, uh, use my pen. It's getting an inferiority complex. Do you know anything more about this man who called you this morning? No, only that he said he was a friend of Mac Grayson's. 
Oh, there you are, Mr. Diamond. This should be enough of a retainer. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, that's all you know? I'm sorry I can't be of more help. Oh, you've been a brick. I'll get the rest from Homicide. Thank you and goodbye, Mr. Moran. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond, and good luck. Oh, I'm sorry. I knocked down some of your washing. Uh, there. Well, I'll be hearing from you. Well, that's the way it goes. One minute you're washing socks, and the next you've got enough money to stake out a claim on every night spot from Mott Street to Harlem. Unless a particular blackmail ring likes to kill private detectives. I had a hunch the assignment might run into overtime, so I put in a call to a lovely redhead named Helen Asher. Francis the butler answered, and I told him to pass the word along that I might be late for my date. I hung up before Helen could get on the pipe and start screaming at me like a wounded eagle. I locked the office, went down to 5th Precinct, and an old friend, Lieutenant Levinson. He was in charge of the homicide detail and could tell me about the late Mrs. Moran and her victim. When I walked in, Sergeant Otis was polishing his billy. Hello, Otis. The lieutenant in? Well, Richard Diamond, the all-American gumshoe. Oh, you're just jealous because that club you've got is a better shape than your head. Lieutenant, Diamond's out here. Okay, send them in. Tell me, Shamus, how does one get to be a great big private detective? Saving box tops? Well, you have to observe things, Otis, my boy. For instance, one look at your shirt, and I can tell you've been eating well for a week. Why don't you either get it cleaned or stick it in a pressure cooker? Hello, Walt. Now, wait a minute, Rick. If you've got a body somewhere, take it to another precinct. Well, I'm a little short right now, but maybe I can dig one up. <laughs> what yeah, a thing. that was a swell one. Is this just a social visit, or am I a dreamer? It's about the Moran suicide. You handle it? Uh Uh-huh. One of the neighbors called us. They're both deader than Otis on a double date. What about the Grayson guy she knocked off? Cheap thug. Couple of convictions. He... Oh, don't tell me Moran's been to you with that blackmail story. Yeah, yeah. He seems to think Grayson was working with someone. Rick, that guy pestered us all morning, but there's no proof of blackmail or anything else, except two people got killed. Give me a quick rundown. I don't know why you're interested. I think Moran drummed up the blackmail theory just to cover that his wife was running around with another man. Well, I'm interested because Moran gave me a fat 200 bucks in advance to get me in the spirit of the thing. Well, if you want to be bored, here are the photographs of the deal. Here's Mac Grayson. Mm. Bullet entered his chest just below the 10th rib. Gun's a 32. Same one that the Moran dame used on herself. Enough powder burns on his shirt to show that she was standing pretty close when she gave it to him. She'd have to be not to miss him. Ah, you can see she was lying about ten feet from Grayson near the bar. Huh? Probably needed a stiff shot before she knocked herself off. That's the highball glass on the floor near her head. And that's the thirty-two she used, about six inches from her right hand, and only her prints on it. Powder burns on the girl? Sure, all over her temple. We did the paraffin test on her hand, too. She fired the gun all right. Did uh, Grayson have any friends? We never tied him up with anyone except an old wino that hangs out on Skid Row, dump called the Parry Club. Name's Wilbur Truitt. Mm-hmm. Now. Yeah. Well, thanks, Walt. Now, look, the dame killed the guy and then shot herself. What more do you want? I'll let you know. Now, wait a minute. I know that gleam in your eye. I always get a sour stomach from it. If you've got something, you'd better tell me. Oh, you're a cynic, Walt. Have you, uh, have you talked to this Wilbur Truitt? We questioned him this morning. Got a tail on him? Sure, but he won't take us anywhere. Now, what are you cooking up? Well, maybe you think there's something to Moran's blackmail story. Oh, don't be an idiot. Then what are you tailing Truett for? Because I can't take a chance. Blackmail's a federal rap, and if Moran keeps stirring up trouble, I want to be able to prove he's nuts. Now, you look here. I want to know what's on your mind. I'll send you a letter. Oh. Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant? Get me my bicarbonate. And shut up. Bye. Goodbye. I went through the squad room and out into the hall. I used the payphone by the door and put in a fast call to my client, William Moran. I had a hunch, and Moran's $200 retainer in my pocket gave him an A priority on it. Yes? Mr. Moran. That's right. This is Diamond, Mr. Moran. Uh I've got a lead on someone who knew Mac Grayson. That's fine, Mr. Diamond. Who is it? A guy who hangs out on Skid Row named Wilbur Truitt. Ever heard of him? No. Oh. Well, he might have been the one who phoned you this morning. I I think I'll go down and find out. Good, good. You'll keep in touch, won't you? Oh, as long as I'm on the case. Goodbye, Mr. Moran. I left the 5th Precinct and headed for Skid Row. If you've never seen the street, it's a liberal education in the misery of human beings. Even the sun winds up with a hangover if it shines on the place too long. 
The parent club was a cellar with a low ceiling and a drink of wine for ten cents a glass. The smell of stale alcohol was so strong that if you opened the, opened the door to air the place out, the walls would probably cave in. I found Wilbur Truitt sitting at the bar with a dirty towel around his neck. He held the towel and a glass of wine in one hand, and with the other he pulled the towel, lifting his hand and the glass up to his mouth. <sighs> you must have been an engineer. I learned this little stunts in grammar school, bucko. I started missing my mouth 30 years ago, so I used this towel as a sort of alcohol pulley. It cuts down the element of risk. Hate to spill a drop. You know a guy named Grayson? It's the shakes, bucko. I am completely exhausted after a night of revelry, and my hand waves like it was flagging down a caravan of whiskey trucks. Look, friend... But uh... after one or two pick-me-ups, I am perfectly capable of lifting the glass by myself. And come nightfall, I'm in excellent condition to entertain my little friends. Oh, swell. Most cowards let the little fellows frighten them, and they end up in Bellevue, but... I like them. They worried me at first, but when they found out how much I drank, they began to show the strain, and the shoe was on the other foot, so to speak. Oh, no. They tried to frighten me the first night, but I just kept right on with one bottle after another, and it finally drove them to drink. Now my DTs have hallucinations. We are rapidly building up a thriving community. What were you saying, Bucko? Uh, something about the evils of self-indulgence, but I've forgotten now. Good. In that case, I will let you buy me a drink. Oh, sure. Waiter, bring a bottle. You just gave me cold chills. If I lick your hand, it's only a sign of fond endearment. Okay. Now, uh, do you know a guy named Grayson? I knew there was a catch. Are you a cop? No. In that case, I trust you. Besides, you are holding that lovely bottle. What about Grayson? First, a small glass of truth serum. First, Grayson. I can't stand to look, so I will turn my back on the bottle and tell you what I know. Mr. Mac Grayson... A very unsavory character who reached a sudden demise last evening dealt in smutty pass and made them pay off by milking his victims. He has only one friend, a Mr. Leo Fink. Now, please, I'm beginning to spit out wads of cotton. Where does this Fink live? Oh, you are indeed a heartless role. I was once. You aren't by any chance a spy from the Purity League? You get the bottle when I find out where Leo Fink lives. Eleven... 22nd Avenue now, please. Now, here you are. Don't struggle with the cork, bucko. I have just acquired the strength of an uncropped Samson. And as I gaze upon this ruby goblet, I am reminded of the fact that you are not the first to come seeking the whereabouts of one Leo Fink. Huh? Play it back in English. Ah, a thug with the disagreeable habit of twisting my ascot. Approached me not ten minutes before you came in seeking the same information. Did you give it to him? I had to. One more pull on my tie, and dissipation would have been a thing of the past. Thanks, Wilbur. Here, buy yourself another jug. Oh, bless you. And good morrow, cousin. Here's to my love. Oh, true apothecary. Thy drugs are quick. Thus, with a kiss, I die. I left Wilbur with his first love and walked out on the street. I grabbed a cab and headed for Leo Fink's address. All the way over, I kept thinking how wonderful fresh air really was. When we finally got there, I paid off the cabbie and looked at my watch. It was 4.30 and the city was turning soft and mellow as the sun started giving up behind the tall buildings. I got that lousy feeling again when I looked across the street. A prowl car was parked at the curb, and it looked like Homicide's private limousine. Something was wrong. I went up to Fink's apartment in a hurry. Yeah? Ah, uh, what do you want, Shamus? Well, good afternoon, Sergeant. I'm taking the census. How long ago did you die, sir? Very funny, Diamond. Otis, who is that? Diamond, who else? I didn't ask for a quick quiz on well-known personalities. Let him in. Yellow, Lieutenant. 
Shame on you, Otis. You'll never make an Eagle Scout. Hello, Rick. What do you want? I bet he's dead. You'll bet who's dead. You know who's dead. Sure, I know who's dead. Who do you think is dead? The guy I came up here to see. Well, who did you come up to see? Well, I think it's the guy who's dead. Don't you know? No, I ask you. Well, I'm telling you. You told me nothing. Look, why are you up here? Because I'm looking for a guy. What guy? I think it's the guy who's dead. Who's dead? Oh, he's on third. Don't you know? I think I know, Lieutenant. You shut up. Of course I know. Well, all right, all right. If you're going to hold out on your old pal... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did we get into this thing? Otis! Here's your bicarbonate, all mixed. All right, now let's start again. Walt, who's dead? Oh, let's not have two bodies up here. The guy's name is Fink. Leo Fink. Uh, Why did you say that in the first place? Because I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Walt, Lieutenant Levinson. Now, what are you doing up here? Oh, I came up to see Leo Fink, that's all. Well, he's in the other room. If he spills anything, don't believe it. He's been dead for ten minutes. That's too bad. He knew Mac Grayson. Yeah, how did you find out? That sweet old gentleman you sent me over to, Wilbur Truitt. Oh, you got something out of him, huh? What else did he tell you? Nothing, but we uh, struck up quite a friendship. I'm going to go back over and see what another bottle of wine will do to his memory. I'd better haul him in. Don't do it, Walt. Don't do it. I can find out things a lot quicker. Shh. I got a system. Okay, but keep me posted. Huh? I've got to clean up here. How did Fink get it? Two bullets in the head. No idea who gave it to him. They used a Luger, I think. Hey, have you questioned Otis? Oh, go on. Get out of here. Walt, tell me, did you check the prints on that highball glass next to Mrs. Moran to find out whether they were from her right or left hand? Now, what difference does it make? I'll let you know. Now, you wait a minute. No, I can't. I'm behind schedule now. Bye. Oh, Otis! I went downstairs in a hurry and started back to Skid Row and Wilbur Truitt. I turned a corner and had a quick change of heart. That's far enough, Shamus. Wow. Well, well, look what I picked up. All right. Get into this alley. Now, why don't you put that cannon away? It shows up like a pair of gums at a dentist convention. Turn around and get going. I can run if it would help. Take your time. You haven't got too much of it left. Stop nudging. You got a coal barrel. Don't you like it? No, but it helps. <laughs> a lesson in the manly art of self-defense. Next time, don't get so close with a gun. Well, what do you know? A Luger. Okay, so it's on the butterfingers. You got the gun now. What are you going to do? I got a mean streak, and it shows up when someone tries to kill me. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and if you don't answer them... You'll wish you'd picked on an octopus. Now, get up! Oh, you're a big one. Now, who sent you after me? I don't know. Who sent you after me? Honest, I don't know. Oh, wait, wait a second. All right, the guy told me on the phone his name was Jones. Sure, first name's John. Now, wait, wait. I, I know it's a phony, but he was recommended. You get paid for your work, don't you? Yeah, but this one I collect after the job. Where? I thought you'd gotten over that stubborn streak. Okay. Uh, uh, the 8 o'clock ferry to Staten Island. He's going to slip me two bills. And you don't know his right name? No. Did you know Mac Grayson? Well, I heard of him, but I never met him. Are you as handy with a thirty-two as you are with that Luger? Huh? Forget it. Next question. Who killed Leo Fink? Oh, that's a pretty big one. Okay, I'll word it differently. Who killed Leo Fink? I'll take the beating. Yeah. Well, I got a hunch this Luger of yours will check with ballistics. Come on. Homicide still up in Fink's apartment. Nuts. What did you say? Okay. I hustled Louie up to Walt and left him handcuffed to Sergeant Otis. They deserved each other. Louie said he was going to be paid off at 8 o'clock, and my watch said it was a quarter after 7. That gave me 45 minutes to check at Homicide and still catch the ferry to Staten Island. The fingerprint man at the 5th precinct put the prints from the highball glass under a microscope and told me what I wanted to know. My hunch had been right. So I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was paying for my ticket at the ferry landing. A thick, wet fog was beginning to roll in off the river, and by 8 o'clock, it was hard to even see your watch. Someone was playing a piano in the lounge as the ferry began to move slowly across the river. I didn't know who I was looking for... But I figured if there was going to be a payoff, it would be outside. I leaned against the rail and took out a cigarette. Got the match, mister? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, right here. Thanks. Lousy night. Yeah. He wasn't my man. 
When he struck the match, I could see his dirty work clothes and his factory badge. I started down the other side of the board. Finding a killer in that fog was like looking for your car keys in a mine shaft. I reached the bow of the boat, and right then I knew I was about to score. I get a tight feeling in my stomach when I start closing in on danger. I spotted the dark outline at the rail, so I pulled my hat down and walked up beside him. He was hunched over with his arms resting on the rail. Terrible night. Mm Mm-hmm. It'd be awful if you had to find someone in this fog. Not if he found you first. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like the name Louis Osgood. Have you heard of it? I like the name Moran. William Moran. Who are you? Just an employee. Diamond. Hey, you get a gold star. Well, what do you want? Uh, Have you found the blackmailers? Now, stop playing Alice in Wonderland. I just pushed around your hired gun at Louis Osgood. He had enough to say to put you away for a long time. He couldn't have. He didn't know my... Didn't know your name? Who murdered your wife? You or Louis Osgood? Why do you say murder? The police said it was suicide. Well, I got news for you, Buster. Homicide just changed its mind. I checked and found out that the highball glass near her head was covered with prints from her right hand. What does that prove? It proves that to take her own life, she'd have to have fingers a foot long. The prints on the gun were also from her right hand. You're going to tell me that your wife shot herself while holding a highball glass in the same hand? That's not my problem, Mr. Diamond. Well, I think it is. If Louis Osgood didn't shoot her, that leaves just one suspect, you. Now, let's take a walk back to the cabin. I want to keep an eye on you for homicide. All right. This is where I leave you, Mr. Diamond. Hey, come here. I hadn't thought he'd make a break, but as long as he had a gun and knew how to use it, I could understand why he did. I got my gun out and took off after him. I expected him to go over the side and in the fog, and he'd have a good chance. But when a guy gets cornered, he does funny things. I never would have spotted him, but he threw open a door and framed himself in the light from the inside. I must have caught him because I saw him start to fold and stagger through the door. I took my time getting there. A wounded man with a gun can get pretty mean sometimes. The door swung back and forth with the motion of the boat, and I could hear the sound of the engines. He'd gone down in the engine room, so I dropped to my knees and went in after him. A long, polished ladder led down to the big diesels below, and I knew I'd hit him with the first shot because there was a bright red trail of blood leading down the ladder and behind the churning machinery. Moran! Moran, come on out! You can't get out of here. Come and get me, Diamond. I don't like being slapped around, and I'm going to see that you get yours. He was somewhere off to my left and keeping himself hidden. A catwalk circled the engine room, so I pulled an old stunt. I took a wrench off the wall and tossed it down the metal ladder. I watched for his gun flashes, and when I spotted his position, I got down on my stomach and crawled along the catwalk until I was directly over his head. He was sitting in a lot of blood. And he didn't look like he had long to go. Come on, Diamond. I know you're down here. Surprise. Look at the birdie. What? Don't try it. Sorry, Moran, but this just wasn't your night. You want to tell me about it? I shot my wife. I came in just after she shot Grayson. And she was standing at the bar with her back to me mixing a drink. She dropped the gun by Grayson's body, so I picked it up to shot her. Wiped my prints off and put hers on it. Why did you do it? I hated her. She had money. I found some letters and turned them over to Mac Grayson, a well-known blackmailer. I wanted him to drive her crazy until she drank herself into a sanitarium, and then I'd have her money. I never guessed she'd kill Grayson, but when I did, I saw a chance to kill her and make it look like suicide. You should never have called me. The police were satisfied. I had to find Leo Fake. He knew I'd hired Grayson... And he was going to blackmail me. So when I dug up the little wino that knew Fink, you hired Louis Osgood to bump Fink and me. Is that right? Hey. Hey, Moran. Oh, well, it was a dull conversation anyway. Lousy night. <laughs> Captain came and helped me carry him up to the deck. Back at the ferry landing, I called Walt Levinson and told him the whole story. I didn't wait around. I just hung up in the middle of his lecture on good behavior and started walking. A stiff breeze was kicking up and pushing the fog back where it came from. After a good round of murder, a guy likes to relax. And I knew just the place to curl up and get my fur brushed. I grabbed a cab and headed for 975 Park Avenue and the only girl in the world who looked better than her $10 million bank account. Who 
Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the library. Thanks. Get me a glass of milk, will you, Francis? Milk? Oh, yes, sir. Right away. Hey, that's a B-flat. Rick, where have you been? Sailing, sailing over the bounding main. Move over. You were supposed to have been here at 8 o'clock. Oh, what's an hour if you tack it on to the end of the evening? Well, I'm glad you've been keeping out of trouble. I can't stand it when you wander in all beat up. Mm, you smell nice. What kind of cologne is that? Gunpowder, 38. What? Oh, nothing. What's this you were playing? Oh, a new song. Again. You were just dandy. Well, you know I don't play well. I just pick. You should be glad you don't play the guitar with those beautiful nails you'd saw it in half. <laughs> You're ridiculous. Whoops. Oh, that wasn't a B-flat. Rick. Mm-hmm. Who do you love? I won't tell. Rick? I love you, baby. Then let's get married. Uh, hey, these are pretty good lyrics. Now stop that. Again, this couldn't happen again. I hate you. This is that once in a lifetime. This is that moment divine. You never sing when I want you to. What's more, this never happened before. Though I have waited a lifetime. For such as you to suddenly be mine. No comment. No. Mine to hold as I'm holding you now and yet never to part. Mine to... Hey, what's the matter? Uh, don't go. You want to sing? Go ahead. Well, what did you have in mind? I won't tell. You're not being original. That's my line. Well, I'm mad. And come here, come here. No. Come here, huh? Mm -hmm. Helen. Mm -hmm. Still mad? No. Mm. Well, let's get you mad again. It's so much fun making up. <laughs> Mine again. What's the name of the song again? <laughs> uh, it never happens again. I'm mad. Oh, good. No. Ricky. Here's your milk, Mr. Diamond. Oh, my goodness. You never warned me. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Tal Avery, Herbert Butterfield, and Jack Petruzzi. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. Now, NBC brings you a three-way cavalcade of grand comedy with Phil Harris and Alice Faye, Fred Allen and Henry Morgan, all following in fast succession over most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. My name's Diamond, and I'm known along the big street as a guy who manages to keep his nose pretty clean and still make a few bucks while I'm doing it. Oh, sure, it gets a little grimy, but you've got to expect that. I'm a shamus, private eye, gumshoe. To the guy who hasn't ever been worried because he tripped over a corpse in his breakfast nook, I'm known as a private detective. And to some guys, I'm known by a lot of other names. Not the kind you'd find in a book on manners and social usages. But there are times when you... 
might turn up on your desk calendar under the heading of what I must do today. Who hires me? How do I make a living? Well, maybe this will give you an idea. Fred, why don't you eat your toast? It's getting cold. Why don't you stop worrying about the temperature of my breakfast? I'm trying to read the paper. Did anyone ever tell you how charming it is to have breakfast with you every morning? Yeah. My ulcers. I'd like to go shopping today. Will you leave me some money? Fred, did you hear me? Mary, I'm reading. Well, stop reading and listen to me for a minute. I need some new summer clothes and I want to go shopping today. Here. Here's ten bucks. Buy yourself a bathing suit. Oh, that's very funny. Hmm? I need more than ten dollars. I want five hundred. What kind of a bathing suit are you going to buy, Mink? I'm not going to buy a bathing suit. I need some new clothes. Will you put down that paper and listen to me? Well, I see you made Jimmy Cello's column again, my darling. What? What prominent socialite is fighting with her wealthy husband and crying on the shoulder of a big-time playboy after the arguments? Is that... That's supposed to be me? Can you remember five minutes in the past five years when we haven't been fighting? Are you accusing me of running around with some playboy? Running around is right. I expect one of you to be the first to do a four-minute mile. How dare you? How dare me? Why, you lushed-up little tramp. Tramp? Yeah, tramp. Everybody in town knows you're seeing Lauren Oliver. All right, so I've been seeing him. We're... We're just friends. Well, that kind of friendship is grounds for divorce in this state. Why, you dirty... I'm sick of this whole rotten mess. And I'm going to do something about it. You're going to do something about it? Why, you conceited, pompous... You're going to do something, are you? Well, you better hurry up because I've got some ideas of my own. Uh, yeah? Lorne. Yeah, yeah, Mary? I've got to talk to you. What time is Ten it? Ten o'clock. Well, it's still the middle of the night. Call me back this later. This can't wait. Fred found an item about us in Jimmy Cello's column this morning. He stormed out of here like he was going to kill somebody. Well, you're just a gal who can recognize the symptoms. Well, that's a nasty line. What do you want at 10 in the morning, Longfellow? Look, honey, I'll take care of Cello, and if that husband of yours gets out of line, I'll take care of him, too. You see what I mean? If things like that didn't happen, I'd be out of business. I'll lay you eight to five that before three o'clock this afternoon, one of those charming people will be walking into my office begging for help. Yeah? Rick? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Hi. You gonna take me out tonight? Sure, sure. I'll be over later. We'll have a quiet evening. No, no. I want to go dancing tonight. If you don't take me, I'll throw a tantrum. But, baby, I don't have the cash. I'm tapped this week. Well, if you won't let me take, you'll borrow it from friends. You told me yourself he was good in a pinch. Yeah, but he's already black and blue from those three lunches at Lindy's. Besides, he's not only your butler, but he's a darn good businessman. He wants security. Well, I'll give it to him. He's already got my badge, my book on the ten best ways to sneak through transoms, complete with illustrations, and my gun. Haven't you got something else? Yeah, but I'm saving the right eye in case of an emergency. Keyholes, you know. Look, honey, let's go take in a quiet movie. And... I want to get dressed up and go to a nightclub. Summer. The flowers are blooming and the fox has left his lair. His what? Oh, I've been hibernating all winter and I want to get out into some nice smoke-filled dance floor. Why, Helen. Why, Helen, nothing. Please, Rick. Uh, hold it. Someone's knocking at my chamber door. Come in. Mr. Diamond? Yeah, I'll pull up a chair. I'll be right with you. Who is it? I'm afraid to look. I haven't paid the light bill. This is a detective agency, isn't it? You, sir, have just won yourself a new economy home size murder sampler, complete with a matching set of bodies. Me? No. I haven't got time to listen to your bright remarks, Diamond. I want to hire you. What did he say? He doesn't like my bright remarks. You won't even admit they're bright. What else? Oh, something about wanting to, uh... Something about what? Uh, what was that last statement, sir? It sounded rather cozy. I said I wanted to hire you. What? I'll call you later, baby. Bye. Uh, wait, wait a minute. I, I... Now, uh, Mr., uh... Sears... Mr. Sears, what can I do for you? I want you to follow my wife. Will I like the view? She's running around with another man. Well, if they're just running around, don't worry about it. It's when they get tired and slow down that things start to pop. There was a veiled article in Jimmy Cello's column this morning about my wife and this man. Yeah, I know Cello. So do I, but I'm not interested in Cello at the moment. Well, what do you want? Enough on your wife so you can get a divorce? Yes. Oh, well, that, that comes kind of high. I don't like cases like this, and I usually turn them down. If you want me to swallow my pride, it'll take a $200 retainer and a 100 a day in expenses. I'll write you a check. Oh. 
Oh, just like that, huh? I am quite wealthy. Hmm. That's why I want the divorce, Mr. Dynam. There you are. Yes, sir. There I am. Now, what's the man's name that your wife is uh, seeing? His name is Lorne Oliver. Well, this is turning into a family gathering. You know him? Sure. Runs the Monarch Club. That's right. What's your wife's name, and we're going to get a look at her. Mary Sears. You can see her tonight at the stork. We'll be there for dinner, 9 o'clock. I'll be there. Oh, uh, incidentally, that uh, comes under the heading of expenses, in case you have a short memory. I have a good memory, Mr. Diamond. You can send me the bill. Oh. Address and phone number? 45 East 65th Street. 45 East 65. Evergreen 41793. 41793. Now I've got to be going. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Sears. Yeah? What'd you hang up on me for? Uh, honey, this is because you always give me an argument. You never want to go anywhere. I'm getting tired of shows and hot dogs. I want to go dancing. What? And I don't mean Roseland. I want to go to the stork. I'm a growing boy, and I like to see the bright lights and throw my money around. But, Rick, you... you I'll certainly... pick you up at 8.30, and this time, don't wear slacks. <laughs> You're an idiot. Bye, idiot. Yes, that's the way it goes, just as I told you. The word private in front of detective means you're married to all the troubles in the world, and that includes everything. So if a guy turns up who's unhappy with his wife, you listen to him howl, and if he's got enough money, you take the job. It's for better or for worse. And until Mr. Sears came in, it was decidedly one-sided. I'd teach cooking to a bunch of headhunters for a fee like the one he'd given me. When I looked at his $200 check, I started getting that big man complex again. So I closed the office and went back to my flat. We'd probably be up late, and Helen always had some extracurricular activities after we'd get back to her place. You know, roasting marshmallows, fast game of canasta, or an exciting round of image on the living room rug. Anyway, I always got home pretty late in the a.m., so I spent the rest of the afternoon taking a nap. At 6 o'clock, I got up and dressed, and at 8.30, I picked up Helen. Wow. And at 9 o'clock, we were sitting at the Stark Club bar, right on schedule. Rick, when are you going to ask for a table? Well, honey, the drinks come past oh, here. But I want to dance. Oh, no, no, no. Mustn't overdo it, lover. Uh, How do you know? Maybe some mountain climber will ask you on a 20-mile hike to bar. Think of your feet. I am. I want to move them around that dance floor. Oh, Rick, I know you. You do something, you do it all the way. Yeah, let's nick. Oh, now you stop that. You're on a job, and you don't want to go in there because you've got to watch somebody. Well, Helen Asher, how are you, darling? Well, hello, Lauren. How have you been? Oh, couldn't be better. Why don't you ever stop over to my club? I'd like to show you around. She just brought a seeing eye dog. Oh, hello, Diamond. You two know each other, don't you? Yes. How did we make such a grisly mistake, Oliver? I don't know. I tried taking penicillin for it, but it didn't do much good. Well, it probably helped out in the other things. Why don't you try hanging yourself? Really? You always did think you were a pretty funny man, didn't you, Diamond? <laughs> It's easy being a comic. You just find an idiot for an audience. How do you like the performance? Stinks. Pardon me, Helen, but I see some people I know. You'll excuse me, won't you, Diamond? Oh, sure, yes. But the next time you drop around, bring some airwick, huh? Rick, even if you don't like him, you shouldn't say those things. It's liable to start a fight. Oh, uh, he wouldn't take a swing at a midget if he was riding an elephant. I wonder who his friends are. They don't seem to be too glad to see him. That name's Sears. Is that who you're watching? Yeah, the wife. I don't know whether I approve or not. She's very attractive. Isn't she, though? Rick! This is business, baby. Business. I'm only drooling because I haven't had anything to eat since this morning. Well, then let's get a table. You've seen her. You've observed what she's doing. Now let's get something to eat. Oh, wait a minute. Here comes somebody else I know. Where? Standing at the check room. The little man? Yeah, here he comes. Who is he? Name's Cello. Oh. Jimmy Cello. Writes a gossip column. I read it all the time. Yeah? Uh, hello, Jimmy. Well, 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 the Broadway shall as soon as the uh, lovely redhead, Diamond. Helen, meet James Cello, but be careful what you say. Jimmy, Helen Asher. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Cello. How do you do? Is this an item, Rick? If I don't get us a table soon, she's going to make me give back her sorority pick. <laughs> oh, uh, speaking of tables, I see some people I know. Uh, nice meeting you, Miss Asher. Thank you. Goodbye, Diamond. Bye, Jimmy. Rick, he's going over to see your table. Hello, Walter. Hi, doll. Hi. Well, well, good evening. What do you want, Cello? 
Oh, I'd just drop by to see how the happy little family was getting along. Well, just drop away. Nobody asked you to stop by. Yeah, why don't you do that and take Oliver here with you? Nobody asked him to stop by Fred, either. keep your voice down. This is my table, and I don't like a lot of crumbs lying all uh, over it. Who's a crumb? Come on, Lorne. I guess Mr. Sears has forgotten a few things. I haven't forgotten a thing, Shallow. When you print one thing in that lying sheet of yours, and I'll have you sued for life. Listen, Sears, if I did print anything, they'd put you away so far, they'd have to pipe air into you. Oh, do go on, Mr. Cello. This is getting interesting. You'd better get out of here, Cello. No, no, no. Go on, Cello. What have you got an old money bag? He's a lying, dirty gossip monger. He doesn't have uh, a thing. Wait a minute. I don't like that. Why don't you ask your husband about North Africa sometime, Mrs. Sears? Well, just a minute. Fred, stop it. Fred. All right, now pick yourself up and get out of here, Cello. Yeah, maybe you're right. I've got a column to get out. It'll be all about you, Sears, in big time. Go on, get out. How about me? You gonna throw me out, too? You can bet your life I am. No, I'm getting out of here. You stay right where you are. Don't talk that way to Mary. I'll talk any way I like to my wife. Go on, maybe you'd better leave. Here come the waiters. Now it's I'm gonna push this fat slob's face in. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, 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 push him, oh, boys. Oh, all right, all right. Oh, come on, break it up, break it up. Come on. Hey, waiter, give me a hand. Come on, you... Take your hands off me, Diamond. Now calm down, Mr. Sears. I'll kill that slob. Oliver, yeah. you shut up or I'll... Pull your pants up over your head and shove you in a glass like a breadstick. I don't like people meddling in my affairs, Diamond. You're fired. I'm what? You heard me. Now take your filthy hands off me. Ah, well, they were lily white before I palmed that check of yours this morning. You can have it back. Here, eat it. What? I'll have you in jail for this, Diamond. Why? It isn't every day you get to eat a $200 check. Oh, Rick, let's get out of here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, baby, but that's what happens when you go to work for a hyena like Sears. You think he's a nice guy because he laughs so much. But you find out later it's only because he chewed your leg off. We left Sears still spitting out pieces of the check I'd shoved down his throat and headed for Helen's apartment. I was sore. When I get hot under the collar, I don't make for good company. So I dropped her off with a kiss and went back to my flat and climbed in the sack. I smoked a dozen cigarettes before I got to sleep. And when I finally did, it must have been with a big smile on my face. All night, I kept dreaming that Lauren Oliver and Fred Sears were beating themselves to death with hot paper sacks. Sunshine Market. Locks popovers are specialty. Now you stop clowning and get over here right away. Walt? Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, wow. Where are you? I'm in your office. Yeah? Well, if any clients come in, give them a good sales talk. Tell them how many people you've killed or something. There's a guy in your office now. Prospect? Depends on what you're talking about. I think his name is Fritz Sears. Uh, tell him to go home. He canned me last night. I don't think he'll listen. All right, all right. So he's sore. He's got a right to be. Like an idiot, Walt. You know I didn't have anything to do with it. I know you didn't, but we find the stiff in your office and we get a report that he fired you last night, but you had a fight with him. I gotta tell the commissioner something, Rick. Tell him Sergeant Otis is teething. Now you stop that. No, what do you know about the killing? The coroner just left. He said that Sears had been dead about eight hours. The cleaning woman found him at nine this morning and called us. Mm, that puts the time of the murder around 1 a.m. We found this clenched in the dead man's hands. What is it? An article torn out of the morning papers. Here, read it. Ah, oh, Jimmy Cello's column. Read it. All right, I will. Don't yell at me. Ah, Fred Sears, wealthy import-export man, is having troubles. He's finding it hard to explain about his past doings in North Africa, and at the same time, he's finding it just as hard to explain his wife's interest in the local playboy, nightclub owner, Lauren Oliver. Ah. He got so mad at the Stark Club... Oh, I was there, I was there. He got so mad at the Stark Club last night that he took a poke at your columnist and then tried to beat up Lauren Oliver. Will this lead to a rematch between Oliver and Sears? We're having a whole bunch of them picked up. Walt, Walt, before you do that, give me a couple of hours, will you? Try to dig up your killer? I can't. You know what we've got to do. It's routine. Well, the commissioner's already having fits every time he hears my name. Now, look, Rick. Walt, I got a business to protect. And if he finds out the stiff was killed in my office, he'll probably be a haul in my license. Yeah. One hour, Rick. That's oh. all I can give you. I got a job, too. Oh, thanks, Walt. I suppose you've got an alibi for one o'clock. Call Helen. We were toasting marshmallows. Well, 
while, I had three good suspects. Lauren Oliver, Cello, the columnist, and Mrs. Sears. One of the three was built just right for the electric chair. An hour isn't much time to dig up a killer, so I grabbed a cab and headed for Lauren Oliver's office in the back of his club. Yeah, come in. How are you, Oliver? Oh, what do you want, Diamond? Not particular about who comes into my club. Oh, I'm surprised you can operate with that kind of policy. People probably see you in here every night. I think I'll have you thrown out. Where were you at one o'clock this morning? None of your business. Herman. Yeah, boss? Come in here and show a guy out of my office. Oh, we get rough, huh? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll let you tell the cops who knocked off Fred Sears. Hey, this is the guy, boss? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you say someone knocked off Fred Sears? That's right, but don't start crying about it. It makes me feel so helpless. I'll tell my story to the cops. They'll get a lot tougher than I will. You won't get tough at all, Mac. Oh, stop flexing, Herman. You'll snap your girdle. Well, I guess it doesn't make much difference as long as Sears is dead. I was with his wife from about 12 o'clock to... to, Well, it was a long time after one. Where were you all that time? At my place. And I'll take a walk, Shamus. You got my alibi. One more question. Did you go out at all? Yeah, I went out and got the late papers. So what? I like to read. Okay, okay. You don't mind if I stop by and see Mrs. Sears, do you? No, go ahead. I'll see you later. Oh, Herman. Yeah? You can let the air out now. Your muscles are lovely. Well, Oliver had a good story if it checked. So that left me with two more stops. Cello's newspaper office was the closest, so I grabbed another cab, and ten minutes later, I was sitting at his desk. Oh, you don't think I had anything to do with it, do you, Diamond? Where were you at one this morning? I was covering a party at Richard Gray's. I was with friends from about 11 o'clock till after three. You can check. Come on, check. Look, Poison Pin, Sears had your column from the late edition clenched in his hand. He, he did, huh? Well, you don't think if I was going to kill a man, I'd leave anything like that around? I don't know. Well, now, obviously, someone is trying to make it look like I did it. Have you talked with Oliver and Sears' wife? Oliver's got an alibi, and I'm headed for Mrs. Sears' place right now. You know the address? Yes, yes. 45 East 65th. But Mrs. Sears couldn't kill her husband. I know her too well. No? Well, thanks, Cello. I'll check your alibi. If it stands up, then I'll have to really go to work on Mrs. Sears. Yes? Mrs. Sears? Yes. Oh, you look even better up close. What's on your mind? You mean right this minute? Well, aren't you nice? Don't crowd me, though. I can keep up a pretty good average in this league. I'd say about a thousand. Mm-hmm. May I come in? I think so. If you keep talking, I like to hear nice things. Well, you deserve them. But I can think of some nice things to say about a panther. We'll talk about my family some other time. Can I buy you a drink? It's a little early, unless you got some milk. Milk? Where's your husband? Oh, you know about him, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. It's looked as though it might work into quite a friendship. Where is he? I haven't seen him since last night. Why? Is he a friend of yours? He's been using my office. Oh? Yeah. yeah he died there last night. What? Everybody is so surprised. But, uh, how? Who did it? That's what I'm trying to find out, lover. Where were you at 1 a.m.? That's none of your business. Okay, let the law drag it out of you. Goodbye, dear. Uh, wait a minute. All right, I'll tell you. I was with a man named Oliver, Lorne Oliver. Oh, for how long? From about 12 o'clock to, well, much later. That's what Oliver says. Did you go out at all? Just to get the papers. That checks with Oliver's story, too. Did you go out alone? Why, uh... uh, No, I I went with Lorne. He says he went out alone. Oh, well, yes, yes, he did. I thought you said you went out with him. Well, that was later. Lorne was the one that went out to get the papers. Okay, what time is it? Oh... About two. When you both went out or when Lorne went out to get the papers by himself? Uh, when Lorne went out. Oh, yes. Now, now I see. Well, I, I'll, I'll see you later. I'll come back again. Oh, I'll do that after you get over crying for your late husband. I'll keep my emotions down to a minimum. I'll bet you will. I left her standing in the middle of the room looking after me like a vegetarian with an eye on a green salad. I closed the door and started down the hall for the elevators. For some reason, I never seem to get where I'm going. Hello. Hmm? Oh. Now, while you're still tuned in, Diamond, I'll give you some advice. Stay away from Mrs. Sears. Now, I want you to be sure and get the point. Rick. Rick, come on, snap out of it. Uh, I'll go away. Come on. 
Come on, you don't look so good. Uh, it matches the way I feel. Oh, here's a new line. Where am I, Walt? In Mrs. Sears' apartment. Hello, handsome. She heard the scuffle in the hall, came out, found you, and called me. Swell. Who did it? I didn't see him, but his voice sounded like a thug that Lauren Oliver keeps around a patty cake with. Oh, that was probably Herman. Lauren is so jealous. Well, your hour is up, and now I'm going to haul them all in, including this Herman. Oh, do you know Herman, Walt? Sure, Herman Sharp. Got a record a mile long. Uh, Walt, if a guy wanted to hire a killer, where would he go? You know all the stoolies as well as I do. Yeah. Mrs. Sears, what was the fight about last night at the stork? Oh, a columnist named, named Cello threatened my husband that he was going to print something in his paper. He said something about North Africa, and Fred hit him. North Africa? This is really getting mixed up. Was your husband ever in North Africa? Yes, during the war. He was a captain in the army. Walt, can you get me this Herman Sharp's address? He's the boy I want. Sure, but I'm coming along. Have your boys pick up Cello, Oliver, and take them both down to the station along with Mrs. Sears here. Well, you don't think I had anything to do with it, do you? I've known Jimmy Cello a long time. About five years ago, he used to run around with a little dancer named Mary Carroll. Sure he did. I'm Mary Carroll, but I broke up with him when I met Fred. Yeah. Well, you'll see him at the station. You can pick up where you left off. Come on, Walt. We went down fast and climbed into the prowl car. Walt put in the call and got Herman's address over the two-way radio. Twenty minutes later, we were standing in front of Herman's door was an old apartment house on the lower east side. I started for the door, but Walt had other ideas. Rick, we can't go in there. Why not? Because I haven't got a search warrant. Well, you've got to go in if you want to crack this case. Not without a search warrant. Search warrant for what? To go in. Well, what do you want to go in for? I don't want to go in. You do. Do what? Go in. Well, go ahead. I haven't got a warrant. Well, what are you looking for? Herman Sharp. He's probably in there. He is? Sure. Well, what are we waiting for? Oh, what did I do that for? For that. What? Herman Sharp. Oh. Ah, is he dead? Yeah, been shot. What are you looking at? Newspaper on the floor. This morning's. Oh. Cello's column's missing. Been torn out. Then Herman's your killer. Swell. Who killed Herman? Don't you know? I'm not going to start that again. Walt, go on back to the station. I'm going to check something and make a phone call. I'll be down in half an hour and point out your killer. <laughs> This is ridiculous. I want my lawyer. You'll get one later. Relax, Oliver. They can't hold it much longer. How do you feel, Mary? I don't like this any more than you do. Well, good afternoon. And happy Father's Day. Rick, where the devil have you been? Made a phone call to Washington, Walt. Mrs. Sears, did you know that your husband had a dishonorable discharge from the Army? Why, no. You knew it, didn't you, Cello? That's right, but I kept it quiet. He got it for running a black market. What's this got to do with the death of Sears? Oliver, you told me you went out to get the papers last night. That's right. What time was it? Uh, a little after two. You know what time the late edition comes out. How about you, Mrs. Sears? Uh, what Lorne says is correct. How about it, Lorne? Were you the one to go out and get the papers? Uh, yes. Uh, then, Mrs. Sears, why did you tell me this afternoon that you also went out to get the papers? Well, I... Mary, don't say anything. You don't have to. The stories don't check, so you couldn't have been together last night. Look, Diamond, what is this... Oh, gun... now you look, Oliver. You're both liars. But that doesn't make either one of you the killer. Oh, but Rick, Cello's alibi checks right down the line. Sure it does, because he was at that party. But the killer wasn't. Oh, we know that. He couldn't have been. Yeah, but the man who hired the killer to knock off Sears was. What are you talking about, Diamond? Oliver, where was your hired gun if last night? You mean Herman? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. He was with me until 6 o'clock, then he left. Walt, when you find Herman's gun, ballistics will probably say that it was the one that did the job on Sears. Herman? Yeah. Cello, you hired Herman to kill Sears, and then you killed Herman. What? You're out of your mind. I didn't even know this Herman. We found the newspaper next to Herman's body. It had your column torn out of it. That doesn't pin anything on me. It just shows you that Herman probably stuck that article in Sears' hand after tearing it out of a newspaper. That's you. That's what you wanted to make it look like. You knew Herman. You knew about the clipping, so you killed him and tore the column out of this morning's newspaper. Of course I knew about the clipping. You told me about it this morning in my office. That's right. But you were the only one I told about it. You couldn't convict Jack the Ripper on that kind of evidence. I'm afraid he's right, Rick. Hello. <laughs> what time does the late edition come out? About two o'clock. Walt. What time was Sears killed? Around one. Say. Yeah, yeah. The killer couldn't have gotten hold of that column at one o'clock. The papers weren't even out on the street. Well, then how did he do it? Only one man could have gotten that column before 1 a.m., the man who wrote it. Jimmy. He uh... tore it out of the galley sheets. The proofs that are made up before the paper goes to press. 
Cello hired Herman, gave him the clippings, and then went to the party. Oh, you're doing great, Diamond. Keep it up. You're still in love with Mary Sears. You were jealous of Oliver, so you hired Oliver's boy, Herman, figuring the cops would pin Sears' murder on Oliver. How am I doing? You're a good liar and a rotten detective. You knew I'd go to see Mary Sears, so you sent Herman to beat me up and make it look like Oliver was behind it. What? You tried to frame Oliver all along the line. Why, you cheap little scandal snooper. I'll fix it so you I'll don't wait blame a, anybody. Wait a minute. Yeah, all right, right. break it up. Come on, come on, break it down. Break it up. Hey, Walt. <laughs> what is it, Rick? Bye. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Diamond. Uh, evening, Francis. Miss Asherin? Yes, sir. She's in the library. She's a little tired from last night. I, I think she's taking a nap. Well, I'll walk on my tippy toes. How about a glass of warm milk, Francis? I'm a little tired, too. Uh, yes, sir. Right away, sir. Well, look at the little baby. Mm-hmm. Oh, has not dream ran? Poor little tired baby. The evening breeze caress the trees tenderly. Oh, Rick. The trembling trees embrace the breeze tenderly. Hello, baby. Don't stop. All right. Close your really eyes. Then you and I came wandering by. Oh. Wonderful. And lost in our sight were we. Ricky. The shore was kissed by sea and mist tenderly. Ricky. I can't forget how two hearts met breathlessly. Ricky, come here. Your arms opened wide and closed me inside. Ricky, come here. Uh, what is it, dear? Just this. Mm. Here's your milk, mister. Oh, my goodness. Now, this time I refuse to blush. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Aberback, Joan Banks, Harley Bear, and Sidney Miller. Music was under the direction of David Baskerville. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. I'm Diamond. When have you got any idea how much trouble a private detective can get into sometimes? Well, if you happen to have an office at Broadway and 53rd Street and the sign painted on your door reads Diamond Detective Agency... You're a setup for more trouble than a guy who goes bear hunting with a switch. I know, because I've got that office and the sign painted on the door. Sure, I've got a lot of idle time, and I use it up sitting around with my feet on the desk, waiting. But idle time can be as dangerous as a rattlesnake taking a sun bath. It's just a preliminary, the lull before the storm. You might wait an hour, a day, or maybe even a week the quiet minutes keep multiplying and sooner or later things come to a head like one day last week 
I'd been working on an extra long lull that didn't look like it was going anywhere. But in another part of town, a union meeting was taking place. It was going to keep me jumping around like a hungry flea at a dog show. I wanted to talk to you men. It's time that we did something. The Laborers' Assistance League is already functioning in a great number of factories in this city. And it's getting a stronger foothold all across the country. It continues to expand and gain power because it operates best where there's growing unrest and discontent within the factories. Now, they cause trouble and make it look like the union's not doing a good job for the worker. I know for a fact that four or five men can sit in on a union meeting and cause enough trouble to make it look like the whole union is wrong. Now, this union is getting along fine. He's really out to make trouble tonight. Yeah, if he keeps it up, this is going to be a tough union to crack. He won't keep it up. We're going to take care of it. Oh, what good will that do? His brother Phil will be in from California next week. We can shut his brother up, too. Are you sure he planned this thing with his brother? Yeah. When he gets in from California, he's bringing enough information to put us out of business. Well, that just gives us a week. He's talked too long. Let's break this meeting up. He's doing just that. Yeah? Well, how do we know you're not talking through your hat? Well, now, look, you all know me. I gripe as much as the next guy. But I know for a fact that this league is not only working like that all over the country... But now it's beginning to move in on our factories and our unions. Yeah, but how do we know it's such a bad thing? There are a bunch of racketeers. And if you don't believe me, you come to this meeting next week and I'll give you the proof you want. I don't believe you. Well, I guess you're right. He promised them proof in a week and that's what his brother gets in. Don't worry about it. When he gets the package, he won't be able to give anybody anything. to the dinner dishes, will you? Oh, sure, honey. Here, Mama, let me wash them. You talk to Tom for a minute. He's going to another meeting tonight. Oh, meetings, meetings. Always meetings. Oh, Tom, you're working too hard. No, don't worry, Mama. Phil will be home tomorrow. You help me. Oh, this is not a good business, Tom. The phone call, the threats. Come on, Tom, tell Mama. No, I, I, I can't, Mama. It'll all be over soon. Now, come on. We'll help Marge. I told you to go sit down and relax. <laughs> you sound like I was getting to be an old lady. You take the dish towel and we'll both do them, huh? <laughs> yeah. <honey. laughs> Your wife thinks I'm getting too old to wash dishes. Just you wait until she has a daughter-in-law. I think Mama's hinting. Oh. <laughs> Mama, shame on you. You give us the time to get the son first, then there's plenty of time for a daughter-in-law. Well, I had you and Phil by the time I was 18. Marge is 22, and you've been married over a year now. <laughs> Mama, if you're so set on me raising a family, why don't you talk it over with Marge? Maybe you two can think up something. We'll let you know. Well, you do that, will you? <laughs> you better hurry up, Tom. You'll be late for the meeting. All right, Mama. Oh, I'll get it. No, 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 no. You say goodbye to your lovely wife. Why, thank you, Mama. You know, before your father died, I only had time to raise two screaming roughnecks. But now I plan to be the grandmother of at least five more. <laughs> How about it, honey? Think we ought to make Mama happy? This is a conspiracy. <laughs> Who do you think's going to get left with all the work? Uh, maybe just three then, huh? Silly. I love big families. Oh, I thought so. <laughs> Smooching when you ought to be on your way to the meeting. Can't a guy even smooch with his own wife? <laughs> Who was at the door, Mama? Oh, the mailman. He left our special delivery package for you, Tom. It's in the living room. For me? Yeah. Must be from Philip. It's from California. Oh, he must be sending some stuff on ahead. Well, why don't you open it, Mama? Maybe it's something for you, too. Oh, the women have dishes to wash. It's addressed to you. If you don't want to open it now, so leave it till tomorrow. Now, go on. Get out of my kitchen. You know go. you're sounding more like a mother-in-law every day. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'll open it. <laughs> you know, maybe it'd make you happier if you knew that Marge and I decided on five kids. Children are not kids. Kids are goats. Well, you never know. Tom, John Wagner called you earlier. A Wagner? What do you want? He didn't say. Who's the package from? Oh, that's from Phil, all right. I know it's a surprise, because he sent it to me at the shop first, and then they sent it on here. wonder why I didn't get it at the shop. Well, what is it? Just a second, Mama. Wrapped up pretty tight. Boy, it's sure heavy. (laughs) 
Diamond Detective Agency, murder soft, cheap. We eliminate the middleman. Oh, by George, that was a good one. Is this Lieutenant Levinson, the homicide kingpin? Yeah. Rick, get down here, will you? What's up, lover? Something pretty nasty. Well, tell Otis to stop leaving his bubble gum under the seats. Well, no kidding, Rick. This is something that you ought to know about. Well, stop sounding like an auctioneer at a mortuary and tell me what it is. You know the Waxmans? Mama Waxman? Yeah. Sure, I had dinner over there last week. Took Helen. What's happened, Walt? Last night, someone sent Tom Waxman a box with a bomb in it. What? I knew you were a friend of the family, and I've got to talk with you. Come down here, will you? You know it. I closed the office and grabbed a cab for Walt's precinct. All the way over, I kept thinking about Mama Waxman and her two sons. I'd known the whole family when I used to be on the force. Tom, who used to sing first tenor at the synagogue, had gotten hit in the throat with a baseball. And Catter Weinberg asked me to take over for him, so I sang that day in Tom's place. Mama Waxman heard me and asked me over later for the best dinner I'd ever eaten. We've been friends ever since. The cab dropped me off at the station, and I went in fast. Sergeant Otis was sitting at his desk reading the police gazette. Hello, Otis. Stop panting. They're just pictures. Oh, it's the comic gumshoe. Go on in, Diamond. The lieutenant expects you. Oh, thanks, Sergeant. Oh, by the way, when are you going to get a haircut? You're beginning to look like Rasputin with a Tony. Uh... Hello, Walt. Sit down. I got a real headache. How much damage did the bomb do? Plenty. Killed Tom and put his wife and mother in the hospital. Mama Waxman's pretty bad. Oh, that's awful. Any line on the killer? Yeah, that's why I got this headache. We're, uh, holding Phil Waxman, Tom's brother. Holding Phil? Are you crazy? Those two kids were inseparable. Tom's wife said that the box the bomb came in was from Phil. She heard Tom say so before he opened it. Well, she could have been mistaken. Someone could have copied Phil's handwriting. The story's got more holes in it than a fishnet. The package was sent from California, Rick. That's where Phil was. He got in this morning and we picked him up at the train. Uh, what does he say? I thought at first he was going to say plenty, but... Then some guy comes in and says that he's his lawyer. After the guy left, Phil shut up like a clam. He denies the crime, doesn't he? Oh, sure, but that's all. Can't get anything else out of him. Who was this guy who claimed to be his lawyer? I got it right here. Name is John Wagner. Ah. Uh, you check on him? Yeah, he's a lawyer, all right. But we can't find an address on him. Moved his offices about three weeks ago. Can I uh, talk to Phil? Won't do you any good. But if you want to have Otis take you over to the tombs. I won't have to hold Otis's hand, will I? Oh, go on. Get out of here. There's somebody to see you, Waxman. All right, Diamonds. You got five minutes. How are you going to keep track, Otis? On my fingers. Well, that'll only get you up to 13. I'll scream if I need you. Uh... How are you, Phil? You're in on a tough rap. Yeah. You want to tell me about it? I've told the police everything I'm going to. Who was the lawyer who came in to see you? Just a lawyer. John Wagner? Just a lawyer. Look, uh, what were you doing in California? Now, Phil, I know you didn't send that bomb. Why don't you open up and get yourself free? I've said all I'm going to say. Now, get out of here, Diamond. Oh, it's like that, huh? Yeah, it's like that. Oh, come on. Go on, get out! Okay, okay. But don't forget your mother. You don't want to let her down. I'm going over to the hospital and see her now. Hey, Otis, let me out of here. Hello, Mama. What? Who? Oh, Richard, how's my big policeman? Fine, Mama. Did you know that one of my wonderful sons is dead? Did you know that, Richard? Yes, Mama. Now, you take it easy or the doctor won't let me stay. They killed my Tom because what he said was the truth. And that's why they are bad, because they don't let people tell the truth. Who, Mama? My boy Phil knows. He will tell everything about them, and then they will be arrested. Sure, Mama, but who does Phil know about? I just saw him and he won't tell me. Mama. I, I feel so sleepy. I, I, I'm tired. Mama. You'll have to leave now, Mr. Diamond. Is she asleep, nurse? Yes, we gave her an injection before you got here. Oh, 
then may I see Mrs. Tom Waxman? For a minute, yes. She's in this next room. She isn't as serious as Mrs. Waxman, but she has to rest. I'll give you a minute with her. Marge? Yes? Who is it? Where? Oh. Oh, no, no. Come on. You've got to help me out. I'm the guy that's supposed to make people laugh. I'm the cornball with the bad line of chatter, remember? I can't help it. I'm sorry. They, they gave me something to make me sleep, and things don't make too much sense. Look, dear. I want to help Mama, and I want to help you, too. But the nurse will only let me stay a minute. The police are holding Phil. I just came from seeing him. Does he tell you anything? Nothing. I made a mistake and told the police that the bomb had arrived in a package from Phil. I didn't think... They can't believe Phil would ever do a thing like that. He was helping Tom. Mama said Phil knows who did it. He doesn't know. He just knows who's behind it. I'm pretty sure I know, too. Who, Marge? Tom's been making speeches against an organization that call themselves the Laborers' Assistance League. I've heard of them. King-size bunco game. Yeah. Phil's been in California. He joined the league and found out a lot of things about it. He used to write Tom once a week. Your time's up, Mr. Diamond. You'll have to leave. Uh, Just a second. Marge, did Tom tell anybody what his brother was doing? I don't know. There was a man named... John Wagner that called Tom all the time. John Wagner? He's a lawyer. Please, Mr. Diamond. Uh, Did he tell any of the men who work in the shop with him? Yes, I think so. Mr. Diamond, I'll have to call the doctor. Please, nurse. This may mean another man's life. Marge, who did he tell? Well, I... I can only remember one person. Ralph Pryor. Pryor. Mama used to fix Tom and Ralph dinner after work sometimes, but he, he... He was Tom's closest friend. Okay, Marge. Now, you take it easy, and I'll see what I can do. Please, Rick, find the men who did this. Yes. Well, I'll try. All right, nurse. I shouldn't have let you stay this long. What would I have to do to get you to take care of me? Have an accident. Well, I'll see what I can come up with. Bye. I left the hospital and walked out of the street... One of those sidewalk photographers snapped my picture and handed me a card in the case I wanted to send him two bits for the print. I threw the card away and headed for the factory where Tom had been working. The superintendent took me down and introduced me to the new foreman of the shop. Yeah, pretty rough about Tom. That's an understatement. Tommy, when did you take over Tom's job as foreman? This morning. How long have you worked for this shop? About three years. Why, are you a cop? I might be. You know a guy named Ralph Pryor? Sure, that's him, right over there about that third turtle. Want me to call him over? No, I think I can make it under my own power. Hey, uh, you Ralph Pryor? Yeah. You knew Tom Waxman pretty well, didn't you? Yeah. Well, don't cry on the machinery, it'll rust. Who are you? What do you want? Name's Diamond. Let's say I'm a friend of the family. Well, good for you. What are you snooping for? I've got an erector set. I just love machinery. Well, don't get too close to this machine or it'll take your arm off. As long as it's not the one I count my money with. How long have you worked here? None of your business. Where were you during the war? Same answer. Well, thanks, Mr. Pryor. You've been grand. Hey, Foreman. Yeah? Did you talk to Pryor? He's the quiet type. So how does the mail come in here? From the mail room. Ask a silly question. No, I mean who brings it in? No special one. Foreman usually sends someone after it. Do you remember a package coming here for Tom yesterday or the day before? No, if there'd been one, Tom would have seen it. He was the foreman then. Where can I find the mailroom? Up the hall to head the stairs. Thanks. Sure is too bad about Tom. You said that. Say, didn't I know you all back in Little Rock, Arkansas? No. I'm from Malvern. I just thought I'd ask. I went up and talked to the mailroom clerk, and he was a little more help. There had been a package for Tom. He told me that he'd sent it down along with some other mail, but he couldn't remember who'd picked it up. I was beginning to get warm, and I knew it. 
So I slipped into a phone booth and put in a fast call to Lieutenant Levinson. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me talk to the lieutenant. Oh, it's you, Diamond. Why don't you stop playing like a detective? Why don't you buy the lieutenant a necktie for his birthday, a fuzzy green one? You think he'd like that? Sure, and if the clerk has never seen a fuzzy green one before, just show him your tongue. Now put the lieutenant on. Uh, Lieutenant Levinson. What? Did you find out anything about that bomb? Oh, yeah, Rick. It was dynamite, highest grade. But I don't see how it could come all the way from California through the mails without the caps blowing the whole thing up. Uh, neither do I. Do me a favor, will you? Pick up a Ralph Pryor. He works at the same shop that Tom Waxman did. What can I hold him on? Just picking him up, pick him up for questioning. Since when do you need an excuse? Now, you wait a minute. If you know something about this I've case, just I'll... got a hunch. Pick the guy up and I'll be down in a little while and tell you all about it. I hung up on Walt just as he was getting around to the words you could censor and headed back to the factory. I waited around outside for about ten minutes and then, sure enough, a prowl car pulled up and two boys in blue got out and went in. In a couple of minutes, they came back outside, only this time they had company. Ralph Pryor. I waited until they'd pulled away, then I hailed a cab and headed for the 5th Precinct myself. Oh, where have you been? Snooping, Walt. I just saw your boys pick up Pryor at the factory. Thanks. Now, would you kindly tell me what you wanted him picked up for? Oh, it's a long shot, Walt. I found out he knew what Tom's brother was doing in California. What was he doing? Getting some information on a racket that's been trying to muscle in on Tom's local union. In California? Yeah, they're operating all over the country. You've heard of them. Labor's Assistance League. Oh, those leeches. Well, I still don't see what this has got to do with Pryor. Well, I think that bomb was sent from the factory here in New York. And I found out a little while ago that in order to get hold of that package, the killer would have to be working in Tom's shop. You think Pryor did it? I'll tell you better when I see if anyone comes down to get him out. Well? Well, what? Well, what are we going to do? Sit here and look at each other? Well, that's a pretty ghastly thought. How about a fast game of canasta? Oh, you know, it's a lousy two-handed game. Well, I'm just trying to help. We could play jacks, but twosies throw me. Yeah, what is it, Otis? Uh, the lawyer, John Wagner's out here. He says he wants to see the guy we just picked up. Fast word? Ralph Pryor? Yeah. He says he represents some kind of laborer's assistance league or something. Said that Pryor's a member. All right. Let him see him. Okay, Lieutenant. John Wagner, that lawyer who came in to see Phil Waxman this morning, is back again, Rick. It's oh. time to see Pryor. Yeah? <laughs> well, what are you looking so smug about? Looks like the hunch is going to pay off. You mean this lawyer is tied in with the killing? Well, I'm not sure, but I think so. Tom Waxman was making speeches against the Assistance League. Now a lawyer from the League shows up to help the only guy who knew what Tom was up to and worked in the same shop with him. Now I suppose you want me to hold the lawyer. No, what? Why? How do I know? That's what I asked you. What? Am I supposed to know everything? Lock him up if you want to. What for? He's not guilty. How do you know he's not guilty? Because you had me pick up Ralph Pryor. Well, let him go, too. Let him go where? With his lawyer. I thought you wanted me to lock up the lawyer. Well, oh, that was your idea. What was? Locking up the lawyer. I don't want to lock up the lawyer. Well, let him go. He's not in. Pryor is. Well, let him go. Who? Phil Waxman. How did he get in here? I don't know. You put him in. Of course I put him in. Now, why should I let him out? I don't know. I ask you. Ask me what? Why you put him in. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Otis. Yellow yeah, Lieutenant. Empty the jails and throw this idiot out of my office. Thanks, Walt. Bye. I went out in the squad room and spotted the lawyer just as Otis started back into Walt's office with a glass of bicarbonate. He was a little guy, dressed neatly in a Hamburg, blue suit and spats. I made sure that he was my man and I went out in front of the precinct to wait. I hung around for about half an hour until he finally came out and then I started the tale. He grabbed a cab and so did I. We went across town, and I watched him as he got out and went into a big building on 38th Street. I went in after him. We rode the same elevator to the 8th floor. We both got out. I made like I was looking for a room number, and he went in the door with a sign on it reading Continental Shipping, offices in New York, California, and London. I got close to the door and could hear a phone being dialed. I'd have given my eye teeth, complete with the fillings, to have heard what the conversation was about. Yes, I just went down to see him. He'll be released in an hour. I've got him passage on the tramp steamer. When they release him, he'll meet me at a place I picked and I'll give him the ticket. I'll tell him the police are up to something and he'll have to get out of the country. Now, don't worry about that. He'll never get there. The captain of the ship is being paid to see that he doesn't. All right. Yes, everything is going as well as can be expected. Oh, one more thing. A friend of Waxman's, a private detective, is following me. One of our men took his picture coming out of the hospital after seeing Waxman's mother. 
Yes, well, don't worry about it. I can take care of him when the time comes. All right, goodbye. I waited until he came out of the building and the hunt was on again. I grabbed another cab and it took my last three bucks chasing him to a little waterfront dive on Canal Street. I followed him in and watched him sit down in a booth at the back of the room. I made like an unhealthy patron and took a table near the door where I could watch. An hour later, a guy walked in and headed for the lawyer's booth. He was Ralph Pryor. He talked with the lawyer for a minute, then took an envelope from him and got up. He went out and I went after him. If I was right, he was my killer. The lawyer could wait. Uh, Ralph. Huh? I want to talk to you. I thought I told you to stop snooping. Bad right here. Let's step in this alley. For what? Get in the alley. Hey, hey. What do you think, you're shoving around? You're just full of questions. You know, mister, you're not so big that you can't end up with a busted head. Now, let me go. I guess you better understand something. Oh. Get the point? Oh, you dirty... You don't want to play, huh? Oh. 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 Maybe you haven't guessed it, but I'm mad. I'm going to kick you from one end of this alley to the other until you tell me who sent that bomb to Tom Waxman. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. The state might slap my wrist, but I don't like losing good friends. Oh, my nose. You should see Mama Waxman. She looks a lot worse, but she's got a lot more troubles. She lost a son. Oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can't take any more. Ah, sure you can. Sure. Just think about something else. Tom Waxman, maybe, or his wife and mother. Want to tell me? Okay. No. Please. Wait a minute. I, uh... All right, I did it. I did it. Leave me alone, will you? You picked up a dummy box sent from California to the factory and you planted a bomb in it. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because Brother Phil had evidence enough to smear the league? You know a lot, don't you? Sure, Tom was going to present the evidence in front of his union. And the league sent an empty box from California dressed with Phil's forged handwriting. I went up to the mailroom and picked up the box and put the bomb in it and sent it to Tom's house. You do it for the league? Yeah, I did it for them. Who's the boss of the league? Uh, well, I, I... Come on, come on. All right. It's... Oh. Now you'll never know. Wow. Mr. John Wagner, complete with Derringer. I hope you noticed the error of his ways, Mr. Diamond. He talked too much. You've got a funny way of keeping clients out of trouble. I'm glad you noticed. I'm going to do the same for you. Won't you need a retainer? No, this one's on the house, so to speak. I think you're going to get one anyway. That cop at the end of the alley with a riot gun doesn't look like he's hunting golfers. That is a very stale attempt at throwing me off guard. Anyone that would be stupid enough to try a worn-out stunt like that deserves to die. You'll make it easy for me. Okay, suit yourself. Fire when ready, Gridley. What do you think? <laughs> Thanks, Walt. You arrived in the nick. Nick pick. A big azunt. Why can't you get mixed up with a wife beating or something? The taxpayers are getting tired of seeing their streets cluttered up with a lot of bodies. Now, don't you yell at me. How did you find me? I knew something was up, so when Ralph Pryor was released, I tailed him. I saw you tailing Pryor, I saw the lawyer tailing you, so I tailed the lawyer. Well, if you'd had an eight-piece band, you'd have had a parade. Oh, nuts. Oh, what's the matter, Walt? You, you'd have had to shoot him. He was going to kill me. Oh, I'm not worried about that. Well, what is it? I forgot to bring my bicarbonate along. Oh. Well, the wagon came and created Pryor and the lawyer off to the morgue. When we got back to the station, Walt put in a call to the feds and told them to check the uh, Labor's Assistance League in California pick up the guys who sent the package through the mails. Using the mails like that can be a tough rap. And three weeks later, the government closed in. They picked up the big wheel and threw the whole bunch away from 10 to 20. Tom's brother, Phil, was released, and he went in front of Tom's union and gave them the evidence he'd collected while he was with the league. Needless to say, the league wasn't represented that night or any night after that. About three weeks after Mama Waxman came home from the hospital, she invited me over for one of her famous dinners. I brought Helen, and her butler, Francis, came along to help with the serving. Hi, oh, Mama, I'm stuffed. Oh, Richard, you didn't finish up the cheesecake. Can't make it, honey. I can't move. Oh, the Helen's a good girl. She ate everything in front of her. You know what? You two should get married. 
her appetite is the best argument against getting married I can think of. Keep working on him, Mama. <laughs> all right. Now, let's all go into the front room. If I know my big policeman, he still likes to stretch out on the couch. Huh? You are so right. <laughs> <sighs> Here, let me help you, Mama. Oh, thank you, Richard. Uh, there's Francis. Oh, he's in making some coffee. Oh, he's been such a help. Before the accident, it was nothing to serve supper. You sit right here, honey. All right. Thank you. I won't have to eat another thing for a week. Here's the coffee, Mrs. Waxman. Uh, Francis, you must call me Mama, like the rest. Oh, yes, ma'am. Mama. Did you have enough to eat also, Francis? It was simply wonderful. You know, someday if Miss Asher doesn't mind, I'd like to stop by and... Well, to swap recipes, as it were. Well, I think that would be wonderful, Francis. Why don't you do that? (laughs) I'll give you some fine ones, Francis. Where's Phil tonight, Mama? He had to go to our union meeting. He's going to work in Tom's shop. He also asked me to thank you for singing at the funeral. Glad to do it, Mama. Richard, we always wondered where you learned to sing in Yiddish. Well, I used to pound a beat on the Lower East Side. Oh. Well, uh, would you do me a big favor, Richard? Sure, dear. I'm feeling a little sad about my boy tonight. Would you sing something for me? Uh, this song he liked you to sing. Oh, eh? I'm a little full of dinner, Mama. Please, oh, 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 yes, sir. Please, Mr. Diamond. Well, <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> Mimi, Mimi. A Yiddish medal. Da fa Yiddish a boy. Pretty good for a shake, it's a mama. Oh, fine. Du schön am Edel, in es darf sein, a soi. What does it mean? Don't tell her, mama. <laughs> Weil in de teure is geschwiben, in es oi is du svabliben, a jiddisch medel. Da fayer is a boy. Hi, 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 cousin Kale Mazelta. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful, Richard. You know, you would make a fine canter. Well, thank you, Mama. How did you like it, Francis? Ha! As a cousin, Mr. Gitten, this was it. What? Francis. What did he say, Mama? <laughs> he said as a canter, you would make a fine dishwasher. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Hey, Eddie. Eddie, you mind if I butt in for a minute? Not at all, Dick. Thanks. I just wanted to tell the people that next week our show is going to be on at a different time and a different day. The day will be Saturdays instead of Sundays. And would you please look in your newspapers for the time? Thanks, Dick. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Diamond will come to you next Saturday at a new time. Be sure to check your newspaper for the hour. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. My name's Diamond. If you spotted me on the street, you'd probably figure me for an average working man. But you'd be wrong. I fit the description all right because I break my back six days a week to keep my piggy bank nice and stuffed. But my occupation puts me in a class by myself. I'm a private, honey, nothing in this world but detective. You probably say, so what? The average working man comes under the heading of a lot of different jobs, and you'd be right on that count. But there's one little thing that puts me in a class all by myself. Trouble. Mr. and Mrs. Average John Doe work six days a week to keep clear of it. I put in the same time playing footsies with it. It's a kind of silent partner with references dating all the way back to the year one. People get in trouble every second, and I count on a small percentage to come to me to get them out of it. The rest, 
odds and good advertising. As an example, take the other night in a little bistro over on 48th Street. A couple of guys sitting at a back table were getting set for a special brand of trouble. The big kind that you find under the heading of murder. Oh, Bert, old boy, this is turning out to be a wonderful evening. Oh, I'm glad you're enjoying it, George. Yes. See, who's a blonde over there in the booth? Hmm? Well, I've never seen her before, but she's cute. Yeah, she's sure. Good evening, baby. Oh, George, George, yeah. take it what? easy. Maybe she's waiting for someone. Oh, don't be silly. Look, she's smiling. Let's ask her over to the table. Well, huh? I still think she's waiting for someone. If you want to take the chance, go ahead. You ask her. All right, I will. I uh, said good evening. Good evening. Uh, my friend and I noticed you were sitting alone, and uh, we wondered if you'd join us. Oh, I don't believe I can. You see... Oh, please. Just for a few drinks? No, Really? Thank you, just the same. Well, if you say so, but I'll be unhappy for the rest of the evening. Hi, baby. Tony. I'm sorry I took so long, but... Hey, who's this guy? Not Tony. I said, who's the guy? Uh, if you'll excuse me. No, you wait a minute. Uh, George, come on. I think we'd better leave. This guy a friend of yours? Yes, he is. Was this guy making a pitch, man? No, he only asked me over for a drink. Oh, he did, huh? Now, wait a minute, pal. Please, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. So you made a mistake. Well, I don't like jokers that try and pick up my girl. Oh, hey, wait a minute. You didn't have to slug him. Maybe you'd like to do something about it. Maybe I would. Oh, Loud enough. That's the first time Tony ended up on the short end of a fight in a long time. Is that right, George? Yes. I think I cut my head. Yeah, you're bleeding all over the place. You better get out of here, mister. I saw the manager duck in the back room. He's probably calling the cops. Here, let me give you a hand, George. Yeah. Here, now, hey. take my hat and wear it over the cut until you get home. I'm getting out here, too. You want me to drop you off? Uh, what about your boyfriend? He's still unconscious. He was that way when I met him. You want the lift or not? Yeah, what about you, Bert? Oh, I'll be all right. I'll go on let her take you somewhere so you can get cleaned up. I'll grab a cab and head for my place. I'll call you in the morning. But I don't now want... Now, stop to... arguing. You can't afford a scandal. Well, all right. Come on, honey. Let's go. Well, this... Very nice apartment. You better go get cleaned up. Uh, back to that room. I'll get a couple of drinks. I can sure use a drink. I won't be long. Take your time. Yes. Tony, get out of here. Where is that guy? Come on, get out of here. Why, you cheap little... I'll beat it out of you. Let go of me. Take your hands off me. Take your hands off her. Help. I'll kill the both of you. Help. There's a gun in the a gun? All right. I'll wring your little neck. Oh. You shot him. I did? You better get out of here. Yeah, but uh, what about you? Go on, get out while you can. I'll think of something. Yeah. Leave the gun. I'll throw it in the river or something. Huh? Oh, all right. Now go on, beat it. You just killed a man. <laughs> Yeah, come in. Hi, Mr. Diamond. Well, Hennessy, what did you do, wreck your cab? Nah, it's down in the front. Hey, that's a warm magazine you're reading there. Yeah. Listen to what it says here about women's bathing suits. Huh? 1949 suits allow maximum exposure to sun. Note plunging neckline. <laughs> Note. Who's going to miss it? If it plunges in the lower, it'd wind up at the bends. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Mr. Diamond, would you mind shoving it in the drawer? The picture distracts me. Mm, not at all, no. I, I don't blame you, Hennessy. Thanks. Now, what's on your mind? This. A hat? Yeah. Well, I don't think I can do you much good. What did you bring it to me for? I found it in the gutter over in Flatbush. So what? Some guy loses a hat. Don't tell me you want me to find him. No, I, I just got to worrying a little, you see. I, I found this beside you. Oh, a thirty-eight. Well, let's have a look. Take a look at the hat, too. It's got blood all over the inside. Yeah. And initials on the inside. BK. Gun's been fired. You can still smell the powder in the barrel. 
Why didn't you take this to the police? Oh, I didn't want to get mixed up in it. You see, I got to pick up as many fares as I can. I ain't got nobody to drive my cab for me, and I didn't want to spend the day answering questions down at headquarters, you understand? Well, you'll probably have to anyway. I'll have to notify them. Yeah? Well, I, I, I thought maybe you could find out who owned the hat and maybe solve the case before you notify him, you see? That way I wouldn't have to spend too much time. I could just tell him I found it and beat it. Well, I can't withhold evidence. It'd take away my license. And if you did, they'd lock you up. Okay, I, I just thought Well, maybe... I can check the hat store before I get to the 5th Precinct. Yeah, well, uh, won't that be a tough job? There's a lot of hat stores, well, you this know. this hat's got a label. Besides, when someone finds a bloody hat with a 38 lying next to it, I, I get interested. Particularly when there isn't a corpse to go with it. Yeah. Well, I gotta go, Mr. Diamond. Thanks a lot. You got a free ride any time you want it. I may take you up on that. So long, Hennessy. Well, there you are. What did that tell you? When you're working with trouble, something always shows up. Sometimes it's just a routine case. A guy knocks off his wife and he comes to you because he suddenly found out that he had that lonely feeling. Or maybe you get a real screwy one. A taxidermist that got tired of stuffing animals and went to work on a neighbor. Or then you get one that gives you the same feeling you get when you pick up a poker hand and the first four cards you look at are all spades. Well, I was holding two cards... A hat with blood on it, a gun that had been fired, and all I needed to fill out the hand was a body. By all rights, I should have taken the evidence right down to my friend, Lieutenant Levinson, at Homicide. But I didn't have anything to do, so I decided to see what kind of pieces I could fit into the puzzle. The label in the hat was from a store on Fifth Avenue. It wasn't far from my office, so I walked it. Yes, sir. Something I can do for you? Yeah. Stop munching your sense in and tell me if this hat is from your store. Well, let me see it. These glasses are not telescopes, you know. Yeah, here. Well, if you're planning to return this merchandise, sir, I can assure you the store will not accept it. You've been bleeding on the sweatband. Look, Rosebud, I just want to know if the hat is from this store. It most certainly is. It's one of our custom models. Who did you sell it to? If you found this hat, we will be glad to return it to its owner. We are not supposed to give out the names of our clients. I have a small badge here that should cut this conversation down to a few words. See? Oh, now, would you mind telling me to whom did you sell this hat? Well, just because you're a detective, I am not impressed. However, under the circumstances, I'll give you the buyer's name. You're a real sport. I suppose you wear a shoulder holster, too. Or is that bulge your tailor's fault? Psst. Come here. I really keep a midget in there. You don't say? Yeah. He spits through the lapel of stupid hat clerks. Oh, really? Now, come on, Bright Eyes. Who bought the hat? Well, if you'll just hold your horses. That's the new line, if I ever heard one. Come on, Bubbles. Oh. Yeah. Here it is. This hat was sold to a Mr. Bertram Calmus. We make all his hats for him. Well, bully for you. What's his address? 430 Sutton Place. Now, will that be all, sir? Yes, that will be all, and thank you. You've been a brick through the whole ugly mess. I left him watering his gardenia and headed for the residence of one Mr. Bertram Calmus. The apartment house was about ten blocks away, and with the money I had in my pocket, all taxicabs started looking like iron claws with four wheels. I walked. Yes? How do you mean that? Yes, I don't want any. Oh, and I've got a pretty good sales talk. I never buy anything unless I have a demonstration. My middle name is Semper Paratus. Like the Coast Guard, I'm always prepared. I suppose I could top that, but I'm getting tired of trying to close the door on your foot. What is it you want? I hate to admit it, but I'm looking for Bertram Calmus. My husband. Good for him. Is he in? No, but he will be any minute. And for the boss. This hat, I believe, is his. What blonde's apartment did it turn up in? It was found in the gutter in Flatbush. Well, Flatbush is a little out of his territory, but the gutter sounds familiar. It's that stain all over it. Blood? Does your husband bleed a lot? Not recently. We've been getting along. Are you from the police? I'm a detective. Oh. Come in. Mm, I'd hate to be selling brushes. I'd have slammed the door on your face. Oh, well, then I made an impression. Perhaps. Let's just say you're waiting for a sacrifice to move you to second base. <laughs> Won't you sit down? Thanks. What happens when I round third? And that depends on your batting average, Mr. Diamond, Mrs. Calmus. That's it. 
Now, getting back to a very dull subject, does this hat belong to your husband? I don't know. It looks like one of his. Has it got any initials in the band? Mm-hmm. B.K. When did you find it? I didn't. The cab driver picked it up this morning. And it isn't my husband's blood. He left about a half an hour ago to do some shopping, and he was very bloodless. No cuts on his head? No cuts. He came in around two this morning. He'd been drinking, but he wasn't cut up. Oh, there he is now. I hope he can discuss baseball and the time. Oh, I got all the things you wanted in it. Um, Bert, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a detective. Yeah? Well, how are you? Fine, Mr. Calvins. Tell me, is this your hat? My hat? Let me see it. Why, no. No, it isn't. The hat store on Fifth Avenue says it's older to you. Well, I can't help what they say. That's not my hat. Are you sure, darling? It was found in a gutter. I don't care if they found it on a Yale man in the Harvard Club. It's not mine. Well, I guess I'll have to take your word for it. Uh, wait, wait. Isn't that blood on the hat? Mm, yeah. Well, goodbye, Mrs. Calmus. Mr. Calmus, nice meeting you both. I'll see you to the door. I can do it. I know you can, dear. Coming, Mr. Diamond? Sure. Goodbye. Come back again, Mr. Diamond. Uh, well, goodbye, Mr. Calmus. Where? Where can I call you? What? I can't explain now. Where can I call you in about a half an hour? My office. It's in the book. You'll hear from me, but please, please don't do anything until then. Okay. Half an hour. Then I go to the police with this hat. Was uh, Mr. Diamond? This is Bert Calmus. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I couldn't say anything to you in front of my wife. That is my hat. Well, I thought so. Why did you deny it? Well, I was out with a pal last night. There was a fight over a girl. I didn't want to mention it in front of my wife. Oh, how did the blood get on the hat? My friend got hit on the head, and I loaned him my hat to cover up the wound. What was it doing in a gutter in Flatbush? I really don't know. My friend left with the girl, and I went right home. Mm. Well, who is this friend of yours? I think something may have happened to him. Well, I called him this morning, and he seemed very nervous about something, and he asked me to come over. I'm in the lobby of this hotel right now. Ah, uh, he's probably just worried about the girl he picked up. As long as the blood on the hat was from a cut on his head, I don't think there's too much to worry about. No, no, Mr. Diamond, I, I think it's more than that. He's my employer, and I know him pretty well. I do wish you'd come over. Well, all right, Mr. Calmus. What's the address? The Whitsitt Hotel on East 54th Street. I'll meet you in the lobby. Don't ask me why I started getting that lousy feeling when all I had was a bloody hat, a gun, and a pretty good explanation for one of the items. But there it was. That jammed up feeling in the pit of my stomach like I just swallowed a whole pineapple. Something was wrong, and I wanted to find out what. So I hurried over the, to the Whitsitt Hotel and met Calmus in the lobby. I'm glad you came, Mr. Diamond. I just put in a call to George's room, and someone else answered. So what? Well, the man asked a lot of questions, like who I was and why I... What did I want with George? And... Oh, I, I take it George is your friend of last night. Yes, George Watkins. He's the president of the firm I work for. Well, let's go up. When someone starts asking questions like that on the phone, it begins to sound like the police have moved in. Come on. Yeah. Oh, hello, Walt. Rick, what are you doing here? Fair question. I'll answer yours if you'll do the same for me. I came up to see a Mr. George Watkins. So did I. Well, what's the matter? Is George in some kind of trouble? Who's this guy? Oh, he's a friend of Watkins. Works for him. Oh, yeah? Well, come on in. George. George, what's going on here? You better let the lieutenant tell you, Bert. I can't think anymore. What's the charge, Walt? Murder. But, hmm? Murder? You got a call from a girl last night who said a man named George Watkins killed someone in her apartment. When we got over there, we found the girl there, too. Oh, well, you must have the wrong man, Inspector George. Lieutenant. Wouldn't... And I'm sure you think George wouldn't, but he just confessed. George? Yes, Bert, I killed the man. But I, I didn't kill her. The man came in and tried to strangle her. She told me to get the gun in the drawer, and when the man wouldn't let her go, I shot him. That isn't what the girl told us. She said she took this gun home, or this guy home, after he'd been in a fight, and when they got to her apartment, he made a pass just as her boyfriend came in. Then Watkins shot him and ran out. We figured he got excited, and when he had time to think about it, he went back and killed the only other witness. I didn't kill the girl. I never went back there at all. I came straight here. Uh, Walt, Mr. Kalmus here was with him up until the time he left with the girl. Is that right, Mr. Kalmus? Why, yes, sir. Now, there was a previous fight, and Watkins got that cut on his head. Mr. Kalmus loaned him his hat to cover the wound. That's right, sir. 
And, uh... Oh, by the way, Walt, what caliber was the murder weapon? Thirty-eight. But we haven't found the gun yet. Here, check this one with ballistics. How'd you find this? Cab driver named Hennessy brought it into me this morning. Found it lying with a hat. Did you ever see this gun before, Watkins? No, I, I told you I don't own a gun. Walt, what time do you figure he killed the man and the girl? The coroner fixed the time of death about one o'clock this morning. Hmm. How long were you at this girl's apartment, Mr. Watkins? Why, about five minutes before her boyfriend came in. I shot him and left immediately. And you don't remember taking your hat or the gun? What are you getting at, Rick? This is an open and shut case. He admits killing one of them, but he won't admit the other killing because he knows it was premeditated. Oh, just a hunch, Walt, just a hunch. Mr. Watkins, would you mind telling me just what happened after the girl's boyfriend started choking you? Well, I grabbed a gun out of the dresser near the kitchen and I shot him. And the girl told me to get out, that she'd take care of things, so I dropped the gun and ran. Did you hear anything else? Anything unusual? No. But, yes, now that you mention it, I did hear something that had slipped my mind until now. What did you hear? Well, I, I don't know whether I can describe it or not. It uh, sounded like someone had opened a bottle of flat champagne. What are you getting at, Rick? Oh, wait a minute, Walt. When did you hear this noise? Right after I shot the man. I remember wondering if someone hadn't opened a bottle in the kitchen. Is that where the noise came from? Uh, yes, I think so. Hmm. All right, if I go over and case the scene, Walt? We've done that. Yeah, but you weren't looking for something. Why don't you come with me, Mr. Calmus? I'd like to talk with you. What's the address, Walt? 16 West 113th Street. Well, now, look, don't worry too much, George. I can handle the business, and in the meantime, I'll do everything to get you off. Thanks, Bert. Now, you wait a minute, Rick. If you think you know something... Walt! Yeah? Bye. Calmus and I went downstairs and took a cab over to 16 West 113th Street. It was a middle-class apartment house in Flatbush, a four-story brownstone. I let Calmus pay the fare, and we went in. I wonder what floor it's on. Well, she'll tell on the mailboxes. Yeah, here it is. Nan Phillips, 206. Well, let's go up. Oh, uh, what do you do for Mr. Watkins? I'm his vice president. That's why I took him out last night. I wanted to interest him in a new account. I just can't imagine him killing anyone, but... I guess people do funny things when they lose their heads. Oh, oh. 206. Oh, here it is. Yeah? Hello. Oh, no. Good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. What do you want, Diamond? Oh, I want to stand out here in the hall and count the hairs in your five o'clock shadow. Now, let us in. The lieutenant said it was all right. Okay, comic. Mr. Calmus, meet Sergeant Otis. How are you? Hello, Sergeant. Oh, just make like a policeman and point out the circumstances in this killing, will you? Well, I don't know why I should, Shamus, but if the lieutenant sent you over, I guess I'll have to. Mm. Two bodies was over there by the window, lying pretty close together. Uh-huh. And the killer, that Watkins fellow, was standing about here in the center of the room. With his back to the kitchen door? Yeah. He shot them both from about here. Hey, what are you looking for? Oh, I like to get out on my hands and knees. It's cooler. And I won't do you no good to start looking for fancy clues. The guy already confessed. Well, 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 well. Hey, what do you got there? Just a wad. So, you got some wadding from the murder gun. You better give it here. Sure. But hang on to it, Otis, and be sure to give it to the lieutenant. Maybe you haven't noticed, but murder guns don't throw this much wadding unless you can kill someone with a blank cartridge. Why? Uh, don't let it throw you. Mr. Calmus, I've got some things to do. Can I drop you somewhere? Well... No, thanks. Now that Mr. Watkins can't take care of the office, I'd better go down and check over some things. But I'll keep in touch with you, Mr. Diamond. Uh, you do that. Uh, now, wait a minute, Diamond. Oh, stop trying to figure it out, Otis. You'll snap your wig. I was getting close to something. I wanted to tie the ends together before it caught up with me. I had a big, fat hunch that Watkins had been framed good. And the more I found out, the more it looked like a killer was still loose. The whole setup had been screwy from the first. Why would a guy lose his hat and drop his gun in the same place? Or, if he threw them both away, why wouldn't he burn the hat and throw the gun in the river? Nobody's frightened enough to lay them side by side in the gutter. I learned a lot since this morning, and I was certain of one thing. The killer tried to make it look good. But he was an awful amateur. I knew something else, too. Amateurs can be awfully mean sometimes when you corner them. I put in a call to Walt and told him what I had, and then I asked him to give me half an hour and, and meet me at Mrs. Calmus's flat. I grabbed another cab, and 20 minutes later, I was sitting on a long couch next to Mrs. Calmus. 
It's easy to get that crowded feeling, even on a long couch. You just both sit on the same cushion. Comfy? Oh, yeah. Uh, what kind of perfume is that? My sin. Past or future tense? A rounding second. Mm. What brought you back, Mr. Diamond? Oh, I, uh... I want to ask a couple of questions. Past or future tense? What time did your husband get in last night? I told you, about two o'clock. Why? Do you know if he knows a girl named Nan Phillips? I really don't know. Oh. Well, all right. Just a few more questions, and then we'll get back to that perfume. I'll think ahead. You said you'd been getting along with your husband. Would you mind explaining that? Certainly. I like nice things, and lately he's been buying them for me. Oh. What's your husband's salary? About 15000 a year. Oh. Could he afford to buy you these things? Well, he told me he was getting a raise, and then he'd gotten a bigger fan. What's this all about? Maybe I'd better tell you. Bert, I didn't hear you. I did. What are you doing with that gun? I'm going to use it. I found Mr. Diamond making passes at my wife, and I shot him. Are you crazy? Don't ask him that. He's allowed to start thinking about it. You can't shoot me and get away with it, Calmus. What are you going to do with your wife? She won't back you up. No. No, I guess she wouldn't. All right, both of you, get up and walk downstairs to my car. Bert, what are you doing? Your husband killed two people last night, Mrs. Kalmus. Now he's going to try and cover because he guessed I knew how it was done. You're not going to kill me, too. Get moving. Bert, please. Go on. Says. Why did you kill anyone, Bert? He wanted to frame his boss. I'll bet when the company checks, they'll find out he's had his hand in the till. They won't find out, Mr. Diamond. With Mr. Watkins' book for murder, I'm next in line for president. I'll be able to fix the book so it would look like he took the money, too. Is that where you got the money for all those things you've been buying for me? You shot the man and the girl from the kitchen with a silencer, didn't you, Bertram? That's right. I knew you were onto something when you discovered that wad from the blank cartridge. I was onto something a long time before that. Yeah? All right. Come on. Over to that gray sedan. And remember, I've still got this gun in my pocket. Ah, uh, you're an amateur, Bertram. Is that right? Sure. I knew you had something to do with it when we got over to the girl's apartment. I didn't know what floor it was on, and you looked in the mailboxes. That's the best way to find an apartment, isn't it? Yeah, but not once at any time did anyone mention the dead girl's name. But you knew it and found it on the mailbox. All right, stop right here. <laughs> Open the door, Jean, and get in first. The front seat. Bert, please. Get in. All right. Now you, Mr. Diamond... You're going to drive. You know, I left my license in my other suit. Stop stalling. I had to do something to stall for just a second because over Bertram's shoulder I spotted a prowl car sliding up to the curb and good old Walt was climbing out. Uh, uh, Bertram, would you mind answering just one question? What is it? The gun that Watkins thought he killed the man with was loaded with blanks, wasn't it? Sure. I killed the guy from the kitchen with a silencer. The whole thing was rigged, huh? The man and the girl were supposed to stage that fight, and Watkins was supposed to shoot the guy with the dummy slug. You said one question. Now get in the car. All right, Thomas, don't move. What? Why, you... Just... Ah! Oh. Well, that was a close one. You're so right, Walt. Take his gun. I think you'll find it's the one that Watkins fired the branks from. How is he? On his way. Hey, Bertram. I'll go call the wagon. Bertram. Yes? You want to tie the ends together? I paid the girl and the man to stage the fight. I told them I wanted to frame George and blackmail him. So you framed him with a double murder instead. Why? I'd been stealing money from the company. How'd you know it was me? Well, knowing the girl's name, for one thing, and your wife told me you'd gotten in about two. Oh. You told me over the phone you went straight home after the fight in the cafe. The killing took place about one. Watkins uh, said he'd been at the girls for five minutes. About 15 to get to her place, so that meant you all left the cafe around 12.30. It doesn't take an hour and a half to get... Hey, Bertram. Mr. Diamond. Huh? I don't think Bert can hear you. Yeah. Well, it was a pretty dull story anyway. <laughs> Well, the wagon got there, and I briefed Walt on everything that had happened. They took Mrs. Calmus home and released Watkins. 
It was a stinking hot afternoon, and I needed something cool to bring me down to normal, so I headed for 975 Park Avenue. A tall lemonade with a mind of its own, and a curvaceous redhead with the same gimmick. Yes? Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Diamond. Afternoon, Francis. Miss Asherin? Yes, sir. She's in the study, reading. Thanks, Francis. Oh, uh, how about something cool? Yes, sir. Right away, sir. Hi. Hi. Well, you look cool enough. That's a nice get-up. You like it? It's the newest thing. Yeah, I uh, saw it in a magazine. What do you do if it shrinks? Oh, silly. No, no, I'm concerned. You might get raided. Don't you like it? Yes, ma'am. What do you think of me? Ah, oh, you're adorable. You're beautiful and you're cute. Hey, that sounds like a song. Uh-huh. Come here. No, not now sing it. It's cute. That's too hot. I'm rather cool. Well, I was only lukewarm until I spotted that play suit. Go on. A, you're adorable. Okay, but uh, then I want to play. <laughs> Get it? Play? Play suit? <laughs> that was then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Go on. A, you're adorable, B, you're so beautiful, C, you're a cutie full of charm, D, you're a darling, and E, you're exciting, and F, you've got feathers on your arm. Oh, Rick. G, you look good to me, H, you so heavenly, I, you're the one I idolize. J, we're like Jack and Jill. K, you're so kissable. L, is the love light in your eyes. Rick. M, hmm? Do you want me to finish? I love you. Oh, you're sweet. Come here. Mm-hmm. Uh, just one moment, sir. Uh, yes, Francis? I'm not going to be embarrassed again. Here's your lemonade. Uh, thank you, Francis. Oh, it's nothing, sir. A. You're adorable, B. You're so beautiful. <laughs> you have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Byron Kane, Lorene Tuttle, Paul Fries, and Wally Mayer. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. This is Diamond. I have a little office on Broadway at 53rd Street. And if you happen to be in the neighborhood sometime, you might notice a sign on the door. It reads, Diamond Detective Agency. Yeah, that's how I make a living. Such as it is. I sit at my desk behind that door and wait for someone to come in and hire me. Eventually, trouble works its way into someone's life and gives him a shove in my direction. He tells me about it, and I listen with the attitude of a father confessor. When he's done, I dry my eyes and tell him what I think. What I think really doesn't matter, because it's just a shortcut to a hundred dollars a day in expenses. Sure, you can hire a guy for less money, but when I work, it's for a price I figure I'm worth. It's got to be that way because sometimes it works a little dirty, and I have to swallow a lot of pride. I get mixed up in everything from simple divorce to muscle-bound homicide, and when trouble can't find me a client, it starts working on yours truly, and I wind up in a corner. I guess trouble figured I was just about due for a squeeze play because one night last week, two lifers in the state pen started working me into their plans. What 
about it, Walsh. Shut up. Wait until the guards pass. Okay. Drag out the cards like we was playing. Sure. Is it uh, set for the night? Yeah. I got the car and everything. Yeah. We'll head for Florida and get across to Cuba. Oh, well, I'd be glad to get out of this uh, three lousy years. Yeah, I got eight behind me. I used every minute figuring how I'm going to take care of a guy. Oh, Walsh, you're not going to start that again. Forget it. Be glad you're getting out. You knock off that guy and you'll never make it to Cuba. Now, look. I figured this whole thing out. I paid out a lot of dough just to make it come off. And when it does, I'm going to kill an ex-cop. And you're going to help me. Me? Yeah. Unless you want to rot here. Oh, you're out of your mind. If this break comes off, it'll be the neatest trick in years. And you want to louse it up by knocking off some guy on the outside? You can stay here and rot if you want to. The only way I take you along is you help me to get a guy named Diamond. Yeah, but you waste a lot of time in New York. You'll have the roads covered by then. Look, just because this Diamond guy knocked off your brother and that bank job... You see, you, you bust out of here, it's on my terms. I... Now make up your mind, it's getting late. Okay, give me the layout. Yeah, what is it, Otis? We just got a call, Lieutenant. Two prisoners busted out of Sing Sing, killed two guards. Who are they? Big time. Bob Wells and Charles Walsh. Charles Walsh? Yeah, life. I know, I know. Diamond helped send him up before I took over this department. Otis, get Diamond on the phone. Diamond? Yeah, Diamond. Who'd you think I meant? Little Red Riding Hood? Yeah, yeah Lieutenant. Mm, oh, Diamond, Otis. Bring me my bike, Cardinal Otis. Someday I'm going to get good and sore. What did you say? Uh, nothing. Ah, uh, nuts. Now, what's the matter? His office don't answer. Give me that phone. Huh? We've got to find him before Walsh does. Maybe he's over at Helen Asher's house. All right, Otis, stop standing on one foot. You can leave. Miss Asher's residence. Hello, Francis. This is Lieutenant Levinson. Is Diamond there? Why, no, sir, but Miss Asher expects him. Oh, oh wait a moment, sir. Here's Miss Asher. It's Lieutenant Levinson for Mr. Diamond, Miss Helen. Oh, thank you, Francis. Hello, Walt. How are you, Helen? I was looking for Rick. Oh, I was just talking to him. He should be here in about 20 minutes. Why? Uh, will you have him call me right away? Something wrong? No, no. Just tell him... Tell him an old friend of his is in town, and I have to talk to him about it. Oh, all right, Walt. I'll tell him. Well, thanks, Helen. It'll be at least 20 minutes. He's walking over from his office. Okay, Diamond, hold it right there. <laughs> Start walking over to that sedan. Don't you know it's not polite to point? Look, laughing boy, I got a big gun in my pocket. Well, I'm proud of you. I thought it was a crossbow. Get moving. Okay. I'd never seen him before. He was a tall guy with a scar in his chin. He walked me over to the sedan and opened the door. He moved in close and shook me down. He relieved me of my 38 and motioned me into the front seat. I slid in and he started to follow, so I kept one leg out in front of me and kicked him in the face. I couldn't get enough leverage to cool him, but it gave me enough time to get out the other door and start making like a miler. I looked over my shoulder and saw him climb out holding a bloody nose. I knew he wouldn't take a shot unless he got close enough to make it count, so when he started after me, I ducked into the subway. I found a dime and went through the turnstile. The train was getting ready to pull out, so I pushed my way on just as the gunner came down the stairs. He said he wasn't happy to see me go. He didn't even wave goodbye. Wait a minute, you! Wait! Oh, nuts. Oh, no. You and your swell ideas. What's the matter? I waited for Diamond outside his office, like you said. I started to hustle him in the car, and he kicked me in the face. Oh. I think my nose is you broken. You stupid... I told you to be careful. Yeah, sure you did. You think I like getting booted in the nose? Look, if you want Diamond so much, you get him yourself. Maybe you can tell me how you're going to get to Cuba without me. 
Huh? Oh. Well, what do you want me to do now? I still want Diamond. Yeah, but he jumped the subway train. How am I supposed to find her? I found out he's got a dame over on Park Avenue. Pick her up, bring her over here. Pick her up? I'd have give you that chair for kidnapping. I'll use her to get Diamond. Pick her up if you want to get out of the country. Yeah, but a now, snitch... Look, I it... busted you out of store. I can bust you right back in. No. Now, pick her up. Her name is Helen Asher. She lives at 975 Park. Well, what if someone else is there? What if there is? You want me to stop over making a fourth for bridge? Get him out of the way and bring the dame to me. <laughs> Hello, Otis. Well, Diamond. Lieutenant's been looking all over the city for you. I bet you've been a nervous wreck. I wouldn't care if you fell off the George Washington Bridge, Shamus. Why, Otis? And after all, we've been to each other. Uh, nuts. You better go on in and see the lieutenant. Sure. Hey, uh, Sergeant. Yeah? When are you going to get some new shoes? If yours turn up anymore in front, you'll have to ski to work. Uh, Hello, Walt. Rick, we've been looking all over for you. Why don't you cops get on the job? It's getting so it isn't safe for a citizen to walk the streets at high noon. What are you yakking about? Well, I leave my office to go to see Helen and some goon tries to hold me up. Well, you're lucky you didn't get it right then. Do you know who busted out of jail last night? Go on, scare me. Charles Walsh. He swore if he ever did bust out, he'd get you. Wow. That explains something. Why, what happened? Well, this character tries to hustle me into a car, so I shoved my foot in his face and beat it into a subway. But it wasn't Walsh. Might have been Bob Wells. He busted out with him. I can tell you in a minute he got a file on him. Sure. Otis, bring in the file on Bob Wells. By the way, Lieutenant. Oh, Walt, do you mind if I use your phone? No, go ahead. I better call Helen. Tell her I'm going to be a little late. And I just talked to her and asked her to have you call. Where is everybody? Yes? Francis? Oh, Mr. Diamond... Please, hurry over here. Something's happened to Miss Asher. What are you talking about? Miss Asher's been kidnapped. What? Yes, sir. A man came in and made Miss Asher go down to his car at the point of a gun. He also hit me over the head. Was he a tall man with a scar on his chin? Yes, sir. That's right. We'll be right over. Walt, I think the guy that tried to push me around has kidnapped Helen. Oh, no. He pulled a gun on her and slugged Francis. We better get over there. Now, if Charles Walsh is loose... And he's trying to get me, then snatching Helen is a sure way to get me to come around. Hey, uh, where's that file on Bob Wells? Oh, wait a minute. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Haven't you got that file on Wells yet? Yes, sir. Just bringing it in. Well, step on it. Otis is bringing it in. Here you are, Lieutenant. Let me see it. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh, shut up, Otis. This is the guy, all right. He's the one who tried to pick me up. Uh, uh may I take one of these pictures, Walt? Sure, but what are you going to do? I'll see if I can find him. You go on over and talk to Francis. See if this is the same guy who took Helen. I'm going to go down to Skid Row and talk to a wise old owl who knows about things like this. I got out of the 5th precinct in a hurry and grabbed a cab for Skid Row. I knew an old deadbeat down there who had a line on every crook in the underworld. And there was just a chance he could tell me where Bob Wells was hiding out. His name was Wilbur Truitt, and he hung out in a shabby dive called the Parrot. Hello, Wilbur. What? Again? You at the piano strike up a chorus of my buddy, for the wandering boy has returned. Look, Wilbur. I, I would rise and bow from the waist as befits the occasion, but I fear that some sterno I accidentally came in contact with has rusted my spine, and I am forced to remain in a sitting position. I haven't got time to listen to the routine, Wilbur. I I'm looking for someone. Here. Take a look at this picture. Ever see this guy? Unless I have my morning constitutional buck, I can bring nothing into focus but a large bottle and a straw. Oh, oh waiter. Waiter, uh, give me a bottle. You have arrived in the nick of time. I get that wonderful warm glow when you ask for a whole bottle. A snap comparison would be that of a happy mother smiling blissfully at a nursing bay. Okay, Wilbur, now tell me, uh, 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 do you know this man? One sip of strength, and I shall have the eyes of a carrot-stuck feline. <laughs> now, now, yes, I can see the gentleman clearly. In fact, my vision has so greatly improved it begins to take on the functions of an X-ray. For instance, I can readily perceive that the man in question 
is addicted to false stimulants, and his low brow and squinty eyes tell me that he is indeed a person of some doubtful character. You're looking in the mirror. Yeah? No, here. Here's his picture. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Mr. Bobby Wells. The description is flexible. Know where I can find him? Up until yesterday, he was residing at an institution upstate. Sing Sing, I believe. It is very possible that he is hiding out in one of his old haunts on 23rd Street, but uh, I couldn't say for sure. Oh, why not? Uh, This bottle you purchased entitles you to one of my best guesses. To be absolutely accurate, I would need further inducement. It's the risk, bucko. Uh, bring me another jug, bartender. Ah, bless you. Try looking in a rooming house at 533 West 23rd Street. Now, if you don't mind, I shall forget the necessity for long conversations and begin to concentrate on the work ahead of me. Goodbye, Bucko, and stop in again. Say tomorrow morning if you wake up feeling charitable. I left Wilbur trying to figure the best way to parlay the two bottles and headed for the address he'd given me. It was a typical apartment house of the district. A four-story building with a high premium insurance policy. I asked the landlady if a Bob Wells lived there, and she told me a man answering his description had taken a room there that morning. She told me he'd gone out a few minutes before, and she'd let me into his room. I told her to keep a lookout and warn me if he showed. Then I started looking. I tore the place apart but I didn't come up with a thing. I spotted the phone and started to call Walt, and that's when I saw it. A pad lying by the base of the phone with a heavy imprint left from the writing on the top sheet. I pulled an old trick. I took a pencil and rubbed the lead lightly over the imprint, and up came one telephone number. I dialed it and waited. Feinberg's delicatessen. Oh, uh, is Bob Wells there? Oh, Bob Wells. Never heard of him. Thanks. Well, it's like that. One minute you think you got a lead hot enough to melt your change purse, and the next you find yourself looking like a tree surgeon in Death Valley. But in my business, it takes a conventional three to strike you out. So I found the address of the delicatessen, and 15 minutes later, I was standing between a smoked herring and a three-foot salami talking with Mr. Weinberg. What can I do for you, sir? Oh, uh, I talked with you, oh, say, 20 minutes ago about a Mr. Bob Wells. Bob Wells? Oh, yes. Never heard of him. Uh, take a look at this picture. Maybe you know the face and not the name. It's familiar. Yes, I think I've seen him somewhere. Think hard now. This is important. Are you a policeman? Detective. Oh. Uh, how about it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So long as you're a cop, sure I remember him. He came to my store last night. I remember because I had already closed and he kept pounding on the door. Finally, I let him in. He was very rude. He bought a lot of groceries, but... Very rude. Have you seen him again? Sure, he came in this morning about locks and bagels. Still rude. Hmm. Where's your phone? In the back. Has, uh... This Mr. Wells done something? He left Sing Sing without saying goodbye to the warden. Ha! Ha! Now, look, uh... I'm going in the back and use your phone. If Wells happens to come in while I'm back there, stall him and come back and tip me off. I'll do my best. But he better not be rude. Hey, Walt, I'm in a delicatessen over on 24th Street. Yeah, Rick. I traced Wells this far, found out he's been buying food here, probably for Walsh. You think Walsh is hiding somewhere in the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, that's my guess. They probably took separate places so they could move in a hurry if one hideout got hot. I'll be over there right away. Good. Comfortable, honey, but no yelling. Or I'll have to stuff up that pretty mouth. I don't understand this. Why did you kidnap me? I've been having a hard time getting in touch with your boyfriend, Diamond. I figure if his girl's in trouble, he'll come looking. I, I don't have a boyfriend. <laughs> sure, sure. Play it straight. But you watch. Tonight I call your butler and tell him we got you. If Diamond wants you alive, he comes to a spot I got picked up. And he comes along. I don't know any diamond. Ain't she cute, Bobby? Yeah, cute. Want me to fix her so she forgets how to lie? No, I don't care if she claims diamonds are uncle. (laughs) 
Go on down to Delicatessen and get some food. I'm getting hungry. Okay. They still think we ought to be getting out of town. In one hour, I call this dame's house. At 12 o'clock, I meet Diamond in the park. Then we get out. Why do you want to see uh, this Diamond? Oh, we're old friends, baby. He sent me up for life. And he shot my kid brother full of holes. I just want to see that Diamond gets everything that's coming to him. You talk too much. You've got some bad habits yourself. Now get that food. And if you're too lazy to walk downstairs, I'll show you a shortcut. Uh, Three floors, straight down. You can jump for it. Okay, okay. Good evening, gentlemen. What can Weinberg do for you? Hey, Lieutenant, that chopped liver sure looks good. Keep your fat hooks off of that, Otis. Walt. Oh, yeah, Rick? Back here. All right. The storekeeper's watching out for Wells. If he shows, he'll come back here in Tempest. I parked the squad car two blocks over. I didn't want Wells or Walsh to think something was up. Where's Otis? Otis! I'll be right with you, Lieutenant. I'm just buying something to nibble on. Hmm. His nibble would grind up a whole cow. If Wells comes in and spots a cop, he'll take off like a jackrabbit. Hold it, Walt. What's huh? the matter? That guy coming across the street. Looks like Wells. Oh. Otis, get away from that door. Huh? I can't hear you, Lieutenant. A man's coming in the store. Get away from the door. He is? You want me to hide? No, you idiot. Just play it smart like you didn't know him. But get away from the door so he'll come in. Oh, okay, Lieutenant. Leave it to me. Oh. Walt Duck. Good evening. What can the Weinberg do for you? Uh, I'll have a couple of sandwiches. Hey, try the salami. It's great. Huh? Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, make it salami. Call slot. Uh, pickle beer. Nice pickle. night. Listen, uh, idiot. Yeah, sure. Master. Uh, he's doing fine, uh, Walt. Relax. You live around here? Oh. Huh? No, uh, just seeing a sick friend. Yeah. Uh, maybe that salami ain't such a good idea if your friend's sick. You know, I had an uncle with ulcers. He couldn't touch the stuff. It's too much garlic. Ketchup? No. My friend's got a cold. Oh. Well, then I don't guess it'll hurt him, but... You know, the best thing for a cold is good mustard plastic. And now you, you, you take the There's plastic... Here's your sandwiches, sir. Uh, Sixty cents. Sixty. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Hope your friend gets better. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, come on. How did I do, Lieutenant? Well, one thing is sure. He thought you were too stupid to recognize him. Can you still see him, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, he crossed the street and he's starting to walk west. I'll tell him. He knows you. Good. When you spot the place, call me here. Think I should throw a net around the neighborhood? Not till we spot the hideout. Right. Hey, Diamond. They got your girl. How are you going to get her out? they would probably use her for a shield. That's a good point, Sergeant. Believe me, I've been thinking about it. Uh, here's the sandwiches. Swell. Hey. Hmm. You only got two. Oh, there was a cop in the delicatessen. A cop? Yeah, big stupid one. Listen, I, I told him I'm getting food for a sick friend, see? And he starts giving me all kinds you of remedies. You sure you weren't tailed? Tailed? No, who tailed me? The cop stayed in the delicatessen. Okay. Here, honey. Have a sandwich. I'm not hungry. Oh. Suit yourself. Here, Bobby. Oh, thanks. Hey, when are you going to put in that call of this dame's butler? Right after we eat. Then we go to the park and wait for Mr. Diamond. Yeah? I'm in a drugstore across from the building that Wells went in. It's about a block away. Nifty drug. Block west on your side of the street. I'll wait inside. We'll be right down. Come on, Otis. The lieutenant hasn't spotted. Okay. Thanks for the bagel, White Boy. That's all right, officer. Come back again when you can pay for it. Come on, Otis. Move your big feet. Okay, okay. Hey, you got any brilliant ideas how we're going to get Helen out of there in one piece? No, I got to admit I'm stuck. Why don't you get that bear trap mine of yours working and make yourself a hero? Uh, well, maybe we could start a fire in the building. It'd have to come out. Oh, swell, swell. There's nothing I'd like better than a well-done girlfriend. Well, I was trying. Yeah. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Otis, remind me to kiss you on both cheeks. Hey, what are you doing? That's a firebox. I'm turning in an alarm. There. 
Oh, we're going to start that fire? No, but Walsh and Wells won't know there isn't one. When the trucks come and the firemen bust in the place, they'll think it's burning down around their ears. Yeah, maybe then they won't watch Helen too close, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. Well, here's the nifty drugstore. Yeah. Rick, I've been worrying about something. Yeah, I know. How do we get Helen out? Yeah. Well, relax. Otis came up with a solution. Otis? Yeah, I turned in a fire alarm. And when the trucks get here, you can tell them what's up and they can go in the building and make like it was on fire. Well, won't Walsh know it's a phony if he can't smell smoke? The chief can tell him it's blazing in the basement. When they hit the street, we can get enough firemen to shield Helen and then take Walsh and Weld. I'll call a precinct and have the block surrounded. We'll need lights if they make a break for it. Uh, which apartment house are they in? That one, across the street. After I call the boys, we better go over and find out which room they're in. Quietly clear the rooms on both sides in case the shooting starts before we expect it. <laughs> I like to upset my stomach. How about that call? Yeah, right. Well, what's your phone number, baby? It's in the book. Oh. She gonna be troubled, Bobby? <laughs> he wants your number. Now, come on. We ain't got all night. All right. Evergreen 54308. Oh, that's better. You ought to be more careful, Bobby. Your lip's bleeding. Yeah. Hey, Walsh. What's that? Sirens. Maybe that's the cops. If somebody tailed you, you... I told you I wasn't tailed. Wait, I'll go see. That's fire trucks. They're coming down a block. I don't smell no smoke. Hey, they're pulling up in front of this building. The joint must be on fire. Let's get out of here. Uh, maybe it's the building next to us. No, oh, they're bringing the hoses right in front of the door of this joint. I'm getting out. Sit still. Maybe it ain't a big one. We can't go busting out in the street. Well, maybe it ain't a big one. But if it is, I don't want to end up like a pound of spare ribs. Ah! Why, you... Yeah. All right, now, come on. Hey, what's that? Yeah, what is it? Fire department, we're back here from the building. What are we going to do with the dame? Shove her in that closet. Just a minute, we'll be right with you. Hurry, Tom, there's a fire in the basement smearing a gas man. The whole place may go up any second. Did you hear that? Yeah, step on it. Okay. Hey, better step on it. Down these stairs. We can find our way. Hey, there's a couple of prowl cars. Yeah. Separate. We'll meet at the other place. Okay, Walsh. That's far enough. Ah. It's the shamus. Get him, Walsh. Don't reach for it, Walsh. I owe you something, Diamond. Ah. You all right, Rick? Yeah, Walsh. He's a worse shot than his brother. Where's Wells? He made a break for it, but he won't get through. All right, Wells. You can't get through. Drop your gun. You won't take me, copper! Well, that's that. What about Walsh? Ah, he's pretty dead. Come on, I want to find out what happened to Helen. Well, Walt and I went up to the room and found Helen in the closet. We took her downstairs and she cried a little on my shoulder. I like that. Makes me feel so protective. Walt cleaned things up and dropped Helen and me off at her place. An hour later, Helen got back to normal and we relaxed on the couch and forgot about Wells and Walsh. <sighs> How do you feel now, baby? Very. Want to get Francis to fix some dinner for you? Oh, no, I'm not very hungry. But you can have some if you want. Mm, no, no. Want to play some canasta or something? But you always said it was a bad 200 game. Yeah, it is. Well, I forgot my jack. <laughs> Silly. Want a neck? Ooh, what you said. Come here. No. Helen. No, I'm mad. Mad? What for? Because those two thugs ruined a wonderful evening. What's the matter? Want me to go? Oh, you idiot, of course not. But I had a big surprise planned. You did? Yes. Believe it or not, I had two wonderful seats for South Pacific, and now it's too late to go. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, well, I'm sorry, baby. I'd love to have seen it. Me, too. Well, I'm not exactly it's your pinza, but I'll try to make it up to you. Oh, Rick, that's a wonderful idea. All right. What'll it be? Uh, some enchanted evening. Oh, really? Me, 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 me. Hmm. A some enchanted evening. You may see a stranger. You may see a stranger across a crowded room. Rick, 
What's the matter? I was just trying to make like Pinza. But, honey, it's safer for you to make like Diamond. Oh. And somehow you know. You know even then. That somewhere you'll see her again and again. Oh, you're not Pinza, but it's wonderful. Thanks. Some enchanted evening. Someone may be laughing. You may hear her laughing across a crowded room. And night after night, as strange as it seems, the sound of her laughter will sing in your dreams. Rick. Who can explain it? Who can tell you why? Ricky. Fools give you answers. Wise men never try. Oh, oh, honey, what's the matter? I was just falling in love with myself. Come here. You never let me finish. Do you mind? Mm. Oh, well, no. And I'm sure Mr. Pinza doesn't either. <laughs> I've just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Paul Fries, and Larry Dobkin. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. As Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. This is Diamond. Hey, what about this heat? I can think of a lot of times I've been uncomfortable, but this runs itself right up to the top of my list. About the only thing good I can say about it, get your laundry dry in a hurry. I usually wash a few things out in my office because the soap's free. Come to think of it, I was scrubbing a pile of things the day we had that big wind. 97 degrees in New York and we get a tornado to cool us off. I had so much dust in my office, I could have supplied mud pies to the whole neighborhood. And after it was all over, the cigarette ad on Broadway was blowing smoke rings through the trap door of one of my scattered longies. The waves in Long Island Sound were so rough friend of mine capsized, and when he came up, he found three terrified herring hiding in his nose. Oh, it was swell. One minute, it was so hot you couldn't move, and the next, a 58-mile-an-hour wind was doing the moving for you. Then, to top it off, I got mixed up in one of the grisliest cases I'd ever worked on. It all started one evening. The car was moving down a lonely road, two people in it. In a couple of minutes, one of them would be pretty dead. What are you stopping for? <laughs> what are you doing? Let me go. Get your hands off me. No, help. Please, please. Ah! Hey, Ed. Huh? Stop the car a second. What for? 
Thought I saw something lying back there on the road. So what? Probably a dead dog. No, no, no. Hold it. Too big to be a dog. Oh, for Pete's sake. Back it up about 20 yards. <sighs> that, 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 that's good. Okay, where is it? Right over there. Yeah. Hey, come on. Hey. <gasps> oh, holy cow. Yeah. She dead? She's wrecked. <laughs> I think I'm going to be sick. Me too. Uh, uh, let's get to a phone call the cops. <laughs> Knit one, pearl one. Hmm. Knit one, pearl one. Ah, there, you little fiend. Now, what does it say about the heel? Mm-hmm. Turn the heel. Hmm. Oh, I dropped a stitch. Now I gotta go back and pick it up again. Yeah? Rick, what's the matter? Oh, Miss Asher? You and your bright ideas. What did I do? You did plenty. I'm a nervous wreck. What from? You remember you said I ought to take up something to keep me busy in the office? Yes. You remember you mentioned knitting? Oh, no. Oh, yes. I've dropped more stitches than the cross-eyed surgeon. You idiot. I was only fooling. Well, I wasn't. I did it up right. Book of directions, enough yarn to wrap up King Tut and all, all his handmaidens, <laughs> and two of the finest bone needles and gimbals. <laughs> now, don't laugh. I was making Francis a pair of screaming argyles. Well, keep with it, strong heart. You went out. Yeah. You darn right. Oh, what I said. Darn. Get it? Helen, are you still there? Yes, Rick. Wasn't funny? No, Rick. Okay, come on over. Let's neck. Yes, Rick. Shame on you. Yes, Rick. Is that all you can say? I love you. And I'll see you about eight. Oh. You don't sound very happy. Well, that's such a long way off. Give you time to make plans. Bye. Bye. Now, let's see. I got to take out one... Two, three, five rows. Yeah, what is it? Rick? Oh, oh, how are you, Walt? Very unhappy. Well, you should see me. I got to take out five whole rows just to pick up one lousy stitch. What? No, oh, forget it. What are you unhappy about? I'll tell you about it when you get down here. The fifth precinct's 20 blocks. Can't you give it to me over the pipe? I wouldn't ask you if it wasn't important. And I'd rather not say anything over the phone. Okay, okay. Stop making like Porsche face in life. I'll be down as soon as I finish this heel. Heel? Yes, if you must know, I've taken up knitting. Coming from you, I am unmoved. I don't care if you're building Sergeant Otis a fur line money belt. Get down here as fast as you can. All right, Walt. But you'll be sorry when it starts getting cold again, and I won't knit you a sweater to cover your little old blue stomach. Oh. Bye, Walt. <laughs> getting Walt's goat was a sport with me, and whether he'd admit it or not, he got a kick out of it, too. Sometimes I wouldn't stay on the rib as long as I usually do, but that was only because Walt always starts sounding just a little bit worried. Then I know it's time to lay off and get serious. Don't misunderstand me. I never lay off entirely, and I never get completely serious. Those are two habits that don't help find the solution any quicker. They just fit you with a mess of ulcers, and you still end up too worried and too serious. I closed my office and headed for Walt's precinct. When I walked in, I spotted Sergeant Otis leaning back in his chair with his number 12s resting on the desk. Hello, Otis. Well, how's the big private detective today? Just fine, Otis. And how is the flash of the 5th precinct? Yeah, don't you worry about me, Diamond. I'll get along. Better go on in and see the lieutenant. He wants to see you. <laughs> hey, what's it about, Diamond? You need someone to help you from the police force? You know, Sergeant, you've got a fine head on your shoulders. <laughs> well, I'm glad you noticed. The one under your arm isn't so bad either. Uh... Hello, Walt. Rick, why don't you leave that poor guy alone? After you leave, he comes running in here and cries all over my desk. Otis? Ah, he wouldn't shed a tear if he was standing in an onion warehouse watching his grandmother set fire to herself. Yeah, well, give him a rest for a while. I got a big problem I want to talk to you about. All right, Walt, what's on your mind? Well... I don't know quite how to give it to you. It isn't strictly kosher for the police force to go around asking for help. Now, wait a minute. I don't want any apology routine. If you want a favor, you came to the right boy, and you know that goes without saying. Yeah, I guess I do. But this is a pretty big favor, Rick. The, uh, the commissioner's on my back. So is everyone else that's got anything to do with this city's government. Sounds rough. 
What did they do? Find out you were hiding a chimpanzee in a cop's uniform and calling him Sergeant Otis? Oh, now be serious for a second, Rex. Sure, if you'll get to the point. All right. I guess you've been reading about these homicides you've been having for the past three weeks. Yeah, pretty messy. Well, the powers that be say, solve them or turn in my badge. Oh, well, now wait a minute. Don't they know that this is the toughest kind of a killing? The killer's obviously got a lot of screws loose, and a maniac doesn't need a motive to kill. Don't those swivel chair bigwigs know that a crime without motive is the toughest job in the world to crack? Sure, sure, they know all that, but the public and the press is yelling its head off, so the pressure is on. Well, what do you want me for? You've got one of the best departments in the state. When you were on the force, it was the best department in the state. Now you stop that. Then stop twisting my arm. What do you want? I want help. I've got to crack this case by next week or I'm out of my ear. You're the best detective we had on the force, and you're the best private gumshoe in the city. Oh, well, that's better. Now, what about these killings? Now, each time they find some dame looking like the last of a hamburger sale... It... Oh, excuse me a minute, but... Yeah? Lieutenant? No, Jack the Ripper. What do you want, Mallet Head? Uh, we just got a report from a guy out in the river road. Another one of them butcher killings. What? Yeah, some dame all hacked up and lying beside the road. Okay, get the car out. I'll meet you downstairs. Oh, did you hear that, Rick? Mm-hmm. Well, come on. You want me along? Of course. I can brief you about the whole setup on the way over. Oh, I don't know whether it's such a good idea to get mixed up in this. Why not? Well, it looks like whoever gets close to this killer doesn't have much of a future. Well, you can't live forever. Oh, aren't you the sweet one? No, that's not what's worrying me. Well, what is then? When I go out, I want a nice, comfortable place to lie down in. The way this nut goes to work with a knife, I might end up in a freezer. <laughs> All right, everybody's back. Go on through, Lieutenant. Show him your biceps, Otis. Ah, uh, comic. How did all these people get out here? This is ten miles from anything. Uh, someone must have heard me call the police. Uh, when I left the phone booth, the whole crowd followed me out here. Who are you? Uh, my name's Ed Cody. Me and my friend here found a body. Where is it? Right over here, Walt. Well, how does it look? The way you thought it would. Oh, Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Yeah, here's your bike card. <laughs> Now you see what I'm up against, Rick. Pardon me. This is the third killing like this in three weeks. Oh, I don't feel too good. Let's walk over this way. Yeah. Cody, you and your friend come along. We want to ask some questions. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, whoever the guy is that's pulling these murders is a complete lunatic. Are they all like that, Walt? You should have seen the last one. How'd, uh, how'd you guys happen to spot the body? Oh, well... I... I saw it first, and I told Ed here. Uh, yeah, uh, we were just driving along when Max spotted something lying beside the road. I backed her up, and we got out. I saw what it was. I left Mac here and went back to town to call you. What's your full name, Mac? McCarthy, John McCarthy. Okay. Now, what are you doing, Rick? Uh, looking at the road. Hey, uh, that your car up there, Cody? Uh, it's Max. I was just driving. You went ahead how far? Oh, I'd say about 20 yards. Then we backed up and left the car where you see it now. You won't find much even if the road is soft. Their car and any other car would have blocked out the killer's tracks. Uh, maybe he didn't use a car. Maybe he walked her out this way and then killed it. No, this place is 10 miles from anything. He drove, all right. And this crowd has ruined any footprints for sure. Oh, here come the boys. Come on, Rick. As soon as they start examining things, we can get back to the station. Yeah, I want to go through the whole file on the last two killings. You won't find much. Well, a change of reading never hurts anyone. I'm getting tired of reading those dime novels. Too bloody. Well, that's the whole mess. No leads at all, huh? Not a one. I'm getting nearsighted from looking at all the lineup. We've picked up everything from drunks to safe crackers. Not a lead. Same type of crime in every case. Hmm. This killer's got a crazy streak as wide as Broadway. Oh, wait until the commissioner hears about this one. Well, yeah? Give me a pencil. Now, tic-tac-toe is out. I got a headache. Stop waving your gills and give me a pencil. Here. What are you doing with that map? Drawing circles. Now, you stop that. That's a scale of this city, and I don't want it loused up by your doodling. Look at that. So you make a dandy circle. Thanks. What's it for? How should I know? You drew it. Drew what? The circle. Wasn't that a little foolish? Of course it was. That's what I'm yelling about. Well, that's bad for you. What is? Yelling. I know it. I thought you said you didn't know. Know what? About the circle I just drew. What circle? The one on the map. That's what I was yelling about. 
Why? You didn't draw it. I know I didn't. You did. What for? How should I know? You're a policeman. What in blazes has that got to do with it? You were a rookie, weren't you? Of course I was. You worked your way up to sergeant and then to head of the homicide, didn't you? You know very good and well I did. Wasn't it a little tough? You bet it was. I pounded the beat for four long years. Did it by the sweat of my... Br- now, wait a minute. How did we get into this? You asked me about this circle I drew. I did? Yes, Walt. But you didn't know what it was for. Oh, yeah. What is it for? It's for you. I get... Yeah, it's not bad. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. You low life, you conniving, dirty, underhanded louse. You always do this to me. I think you sit around nights and pull the wings off of flies. Moths. All right, moths. Sit around and dream up little monstrosities to pull on the police force and use me as a... a, a, a guinea pig. A, right. Guinea pig. You call me, Lieutenant? No. Get out of here, you idiot. Y- yeah, Lieutenant. Diamond, for once I'm going to find out what's at the end of this merry-go-round. I want to know about that circle. And I'm going to get it out of you if I have to shove that map down your throat. Huh? This happens to be the commissioner, Lieutenant. Oh, not you, Commissioner. Are you on the Yes, Commissioner. I'm the commissioner of this Yes, Commissioner. Well, I just went out and looked at the body. Yes, but, 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 your motor's running. You shut up. Oh, no, Commissioner, somebody else. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, who was it? I am not talking to you. Don't you want to know about the circle? No. Fine. When I was looking over the reports on the killings, I noticed something. You don't say. Say what? Mm-hmm. Okay, if you don't want to play, be a sorehead all your life. Well, I noticed that all of the killings, including the one we looked at this afternoon, were within at least ten miles of each other. And the first one, this one, this one right here, was exactly in the other direction from the last one. Bully for you. No, it's nothing. Well, using the first and last homicide for the edge of the circle, we find that the other killing also fall within the sphere. Okay, so what? Mm-hmm. Getting interested? No, I'm not. Well, the girl this afternoon had been dead for about 14 hours, wouldn't you say? Yeah, but the coroner can come closer. Well, about anyway. Now, in the other two cases, it says that both girls met their deaths about 3 in the morning. Now, if the last one was dead 14 hours, she comes close to that time, too. Okay, okay, what does that prove? Not a thing, but it's something to go on. This is a wild one, Walt. But... Let's say that our killer started off with his victim somewhere within that circle. To drive five miles, half the distance of the circle, it would take him, oh, about... uh, Fifteen minutes. Okay, fifteen minutes. Now, that means he left his starting point around 2.45. Now, that's a funny hour to be so consistent. You're right. Bars close at two. Forty-five minutes to talk a dame into a ride. Hmm? Might be. I'll be done. I may be all wet. The killer probably started from somewhere outside the circle, but we can start by eliminating the idea of the night spots anyway. Yeah, Lieutenant? Check on all the night spots from... Uh, 45th Street and Broadway, the center of the circle. From 45th Street and Broadway for 10 miles in every direction. Yeah, Lieutenant. That means cafes, bars, bowling alleys, anything that stays open till 2 or after, and step on it. I hope we're right. So do I. I don't like walking on eggs. Then sit down. Who knows? You might hatch something. Walt found out the name of the last victim, and the family supplied us with a picture. Her name was Martha Kirk, and her family knew nothing of her whereabouts the night of the murder. You can't really appreciate a police department until you really see them in action. Inside of two hours, Walt had every dive, bar, and night spot in the ten-mile circle tagged. They spread out, one man to every five blocks, each with a picture of the three murdered girls. Because it had been my idea, Walt wanted me to swim with it and maybe sink. I took a little section from 48th Street to 46th Street, and by late afternoon, I'd covered most of the likely prospects. You guessed it. The bottom of the barrel was coming up fast, and it was emptier than a ballpark during a thunderstorm. No one had ever seen the three victims. The last spot on the list was a bowling alley. I walked in and spotted the cocktail lounge. When I climbed up on one of the stools, a bartender with a head that should have been out on the alleys walked up to me. Yeah, what'll it be? Uh, how about a glass of milk? Glass of milk? Do you can stand it? Well, if you're worried, water it a little. I don't want to pass out on you. Uh, get him, he made it funny. So did your family. You're looking for trouble? Only if I get pushed. I'm looking for information. Place door on the left. Yeah. Ever seen any of these girls before? What are you, cop? Let's say I'm nosy and that I've got a badge to keep me in the spirit of the thing. 
Oh, why'd you say so? Uh, uh, let me see him. All right. Here's the first one. Uh, no, no, no. I ain't never seen her. How about this one? Uh-uh. And this one? Nope. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Eh, sure, I know this one. Comes in here about twice a week. Was in last night. Gets lushed up, cries about how tough a family is on her. Name's uh, uh, Kirk. Yeah. Uh, Martha. Uh, Martha Kirk. Nice looker. She was. Huh? Uh, did she ever come in with a man? No, but uh, sometimes she leaves with one. Same guy every time? No. Do you remember her leaving with a man last night? Uh, yeah, yeah. Come to think of it, she did. What time? No, oh, about 2.15. Uh, we stop serving the two right on the dot. That we do. That you do, yeah. Okay. Think you'd know the guy if you saw him again? Oh, sure. He comes in a couple times a week, too. Uh, I seen him pick up a couple of strays. <laughs> I guess you call him a wolf. Yeah, with a hatchet. Huh? No, forget it. Where's your phone? Uh, right over there. Hey, here, use a slug. It's on the house, officer. Thanks. Hope nothing's happened to Martha. She was a rotten drunk. What a wonderful kid. She was, huh? Give precinct Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me speak to the lieutenant, and if you crack just once, I'll come over there and shove your head so far down you'll have to untie your shoelaces to cough. Oh. Okay, okay, Diamond. You don't have to get nasty. Lieutenant Levinson. You can forget about retiring, Walt. You got something? Yeah, looks like. What did your boys turn up? Nothing yet. What is it, Rick? Don't play games now. Get over to 47th and 9th. The bowling alley in the middle of the block. I'm in the bar. Want me to bring the boys? No, no. This is one we've got to play quietly. I don't want to scare our ghoul off. I'll be right down. Hey, what about that milk? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Coming up. Uh... Hey, uh, is there going to be a pinch? Uh, there is, Buster. There certainly is. Walt romped in about a half hour later, and he talked to the bartender. He finally looked satisfied. He had to because it was the only lead that had turned up. We told the bartender to tip us if the guy showed again, and we sat on to wait. Maybe my rabbit's foot started thinking it was back with the quartet because around 1 a.m. it started kicking. The bartender gave us a nod just as a big guy wandered in and sat down at the bar. He weighed in at about 2.20 and his clothes were sloppy. He ordered a drink and started eyeing a cute little number sitting at the other end of the bar. Let's take him. Hold it off. He's making a pitch. What? The dame at the end of the bar. So he's making a pitch. What do you want to do? Wait around till he takes her out of here? Maybe you'd like to help him sharpen his axe. Look, you haul him in now, you'll have to beat it out of him. You want him to pick the dame up? Was that against the law? Arrest me. Now, you stop clowning. You'd rather catch him with the goods, wouldn't you? Yeah, but... Now, don't start that again. You butted the commissioner to death. Just relax, and maybe you can pick up a few pointers. Our big boy moved all right. Right up to the seat next to the cute little girl. She was under full sail. Didn't seem to mind it at all. He landed at 1.15. At 1.30, he'd established a firm beachhead, and by 2 o'clock, there was a flag raising. Okay, he scored. Now, joint's closing. Uh, they're leaving. I'm going to tail him. How? He's probably got a car. And if he gets away with that girl, he may kill her. Look, Walt, I promise you, he won't get into that car unless I go, too. Now, come on. We'll both stick close to him until I can think of something. We followed the man and the girl outside and walked a few yards behind, making like we had a little load on they headed for a big parking lot, and that's when I got the idea. The parking attendant was just walking up to him when I stumbled forward. Hey, boy. Rick, what are you doing? Stay with me, Walt. Yeah? Uh, son, I, I want a car. Hey, just a minute. I was here first. Sure, honey. Don't let him get away with uh, it. Look, old man, my, my friend here is late getting home. He's got a wife that's ten feet tall. You mind if I get my car first? <laughs> ah, go ahead. Some nerve. Relax, honey. They're going to take a little drive, huh? Yeah. Okay, let's see your ticket. Well, I'll go here someplace. Well, come on, we'll walk up. I know where the car is. Okay, but you got to have a ticket. Rick, what's going on? Keep walking. Hey, I thought you was loaded. Keep going. We're the police. Huh? That's right. Oh, what's wrong? Which one is that guy's car? You mean the guy back there with the dame? Yeah. Uh, he gave me his ticket. Oh, right over there, the coupe. Rick, come on. I'm going to climb in that trunk, and you're going to put in a general alarm, Walt. Then you're going to get in your car and tail us. But stay fine up behind so that he doesn't spot something. Okay, but I think you're crazy. 
Is the trunk open? Yeah. Now get going. Well, they'll see me coming back. Tell them you forgot something in the bowling alley and that I passed out my car. All right. Oh, and son. Yeah. Don't let on that anything had happened. We think that man is a killer. Oh. I squeezed into the trunk and waited. About two minutes later, the lovebird showed up and got in the front seat. We rode like that for about 15 minutes, and it wasn't bad until we hit the dirt road. Then my inside started bouncing around like a pound of rice in a wind tunnel. We drove for about 10 minutes more and came to a stop. I raised the trunk just enough, just enough to get some fresh air and listen. I didn't want to climb out because they'd feel the movement up in front. I was sure they could hear my breathing. <laughs> what are we stopping for? Well, I, uh... Uh-uh. <laughs> I, uh, just wanted to look at the pretty scenery. Now, how can you? Too dark. Uh-huh. <laughs> I can see you, baby. You're nice. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I do. They went on like that for another half hour, and I started thinking I'd picked the wrong guy. Then the conversation changed. <laughs> What's the matter? That's so funny. Don't you know? No, and I don't like the way you're acting. Women. That's what's funny. They're all the same. Huh? Just like my wife. She was like all the other women. Hey, let's get out of here. You're talking funny. Funny? Yeah. See a man and you like him. Any man. You're all alike. Now you stop that. I just came along Come because... here. No, you let me go. You ain't no different. Come here. No, stop that. Let me get off the car. Sure. Go ahead, go ahead. I don't want no blood stains on the seat any. <laughs> right down the middle. I rolled out and didn't forget to take my 38 along. I spotted him in the moonlight, moving after like a big animal. He was laughing. I could see something in his hand. It was a knife. She tripped and fell, and he moved in. He gave me goosebumps bigger than grapefruit. When he was nearly on top of her, I closed in. Okay, hold it! Drop the knife! I'll kill him! I'll kill him! You all right, honey? No, no, no. Just take it easy. Take it easy. It's all over. I'm so glad you got here. Come on, now. Let's, let's get back to the car. Easy. You sure you're all right, dear? You know something? No, what? I think that man was crazy. <laughs> Well, Walt finally got there and we sent the girl home. The wagon came and cleaned up things. I found out later that Walt was blessed by the commissioner and I got an assist. I needed calming down, so I stopped off at 975 Park Avenue, the home of the best remedy for bruised nerves I knew of. Oh, good evening, sir. Good evening, Francis. Is Miss Asher in? Yes, sir. She's in the study, knitting. Knitting? Knitting. Thank you, Francis. One, curl, two. Knit, one, curl, two. That's like taking stupid pills. Rick. Hello, baby. Oh, look what I've gotten into. I'm a nervous wreck. Oh, that'll teach you. What are you building? Well, it was going to be a surprise for you. Oh, a whole suit. <laughs> well, Ricky. Yes? I need relaxing. You need relaxing? Oh, swell. Ricky, come here. I know just the thing. No, come over here. There's an old spinning wheel in the parlor. 
spinning dreams of a long, long ago. Ricky! What's the matter, dear? Uh, what about this? Cruising down the river on a Sunday afternoon. Ricky. With one you love, the sun above, waiting for the moon. Ricky. The old accordion playing. Ricky. A sentimental tune. Rick! Oh, honey, what's the matter? You can sing later. Oh. Please. What is it, really, baby? Come here. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know something? What? I may never sing again. Okay. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Bill Conrad, Lorene Tuttle, Jack Crucian, and Sidney Miller. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Dick Powell will next be seen in the motion picture Mrs. Mike, based on the best-selling novel Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. About the most strenuous effort I might give out during a working year is maybe chasing some thug up the escalator at Bloomingdale's department store. But last week, I really outdid myself. The all-stars of the police force challenged the private detectives to a baseball game for the benefit of the vice squad. And I wound up stiffer than a pair of starched overalls. Because the private detectives are quick to take advantage of the slightest opportunity, by the eighth inning, we realized the need for some immediate strategy. The score at that point was six to four, the cops leading. So I got a hold of a little blonde I knew and had her walk across the infield in a sweater. The idea was to disturb the opposing team and take their minds off the game. It would have worked, but it seemed that since I had last seen my little blonde friend, she'd become quite a favorite with the police force, so they just waved hello and went about their business. My drooling colleagues, however, had not come in contact with said hunk of fluff, and before the game was over, three of them had picked up the bat boy and tried to bunt with him. You may have read where the police force finally beat us, Close game, 37 to 4. But I want to say right here and now, they never could have done it without that sweater. And oh, yeah, I got mixed up on a little honest murder the next day. It all started in the back booth of a middle-class nightclub. A couple of people were busy trying to think up the fastest way to make a homicide billiard. Oh, uh, that's the three-cushion variety. Killing to frame up to the electric chair. Leon, are you sure this will work? You want to get rid of that old man of yours, don't you? You know I do. Well, I got a wife that I want to dump, too. This letter from her is going to fix it, so we both end up very unmarried. Are you sure they'll blame it on Martin? Sure, I'm sure. When they find him with this letter and his own gun and the dead body of my dear little wife, they'll slap him in the chair so fast he won't know what happened. Who's going to find him with the body? That's your job, baby. I'll get the letter to your husband and you swipe his gun and get it to me. And you go get yourself a private detective and tell the shamus that you suspect your husband of running around with another girl. You and the shamus tail your husband. I'll have a time so you catch him with the goods right after the killing. Well, all right. I hope it works. 
It will if you want it to, baby. I want it to. Because I want you. Yeah. Yeah, and all that nice money your husband's going to leave you. Leon. Come in, June. Yeah. Come in. Mr. Diamond? That's right. I want to hire a private detective. Well, good for you. Sit down. Thank you. What is your fee? Hmm? What's the matter? Oh, stand up and sit down again. They're 52 gauge, Mr. Diamond. Like them? Oh, you'd look good if they were sweat socks. I don't think they'd go with a high heel. Ah, uh, you've got a point. Now, uh, <clears throat> what were you saying? I wanted to know what your fee is. Oh, a hundred a day in expenses. Uh, isn't that a little high? I stopped eating at the automat six years ago. All right, I'll give you a retainer. Oh, uh, wait a minute now, wait a minute. What's the job? I think my husband is running around with another woman. Uh, what do you want me to do, hustle him off to the nut house? Oh, aren't you nice? I want you to go with me as a witness. You know, uh, any other time I might get shy, but I'm really interested in seeing a girl who could beat your time. Hmm. When do I start? Meet me in front of my house at 10 minutes to 8. My husband leaves around 8. What's the address? 521 East 58th Street. My name is Hires, Mr. Diamond. Uh, June Hires. All right, June. I'll see you at 10 to 8. Now, uh, excuse me, but about that retainer. Oh, yes, that. Um, here's $100. Is that enough? Uh, it'll keep me interested. What's your husband's name? Martin. I'll see you this evening, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, one more question. Yes, why haven't you and your husband been getting along? Uh -huh. A lot of reasons. By the way, Mr. Diamond, how old are you? Hmm? No, oh, oh, well, I'm frisky, but I passed the foolish mark when I was three and a half. Mm -hmm. Did you? Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. I wonder if I did. Diamond Detective Agency, with men who know the corpses best, it's Diamond, two to one. Rick. Oh, oh, Helen. Hello, baby. What are you doing? Uh, what gauge nylons do you wear, dear? Fifty-two. Why? No, nothing. Oh, Rick, are you going to buy me a present? Oh, you never can tell. I was just looking at a pair a few minutes ago. Rick. Yeah? Where were you looking at them? Now, uh, what kind of a question is that? A very good question. Have you got a girl up in that office? Helen. Don't you, Helen, me, have you? Well, I give you my word I haven't. All right. Was there a girl in your office? The, the... Was there? Well, a client... I got a hundred dollar retainer. I don't I... care if she gave you the George Washington Bridge. You were obviously looking at her leg. Well, I couldn't help it. She sat on that way. Now, look, honey, she's just another client. Mm-hmm, with 52-gauge nylons. But you do count the threads. Oh, can you do that? Oh, you wolf. Yeah, but you're the only one who gets the benefit of my talents. You can put the soft soap away. How am I going to see you? Well, I got some business at eight. I'll, I'll be over later. Well, I'm going to stay mad until you get here. And you're going to tell me all about those nylons. I'll be sure and do some research. Bye. Well, there you are. You sit around and wait for a meal ticket to come in, and just because it happens to be fitted with curves, your best girl digs up the green-eyed monster. I don't know why gals get sore at a guy just because they catch him panting a little. <laughs> After all, it's hot in New York. I spent the rest of the afternoon trying to hit a big horse fly with a rubber band and some paper clips, and by six o'clock we shook hands and called it a draw. I closed the office and went home. I got into some clean clothes and grabbed a bite to eat at the corner drugstore. At ten minutes to eight, I was sitting in June Hire's car, parked across the street from her front door. Mr. Diamond, how did you ever get to be a private detective? Uh, Mrs. Hire, how did you ever get to be a housewife? You think things up in a hurry, don't you? Only when I got competition. You like competition? Uh, yeah, up to a point. After that, I get tired of the struggle. <laughs> I feel like I was back in college, sitting in a parked car with a good-looking man. Your education must have been pretty tame. I haven't moved once. Well, I really started to study after I graduated. Oh, I bet you got straight A's. Must you top everything? I play around with a lot of trouble, Mrs. High, and I've got to stay one step ahead of it. Do I look like trouble? When's your husband coming out of that house? Any minute now. You didn't answer my question. I'll tell you as soon as I see your husband. 
Well, how will that tell you? Well, if he's wearing a beanie with a propeller on it, I'll know you've been giving him a lot of trouble. So I've been giving him trouble. Does that mean I'll do the same for somebody else? Uh, what's the difference, a husband or a private detective? They both got their names from a guy named Adam. Oh, look. A cab pulled up to the front door. Yeah, I see it. And here comes Martin. Hmm. He's getting into the cab. Well, what do you know? What's the matter? No beanie. We both sat and watched while Martin Hire got into the cab and it pulled away. Mrs. Hire put a car in gear and we started the tale, giving it a safe distance. He led us across town to a middle-class apartment house and we stopped the car and waited up the street. He's getting out and going into that building. Come on. Oh, what for? Shouldn't we let him get up there first and, and then... Look, look, baby. Do you know who, who this gal is? No, no, of course not. Well, then come on. I want to see what door he goes in. But, well, won't he see us? Honey, I don't tell you how to put your lipstick on. I don't tell me how to make like a bloodhound. Well, the, the lobby is empty. Well, watch the elevator. Oh. It's stopping on the fourth floor. Hadn't we better go up? Look, uh, look, lover. The fourth floor probably comes equipped with a lot of doors. Now, if you want to just knock on any of them, go hire yourself Humphrey Bogart. Well, then what do we do? You stand by and watch like you... Uh, make like you knew what I was doing. See, the little old elevator's coming back down. Now, you just hold it there while I look at the mailboxes. Oh, Mrs. B. Callahan. Mrs. Lillian McEdward. Mrs. Mike. Well... And Miss Sally Maxwell. Okay, now we push the button for the fourth floor and away we go. Fun? Um, h- how do you know where to go? I got the name off the mailbox. But you said yourself there must be a lot of people on the fourth floor. Elementary, my dear girl. Process of elimination. We're lucky this time. Only one single girl on the fourth floor. Sally Maxwell. Come on. It's 406. What if there'd been more than one single girl? So I make some new friends. Now stop asking questions and stick close. Mm, I'd love it. Now, here it is, 406. Now hold it down. Can you hear anything? No. Yeah, somebody's moving around. Oh? Uh Oh, Doc. What? Too late. What the... June. Uh, good evening. I represent the Great Nothing Life Insurance Company. What are you doing here, June? I might ask you the same thing. Do you mind if we come in? I'd like to interest you in our indemnity clause. Stop pushing. Get out of my way. Oh, you don't know what you're missing. You get $3 million if a python bites you in the middle of Times Square. You can't force your way in here like that. You... Oh, now you've hurt my feelings. Then take your hands off me or I'll strike you again. Sure, but you need two more to put you out. Here, have one on me. <laughs> Now, the next time you go striking people... Mr. Diamond, look. I looked past the little guy and spotted the body. She was blonde, and I didn't know why she was hanging on to the rug that way. She wasn't going anywhere. All right, you. Get out of my way. Huh? Oh, what a lovely gun. Martin, you killed that girl. No, I did not. I came in here and found her like that, but I didn't kill her. She had been shot. I know that. I found the gun by her body. You don't think I'd kill her? I was in love with her. Martin. Is that the gun that did it? Yes. I mean, no. I, oh, I don't know what I mean. But you stand right there. Don't take another step. That's your gun, Martin. You shut up. I didn't kill Sally. But I know I haven't got a chance of proving it, so if you come any closer, I will most certainly shoot you. I hate to look like an idiot, but it's against the law to shoot people. Mr. Diamond, be careful. Come on, Martin. Give me the gun. You don't think I'll shoot, do you? Come on, give it to me. Just one more step. Look out, he's going to shoot. Come on, open but... up in there. What? Better drop it, Martin. You've got company. Stay back. Stay back. This is the police. Open up or we'll break the door the in. Police. Well, give me the gun, Martin. No, no. Let, yeah. let him in, June. They've all left and tear down the whole wall. I've got Martin. Yes, all right. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. What's going on in here? Uh, hello, Walt. Hey, Lieutenant, look. It's the gum show. Rick, why do you guys always have to break down doors? Why don't you try turning the knob first? Otis, didn't you see if it was unlocked? Uh, I forgot, Lieutenant. You mallet head. We got a report that someone heard a shot from this apartment. There's the body, Walt. Who's this guy? Uh, Martin Heyer. Here's his gun. He was going to use it on me. I didn't kill her. I came in and found her that way. Oh, no, shut up. Who's the girl with you, Diamond? Uh, this is Mrs. Heyer. Martin is her husband. I don't say. The old triangle, huh, Rick? I engaged Mr. Diamond to follow my husband. That's right, Walt. We caught Martin trying to sneak out on the corpse. I told you I didn't kill her. And I told you to shut up. 
Is this your gun? Uh, yes, but I found it lying by the body. I knew I'd be blamed if someone found my gun, so I put it in my pocket. Yes, sir, Tim Rick. Haven't had time. Shake him down, Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. I want my lawyer, and you get away from me. You open your trap just once more. Okay, butthole. Please, still. Mr. Diamond, I'd like to get out of here. Sure. Okay, Walt? Yeah, but I want to talk to both of you down at the station later. Uh, here's something, Lieutenant. What is it? Oh. Letter. Are you coming, Mr. Diamond? Uh, you go on down. I'll be right with you. Uh, all right. Walt, what does the letter say? It says you can't continue this way. I've decided to break it off once and for all. It will do no good to see me, so please stay away and leave me alone. Sign Sally. Let me see that. Yeah. Well, what about it, you? Is the dead girl named Sally? Yes. I don't know why she sent it. We were both in love. Sure, sure. What were you going to do about your wife? I was going to tell her this evening. Then I received this note. I came right over to see Sally, but believe me, I didn't kill her. Tell me something, Martin. Is this the way you received the letter? Yes. Why? Now, you wait a minute, Rick. I'm very happy with what I've got, so don't start making like Sherlock Holmes. Oh, well, I, I guess you're right, Walt. He admits it's his gun, and this letter is certainly motive enough. Yeah. Otis, call for the wagon and put the cuffs on hire. Right, Lieutenant. Walt... Why would someone send a letter after tearing off the top of it? Huh? See, the top of this letter is missing. The part that usually reads Dear Julius or something. So what? Do me a favor, will you, Walt? Oh, what is it? Give me three minutes and then have Otis fire a shot from this apartment. What? Is that all you can say? Have Otis fire a shot in about three minutes after I leave. I will not. The police department can't go around making like it was the 4th of July. You want to solve a murder, don't you? I have solved it. What more do I need? I got a suspect, the murder weapon, and a good motive. Uh... Walt, if you'd just killed someone and a guy caught you at it, what would you do? Well, I'd knock him off, too. Well, I caught Hire in the act and he didn't pull the trigger. Well, you said yourself he was going to. But he didn't and he took too much time thinking about it. Walt, I can't remember hearing a shot when I came in this building. So you didn't hear a shot. Maybe you couldn't. Well, that's what I want to find out. I was right behind Martin all the way up to this apartment and I didn't hear a shot. Maybe he didn't kill her. That's right, I didn't. Please, I didn't kill her. You see, Walt? Oh, you always start something like this. Martin, did your girlfriend Sally have any enemies? No. At least she never told me about any. Now, where are you, brain trust? Just a little more sure of myself. First, Martin can't make up his mind about shooting me. Then he claims that the murdered girl didn't have any enemies. Does that sound like a killer trying to cover up? You've run into smart killers before. I'm surprised that you, Rick. I called the station, Lieutenant. I'm proud of you. Uh, Go on in the other room and shoot that cannon of yours off when I tell you. The what, Lieutenant? You heard me. Shoot it into a mattress, but don't muffle a shot. Uh, okay. But not till I tell you. You might think it's fun and blow up the whole building. Thanks, Walt. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, uh, just looking around this desk to see if I can find the top piece of this letter. Oh, uh, Martin, are you sure that your girlfriend didn't know anyone who might want to kill her? She never said she was in danger. But you might ask her husband. Her husband? Oh, swell. Why didn't you say something about her husband before this? You didn't ask. Oh. Who is her husband? His name's Leon Fisk. The gambler? Yes. Oh. Bye, Walt. Now, you wait a minute. Have orders start making like a Roman candle three minutes after I leave. What's that you've got in your hand? Huh? Well, it's a piece of stationery from the desk that matches the stationery this letter was written on. You can't take that letter. It's evidence. What is? That letter the murdered girl wrote to this guy. Well, how do you know she wrote it? Because this guy said so. Yes, but I'm not sure... It could be forged. See, Walt, maybe she didn't write it. Well, that's why I want it. The lab will be able to tell from other samples of her handwriting. Tell what, Walt? Who wrote that letter? Well, don't you know? Of course I don't know, but we found it on this guy and it's police evidence. Why? Why? Well, because it just is, that's all. Well, anybody could have written it. You could have written it, Martin. Yes, I guess I could. And send it to yourself? Why would I send it to myself, Lieutenant? You wouldn't. That's why it's important. You mean the letter itself or the fact that he couldn't have sent it to himself? Both reasons. Well, if he couldn't have sent it to himself, that eliminates him as a suspect. It does? He didn't do it. Did you, Martin? No. See, Walt? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why do I always get into something like this? You asked me if I sent the letter to myself. You shut up. And you said he couldn't have. That's right, he couldn't. Then someone else did. Of course they did. Okay, then as long as you're not so sure it's important, I'm going to take it with me. Who says it's not important? Well, if he didn't send it to himself, then someone else did. And if someone else did, the murdered girl couldn't have, so anyone could have sent it. Isn't that right? Say that again. He said if I didn't send the letter to myself, then I couldn't have gotten it. In no, consequence... no, no. He said you couldn't have sent the letter to... No, no, wait a minute. 
You couldn't have written it to... To, to myself. Yeah. So someone else wrote it and sent it to the murdered girl and... No, 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 no. Send it to me. You're crazy. I distinctly heard him say... Walt. Yeah? After you figure it out, be sure and have Otis fire that shot. I'm going to see Leon Fisk. Okay, okay. Now, let's start it again. If I didn't... If somebody didn't... If, if you didn't... If I didn't what? Lieutenant? Oh. <laughs> What is the matter, Lieutenant? He did it again. And you helped him. You rat, I'll see that you get the chair even if you didn't kill her. What did I do? You shut up. Well, what took you so long? I had to get a merry-go-round started. Oh, um, can I drop you somewhere? Just relax for a second. I've got to think something out. Well, I didn't ever think Martin could kill anyone. Yeah. What was that? Just, uh, just a backfire. Look, uh, drive me across town. I want to talk to a guy named Leon Fisk. Uh, Leon Fisk? Yeah, runs a nightclub with an iron claw in the back room. Uh, what's the address? Uh, 222 East 45th. I remember it because when I was on the force, I used to raid his place for exercise. Uh... Thinking of doing some gambling? That's the way it'll probably end up. Let's go. She drove me across town, and ten minutes later, we pulled up in front of a low building with a flight of steps leading down to a basement door. A large sign over the door read, Cellar Club. I got out and thanked June for the lift and watched her drive off. I went down the steps and through the door. Something I can do for you? Yeah, I'd like to see Leon Fisk. Maybe you don't want to see you. What's the name? Just tell him Diamond. Okay. Uh, you got a phone booth? Yeah, right over there. Thanks. I found the phone booth and went in. In my business, you work with hunches, and sometimes they pay off. I knew that the torn letter had to be sent to someone the dead girl was going to slough. I didn't think it was higher, so the next best prospect was her husband, Leon Fisk. I didn't have a thing to pin on him, but a good bluff can open a lot of doors. I took out the letter and copied the handwriting on the other piece of stationery. I wrote the name Leon at the top, and then the words, We Can't Continue, so they'd correspond with the first part of the original. Yeah? What was your writing? What's it to you? You don't have to get sore. I just thought maybe you was getting a tip on the horses, and I sure could use a winner. The nags had been beating me to death. Oh, no tip. Okay, the boss will see you. That door right over there. Thanks. Well, Diamond, it's been a long time. I haven't missed you, Leon. What brings you here? Your wife was killed tonight. Sally? One's usually the lemon. Uh, that's too bad. How did it happen? I thought maybe you could tell me. I don't know anything about it. Hmm, ever see this letter before? Hey. Uh, what's the matter? That's your wife's handwriting, isn't it? Yeah. It says, uh, Leon, we can't continue. Then the writing stopped. Well, so what? Well, the guy the police are holding got a letter from Sally, too. It started the same way, but it wasn't addressed to anyone. The top was torn off. You know what I think? No, tell me. I think she started one letter to you, then threw it away and wrote another one. I think you sent the second to Martin Haar after tearing off the name Leon. Now, go on, Diamond. You didn't count on her starting a second one, so you went up to her apartment and killed her with Martin's own gun. Oh, with his own gun. Uh, maybe you can tell me how I got it. Oh, no, I think so. You had to know a lot of things before you could kill your wife. What time Martin would arrive, so the time of death would be close. You had to have his gun to leave by the body, and you had to have a witness who would swear Martin killed her. It had to be time, just right. You're talking yourself into a corner. How would I get all these things? By working with someone who was close enough to Martin... Maybe like his wife? You're crazy. Am I? She just drove me to this place. So what? A lot of people know this place. She told me she didn't. So I gave her an address eight doors down, but she pulled up right in your front of your door. Well, that could happen. It was too pat, Leon. Getting me to come to her place at ten minutes to eight and knowing her husband would leave close to eight. She had to know it because that letter was delivered just before I got there. Think you can prove it? You made one mistake. I didn't hear a shot when I got to your wife's apartment. I found out later that you could hear one all the way down in the street. Your wife was killed before Martin went into that building. Probably when you saw his cab pull up. Well, anyway, it's enough to hold you on, and I think we can prove later on that you've been seeing June Hires. You're a pretty smart shamus, Diamond. 
Oh, you mean you admit it? Okay, baby, come on in. Joan, come on out of there. Leon, are you crazy? Well, well, well. I didn't know you kept your back room stocked with nylons, Leon. Yeah, yeah. I guess you two don't need any introduction. Why did you have to drag me into this? You heard what Diamond said. He knows all about it. You got the car out back? Yes. But what are we going to do with him? Diamond? Well, he's going swimming with a barrel of cement. Lieutenant Levinson wouldn't like that. He knows I came here. You're lying. Wait a minute. Maybe he isn't. Diamond was upstairs with him for quite a while. Okay, so we'll have to hurry things up. Leon, you you can't shoot him. Yeah. You should know it's not quite the point. I'm not going to knock him off here in the office. We'll take him in the car and do it later. No, Leon. What do you mean, no? It was your idea to kill your wife. I just helped get the gun. I'm not going to be along if you kill Diamond. You're going to be right with me, baby, because you're in this up to your pretty neck, and I need that car. I'm not going to do it. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, you and Diamond go swimming together. Leon! Give me that gun. You... Let, me... Let me go. Come here. on, drop it. You go to the devil. Joan, Joan, come back here. I'm getting off. You got me into this mess. Come back here, you... you dirty little tramp. Don't you take that car. You're not going anywhere, Leon. You want to bet? I'll... You diamond! He hit me with the butt of his gun, and I went down like the price of wheat in July. As I picked myself up, I watched him run for the back door. June! June, wait for me! You're not gonna leave me here to take a rock! I got my gun out and stumbled over to the window and looked out just as the car started up. I spotted Leon with a gun in his hand. He looked mean enough to start shooting with it. He did. I started running up the alley then. I suppose I could have said something like stop or I'll shoot, but I was too tired. I just rested my arm on the window and let him have it. Ah! Well, Walt finally showed and cleaned things up. I was bleeding again, so I headed for 975 Park Avenue and my usual first aid station. Yes? Hello, Francis. Miss Asherin? Oh, my goodness, Mr. Diamond. Come in, sir. Come in. You've been hurt again. I guess you'll have to answer the door a little quicker after this, Francis, or build a first aid station in the hall. The usual, sir? No, you can forget the plasma, Francis. I had liver for dinner. I can stand the loss. Just as you say, sir. Miss Asher is in the study. Oh, thank you. Why don't you go to bed? You look tired. Yes, well, good night, sir. Boo. Oh, oh, Rick. Yeah, isn't it awful? Oh, what happened to your chin? Oh, I got it caught in a thirty-eight. Wanted to go. Want you to go? Why? Well, I thought maybe my poor little face scared you. Oh, I like your poor little mussed-up face. Well, thanks, sporty. How about some music? Oh, I'm too tired. Turn on the radio. All right. Now, let me look at that chin. Oh, that's soothing. Hey, oh, shut that radio off. I'm trying to sleep. Now, what is that? Oh, it's that crabby old neighbor. Oh, it is, huh? Now, Rick, don't get mad. I'll turn it off. You want something, Max? Yeah, some sleep. Is that too much to ask? Well, stick your head in a closet. Now, look, bud. You look. That radio wouldn't wake a two-year-old. Well, just pretend I haven't stopped teething, wise guy. All I want is some sleep. Oh, you do, huh? Sleepy time, gal. You're turning night into day. Uh, you... oh. Rick. Oh, that guy upsets me. All oh, right, he upsets you. That's too pretty a song to sing like that. No. Now you do it right or I'm going to be mad. Well, honey, then that's the last thing I want you to be. Now, now cuddle up on the sofa. You comfy? Mm-hmm. Don't be mad now, baby. Sleepy time, gal, you're turning night into day. Sleepy time, gal, you've danced the evening away. Oh, that's wonderful. Before each silvery star fades out of sight. Please give me one little kiss, then let us whisper good night. It's getting late, and baby, your pillow's waiting. Sleepy time, gal, when all your dancing is through. Sleepy time, gal, I'll find a cottage for you. You'll learn to cook and to sew. What's more, you'll love it, I know. 
When you're stay at home, play at home, eight o'clock, sleepy time, gal. Well, how was that, baby? Helen. Helen. Well, how do you like that? She snores, too. Hey, you! Max! Yeah, now what do you want? How about a game of gin? I'm lonesome. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Jay Novello, Joan Banks, and Stacey Harris. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. As Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there. This is Diamond. You know, I'm sure a lot of you people have never seen this big city of New York that I live in. But you ought to. It's really worth seeing. I don't mean a four-bit tour in a bus. I mean that one time that you stop along the way and really take a good look. Maybe it's from a building 40 floors up. You brace yourself against the stiff morning breeze, and you lean out and watch the biggest city in the world wake up, stretch, roll up its progressive sleeves, and go to work. Or maybe it's 6 o'clock in the evening, and you're on your way home. You hold up at a busy intersection, and you feel the colossus even before you see it. You look behind, to the right, to the left, and then up. And there it is. You could only take in three blocks, maybe, but the pushing crowds and towering buildings are a common denominator for the Bronx, Park Avenue, and Flatbush. The rest you have to imagine because your dinner's waiting. Well, I'm lucky in a way. My dinner's ready when I start throwing nickels in the automat. My meals and my time are freelance, and my work is a ringside ticket to the biggest city in the world. Sure, it's lonely sometimes, and trouble walks the streets on a 24-hour beat. But that's how I pay my rent. Trouble's my silent partner. And he sends me everything from divorce labels to some marked City Morgue, DOA. Dead on arrival. One night last week, old man Trouble was sitting curled up on a doorstep watching two thugs hiding in the shadows of a building. Trouble had a big smile because he was cooking up a king-sized mess for yours truly. Hey, Lou. Yeah? Ain't he ever gonna come out? He'll come out. We just gotta wait, that's all. Hey, Lou. Yeah, what is it? I hope he comes out soon. That cop car is due in a little while. Yeah. Hey, hey, supposing they drive up the street just when he comes out. And we don't use the artillery. We don't? We follow him and get him someplace else. Okay, okay. Hey, Lou. What? Here he comes. Yeah. You ready? Yeah, sure. Look, he's got his two big watchdogs with him. Get set. Now. We better get going. Don't run, stupid. You think we was being clocked? Hey, Lou. There's that lousy cop car. Come on. Where are you going? In this club. Come on, hurry. Hey, Lou, supposing the cops come down here. Shut up. Terrible gentleman. Uh, yeah, for my friend and me. Right this way. Sure, I can help me. 
a picture to take? Lou, are you crazy? We can't sit down at no table. They'll have the whole neighborhood covered in a few minutes. We can sit for a second, then we'll go out the back door. Here you are, gentlemen. Is this all right? Oh, just standing. Yeah, this is just fine. Thank you. Very good, sir. I'll send a waiter right over. Oh, well, now, come on, Lou. Let's blow this joint. Wait till he gets further away. Please, Lou. Okay. Now you go first. Take your time off, Molly. Picture, sir? Huh? No, miss. We don't want no photographs. Hey, yeah, we, we don't want none. Thanks. Just the same. Oh, that's okay. Picture? Like a souvenir picture to take home? Oh, yeah, thank you. Well, come on. Right behind you. Now, hold it right there. No, no, no. Don't move. Thank you. That will be the fella. Hey, Mel, hold it a minute. Yeah, what is it? That dame. This is no time to start looking at dames. No, you fathead. The one with the camera. So she's got good-looking legs, but we got... Uh-oh. What's the matter? There's a cop in the door. Get going, but take your time. I'll tell you about the dame later. Oh, Lynn. Yeah? What is it, Monsieur Davis? Where are you going? Back to the dark room to develop these pictures. You always said not to keep the customers waiting, didn't you, Monsieur Davis? I'm glad to see you listen to your employer. I, um, I'll just come along to see how this batch turns out. This batch isn't any different from the last hundred batches. We'll just go along and see... Oh, that does it. I beg your pardon. I said that does it. You cornered me in that dark room once, and it was all I could do to keep you away from me. Lynn. If you think that just because you run this place, you've got a right to make passes at me, you better get yourself a new girl. Well, maybe that isn't such a bad idea. Come to think of it, I kind of go for it myself. And as long as I'm quitting, here's something you've been asking for for a long time. Oh. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Now get out of my way. That phony French accent may fool the customers, but it doesn't fool me. You get out of here. Pick up your check and get out of here this minute, you, you little... Oh. Now... What were you going to say, Mr. Davis? Get out, get out. Diamond Detective Agency, if you've lost a body, let us dig it up. Oh, Rick, that's awful. Depends on who we dig up and how long he's been there. Rick. Hello, Helen, baby. You're simply gruesome. I know it, but my tongue matches my shirt. What do you do when you wear stripes? I tell everybody I've been licking barber poles. Oh. Eh, thought you'd catch me, didn't you? No, I don't think I'll ever catch you. Oh, I think you're the prettiest little old gal in the whole dang breast of the state. Flattery will get you nowhere. Have we got a date tonight? Only if the elevator is still running. Mr. Diamond? Hmm? Oh, uh, I'll call you back later, honey. I think I just cited the client. Mr. Diamond, please, I- I've got to talk to you. Well, honey, go back and shut the door. If too much smoke gets out of here, the ceiling will cave in. Hmm? Oh, yes. All right. Rick, did I hear a girl's voice? I think so. But maybe she just wears those clothes because her mother never had a haircut. What does she look like? I can't tell you right now. I'm parked behind a curb. Rick! The the door is closed, Mr. Diamond. Now may I speak with you, please? Uh, Helen, I'll call you later. I don't care if she is a prospective client. You face the window when you're talking business. Well, there's a cigarette ad out there. Why look out at an ad when the slogan's right here in my office? Slogan? Yeah, you know, so round, so firm, so... Rick. Bye, baby. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, you were saying... I, uh, I want to hire you to protect me, Mr. Diamond. I know an easier way. Wear a diving suit. Mr. Diamond, put your eyes back in your head. And please listen to me. My life is in danger. There's an answer for that, too, but go on. Tell me the story. Well, my name is Knight. Miss? Yes. Yes. Uh, in the last two days, there have been several attempts on my life. Uh, by whom? Well, I don't know. Well, do you know why anyone would want to kill you? No, no, I don't. Well, now we're getting someplace. Don't be funny, Mr. Diamond. I tell you that twice an attempt has been made on my life. How? Well, the first time a man followed me home and tried to break into my apartment. I screamed and then frightened him off. Maybe he was lonesome. What about the other time? Well, I don't know whether it was the same man or not, but the next night a man jumped out of a car and tried to make me go with him. I kicked him and ran down the block. Sounds more like a kidnapping than an attempted homicide. Why didn't you tell this to the police? Oh, I did. They investigated, but I couldn't give them enough to go on, so they just put a man watching my apartment. I bet he has to stand in line. Didn't they give you an escort? No. They seemed to think I was after some kind of publicity or something. Hmm. They told me it was all right to go out in the daytime, but to stay in my apartment for the next couple of nights. Sounds reasonable. Will you help me, Mr. Diamond? I'm afraid this will happen again. Uh, my dear, my my fee is a hundred a day in expenses. A uh, hundred a day? Hmm. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I don't have that kind of money. Well, neither do I, but if I starve, I do it with dignity. I can't lower my fee, Miss Knight. I never have. Hmm. Well, then, I just 
I'll have to find another detective agency. There are a lot of good ones. I'm sorry, the rule might bend a little, but it won't break. If I took the job knowing you couldn't pay half the fee, ten minutes later, some guy from Texas with an oil-soaked wallet might want to hire me to count his gas stations. Ah, sorry, sorry, but it's a tough world, Miss Knight. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mr. Diamond. Maybe you could recommend someone? Oh, any of them are good. Just close your eyes and open the classified. Well, goodbye, Mr. Diamond. I'm sorry. So am I. My conscience just slit its throat. Like you said, Mr. Diamond, it's a tough world. Uh, yeah, the toughest. Goodbye. Yeah. No, nuts. Yeah, what is it? Diamond? He's hiding his head in the desk. I'll get him for you. Come on out, you heel. Look, I don't know who this is, but put Diamond on the pipe. This is Diamond. Wait till I get the bad taste out of my mouth. Look, you can wet your whistle later. I've always wondered what happened to people who said that. Is there a dame in your office named Knight? <sighs> well, there was. She left just before you called. Well, let me give you a little tip. If she hired you, you're going to start feeling overworked right now, so tell her you don't want the job. Oh, I am, huh? Yeah. Well, your nearest relative is going to have to come down and identify the body. You know something? No, what? A couple of minutes ago, I proved that a good businessman can start looking like a big, fat heel for a lousy hundred a day in expenses. Huh? Don't work on it too long, but stop in sometime, Buster. I'd like to help you spit out your teeth. You better listen to what I say, Shamus. You're way out of your class in this one. I'm always out of my class when I talk with slobs. And if you don't like it, look me up. I'll be working for Miss Knight. I went out of my office in a hurry. When somebody tries to push me around, it's like giving a kid a slingshot in a hothouse. You can tell him all night not to do it, but by morning, he's busted every window in the place. I hoped I might catch Miss Knight before she got to the street, so I grabbed the elevator and went down to the first floor. I couldn't find her in the lobby, so I went out on the sidewalk. The street was crowded, but those curves showed up like a covered wagon on Madison Avenue. She was just starting across Broadway when a big black sedan pulled up and a guy climbed out after her. I took off as fast as my little 175 pounds would carry me and cut Kitty Corner across the street with an eye on the black sedan. The guy had her by the arm, and I knew when she stopped struggling, he'd showed her his gun. I was on a dead run, going to make like a big hero, but his 38 changed my mind. <laughs> He missed with the first one, then he shoved the girl away from him and tried again. I could hear the slug whine past my head, so I hit the sidewalk right next to the girl. He jumped for the car. I just lay there and watched him drive off. Did, did you get the license number? No, it was covered with mud. Gee, I guess you must look pretty silly just sitting here. Yeah, got some jacks? I'm a wizard for this. Maybe you believe me now, Mr. Diamond. Yeah. Here, let me give you a hand up. Uh, thanks. Now, come on, let's get out of here. We're collecting a crowd. Where are we going? I know a policeman who can't understand attempted assault. He says it's not necessary. And believe me, baby, he's got a cure for it. Come on. In just a moment, we will return to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. But first... The National Safety Council reports that in almost every motor vehicle accident, there is one or more violations of the law, speed, drink, and carelessness being the worst offenders. The difficulty is that people continue to think of the horror of accidents as always happening to someone else. It never occurs to us that we may be killed dashing out to lunch tomorrow. Yes, it can and does happen, for it's the careless little chances each one of us takes every day that cause the big accident totals. Every motorist and pedestrian is urged to support actively the safety movement in his own community. Be careful. The life you save may be your own. And now, back to Dick Powell and the second act of Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond is hurrying with his pretty client to see Lieutenant Levinson, head of homicide. I hailed a cab, and ten minutes later, Len Knight and I were walking into the 5th Precinct Police Station. Sergeant Otis looked up and started to say something, but when he saw what I was with, he changed it to a low whistle. <laughs> oh, stop puckering, Otis. You look like you've been unstopping sinks. Oh, very funny, wise guy. Um, how about the uh, introduction? Uh, Miss Knight, Sergeant Otis. Homicide's answer to mercy killings. Hello, Sergeant. Yeah, don't pay no attention to him, Miss Knight. 
He was born with a nasty disposition. Is the lieutenant in, Sergeant? Uh, yeah, go ahead. He'll see you. Uh, nice meeting you, Miss Knight. Uh, nice meeting you, Sergeant. <laughs> oh, this... Uh, yeah? Stop clucking. You'll have every rooster in town in here. Hello, Walt. Who's that with you? Uh, this is Miss Knight. Is she dead? Walt. Say something nice to the lieutenant, dear. After that last remark? Oh, look, Miss Knight, I'm sorry, but this guy you're with has a talent for finding homicides. I'm suspicious of everyone I see him with, because even if they walk into my office with him, he'd do it just to confuse me. Well, I'm quite alive, lieutenant. Then let me give you a friendly tip, Miss Knight. Stay away from this guy. His sense of humor will turn your hair white. Oh, isn't he a dream? Walt, Miss Knight wants protection. Yeah, I see what you mean. Walt, now stop gnawing on the desk and listen to me. Miss Knight is in line for a murder or for kidnapping. I knew it. She wants protection and you're going to give it to her. That's not my department. This is homicide, isn't it? Of course it is. But you know very well we don't go to work until you're dead. Well, honey, I guess you'll just have to rile it and get yourself killed. That's the only way. Now you stop that. Send her to another department. They'll give her all the protection she needs. She's been there. They stuck a guy out in front of her apartment. Now look, I just saw Hood try to muscle her into a car. He took a shot at me and you know bullets give me that let down feeling. Now, put one of your boys with her until I can do something about clearing this thing up. What's your full name, Miss Knight? Uh, Lynette. Lynn, for short. Where do you live and where do you work? I live at 419 West 48th Street, apartment 309. I quit my job three days ago. Where was this job? The Circus Club on 52nd Street. I took pictures. Took pictures? Yeah, you know. Souvenirs of the customers. Oh. Why'd you quit? Well, my... Boss got grabby. I slapped him around. Hey, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, honey. Did did you say Circus Club, 52nd Street? Yeah. What about it? Walt, didn't somebody gun down Al Rigoletta and two of his boys right near there? Say, you're right. Three nights ago. You didn't see that shooting, did you, Miss Knight? Well, no, but I read about it the next day. Well, if you didn't see it, they couldn't want to get at you just because you're a witness. Oh, this is screwy. What have we got to work on? You just put a man to guard her. I'm going to see what I can do. All right, but only because I owe you a favor. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant? Get in here. Otis? Yes, Otis. He's not as stupid as he looks. Want to bet? He couldn't be and live. Uh, you want me, Lieutenant? Not for keeps. I want you to stay with Miss Knight here until I tell you to come home. Somebody's trying to get rough with her. Got it? Yeah. <laughs> Walt, have you found any eggs around the office? Eggs? Otis, where do you hide your nest? Oh, Lieutenant, make this guy lay off for me. Yeah, Rick, lay off the poor guy. Otis. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Lieutenant. Stop standing on one leg and wait outside, you mallet head. Oh, oh, yeah, Lieutenant. Uh, Walt, I'll keep in touch. Okay. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Uh, yes? Thanks. I'll make it up to you some way. Don't strain yourself. I like an obligation to be fun. It will be. Rick. Yeah? Bye. I left the 5th Precinct and headed for the Circus Club. It was a small place with sawdust on the floor and colored decorations like the inside of a circus tent. The place was still closed, but a short, dapper little guy in a gray business suit answered my knock. Yes, you're from the police. Why? You need them? I just put in a call. Someone burglarized the place last night. Oh. Do you know a girl named Knight? Lynn Knight? That's it. I most certainly do. I fired her three nights ago. If she's in some kind of trouble with the police, she deserves it. You must run this place. That's right. My name's Davis. Would you like to take a look at the room that was broken into? I certainly would. What did they steal? That's just it. I don't know. They turned it upside down, but I can't imagine what they were after. It's a dark room. A dark room? Yes. I have several girls that take pictures of the customers. They developed the prints in the back of the cafe. Right this way. Uh, forget it. But I thought you wanted... I'm not from the police, Mr. Davis. I'm a private detective. Uh, tell me, did Miss Knight turn in all her film the night she quit? I fired her. Difference of opinion. Did she turn in all her film? Why, no. As a matter of fact, she didn't. She left with her camera and several customers got rather angry when the pictures weren't developed. You mean her last role was still in that camera? It must have been. She didn't leave it in the dark room. I looked. Mm. Where's the phone? Right over there. Walt, I think I've got something. Diamond, I've got something, too. A sour stomach and headache. What's the matter? Otis followed that night dame halfway home when some guy stepped out of an alley and split his head with a sap. He's down in emergency getting his skull crocheted. What about the girl? We don't know. Otis can't remember. Oh, that's...
that's dandy. I'll call you back. Now, you wait a minute. I can't. Bye. I had one of those muscle-bound hunches. And I had to work fast or Lynn Knight was going to get herself kicked around and maybe end up in the city morgue. I remembered her dress. And 15 minutes later, I was standing in front of room 309. I could hear the phone ringing from somewhere inside, so I waited to see if anyone answered it. On the third ring, I tried the door. Well, well, well. Hello? Uh, who is this? Uh, this is Diamond. Oh, thank goodness. This is Lynn Knight. Well, where the devil are you? Lieutenant Levinson said you'd disappeared. I'm in a bar on 50th Street. That man who tried to shove me into his car this afternoon hit Sergeant Otis on the head, and I've been running ever since. Now, how did you know I was here? Oh, I didn't. I called your office and got no answer, so I just took a chance. Maybe you'd gone looking for me. I was, but I was looking for something else, too. Tell me, baby, have you got a camera? Why, I did have. Did have? What happened to it? Well, I sort of uh, sold it. Oh, you mean you hocked it. Well, I didn't need it anymore, and I did need the money. So you stay right where you are, and I'll be down. What's the name of the place? Uh, oh, 2320 Club. Please hurry, Mr. Diamond. I'm scared. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you something else. Hello? Hello? Oh, I, I thought you'd hung up. No, I thought you... Lynn. Yeah? Is there an extension on this phone? Why, yes, in the bedroom. So you don't think... I don't know. Wait a minute. Hey, what are you guys... Oh! Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond, are you still on the... Okay, Mel. Let's go get the dame. Hey, that was pretty smart waiting around and listening in on the extension, Lou. What do you want me to do with the shamus? He looks like he can still hear things. Well, turn him off. Sure. Okay. Okay, let's go. What are you limping for? I kicked him with the wrong foot. I got a lousy, ingrown toenail. I laid there trying to crawl back to a more sensible way of life. He'd kicked me so hard that it shook my eyes loose and they'd run back into my head to hide. Everything was suddenly crammed into a long funnel that disappeared into the floor, and I felt pretty sick. I was stuck in an acre of colored molasses, and trying to get myself loose was like pulling a pillar through a garden hose. When I finally made it, I stuck my head under a sink and let the cold water bring me back to normal. Then I headed for the 2320 Club in a hurry. Something I could do for you? I'm looking for a girl, but I don't see her. Ah, they come and go. It's like that around here. She had on a green skirt and a jersey blouse. Couldn't miss her unless you don't like girls. Oh, her. Uh, She used the phone and then she left. Alone? No, a couple of ugly-looking guys came in and she left with them. Hey, you know her? Yeah. Well, she forgot her purse. You might tell her. Her purse? Let me see it. Oh, no. Here's the badge, Buster. Oh, okay. He handed me the purse and I went through it. Nothing much but a pawn ticket. I looked at it, and that hunch started biting my leg, so I took off for the pawn shop. Good afternoon. Uh, here's a ticket. I want to claim the article. Sure, sure. A11249. Here, here it is. Ah, lovely camera. Bingo. Did the girl sell it to you? No, she just wants me to claim it for her. Well, be careful. She said there was still some film in it. She wanted to come back and get it when she got a new job. Uh, Fifteen dollars, please. Yeah, here you are. Is there a place around here where I can get the film developed? Right across the street. You can see it from here. Ah, thanks. Here it comes. Yep, yep, it's coming up, but we'll, we'll leave it in a little longer. Hey, maybe I'm nosy, but what's so important about this roll of film? I'll tell you better when I look at it. Well, I'll turn on the light. There you are. Yeah. Well, nothing on this one. Hmm. Mm. Nope. Hey, look at this. Oh, some old guy with his wife. Is that what you wanted to find? You see those two guys in the background that look like they're just sneaking out of a chicken house? Yeah, so what? The one in the back is Lou Garzoni. The gangster? Yeah. Give me that negative. Let's get out of here. Well. You two holding hands in there? Hey, who are you and what's the gun for? Uh, Take it easy, Doc. He shoots people. That's right. Now back into the room. Uh, All right, but take it easy with that gun. Give me that negative, Shamus. Okay. 
Now, where's the picture? It, it, it's still in the juice. Well, get it. I'll get it. That's better. Well, come on, come on. I can't seem to find it. Oh, yeah? Look for yourself. I'll look. See? <laughs> say, you threw it in his face. That stuff oh, might blind him. So now he can't see to kill you. My eyes. Get me to the doctor, quick. After you Wait. tell me where the girl is. 212 West 45th Street, apartment 513. Harry, I can't stand it. Call a doctor for this guy and then get hold of Lieutenant Levins in 5th Precinct. Why, why? Tell him to meet me in front of 212 West 45th and to step on it. Yes, yeah, all right, I'll boy. take those pictures. I can't stand it. I'm Ah, oh, sure you can. It's no fun looking at the electric chair anyway. <laughs> Apartment 513, he said. Oh, here it is. Yeah. If Lou Garzoni's in there, we've got to take him by surprise or he'll knock off the girl. Otis is down in the alley, so he won't get out that way. Well, here goes. I hope it works. Yeah, who is it? Oh, uh, Mel had an accident. He sent me up to tell you. What's your name? Tony Vega. Well, why didn't you say so? I thought you was in stir... Coppers! You dirty dog! Walt. How about it, Walt? He's on his way. Where's the girl? Probably in the other room. Yeah, yeah. Take it easy, baby. All right. I'll get the gag on. Now. There you are. Oh, Mr. Diamond. Mr. Diamond, he was going to kill me. Yeah, I know. Is she all right? Sure, Walt. Oh, uh, how about Gazzoni? No hurry for the wagon. No. Now, will you please tell me how you knew Lou Garzoni was in this apartment? Well, he and his boy were after a picture Miss Knight took. Yeah, this one. Ah. Here they are in the background. He was an old enemy of Al Rigoletto, wasn't he, Walt? Yeah. Why? Oh, I bet he was the one who rubbed him out. Then he and his boy ducked into the nightclub. Garzoni saw his picture taken, so they went after Len. Why, why Mr. Diamond? Oh, what's the matter? You finally called me Len. Oh, well... Lynn. <laughs> uh, you go home and take it easy. I might stop by tomorrow. What's the matter with tonight? I've got a piano lesson. Bye. Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant? Is it all over? Yes, you hammerhead. Now get out of that garbage can and see if you can find your way back to the station. <laughs> Okay. Rick. Hmm? Tell me about the girl in your office. Oh, nice kid. Lovely eyes. I'm jealous. Good for you. And I'm mad. You're so busy. <laughs> you like the new piano? Oh, yes, yes. It's a big one. <laughs> Must have taken a herd of elements to make the keyboard. Sing something. What does Rita Baby want? I don't care. Okay. Oh! Care. I don't care. Rick. Well, that's what you said. You said that. Yes, you did. There's something nice. All right. Everywhere you go, sunshine follows you. Oh, that's such a beautiful tune. Really? Everywhere you go, skies are always blue. Rick. I'm going to finish it. Children love you. They seem to know. You bring the roses right out of the snow. The whole world says hello. Everywhere you go. You suppose the guy who wrote that song ever got shot at? <laughs> oh, Rick, you idiot. Come here. Oh. This is much more fun than piano lessons. Uh. 
You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Joan Banks, Paul Dubob, Herbert Ellis, and Sidney Miller. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evening. Shows like Hollywood Calling, Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, The Ethel Merman Show, and the NBC Symphony. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial tuned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. And don't miss the interesting story, My Mr. Powell and His Mr. Diamond, in the September issue of Radio Mirror, now on your newsstand. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at this same time next week, when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. As Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, there are a lot of people in a big city like this. Good ones and bad ones. They walk down Broadway and rub elbows and you can't tell them apart. Why can't you? Because a lot of them are poured out of the same mold. Brought up in the middle of garbage cans and gang wars. Weaned on the smell of slums and conditioned to the taste of dirt and a kick in the ribs. By the time they get old enough to raise their fist, they're given two choices. Two ways to beat the gang wars and garbage can. One guy picks himself up, shakes off the filth, and jumps over on the right side of the fence. The other guy picks himself up, too. But when he does, he raises that fist and shakes it at the whole world because he wants things the easy way. He continues to shake his fist until someone shoves a gun in it. Then he's a swaggering giant. Sometimes he climbs over with his little bag of rot and hides in the lap of society. But take away the gun and he ends up right back in the middle of the garbage cans with his face in the dirt. What about the guy on the right side of the fence? Well, you rarely ever hear of him. Unless he becomes president or gets mixed up with the guy on the wrong side of the fence. Like the case I bumped into a couple of days ago. It all started in Central Park. Some crook I run over. That young guy over there ran over with his car. I came up right after it happened. He was leaning over her and crying. A little late for crying, I'd say. Says he didn't kill her. Says someone pushed her in front of his car. <laughs> Ain't that a good one? All right, everybody back. Here comes the ambulance. Come on, you. But I tell you, I didn't kill her. I was in love with her. That's the last thing you should have said. But I swear I didn't do it. I was going to meet her about a, about a half a block up the street. And someone pushed her out in front of my car. I couldn't stop in time. Hey, look, I just got to write a report and take you down to the station. You can tell it to the inspector. Now look out. Here's the ambulance. Hello, Crackett. Yeah, you are too late. The body's ready for the morgue. Ah, Central Park's turning into a graveyard. I'm going to start taking my girl someplace else. What do you mean? Somebody else got run over in the park? Somebody got shot full of holes. Call came in just for this one. That uh, gangster Chino Scarbo? Scarbo got knocked off. He was dough, wasn't he? Please, officer, can't I get to a phone? Shut up. One of the biggest gangsters in town gets rubbed out, and I gotta show up at the station with you. You know, Sonny, I'm not pleased with you at all. Diamond Detective Agency, corpse is designed with you in mind. Rick. Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Where do you get all those awful slogans? Ghost Rider. Ho, ho, ho. Get it? Rick. Wasn't a riot? No, Rick. 
was a bomb. Oh. Uh, okay, maybe this will get a yuck. Oh. Oh, here's a butte. Are you lonely? Join the Lonely Souls Club and find your perfect soulmate. All ages. Guarantee satisfaction and money refunded. Well, I wonder if Mighty Joe Young knows about this. Rick, what are you talking about? I'm reading the personals. Hey, get a load of this one. We'll give ride to coast, must be young companion, pretty, easy on the eyes. Hmm. Think I ought to apply, baby? You're ridiculous. Oh, here's an odd one. Anyone witnessing unusual accident at the 77, 72nd Street transverse, 11 p.m. Wednesday night, when young girl was killed, call Skyler 6036. Urgent. That's in Central Park. Yeah, somebody's got trouble. Mr. Diamond? Uh, hold it a minute, baby. Yeah, I'm Diamond. What can I do for you? I, uh, want to hire you. Uh, Helen. Yes, I know. Bye. A hundred dollars a day in expenses, sir. That's your fee? Yep. I like to give it to the prospective client first. If he turns green and faints, we both save a lot of time and talk. How do you feel? About the fee? Fine. Well, what else is bothering you? My son is being held on a manslaughter charge. Well, if he kills somebody, that's a job for the police. But he didn't do it intentionally. The girl was shoved in front of his car. That's his story. Yes, it is. And I believe him. Hmm? Who was the girl, and why do you think anyone would want to kill her? Her name was Jean Cooper. My son was in love with her. Why anyone would want to kill her, I really can't say. Uh Uh-huh. Your name and your son's name, where he's being held? My name is Cook. Earl Cook. My son's (laughs) name is Tom. He's at the 5th Precinct Police Station. Oh, wouldn't you know it? I beg your pardon? Uh, Forget it. Uh, What's your business, Mr. Cook? Politics. Where can I reach you? I live at 261 Riverside Drive. My phone is Skyler 6036. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? I don't know. That phone number's familiar. Where did your son run over this girl, Mr. Cook? The 72nd Street Transverse. 11 o'clock Wednesday night? Why, well, yes. How did you know? I read the papers. Is this your ad in the personal column? Yes, yes it is. You see, the police claim there were no witnesses. But I had hopes that there might have been someone who had seen the accident... Well, if if anyone calls you, let me know. Now, uh, I'll take $100, Mr. Cook. That's a retainer in case I run into trouble and have to get buried in a hurry. I hate to strain my relatives. He wrote me out a check, and I closed the office and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. An automobile death isn't exactly up my alley, but if someone had pushed the girl out in front of the car, then it was murder. And that was a territory I knew my way around in. Well, well, good morning, Sergeant Otis. Huh? Oh, where did you come from, Shamus? Sugar and spice and everything nice. Huh? That's what little boys are made of. You're crazy. That's what little girls are made of. Why, Sergeant, you peaked. Uh, you want to see the lieutenant? I think that would be lovely. Go on. Oh, uh, Otis. Huh? I just had a horrible thought. Yeah? Wouldn't it be awful if there was a whole room full of you? Hello, all. Diamond, you get out of here. Every time you wander into this office, I grow another ulcer. Why, Walt, I'm surprised at you. Well, you wouldn't be if you had to listen to Otis bellyaching all over the precinct 12 hours a day. Why don't you leave that poor guy alone? Don't listen to him. Don't listen to him? How can I help it? He screams so loud, only dogs can get with it. Have you got a boy booked here on the manslaughter charge, uh, Tom Cook? Yes, we have. I knew darn good and well you'd be springing something before you'd sit down and act like a normal human being. What do you want Cook for? He ran over a dame last night, and that's that. Maybe you want to give him a driving lesson? Uh, uh, uh. You're turning blue again, Walt. I'll light up like a pinball machine if you don't start giving me some peace and quiet. Can I see, Cook? No, you can't. Well, why not? I know you. You'll end up by proving you wasn't even in the city last night. Before the day is gone, we'll be booking Otis for the k- killing. Did he do it? Who? Otis. Now, you stop that. Don't you dare start that routine again. I'm the biggest sucker in the world for that thing, and I admit it, but I am prepared. I know who's on first base today. Who? Williams. He's playing for... Uh, Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant? Yeah, Lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant. Is that all you can say? Take Diamond down to see that guy cook. And if you let him back in this office, I'll break every bone in your fat head. Yeah, Lieutenant. Oh. Where is that bicarbonate? My Walt. I left Walt coming on like Vesuvius, and Otis took me down in the tombs to see Tom Cook. Cook was a man about 25 or 26, put together like a high jumper. He had sandy hair and a nice face. Also, he looked pretty worried. I tell you, Mr. Diamond, I didn't intentionally run over Jean. She called and asked me to meet her in the park. Why? Well, we always met there. Oh. You say she was pushed in front of the car? Well, that's what it looked like. There are some bushes right near the sidewalk. 
she came flying out of them and fell in front of me before I could put on the brakes. What did she want to see you about? It was personal. Now, look, look. You're up on a manslaughter charge. You can get a lot of time for that. Now, what did she want to see you about? I can't tell you. I just can't tell you. It would ruin someone. It's going to wreck you if you don't. Then it'll have to. Okay, okay. Did she have any enemies at all? Boyfriends, girlfriends, ex-husbands, jealous ice men? She had an ex-husband. When did she separate from him? About a year ago. Why? Do you think maybe Cooper was jealous? Is his name Cooper? Yes, uh, John Cooper. Oh, live in town? Well, he was living at 498 West 81st Street, but that was a year ago. Okay. Tell me where your girl was living. 383 Madison Avenue, apartment 206. She was living under her married name, Cooper. Mm. Sure you don't want to tell me what she wanted to see you about? I can't, Mr. Diamond. Okay, but I hope the person you're protecting appreciates it. Five years in Sing Sing is stretching loyalty a long way. This person's worth it. Uh, Otis, let me out of here. You locked me up with a Boy Scout. Uh, Mr. Cook? Yes? Uh, who is this? This is Diamond. Diamond, I'm so glad you phoned. Oh? Remember my ad in the personal columns? Yes. Well, I just received a call from someone who claims he saw a man push a girl in front of my son's car. Oh. He said he was in a hurry, so he didn't wait around to see the rest. Can you imagine that? In too much of a hurry to stay round. No, I can't imagine it, unless he was running away from something, didn't want to be caught. Did he uh, tell you anything else? No, I, I asked his name, but he hung up. No. Oh. Well, if you hear from him again, call Lieutenant Levinson of the 5th Precinct. And I'll call you later. All right, Mr. Diamond. But now I'm sure my son is innocent. Well, I hope I can come up with more than your confidence. I knew a guy who yelled frame all the way to the electric chair. They fried him like a lean pork chop. I left the phone booth and took off for John Cooper's apartment. I found the place and gave my rabbit's foot a pat on the hock. The little bunny was still with me because a John Cooper was listed on the mailboxes. I took the steps two at a time. Yeah, who is it? Uh, the name's Diamond. I don't want any. I'm selling a homicide, complete with samples. You better open up. Hey, what are you talking about? I'm talking about your ex-wife. She was killed last night. What? Mind if I come in? No, 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 come on in. Jean dead. How did it happen? She was run over by a car. Oh, that's awful. Are you from the police? You got a gold star. Where were you at 11 o'clock Wednesday night? I was right here in my apartment. You can prove it? Well, I didn't leave. I don't guess I can prove it. I hope you don't think I ran over, Gene. I know who ran over. I'm trying to find out who aimed her. I don't understand. She was pushed in front of the car. How do you know that? Why shouldn't I know that? Well, but I don't know. I, I, I guess you should. When was the last time you saw your ex-wife? Oh, about eight months ago. We didn't get along, so we didn't speak after we split up. You haven't seen her since? No. Or are you jealous of her new boyfriend? Jealous? Why should I be? Good question. I'll see you later, Mr. Cooper. Yeah. I hope I've been at some help. You've been dandy. I left Cooper pinning up his gold star and headed for the dead girl's apartment. I knew the law had already been there and that it would probably be locked tighter than a wine truck on Skid Row. I found the landlady's door and gave it a jolt. Yeah. Oh, what do you want? I'm uh, looking for the landlady. You want an apartment? We got one coming up in a couple of days. The dame that was in it croaked. You can pay in advance if you want it. Can I take a look at it? No. Nah. Lousy coppers told me not to let anyone in. You got my word, it's a good one. Oh, well then, you'd better let me talk to your mother. My mother? My old lady's been dead for 20 years. She has? Aren't you a little young to be running an apartment all by yourself? <laughs> Hey, Sonny. Yeah? How old do you think I am? Well, it's hard to tell. I'd say, oh, about 28. <laughs> Come on, I'll show you the apartment. But watch those steps. I think you could use some glasses. Right up here, handsome. Was the poor girl who died married? Used to be, but she got divorced. Here it is. There you are, honey. Go on in, take a look around. I'll go on back downstairs in case the law comes back. I'll have to stall them, I guess. Thanks, beautiful. Oh, that's all right, honey. When you're done, stop in at my place and I'll give you a drink of gin. I waited until I heard the old bat fly down the stairs, and then I took the place apart. It took me exactly ten minutes, and even if I do say so, it was a pretty neat job. 
I was on the last lap, going through the wastebaskets, when I spotted something on the magazine stand. It was just below eye level. It was a late issue of a magazine, and it was addressed to Mr. John Cooper, 498 West 81st Street. I grabbed it and picked up the phone. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Oh, this is Wooly. Wish you talking to Lieutenant Levinson? Oh, how are you, Wooly? Uh, get it for you, chop, chop. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? Oh, very fine. Chop, chop. Your head, maybe. Huh? Wooly say very fine. You speak very fine Chinese. Oh. Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, this is... Uh, this is Diamond Walt. It is. I told Otis I didn't want to talk to you. He said Wu Lee was on the pipe. Oh, this is Wu Lee too, Walt. Oh, that lame brain, Otis. Oh, what is it now, Diamond? I got a liar in the balcony, Walt. What are you talking about? I've spoken to three people about the girl that was run over. One of them lied to me. Now, I believe the kid's story. I think she was pushed. So, she was pushed. I can't be bothered with that right now. I'm all tangled up in the Scarborough killing. We found the gun that did the job lying in the bushes in Central Park. Wait a minute. In Central Park? Yeah, we traced it to a pawn shop, and the pawnbroker identified one Louis Spiegel as the one that bought the gun. Walt, what time was Scarbo knocked off? Shots were heard about five minutes to 11. Hey, that's just about the same time that Cook ran over the girl. You are so right, and Scarbo got killed on the other side of the park. About five minutes to run to where the girl got run over. Now, what are you getting at? If you know something about this Scarbo killing, I'm... Walt, some guy called Tom Cook's father and said he saw the girl shoved in front of the car. He wouldn't tell his name because he said he'd get in trouble. Uh, probably a crank. No one would duck out on a deliberate murder. Unless he'd just rubbed out New York's biggest gangster. Hey. Yeah. Have you got Louis Spiegel on tap? No, he's hiding out. Oh. Well, do me a favor. Check your files and see if you've got a record on a John Cooper. The dead girl's ex-husband? Yeah, then I'll call you back. I've got a guy who might show us where we can find Louis Spiegel and the guy who pushed the girl in front of the car. Killed two birds with one stone. It's quite a billiard shot, but give my little stool pigeon two bottles of fermented grape juice and he can run the table. I left the apartment and slipped by the landlady's door. I knew she was building a party because I could smell the hunted proof clear out in the hall. I ducked out on the street and headed for Skid Row in a place called the Parrot Club. When I went in, I spotted my man sitting in his usual spot at the bar. His name was Wilbur Truitt. Ah, greetings, Bucko. You have come just in the nick. Not having the necessary funds to purchase another bottle of strength, I asked yon bartender to put it on the cup. Uh, Wilbur, Whereupon I... he handed me this can of rat poison. Mm. It turned out to be rather soothing in a toxic sort of way. Bucko, you know me. I do not wish to deprive the little rodents of their daily constitution, so I would much rather nurse on the succulent end of a bottle. Wilbur, I'm looking for someone. I have been looking for someone all my life, preferably a brewery owner. A uh, bartender, uh, bring me a bottle. Oh, noble sir, your over-kindness doth wring tears from me. I do embrace your offer. Now, you don't wrap your hooks around this jug until I find out where Louis Spiegel is. Ah... That is indeed a difficult problem. Mr. Spiegel carried a rather large gun under his arm. Then if I sit here and gaze at that bottle for any great period, I shall become cotton-mouthed and surely choke to death. Mr. Louis Spiegel might be found in the freight yards, hiding in an old shack at the end of 50th Street now, bucko. I'm rusting. Here you are, Wilbur, and thanks. Farewell. Lord knows when we shall meet again. I have... Faint, cold fear thrills through my veins. <coughs> oh, but no matter. I have never let a cork confuse me before. Bartender, a corkscrew and bring the cat. I owe him a drink. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Diamond, Walt, what did you find out? John Cooper has no record. Uh oh. But George Kingsley has. Oh, alias? Yeah. George Kingsley, alias John Cooper, did 10 years for embezzlement. Oh, fine. Thanks, Walt. Now, here's the pitch Lou Spiegel is in a shack in the freight yards at the end of 49th Street, North River. Get some men to surround the place and have Otis pick up John Cooper and bring him down there. I'll be there in half an hour and give you a couple of killers. <laughs> All I needed was a motive, so I hung up the phone and headed for the house of my client, Earl Cook. Oh, come in, Mr. Diamond. I'm very glad you've come. Uh, Mr. Cook, did you... I uh, want to show you something. Here. Uh, what are they? 
Letters to my son. Blackmail letters. Oh? Where'd you find them? I was going through my son's things, trying to find something that might help uncover the motive for his accident. Mind if I take a look? Well, I can save you the trouble. They're about me. About you? Yes. I told you I'm in politics. Well, I am. And I'm a big power. When I began my rise, I was a young criminal lawyer. I had to accept a lot of cases that I might have turned down under different circumstances. I see. And the opposition tried everything to discredit me. Smear campaigns saying that I was getting acquittals for common thugs who were known to be guilty. And later, when I became a judge, they switched the campaign and said that the men I sentenced were innocent. Were they? Of course not. But in those letters to my son, the blackmailer said that he had definite proof that could ruin me. My son knew about my past, and when he started receiving the letters, he was afraid to confront me with the evidence for fear I might have to admit my dishonesty. Have you talked with your son? I just left him. That's why he didn't tell you anything. He thought he was protecting me. His girl, Jean, found out who was sending him the letters and, well, she was killed before she could tell him. Well, that fits. If the girl found out, then the blackmailer would not only have to know your son pretty well, but he'd also have to know her. You think you know who he is? Uh, see this magazine? Mm -hmm. Well, some of the pages are cut up. Now, take a look at these blackmail notes. They're formed with cut-out letters to spell out the words. Mm. The type is the same as the type in the magazine. Where did you get that magazine? In the girl's apartment. Well, then she must have had something to do with it. She found the magazine all right, but it wasn't hers. Uh, look, Mr. Cook. Yes. Did you ever send a man to prison named Kingsley? Yes, I believe so. For embezzling. Ah, thanks. And where are you going? I'll call you later. I've got a date at the freight yards. <laughs> Oh, hello, Rick. We've got Spiegel boxed up. He's in that shack down there. Ah, will he come out? If he does, it'll be feet first. Well, I guess you'd rather have it that way. Any shooting? He tried a couple, but I had the boys hold their fire until you got here. I see. Where's John Cooper? Otis hasn't showed up with him yet. Uh, let me use your loudspeaker, Walt. Well, sure, go ahead, but uh, keep your head down. Spiegel! Spiegel! Lou! Why, that low life, I'll blast him to kingdom come. Hold it, Walt. Spiegel knows me. Louis! Louis, this is Diamond. I want to talk with you. You better get out of here, Diamond. It ain't none of your business. Lou, you've got my word. There'll be no shooting. I want to talk to you. Look, Diamond. I know they want me for the Scarborough killing, and I say, okay, I've done the job. But I'm allergic to electricity, and I don't like cops. You blow this place apart, I say, okay, too. And that's the way I want it. How do you still want to talk? I want five minutes. Okay, come on down, but keep your hands behind your neck. Walt, no shooting, huh? Okay, but I think you're crazy. He kills guys for practice. I moved out from behind the boxcar and put my hands behind my head. I started down toward the shack and I could see Spiegel looking at me over the barrel of a forty-five. One bad move from any of the men stationed around the yards and I was going to get dead quick. I walked up to the shack and went in. That's far enough, Diamond. You've got five minutes. Uh, it won't take that long, Lou. Keep your hands where they are. Oh, I, uh, thought you might want a cigarette. Oh. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm all out. Yeah. Keep the pack. Uh, just one. I got a date. Now, light? I can make it. Four minutes, Diamond. Did you see a girl shoved in front of a car the night you knocked off Scarbo? Yeah. I called some guy and I told him about it. I read his ad in the personals, but I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, because then the law would know you were in the park. Looks like it don't make much difference now. The kid who ran over the girl is in on a manslaughter rap. You'll get five or ten. That's tough. You got three and a half minutes. Lou, did you get a good look at the man who gave the girl the shove? Sure, I'd remember him. Rick! What do they want? I'll see. With your hands up, you'll see. Sure. What is it, Walt? Otis has got Cooper. Lou, will you do me a favor? I don't know. I want you to tell me if the guy they've got up there is the one who pushed the girl. Sure. But I can't see him from here. I'll have him brought down. I hope you ain't up to something. I don't want to see no kid get sent up on a bum rap. But if you get funny, you get holes. Walt! How about his bring Cooper halfway down to the shack? He doesn't want to go. Then drag him. I've only got two minutes. They bringing him? Yeah, here he comes. Okay. Out that door. 
What are you doing? I'm doing you a favor. I'm tired of this shack, and I'm walking out with you in front of me. Okay. Don't get too far ahead. Rick, what's Spiegel up to? I don't know. Hold your fire. I'm surprised at you. Even if I identified this guy, it wouldn't hold water. I got a bad reputation. Hey, what's going on? Take it easy, Otis. You can't do this to me. What's this all about? That's the guy, Diamond. I don't know what you're talking about. Sure you do. I saw you push that dame in front of the car. You're crazy. Now, I don't like that. You got just ten seconds to admit it. I won't admit anything. Then I shoot you. Hey, you can't... Shut up, Flatfoot. Stay out of this, Otis. I tell you, I won't admit anything. Five seconds. Come on, Cooper. I found out all about your prison record. I know Cook sent you up and you wanted to get even. You found those letters Tom wrote to your ex-wife, so you started blackmailing him. And I know you lied when you said you hadn't seen your ex-wife. I found a magazine in her apartment with your address on it. Time's up. No, 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 no. All right, I did it, I did it. You're too late. I'm on schedule. Oh, you idiot. Why did you shoot him? What's the difference? I kill people, he kills people. Besides, he wasn't polite. So long, Diamond. You got your favor. He's making a break. He'll never make it. Spiegel. Spiegel, in the name of the law, stop. Well, what? Yeah, they got him. They sure did. You know something? He wasn't such a bad guy. Wasn't he? I guess he's killed a dozen people in his time, but maybe you're right. Maybe he kissed them all goodbye before he pulled the trigger. Well, I got a right to an opinion. Yeah, yeah, and it scares me a little. You're lucky you didn't try to pull a gun on him. You'd look pretty silly telling everybody what a nice guy he was after he'd shot off the top of your head. <laughs> Lots of lemon, honey. What's that you're playing? I don't know. It says on the sheet music for kazoo and voice. <laughs> you idiot. Here, see how this tastes. Ah, uh, oh, that's wow. But can't you drop a muscle in it or something? No, that's plenty strong. Oh. The last time you complained about my weak drinks, Francis had to carry you home piggyback. Yeah, remind me to buy him a saddle. I hear they uh, let the cook boy out of jail this evening. How the dickens did you know that? Mm, never mind, I find out things. You have been snooping. Well, you won't tell me anything about your cases. How did you find out? Uh-uh. Helen? No. You'll be sorry. Here. You sing this, and I'll tell you how I found out. Well, I don't know whether I can. Your lips tell me no, no. But there's yes, yes in your eyes. I've been missing your kissing Just because I wasn't wise I'll stop my scheming and dreaming Cause I realize Your oh, Rick, that's wonderful. Oh, okay, now make like a truth serum or I sing 20 courses of McNamara's band. <laughs> Well, I was looking for you, so I called Walt Levinson. He told me all about it. Very elementary, my dear Diamond. Oh, get her. Do I look smug? Close your eyes and let's see. Now, that's silly. Why do I have to close my eyes? Close your eyes. <laughs> oh, that's better. Mm. Rick, aren't you nice? I certainly am. But people always notice my dimples first. Come here. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Helen, mm-hmm. you're looking smug again. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Eleanor Audley, William Johnstone, Sam Edwards, David Ellis, and Frank Lovejoy. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandell. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evening. 
Shows like Hollywood Calling, Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, The Ethel Merman Show, and the NBC Symphony. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial tuned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. As Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, I saw something the other day that's as typical of New York as the Empire State Building. I was walking down 2nd Avenue when I spotted some kids around the fire hydrant. They'd turned it on and the whole gang was splashing around, keeping cool. They'd done something else, too. They'd found a barrel... And I suddenly remembered when I used to play in the gutter with the same kind of barrel. It's open at both ends, and when it's held over the gushing hydrant, it acts like a big hose, and a lot of passing New Yorkers can end up pretty wet. I stopped and watched, and just like always, one of New York's finest showed up and the kids scattered. He turned off the water and the fun was over. Oh, but not for long. Somebody was sure to give the kids a monkey ranch, and ten minutes after the cop had disappeared, the street would be flooded again. Yeah, kid can have a lot of fun, even in a big city. But it's unfortunate that every once in a while there's a boy who forgets to have fun and heads for trouble. Like a case I got mixed up in not long ago. It all started in a candy store under the L on 9th Avenue. I'm just closing up, boys. We want to talk to you, Pop. I told you I was closing up. Come back tomorrow and we can talk then. Eddie said he wanted to talk to you, Pop. You better listen. Hey, what is this? You kids get out of my store. You want to buy something, you come back tomorrow. You ain't been making enough on your number sales. We come to see why not. Oh, so that's it. First, they threaten to beat me up unless I sell the numbers. Then they get sore because I ain't selling enough and send young hoodlums to see that they do. Well... You go tell your boss that I'm through selling numbers to poor people who think they can get rich quick. You tell your boss if he don't like it, I'm going to the police. You tell your boss that. Sure, we'll tell him. But he wants us to tell you something. I don't want to hear nothing from you bunch of no-goods. Now you get out of here. Oh, no, that ain't nice. Is it, Jim? No, that ain't nice at all. I told you to get out. If you don't, I'll call a cop. You ain't calling anybody, Pop. Yeah. What are you doing? You get away. Hey, please! It's, it's... No, no, please, help. Shut up. Okay, Jim, make him shut up. Please, I'm an old man. Yeah, yeah, sure you are, Pop, but old guys like you need exercise. <laughs> Think he's had enough, eh? Yeah, grab some of them cigarettes and cigars off the counter. Ah, yeah, sure. Hey, we better get out of here. Maybe somebody heard him yelling. Okay, grab me a box of candy, too. I got a date with Nancy tonight. I'll grab a couple. I got a date, too. Let's go. Down this alley. Yeah. Okay, okay, slow it down. Right. Let's get over to 27th Street. Okay. Come on, Mr. Parrish wants to see us. Right. Uh, hey, Ed. Yeah? You go up to see your brother today? Yeah. How's he doing? He's doing all right. Ain't he scared or nothing? <laughs> What's the matter, Eddie? Oh! Hey, what did I say? What did I say, huh? I told you once not to say nothing about my brother. I was just asking. I didn't say nothing, hey. You asked if he was scared, didn't you? Okay, okay. Well, he ain't scared. He's a big shot. He wasn't scared of the guy knocked off by the cops or nothing else, see? Not even a hot seat. <laughs> hey, that's the cop who spotted us. Come on. <laughs> Diamond Detective Agency, we filtered the choke on the way to your throat. Oh, 
for Pete's sake, Diamond, aren't you ever serious? Well, Lieutenant Levinson, what's the matter with you? Did someone swipe one of your ulcers? Now, stop that. I wouldn't call you unless it was something important. I know. You're losing Sergeant Otis to Barnum and Bailey. You stop that. Ringling Brothers? Don't be ridiculous. I'm not. What other sideshow could boast a pointed head with a gray suede face? Diamond, I have an important message for you, so for the sake of my sour stomach, act like a normal human being for five minutes. Ah, uh, sure to be a strain, but go ahead. Bill Garrett wants to see you. Bill Garrett? Yes. He goes to the electric chair tonight at 8 o'clock and he wants to see you. Well, he can't sit in my lap. Now, look, I don't like the type any more than you do. He's going to die, so why the cracks? The guy he shot had a wife and two kids. Maybe you want me to make cracks about them? All right, all right, but will you see him? It's his last request. All right, sure. I'll call the warden and tell him you'll be up. Well, you be sure and put in the call. If Otis does it, the warden will get so confused they'll turn Garrett loose and toast me. Well, in my business, you get a lot of screwy ones. But you never know where they'll lead, so if you've got that nervous, got to get in trouble feeling, you follow it up. I put in a call to my lovely redhead, Helen Asher, and told her I'd be a little late, but to keep the bottle spinning anyway. Then I took off for Sing Sing. Hello, Garrett. Hello, Simon. I'm glad you got here. Wouldn't miss it. Neither would I, unless I could help it. Look, Garrett, I'm busy, and you're on a tight schedule. Now, what's on your mind? Well, it's like this, Rick. The name's Diamond. Okay. I know you hate guys like me, but I ain't ashamed of what I've done. That's the way I lived. That's the way I'm going to go out. Now, if you want someone to listen to you feel sorry for yourself, you'll be along in a few minutes before eight. Uh, maybe I better forget it. You ain't got no use for nothing. I got use for everything that doesn't include guys like you. There's no middle with me, Garrett. It's got to be right or wrong. And uh, right keeps you out of trouble, huh? Well, not always. But it helps people to live together. Okay. I guess you know I got a kid brother. Yeah. He's going on 17, and it looks like the family's going to have another guy for you to hate. What do you want me to do? He thinks I'm a big shot. I want you to convince him I'm not. Oh? What's he done? I don't know, but he's just like I was when I was that age. Tough, wise guy. He wants to be just like me. Oh. Has he been up here to see you? Yeah, but that don't change his mind. Just makes him madder at the world. I ain't getting soft, see, but he's a great little guy and he's smart. A lot smarter than I was. It's just going to take someone to show him which foot to get off on. Ah, okay, okay. What's his first name and where can I find him? His name's Eddie. He's got a club they call the Panthers. Uh, you know the kind. Yeah, with me it was the Brownies. It's over on 26th Street and he's got a girl he told me about. Her name's Nancy Hyde. She lives with a rant over 37th Street. Okay, I'll see what happens. He's tough. Oh, lots of guys are tough, Garrett. Sometimes if they get a break, they turn out to be so tough, they even get to be All-American. Hey, I'd like that. I'd like to see the kid get to be All-American. That might be a little difficult, but you never know. Maybe they've got television down there. The kid's around here, boss. Okay, Eddie, go on in. Thanks, muscle man. Hiya, Mr. Parrish. Hello, Eddie. We took care of old man Thompson like you said. Good, good. You, uh, beat him up bad? Bad enough. Yeah, yeah, we really waked him over. We got Shut up, I'll do the talking. What do you think's running this mob anyway? Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Get a load of that, Bart. We got a big shot. Yeah, yeah. You run your bunch pretty good, don't you, Eddie? I run the whole club. The Panthers got 23 members now. You hear that, Bart? Twenty-three members, and Eddie's the big boss. <laughs> I like that. I like you, Eddie. You and me and the twenty-three Panthers is gonna go a long way. Well, that's something I wanted to talk to you about, Mr. Parrish. We're getting awful tired of just beating up guys. We want to start doing something big, like knocking over gas stations or something. <laughs> so you want to start doing something big, huh? Like knocking over gas stations, huh? Yeah. Well, you got a lot to learn, Eddie. Oh, I've been doing all right, ain't I? Well, you're going to do a lot better. How would you and the Panthers like to start making some really big cash? Hey, we'd like that. Shut yeah. up. We... <laughs> well, what does the boss say? The boss says great. What do we do? It's a cinch. Bart, go out in front and see that we ain't disturbed. Yeah, sure thing, boss. Bart carries a gun, don't he, Mr. Parrish? Yeah, Eddie. He carries a big one. I'm going to carry one someday. Sure you are. You're going to be a big shot. But you got to learn first. You got to start from the bottom to be a big shot. 
Now, here's the pitch. You get your gang together and explain that this... Swipe cars, so we swipe cars. I don't know, Ed. Beating up guys is one thing, but swiping cars is pretty dangerous. Look, it's a cinch. We go out in the road someplace, and one of us thumbs a ride. Huh? When the car stops, we all jump in. Later on, we knock the guy over the skull and take the car. Oh, stealing cars is a tough rap. If you get caught, but we don't get caught, see? If we catch a stoop out in the road someplace, it'll take him a long time to get to a phone. We drive the car to Mr. Parrish's warehouse and collect 50 bucks. Easy. I don't know. You better know. You're in a gang and that means you're in on it whether you like it or not. Okay, okay, Ed. You're the boss. Okay. We pull the first job tonight. The, the, I, I thought you had a date with Nancy. Oh, I got a date. I can break it. She does what I tell her. Yeah, but... Hey, what do you want? Yeah. This is a private club. I'm, uh, looking for Eddie Garrett. Who wants him? Nobody for a present, but I'm still looking for him. Well, beat it. You smell like a cop. You got a good nose. That's pretty close. Hey, just Shh, some... Shut up. We ain't seen any. Uh, yeah, that's right. We ain't seen him. Okay, but if you do, tell him I got a message from his brother. From my... From his brother? Yeah. Tell him that if you see him. Oh, oh wait a minute. I'm Eddie Garrett. Good for you. Proud of it? Oh, you're a wise guy, ain't you? I'll tell you later. Your brother says he thinks you're in trouble, are you? Trouble? <laughs> that's a hot one. What made him think that? He runs around with it. He says you think you're a big shot. Maybe I do. Then you're in trouble, Sonny. Oh, what are you talking to this guy for, Eddie? He talks crazy. Why don't we throw the bummer out? How are you going to do it? Grow 12 feet? Oh, you're a pretty wise guy, you are. You wouldn't act so wise on the other end of a shiv. Shut up, Jim. Come on, get out of here. What about this wise guy, Ed? You want to be left alone with him? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, but I'd still like to wake this wise guy over. <laughs> Hey, hey, what's the idea? You tripped me. Ed, you see that? That's why he's got tripped me. You're pretty clumsy, Sonny. Now beat it. No, wh- why you... You hate him? Beat it. You're lucky you didn't pull that knife, Jim. You'd look pretty silly with a broken arm. Yeah. Well, okay, okay, wise guy. I'll see you again. Now tell me what you want, and then you'll get out of here, too. Nice clubhouse you got. It's all right. It's, uh, six o'clock. So it's six o'clock. Doesn't it bother you? Two more hours and your brother dies. So what? So he doesn't want you to end up the same way. Don't you worry about me, mister. Your brother's worried about you. He wants me to help you. How about it? I don't need no help. You're a copper. Guys like you that sent my brother to the chair. I'm not a cop, Eddie, but I used to be. You ain't a cop? No, but if I was just a plumber and I had the chance to put your brother away for a killing, I'd do it. Yeah, I thought so. You look like the type. You're still a copper and you're no good. Now go on, get out of here. I don't need no help from a lousy copper. I don't need no help from anybody. Hey, Eddie. Oh, didn't know you was entertaining. This guy's just going. Come on in, boy. Let's go, Eddie. What do you mean, let's go? I want to talk to you. We'll go up to my place. I ain't going nowhere with a lousy copper. Copper? Yeah, yeah, he's been in here preaching to me. Better leave, Flatfoot. Come on, Eddie. No, I ain't going nowhere. You heard what the kid said. Now look. Yeah. Well, well, well. Guns and everything. Like it? Goes bang, bang. Hey, hey, wait a minute, Bart. I don't want no killing. Oh, don't worry, Eddie. I'm just going to put the flat foot to sleep. Oh. Hey, you slugged him with the gun. Mr. Parrish wants to see you about tonight. Huh? Okay. He, he ain't dead, is he? No, no. I just tapped him a little one. Come on. Tap me a little one. <laughs> that was the biggest understatement of the year. He tapped me so little, my health, my head felt like it was in sections. I lay there for a while trying to find the piece that did my thinking, and when I started coming out of it, it was like trying to open a beach umbrella in a 90-mile wind. I didn't know how long I'd been lying there, but when I finally opened my eyes, I, I saw something that made the beating a welcome relief. Hey, look, Lieutenant. He's with us again. <laughs> oh, no. Shut up, Otis. Rick, how do you feel? Uh, I wish I was dead. Oh, now it can't be that bad. No. Well, you lie down here and look up at Otis. Makes you want to slash your wrist. Hey, he's riding me again. You're all right. Here, try to, try to sit up. Without my head? Oh. Now, who beans you? A guy named Bart Lippett. 
He didn't know me, but I recognized him. Small-time muscle man works for Sam Patton. A lovely group. So how the devil did you find me? Well, we certainly weren't looking for you. We came down to pick up Bill Garrett's kid brother. Pick him up? What for? Your job's ho- homicide. Yeah, he and another kid beat up an old storekeeper last night. The guy's in pretty serious condition. Oh, no. How serious, Walt? Well, the doctors say critical, but he does stand a chance. Hey, now, you, wait a minute. Where, where are you going? What time is it? Seven o'clock. Why? I got an hour to keep a promise. I hope that storekeeper doesn't die. If he does, Sing Sing will be building their electric chairs in tandem. <laughs> In just a moment, we will return to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. But first, traffic accidents claim a victim on the average of more than one a minute, all day, every day in the year. The difficulty is that people continue to think of the horror of accidents as always happening to someone else. It never occurs to us that we may be killed dashing out to lunch tomorrow. The National Safety Council reports that in almost every motor vehicle accident, there is one or more violations of the law. Speed, drink, and carelessness being the worst offenders. Every motorist and pedestrian is urged to support actively the safety movement in his own community. Be careful. The life you save may be your own. And now back to Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Well, the law was after Eddie Garrett, and I'd promised his brother that I'd keep him out of trouble. If the storekeeper died, Eddie was sure to get life. But if he lived and I could make him give himself up, I'd stand a good chance of helping him. I remember that Garrett had said Eddie had a girl, so I took off to 37th Street in a hurry. Yes? Are, uh, are you Nancy Hyde? Why? Well, I, uh, I'm looking for Eddie. Oh, uh, well, I, I haven't seen him. Huh? You're a little nervous. Well, no, I'm just a little worried. About Eddie? Who are you? Oh, well, I know his brother. He wanted me to find Eddie. Oh, his brother. Well, I don't know where Eddie is, and you stay away from him. You, uh, don't approve of Eddie's brother? No, and I'm not afraid to say it. Eddie's a good boy, but he worships his big brother, and he thinks he's tough. So you can just go tell his brother that Eddie's not going to turn out like him. Not if I can help it. Oh, he's not if I can help it either. I am a private detective, Nancy. My name's Diamond. You said that Eddie's brother wants you to find Eddie. He does, but he wants to keep Eddie out of trouble as much as you do. Oh, well, honestly, Mr. Diamond, I don't know where Eddie is. He called me a little while ago and said that he might be able to come over later. And he didn't say where he was? No. Hmm. Well, if he does come, try to keep him here, and I'll get in touch with you later on. All right, Mr. Diamond. I went down the hall and back down the steps in a hurry. When I reached the street, I stopped and waited for a cab to come along. I took out a cigarette and was just about to light it when I spotted a shadow ducking in behind the doorways and making its way up the street toward me. I slipped back in the building and waited. Hey, what is this? Take it easy, Eddie. Oh, the copper. Let me go. That storekeeper you beat up may die. I'm taking you down to the station. What? That's right. He's in a bad way. Now, come on. Let's go. I might have known it. But you said you wanted to help me. That's a laugh. This is the only way I can help you. Oh, sure. Well, if the law picks you up, you won't, have, won't stand a chance. You may even get shot. Well, I'll take my chances. Not tonight, you won't. Let me go. Let go of my arm. Now, look. I don't want to hurt you, so stop kicking. Yeah, this is swell, this is. Everybody wants to help me. My brother's going to chair, and if that old guy dies, I'm going to prison. Please let me go. I just as soon get shot. I ain't got nothing to live for. Now, take it easy, kid. The old boy might not die, then we can work something out. <laughs> what was that? That's Nancy. That's Nancy. Let me go. Come on. I turned him loose, and we both went up the stairs three at a time. We reached the door, and I got that lousy feeling. The screams had stopped, and from the way she was yelling... It would take a lot to shut her up, like dying. It's locked. Nancy. Nancy. She don't answer. Look out. She ain't here. Look in the other room. Nancy. Nancy. She ain't in here either. Hey, what's the gun for? Get rid of the window, quick. What's the matter? That car driving off down there, you know it? Oh, why? Because I saw your girl being pushed in it. I couldn't take a shot because it might have hit her. They took it down the fire escape. Yeah. Eddie, Eddie, who would want to kidnap Nancy? I don't know, I don't know. You're working for Sam Parrish, aren't you? How did you know that? I recognized his muscle man just before he put me to sleep. I ain't saying nothing. Now look, you stupid little idiot. Aren't you worried about your girl? Yeah, sure I'm worried about her. What's that got to do with Mr. Parrish? Nothing, maybe. But if he heard that the law was looking for you, he might be afraid you'd talk. 
What were you and your gang doing for Paris? I, I, I can't tell you. Okay, okay, then you're on your own. If the girl gets killed, they'll let you cry about it for the rest of your life and sing sing. I'm through trying to help you, Eddie. You're too far gone. You're no good. Wait, wait a minute, Mr. Diamond, please. I'll tell you, I don't want Nancy hurt. Please, I, I don't know what to do. Well, first, try to take it easy. And then tell me what you were doing for Sam Parrish. Well, we used to beat up guys that wouldn't sell enough numbers. Mr. Parrish controls a lot of the numbers racket. We were supposed to start swiping cars. He was going to pay us 50 bucks a car. Oh, call him. Call him? Yeah. Here's the phone. But for Pete's sake, don't let on that you know anything's up. Okay. I want you to tell him that you've decided to give yourself up. Okay. If he's got Nancy, I'll kill him. You just be sure and tell him that you're going to give yourself up. He'll tell you whether he's got Nancy or not. Yeah. Mr. Parrish? Uh, Eddie, is that you? Yeah. Oh, good, good. Me and Bart have been looking all over town for you. The uh, cops are after you. I know. I'm going to give myself up. You what? Yeah, it's better this way. They might go easy around me if I do. Look, kid, you, you got to stop talking like that. You're going to be a big shot. You can't go turning yourself into the law. No, I'm going to do it. Hey, uh, you come down here and talk to me first. Uh, where are you? It's no good, Mr. Parrish. I'm leaving for the station right now. Eddie. Yeah? You ain't going nowhere unless you want to see your girlfriend scooped out of the East River. You have got her. Sure, I got her. So you get on down here. I just left her and she don't look so happy. She's with Bart and you know Bart. Why, well, you dirty no Buck, good grease ball. You get out of my office in 20 minutes or I'll call Bart and the little girl dies. Now get down here. Hello. Hello. He's got her, Mr. Diamond. I got to get down there or he'll kill her. Where's his office? He don't have Nancy there. He told me she was with Bart. I, I got to go. You do and he'll kill you. Then he'll do the same with the girl. You can't take the chance. What are we going to do? I only got 20 minutes. Does Parrish have another office or a hideout? No, no. Wait a minute. Yes, he does. Sure, the warehouse. He told me about it this afternoon. We were supposed to take our stolen cars there. Okay. I'll call Lieutenant Levinson and tell him to meet us there. You think that's where they got Nancy? I hope so. 20 minutes isn't much time. I put in a call to Walt and briefed him in a hurry. Then Eddie and I took off to the warehouse. It was at the foot of 14th Street, and by the time we got there, we had only ten minutes left. The building was as dark as a foggy grave and locked tight. We found a window in the basement and finally jimmied our way in. You all right, Eddie? Yeah, but I, I can't see nothing. Come on. That looks like some stairs. Maybe we guessed wrong. Hey, what was that? I don't know, but there was a jockey on it. Come on. There's a light. Yeah, a little office in the back. Now, you stay here. There might be some shooting. Uh -uh. The Bart's in there with Nancy. I want in on it. This is no time to argue. Now, back over against the wall. Gosh, I bumped into some boxes or something. Oh, shut up. Look, it's Bart. Hold still. Who's there? What are we going to do? He's got a gun. Answer him. Answer him? Yeah, quick. Come on, come on. Who's out there? Uh... It's uh, me, uh, Bart, Eddie. Huh? What are you doing here? We've been looking all over for you. I'm on the lam. The cops are after me, so I remembered this place. Well, ain't that nice. The boss has been worrying about you. Come on back, Eddie. <laughs> Got a friend of yours here. Go on. I'm going to circle him. Uh, sure, sure, Bart. Uh, I'm coming. Come on over here where I can see you. There. That's it. Okay, kid. Now hold it right there. Hey, what's the idea? Well, the boss is afraid you'll do some talking if the cops pick you up, so I got orders to knock you off. Sorry, kid. You know how it is. Drop it, Bart. Hey, hey he wait. drop it! Oh, you, you love it! Duck, Eddie! <sighs> you got him. Yeah, thanks for the assist. Let's see if the girl's in the office. Yeah, they got a gag in the mouth. Nancy. Oh, she's okay. There. Oh, Nancy, honey. Oh, Here, I'll get those ropes off you. Man, I'm in some pretty bad trouble, but I swear if I get out of it, I'll go straight. Oh, you'll be all right, Eddie. I know you will. Oh, ain't that cozy. Look out, Eddie. Hold it right where you are. Well, things are really getting crowded. That's Parrish, Mr. Diamond. I guess. You shoot pretty good, Diamond. I saw you get Bart. I guess I'm going to have to pay you back for that. The law's on its way. So they find a morgue. Eddie! Oh, shoot Nancy, please. Shoot me, but don't shoot Nancy. 
Here they come, Parrish. You seem pretty anxious, mister, so I'll let you have it first. No! No, you can't! Look out, Eddie! Oh, Eddie! You slob, Parrish! Oh, Eddie! Eddie, he's hurt, Mr. Diamond. Don't, Parrish, but his is permanent. Eddie. Eddie, where you hit? I think in the stomach. We'll get you to a hospital quick. You saved my scalp and you jumped in front of me. Thanks. I hope that perish. I paid him in full. What time is it? 8.35, Eddie. Oh. Well, funny, I don't feel so bad about my brother now that it's over. He'd probably be sore about me helping a cop. But you know, I don't mind. Especially when it's a nice guy like you. Well, Walt busted in. They got Eddie to the hospital. Otis tripped over a pipe and broke his big toe, so they had to throw him in the wagon along with Eddie and his girl. Eddie recovered all right, and so did the storekeeper. He helped beat up. The kids all got two years, sentence suspended. Because my lovely redhead, Helen Asher, convinced the judge that the boys would become much better citizens if they worked out their two years on her farm upstate milking the cows. Before Eddie left for the farm, Helen had him over to the house and he brought his girlfriend. Well, we gotta be going, Mr. Diamond. I gotta catch a train. Thanks for the swell dinner, Miss Asher. It was my pleasure, Eddie. It was wonderful. Oh, Mr. Diamond. Yes, Nancy? Miss Asher was telling me that you sing. Oh, Miss Asher is sometimes afflicted with an extreme case of blabitis. Well, hey, I'd like to hear you sing something before I take off. Would you, Mr. Diamond? Certainly he would. Do you want it after I tear out your pretty tongue at the lungs or before you, dear sweet little girl? Oh, you mustn't talk that way in front of guests, Rick. They'll think we're married. Well, he's not as tough as he sounds. Now, come on, Mr. Diamond, give. Yeah, I'll give you a hit in the head. Come on, after Eddie hears me, uh, he may realize that crime does pay. It's on your pretty head. Just sing. Stop making like a prima donna. What do you want to hear? Oh, uh, something romantic. Oh, bless your little pointed head. You kids go sit on the sofa. Okay. Come on. Where are you now that I need you? Now that I want you so badly, I'm crying. Where are you? Where did fate lead you? Funny how I dreamed you'd still be standing by. Anyone? I had you at my beck and call. I called you any time at all. I guess I took you too much for granted. I never thought I'd lie awake and sigh. Where are you now that I need you? Now that I love you so madly, I could die. Oh, how was that, kids? Rick, look. Well, how do you like that? They're stealing our stuff. <laughs> Come on, Eddie, break it up now. you got to catch a train. Mm. Eddie. Mm. Nancy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Sheldon Leonard, William Tracy, Mary Shipp, Sidney Miller, and Bill Conrad. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evening. Shows like Hollywood Calling, Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, The Ethel Merman Show, and the NBC Symphony. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial turned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective.
This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here, transcribed, is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. And now, Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. If you happen to wake up some morning and spot something walking in front of your house and it looks like Santa Claus with jaundice, don't turn the hose on him. He's not on fire. He's just wearing the newest thing in men's fashions. They call it the bold look. And it's supposed to be the masculine answer to Dior's new look for women. It's an answer, all right. Like walking up to your best girlfriend and slicing her down the middle with a broadsword. Now, if you haven't seen it yet, just close your eyes and try and picture yourself in the bold look. Imagine walking down Fifth Avenue, very casual, decked out in a new bright purple non-shrinking suit, pastel shirt, yellow maybe, hand-painted tie and argyle socks. Got it? What do you think? Pretty bad. About the only thing I can think of that's more gruesome is that little murder I got mixed up in last week. It started in a house out on Long Island. A guy named Harry Baker was getting involved with his private secretary. Here are the papers you wanted, Mr. Baker. Oh, thank you, Connie. What time is Mrs. Baker going shopping? She didn't say. This afternoon sometime. Oh, where is she now? In her room. Come here, Connie. Harry, no. Supposing she comes down. I didn't see you last night. I missed you. I got hold of the man you wanted. His name's Nat Fox. He wants 500 for the job. Oh? Well, what's the matter? That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Connie, I had a lot of time to think last night. And? Well, I'm not sure. I don't know if this is the thing to do. You don't know? Oh, Harry, we've gone through this a dozen times, and I won't go through it again. If you haven't got the backbone... Oh, my dear, you know it's not that. No, I do not. I'm sick and tired of living this way. Not being able to be seen with you, watching you being pushed around by that old shrew... Oh, I'm not going through the whole thing again. Please, Connie, can't we wait for a while? My wife's well past 60. Sooner or later... And in the meantime, you live off the skimpy little allowance she doles out to you. No, Harry, no. I want us to live like two normal people. If you're going to start changing your mind just when it looks like we can have all these things, I'm through. Now, Connie, wait a minute. No. If you want me, then you've got to go through with it. Well? You know I want you. I love you more than anything in the whole world. Then get that old biddy out of the way, or I promise you, you'll never see me again. <sighs> All right. Oh, don't look so worried, darling. Nothing's going to go wrong. I already fixed it with this Nat Fox. You'll be in the department store the same time as your wife. Oh, Harry, think of the wonderful life we can have. All that money's going to be ours. We can go to Europe and live the way we should. Yes, sir. Uh... No, I'm a little worried about this Nat Fox. Uh, I'll give him the $500, but if he finds out what happened, he'll be in a good position to blackmail us. Don't you worry about Mr. Fox. He's my affair. You just leave everything to me. Well, well, well. Hello, Otis. Uh, what do you want, Diamond? I thought I'd drop in and see the lieutenant. Aren't you glad? You want me to make you feel good or do you want the horrible truth? The truth, Otis. I'll steal myself. You turn my stomach. I couldn't without a bulldozer. Ah, uh, very funny. <laughs> when are you going to go on a diet, Sergeant? Eh? You're beginning to look like Dumbo with a goiter. Uh... Hello, Walt. Oh, no. Who's dead this time? No, don't be silly. I just came down to talk to see how you were. I don't believe it. Say something without corpse in it. Your smile is like the first dawn of an Indian summer. You said Indian. So what? 
If you said it, he's dead. All right. If that's the way you feel about it, goodbye and good luck. Oh, now, wait a minute. Stop being an idiot. That's all right, Walt. I understand. Now, come back here. You know very well I'm glad to see you. And you think just because I come down to see you, I've gotten mixed up in some kind of a murder. Oh, a fine friend. Now, you stop acting like that. You're a worse hand than Otis. That did it. I'll never send you a good dead body again. Is that a promise? Is what a promise? That you'll never send me a good dead body again. Oh, want me to break the law, huh? Hold out police evidence. Of course not. You know I was only kidding. Just like the police force, making fun of a corpse. I have never made fun of a corpse. So that's what's the matter. What? Too serious. That's what's ruining your stomach. Oh, now, stop that. You know what's wrong with my stomach. I've been working too hard, that's all. So the next time I find a corpse, you'll want to take a vacation. This precinct is more corrupt than I thought. What do you mean, corrupt? Just what I said. I find you a corpse and you won't even look at it. You want to go on a vacation. I don't want to go on a vacation. I'll look at the corpse. What corpse? The one you wanted me to look at. There you go, acting like I've gotten mixed up in another killing. Trying to make it look like the corpse is mine. What? Well, it's not my corpse. It isn't? No. Well, whose is it? Well, you know. You tried to frame me with it. I did not. Don't you try to shove that body off on me. Yeah, what is it? Oh, hello, Helen. It's for you, Rick. Thanks. Hi, baby. I'll hold it a minute. Walt, you better do something about that body. Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah. Otis, put in the general alarm. Diamond's found another killing. Oh, wait a minute. No, Walt, it's your killing, remember? Oh, yeah. Forget about the general alarm, Otis. I've got... Oh, Diamond. Sure, Helen. I'll meet you at the store. Oh. Sure, sure. I love you. Bye. Oh. Walt. What a funny look. You're all red. Oh. Walt. Walt, you're turning blue. Oh. Well, I got to go shopping with Helen. I hope you find the body. Bye. Lieutenant, I'm still waiting. Sergeant. Yeah, Lieutenant? Shut up. I don't know why I do that to Walt, but I always get such a kick out of tying him up in knots. When he takes the bait, he goes for it hook, line, and sinker. It's a good thing Helen called and asked me to go shopping with her. He might have blown a fuse. I don't generally like the idea of shopping, but she said it was Francis's birthday, and any kind of an afternoon with Helen could always work its way into a wonderful evening. What do you think I ought to get him, Rick? I'll get him some shirts or something. Hey, look at these. Rick, get away from that counter. What's the matter? My hip's too big? Oh. Oh, I wonder if these come in baby blue. Rick, now stop that. People are looking. Is there something I can do for you? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You seem to be interested in the lingerie. Is there something I can show you? Oh, uh, I'm looking for something for a birthday. Oh, well, then may I suggest a nightgown, perhaps? We have some lovely numbers. Uh, This is for a butler. A butler? Uh, Yes. Oh, then you were thinking of getting something for the lady, too. Uh, No. Just seeing whether the baby blue went with my eyes. Well, really. Oh, come on, Helen. Rick, she must think you're crazy. Five minutes more and there wouldn't have been the slightest doubt. (laughs) This is fun. Rick. Hmm? That woman. What woman? The elderly one over there with the mink stove. Oh, yeah. I just saw her put a box of stockings in her purse without anyone seeing her. You saw her? Yes, but the clerk didn't. And she left the counter without paying. I know. You know? Oh, sure. I spotted her five minutes ago. Not a very good shoplifter. That's stealing. Shouldn't we tell the manager or something? Oh, the store detectives are sure to have her spotted. Why don't they arrest her? Point of law, baby. They can't put the arm on her until she steps out of the store. Now, look. She's going out the front door. Just watch. She's out. She's just standing there on the sidewalk. Oh, that's funny. They must have spotted her. She was too careless. Look, that big car is pulling up and she's getting in. They're driving off. Well, maybe the store dicks were looking out the window. Well, I'm going to tell that clerk. I remember her description. Oh, now, Clerk! Helen. Yes? Oh, did your husband decide that they did go with his baby blue eyes? He's not my husband, and that's not why I called you. Uh, she thinks yellow goes with my complexion better. Oh, yeah. Really? Now, stop it, Rick. That woman who was just at your counter. Uh, which one? We've only had about 600 this morning. Now, don't be flip with me. The elderly woman who was just here looking at the stockings. The one with the beautiful mink stole. It was beautiful, wasn't it? Then you noticed her. Of course. That was Mrs. Zabel. 
Baker, one of our best customers. Well, Mrs. Baker is a shoplifter. Oh, you must be mistaken. I tell you, I saw her steal some sacking. I tell you, you are mistaken. Oh, now, look, look. I, I was going to stay out of this, but what Miss uh, Asher says is true. I saw her, too. Miss Asher? Yes. Oh, you have an account with us, don't you, Miss Asher? Until you started telling me I was mistaken about that woman. Oh, just one moment. Oh, Mr. Pennywig! Mr. Pennywig! What are you doing? I'm calling the manager. The manager? Yes, Miss Asher. I would prefer to have him explain it to you. Yes, Miss Phillips. What is it? Well, I'll tell you what it is. Don't ever put Miss Phillips in the toy department. She's so nearsighted, she's liable to think the electric train is the 8th Avenue subway and climb on it at 5 o'clock. I what? beg your pardon? Uh, Mr. Pennywig, this is Miss Helen Asher. Oh, how do you do, Miss Asher? I heard a lot about you. You're going to hear a lot more. Oh, is something wrong? Yes. Yes, something is wrong. Miss Asher here spotted a woman stealing some stockings, and when she reported it to your clerk here, she said she was crazy. I saw it, too. Is this true, Miss Phillips? Uh, yes, sir. It was Mrs. Lillian Baker. Oh. I was just trying to do the store a favor, but since you don't seem to think that the customer means anything around here... I'll see that my account is closed out. Oh, now, just one moment, Miss Asher. Uh, may I talk with you in private? I don't see why. Come on, baby. I know a joint on Broadway where we can get things without the lip that goes with it. Come on. Oh, please, Miss Asher. It's about the shoplifter, Mrs. Lillian Baker. You can tell me right here. I must rely on your integrity to keep this a secret. You see, we know that Mrs. Baker stole those stockings. She steals something nearly every day. What? She's very wealthy, very eccentric, and very much a kleptomaniac. Oh. Her husband handles all her affairs, and he's instructed us to watch her and send him the bills for the goods she steals. Oh. Well, can't you break her the habit? Her husband was like his pants in the family vault every night. Yes. She's under a doctor's care, and he advises letting her continue, but without her knowing that anyone else has found out her secret. Uh, she's quite old, you see, and her husband assures us that discovery might be very disastrous. Oh, I see. Well, I'm very sorry. I didn't know. Well, I'm not. This pixie behind all the unmentionables can get a person steamed up enough to cause a minor explosion. Well, I was just doing my duty, sir. Mr. Pennywig. Mr. Pennywig. Now what? Uh, yes, uh, well, what is it? Oh, Mr. Pennywig, we've had a jewel robbery. What? Yes, sir. Three of our most priceless gems are missing. Oh, dear. Mrs. Baker? I don't know, sir. We watch her very closely when she's looking at jewelry. But five minutes after she'd gone, we discovered the loss. Was it of any consequence? Was it? $300,000 worth. Oh, oh. Hey, wait a minute. Who else was in the jewelry department? Oh, several people. I'm so upset. Take a look over there. Where? Over there. The man in the wide ten stripe near the linen counter. Excuse me, I've got to go call Mr. Baker. Now, wait a minute. Yes? Maybe Mrs. Baker didn't lift those rocks. That man over there, was he in the jewelry department? Why, come to think of it, yes. Oh, now wait here. Rick! Hello, Nat. Hey, what are you doing? Now, take it easy. I just want to see what you got in your pockets. Well, well, Richard Diamond. You must think you're still on the force. Someone just lifted some stones out of the jewelry department. You still in the racket? In a star like this? Are you crazy? No, but I thought maybe you were. Now, let's see your pockets. You ain't no cop. Go on and peddle your papers. You look pretty silly with a broken arm. Okay. Okay, you don't have to get rough. I'm clean. Now, well, that's better. I'll turn them inside out. Hey, what's going on here? Now, uh, meet Nat Fox, one of the better-known jewel thieves. Yes. He was in the shop about the time Mrs. Baker was. Oh, I've quit the rackets. I, uh, I just like to look now and then. Oh. Well, at least he hasn't got them on him. Oh, oh. oh what are we here? Gum wrappers. I like to chew gum. Oh, well, you chew a lot of it. Better call the law, Mr. Pennywig. Or if you say right away... Go to the devil. Why, Rick! He's getting away. Stop him. Oh, relax, relax. We can always pick him up. I want to take a look at your jewelry department. Nat Fox didn't have the jewels on him, but as he did have a lot of gum wrappers, the first thing I wanted to do was to case everything in the jewelry department. It was an old stunt. The thief chews a lot of gum, palms some jewels, and sticks them in the gum. Then he sticks the gum under something, and a confederate comes along later and scoops it up. If the thief gets spotted at the scene, he's clean, just like Fox was when I searched him. Well, I looked under everything, on everything, in everything. There was a lot of gum, all right, but no jewels in any of it. Rick, couldn't someone have picked it up already? Well, it's the only thing I can come up with, unless this Mrs. Baker really did steal them. Well, uh, the police will be here in a few minutes. No, uh, a clerk. Yes, sir? 
can you remember who was in the jewelry department when you discovered the jewels were missing? Well, this Mr. Fox and Mrs. Baker had already left. But I believe they were several women. Yes, there weren't any men, just several women. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Thank you. Come on, Helen. The robbery detail can take it from here. Well, uh, thank you very much for your help, Mr. Diamond. Oh, uh, where can the police get in touch with you if they want to ask any questions? They know me. And if you ever need any guidance, just look me up in the book on the private detective. Can't miss it. The one with the biggest ad. Helen and I got out of there just as the prowl cars were pulling up at the curb. I stuck my tongue out at a few old friends and climbed into her king-size convertible. We took a couple of turns around Central Park and she dropped me off at the 5th Precinct and my dear old buddy, Lieutenant Levinson. Don't you dear old buddy me. You get out of here. Temper, temper, temper. I will not be subjected to any more of your fiendish humor. I won't go through another one of these routines of yours for promotion. <laughs> I promise I'll be good. Oh, no, you don't. That's the most dangerous thing you could say. Yeah, what is it? Suicide, Lieutenant. See? See, look what happens. It already has happened, Lieutenant. She did it 20 minutes ago. I wasn't talking to you, Melonhead. Now give me the dope. You got him. You shut up. Yeah, Lieutenant. Oh, not you, bird brain. Let's have the report. Oh, uh, Mrs. Lillian Baker jumped three floors from a balcony. Husband Harry Baker made the report. Port Washington, Long Island. Thank you, Sergeant. What, did he say Mrs. Lillian Baker? Yes, he said Mrs. Lillian Baker. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get out to Long Island. Well, let's go. I'll grab my coat. Now, wait a minute. What makes you think you're coming along? And why in blazes are you interested in Mrs. Lillian Baker? If you know something, by heaven, I'll... Walt, Walt, you're turning blue again. Come on, I'll tell you on the way. I briefed Walt on what had happened back at the store when Helen and I saw Mrs. Lillian Baker lift the hosiery. We reached the Baker estate about three o'clock in the afternoon and drove up a long circular driveway to the big house. The husband, Mr. Harry Baker, met us at the door. Oh. Oh, please come in, gentlemen. Thanks. You, you'll have to forgive me, gentlemen, but I'm still a little upset. My wife was a sick woman, but I never expected her to do anything like this. Where's the body? Out in the garden. Right this way. Have you any idea why your wife committed suicide, Mr. Baker? Oh, Yes. There's the body. You don't mind if I go back inside, do you? I want to ask you some questions, then you can. I understand that your wife was a kleptomaniac. Is that right, Mr. Baker? Why, Why, yes. How did you know? Mr. Diamond here saw her steal something from the store today. You mean the jewels? No, no, I mean the stockings. Did she steal the jewels? Why, yes. I, I found them under her mattress after the store called and told me of the loss. She was a sick woman. She's been stealing things for years, but... She didn't think anyone knew about it. I had an arrangement with the stores that I could take care of all the things she took, but those jewels were too much. I had to confront her with the evidence. And she broke down completely when she discovered we knew her secret. Harry. Oh. Wow. This is my private secretary, uh... Lieutenant Levinson. Richard Diamond. Oh, Miss Constance Loring. Lieutenant Levinson, Mr. Diamond. How do you do? Well, pretty good. I'd like to tell you about it sometime. Don't uh, dead bodies make you a little nervous, Miss Loring? What? Miss Loring was here when my wife jumped. She's already gotten over the initial shock. Oh. Uh, she's been in the library calling some of my firms to tell them I won't be at work for a while. How long has she been here? Why, all afternoon. She's been taking some dictation. With her hat on? Oh, uh, well, you see... Ah, uh, forget I... it. Uh, tell me, did your wife jump from that balcony, Mr. Baker? Yes. Hmm, three floors. About a four-foot railing around the balcony. If you think that there's been any foul play, you can check with her doctor. He'll tell you she could easily take her own life if her secret was discovered. I'd like to talk to him. What's his number? Evergreen 54469. Dr. Leonard Bischoff. Thanks. While you're calling him, Rick, I'd like to see those stolen jewels, Mr. Baker. Certainly. Right this way. Phone's right over there on the stand, Mr. Diamond. Would you open the safe with the lieutenant, Connie? Uh, Mr. Loring... Dr. Bischoff, please. Richard Diamond. Yes. Hello. Dr. Bischoff, this is Richard Diamond. Here they are, Lieutenant. Now, you can easily see why I wouldn't, or should I say, couldn't pay for them. Mm. Is the store coming over to pick them up? No, I told them I would bring them down. What's this all over them? Well, I, I don't They're know. They're all sticky. Got something all over them. That's uh, probably gum, Walt. Gum? Yeah, the kind you chew. 
Well, by the way, Baker, you were right. Dr. Bischoff says your wife was a sick woman, but he didn't think she'd care it to such extremes. Well, we never know what we will do under such stress. No, I, uh, I guess we never do. Oh, Walt, can I use the car for about an hour? It'll take you that long to clean up things around here. Well, you got something? Yeah. Mr. Diamond, if you think... I don't think, Mr. Baker. I find out. Oh, Walt. Yeah? Bye. I went out fast and climbed to the prowl car. I grabbed the two-way radio and put in a call to Sergeant Otis. He gave me the address I wanted, and ten minutes later, I was rolling up in front of an old brownstone where Nat Fox, the not-so-ex-jewel thief, was now living. I went up and knocked on his door. Well, there was nothing like finding out. Well, what do you know? Mr. Baker's residence. Let me speak to Lieutenant Levinson, dear. He's right here. Hello. Walt, I'm over at Nat Fox's place. Now, don't say anything. Right. You remember I told you I spotted him right after the theft and shook him down? Yeah. Well, he's through giving the police department headaches. What do you mean? He can't explain the two bullet holes in his head. I called the station and had them send over the wagon, then I took off for the department store. I was sure that Mrs. Baker hadn't jumped, and I was pretty certain that whoever had knocked off Nat Fox was in on the Baker killing. Oh, hello again, Mr. Diamond. Have you heard we found out who stole those jewels? Nat Fox? Why, no, it was Mrs. Baker after all. Mr. Baker called us back and said that he'd found the stones. Oh, well, that's dandy. Well, I'm going to take your clerk who was in the shop at the time of the robbery. Take him? Yes, I want him to identify someone. I'll have him back in about an hour. Oh, well, I suppose it'll be all right. Uh, George? Yes, sir? Uh, I want you to go along with Mr. Diamond here. He wants you to identify someone. It's official, I guess. It's official, all right. When you point out a thief and a killer, it's always official. Rick, what took you so long? Walt, this is the clerk from the department store where the jewels were stolen. How are you? What's he here for? I want him to see if he can identify someone. Oh, uh, where are Baker and his lovely secretary? In the library. Come on. Now, uh, look, George, I yes, want sir. you to stand outside this door until I call you. Then I want you to come in and see if you've ever seen anyone in the room besides myself and the lieutenant. I'll do my best, Mr. Diamond. That's all I want. Come on, Walt. What are you up to? Surprise. Well, hello. Why, hello, Mr. Diamond. Uh, come in. Thanks. How are you, Connie? I see you've taken off your hat. You're very observing. I sure am. Why did you kill your wife, Mr. Baker? What? All right, I'll word it a little different. Mr. Baker, why did you kill your wife? Are you insane? Everybody asks me that. Uh, maybe I should see a good doctor. Yes, maybe you should. Like Dr. Bischoff, maybe? He's the best in town. Mr. Diamond, you're being ridiculous. I was with Mr. Baker when his wife jumped. You shouldn't have said that. It makes you an accessory. What do you mean? I mean you're lying if you try and tell me Mrs. Baker wasn't killed. She jumped. Over a four-foot railing? Yeah. What are you getting at? How old was your wife, Mr. Baker? Close to 70. Why? Pretty good health, physically? Why, yes, of course. You say you were in the house and neither one of you gave Mrs. Baker a push off that balcony, Connie? Of course. Are you sure you weren't out putting two bullets in a cheap thug named Nat Fox? I don't know what you're talking about. Rick, what is this? Who has the money in the family, Mr. Baker? Why, my wife did. And who does it go to in the event of a death? To me, naturally. Naturally. Walt, Mrs. Baker couldn't have taken those jewels. She was too much of an amateur. Helen and I spotted her swiping stockings at 50 paces. Whoever did lift those rocks was a professional thief. Well, why couldn't my wife have hired Fox to do the job? Who said anything about Fox doing the job? Why, you did. Harry! Uh, shut up. Uh-uh. I just said that Nat Fox was dead and that I thought Connie killed him. I didn't kill anybody. You were just coming back from it when you bumped into us. You hadn't even taken your hat off and you were still carrying your purse. I was just going out. Uh, let me see that purse. You stay away from that. Anything in it? Yeah, well, no gun, but she probably threw it in the river. Nice handkerchief. I'll sue you, Diamond. Look at the handkerchief, Walt. It's sticky. Give me that! Sit down, lover. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought there was a chair there. It's sticky, all right, Walt. That's gum. And gum on the jewels. 
She must have picked them up. Yeah, right after Nat Fox stuck them somewhere. Oh, you're both crazy. She was here with me all day. Yeah. Now, George. Yes, Mr. Diamond. Who's this person? You just relax. I want to find out what's going on, too. Well, George? Yes, sir? That girl was in the shop right after Mrs. Baker. That's a lie. I wasn't. I wasn't. I didn't kill anybody. One of you hired Fox to steal the jewels, then you picked them up and brought them to Baker here. You killed Fox to keep his mouth shut. I did not. Yes, she did. Harry! We might as well tell them. You're right. But I didn't kill my wife. I can't get first-degree murder. Why, you dirty old man. You did kill her. You told me you were going to. You were up there and you pushed her off. Try to prove it. She jumped. No, she didn't. There was a four-foot railing all around that porch. Well, she could have climbed it. That's right, Rick. She could have. But you should keep in touch with her doctor, Mr. Baker. When I was in the store today, I spotted your wife with a cane. A a cane? Yes. Dr. Bischoff said uh, she didn't want to tell you about it because she didn't want you to worry. Didn't want me to worry about what? She had arthritis, Mr. Baker. Dr. Bischoff said she could barely walk upstairs, let alone climb over a four-foot railing. He also told me that under the conditions, her age and everything, she couldn't have lasted more than a year. You were in too much of a hurry. Okay, Walt, you run with the ball from here on. I got a date. Hmm? You didn't tell me what you did after you left me this afternoon. Oh, I just fooled around with Walt for a while to kill the time. By the way, what did you finally get for Francis? Oh, I got him something in the newest fashion. It's called the bold look. What? Well, it was pretty ghastly, but he loved it. Oh, tell me what you got him. Well, a purple suit. Non-shrinkable. Yes, how did you know? Uh, it figured. Go on. A green shirt, one of those hand-painted ties. Rick, where are you going? Oh, I can't stand it. Oh, that's wonderful. What is it, Rick? What is it? I thought you were supposed to be bugged on South Pacific. Oh, is that what it's from? Yep. It was on next to closing, right after Fink's Mules. It does? You better get those tickets again. See what it's all about. Well, give me a preview. You'll hate me in the morning. There's an answer for that. Yeah. Younger than springtime are you softer than starlight are you warmer than winds of june or the gentle lips you gave me gayer than laughter are you sweeter than music are you Angel and lover, heaven on earth are you to me. And when your youth and joy invade my arms and fill... Hey, what's that? What? That, standing in the corner. Oh, Francis, that's Francis, Rick. What are the odds? Oh, yes, sir, it's me. Now, Rick, be careful what you say. That's the new bold look. Well, turn it off. It's getting bilious. Uh, don't you like it, sir? Now, Rick. Hmm? No. Well, uh, uh, Francis, I uh, I think it's... Uh, yes, it certainly is. I think it's rather gay, don't you, sir? The gayest. Oh, my goodness. I forgot something. Does it look like a stomach pump? Forgot something? Yes, miss. The outfit wouldn't be complete without them. Well, hurry up. I'm going to black out any minute. What did you forget, Francis? The spats. Spats? Yes, sir. Seersucker spats, and they were lovely. You have just heard transcribed Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Lorene Tuttle, Joseph Kearns, Peter Leeds, and Joe Forte. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. As Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. I'm a private detective. And as long as I've been in this business, I've found only four things that really make this racket worthwhile. Women, money, women, and more money. Don't, don't misunderstand me, I've got other habits too. I, uh, I drink lots of milk, go to the fights... Dance to uh, Minas Brombo, west of Ebbets Field, and write fan letters to June Allison. But no matter how you slice it up, it still boils down to the same ghastly facts. To drink the gallons of milk, you've got to have root. To go to the fights, you've still got to have it. But you add a little, uh, a little something, or a big something, as the case may be. That's right, a woman. Then if you're going dancing, you like to go to a nice place. Nice place? That's an 8 by 10 dance floor supported by bodies of patrons who couldn't pay the $12 minimum. So now you get into more money and there you are. Women, money, more women and more money. About the fan letters to June Allison? Now, oh, who knows? She never writes back anyway. To show you how I make this money that gets me into so much trouble, let me tell you about a case I got mixed up in. It all started last week during a seance. Quiet, please, Quiet. Now, if you will please place your hands on the table, Mrs. Van Dyke. Lightly, just for fingers touching. Oh, Dr. Langley, I'm so excited. Please, Mrs. Van Dyke. The professor must have complete silence. Oh, I'm sorry, but what's he doing? Uh, he's going into his trance. Uh, uh, Dr. Langley. He's contacted the outer circle. I feel your presence. Who are you? Mama. Mama. Doctor, that voice is calling me. Not too loud. You'll break the contact. But men is my first name. Listen. Spirit, speak again. Who are you? I am Lillian Van Dyke. Oh, that's mother. 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 Mrs. Van Dyke, you must relax. If you continue to disturb the contact, your mother will leave. I'm sorry. Oh, Spirit, I feel that you have a message for someone in this room. Spirit, have you such a message? I have. Then speak. My love. Oh, yes, Mother. You are in grave danger. God yourself. Rely on Dr. Langley. He will help. Yes, Mother. What else? Mother? Oh. Contact has been broken. Your mother will not return again today. Oh, will I be able to speak with her again, Professor? I must speak with her again. She said I was in some kind of danger. If you will return here tomorrow, Mrs. Van Dyke. Mother said to rely on you, Doctor. I intend to. I assure you, your confidence will be rewarded, Mrs. Van Dyke. In the meantime, I suggest you go home and get some rest. Yes, this experience has been rather trying. Goodbye, Professor. I shall see you tomorrow. Until tomorrow, dear lady. Coming, doctor? Uh, I wish to consult with the professor for a moment. I'll be right along. Very well, doctor. I'll wait in the car. Goodbye again, professor, and bless you. Goodbye, and bless you, you old goat. Take it easy. Really, she gets out the front door. Okay. Now, look, Langley, when are we going to pull the job? I'm getting tired of drumming up banshees for old money bags. Let's get those jewels. Look, tomorrow her mother is going to tell her that someone is after her precious jewel collection. Tell her? She'll lock them up in Fort Knox if that happens. Oh, I'm surprised at you, Professor. What if her dear old departed mother tells her to leave them with me for safekeeping? I get it. By the time she gets wise, we'll be in Mexico. <laughs> right. I'll see you tomorrow morning before Van Dyke gets here. We'll plan what we want the voice to say. And for Pete's sake, tell that old witch to sound like a ghost for a change. She came on today like Apple Mary with a hangover. Mr. Diamond? That's right. 
Come on in, but watch the clothesline. Oh, you've been washing. Aren't these a little loud? You should stop around when I'm doing socks. Uh, my name is Van Dyke, Mr. Diamond. Nancy Van Dyke. Miss? Mm-hmm. Well, bully for our side. What can I do for you, Miss Van Dyke? I'm worried about my aunt, Mr. Diamond. Why? Is she playing shortstop for Brooklyn? I don't think I understand that. You're not alone, but I have to keep trying. Uh, why are you worried about your aunt, Miss Van Dyke? Well, lately she's been seeing a man who calls himself Dr. Langley. Uh-huh. Are you of the Long Island Van Dykes? We used to live on Long Island. Why? Well, if you're the same family, you say piggy bank instead of U.S. Mint. We are quite wealthy. Uh-huh. That's like saying Scarface had a gun collection. You, uh, think this Dr. Langley is after your aunt's money, is that it? Yes. He's been taking her to see a clairvoyant, and she claims that he produced her dead mother and that she talked with her. Maybe she's been getting tips on the market. My aunt says that this apparition, or whatever it is, warned her of impending danger. What's the medium's name? He calls himself Professor Leonardo. Uh-huh. What else did the ghost have to say? Well, she said, or it said, to trust Dr. Langley, and that's exactly what my aunt started to do. She even consults him on matters of business. He's completely sold her on this phony Professor Leonardo, and unless I miss my guess, he's got a wandering eye for her jewelry collection. She had it out, and she was showing it to him last evening. What do you want me to do? I want you to prove that this Dr. Langley and the Professor are charlatans. Well, in my business, charlatan is a nice word. These guys are either legit or phony. So if you want me to find out, the fee is 100 a day in expenses. Well, I'll give you a retainer. Is 200 all right? Have you ever seen 200 that wasn't? What's your aunt's name and address? Uh, Mrs. Myrna Van Dyke, 326 Park Avenue. There's your 200, Mr. Diamond. Thank you. If you prove these men are phonies, please report it to my aunt. Then stop by my place and I'll pay you the rest of your fee. 741 Madison Avenue. Oh, uh, 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 Miss Van Dyke, did you ever model bathing suits? No, Mr. Diamond, but I have a very nice one. I got it in the south of France last season. I'll show it to you sometime. I hope it won't be on a hanger. Goodbye, Miss Van Dyke. Well, I had 200 fat clams in my little hot hand and an assignment that didn't look like it was going to be too tough to crack. I needed some information on the professor and the doctor... So I headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station and Walt Levinson's office. Yeah, what is... Oh, no. What do you want, Shamus? Why, Sergeant Otis, what will the lieutenant say when he finds your big feet all over his desk? He won't say nothing. He ain't here. Well, how'd you ever figure that out? Where is he? Out of town. Doing what? Doing his vacation, that's what. Don't tell me he left you in charge. Yeah. What's the matter with that? Hmm. If you've got a few days, I'll tell you about it. Leaving you in charge of homicide is like stopping a leaky faucet with bubble gum. I ain't in charge of homicide, wise guy, but I could do it if I had to. He just asked me to watch his office and take the call. He'd get better results with a parrot. Well, I want some information, Sergeant. Who do I see? Me. I could see more in a barrel of mud. Now, you better lay off, gumshoe. I got instructions to throw you out if you get out of line. Oh, Sergeant, Sergeant, it's nothing personal. You've got beautiful eyes, and... Oh, I love all three of them. It's just that you're... You're obnoxious. Well, okay. But you start calling me any nasty names and you go out of here, I... Uh, 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 Sergeant. Well, you do. Now, what do you want? I want your file on bunco artists. Okay. You gonna look up some of your relatives? Oh, that was a real garter snapper, Sergeant. Yeah, here's the file. Uh, you can do me one more favor. Look up uh, Professor Leonardo. He's a spiritualist. Oh, drunk, huh? I'll get the file. Oh, no, 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 Sergeant. In the phone book, he's like a fortune teller. Oh, one of them guys. That's right. Well, well, well. well. You find something? Yeah, I was looking for this guy, too. Let's see. Dr. R.L. Langley. Here is Dr. Fred Bishop. Here is Dr. Leopold Karnowski. Hey, this guy's been busy. Two convictions, bunker artist. According to this, the guy goes after old dames and gives them a good fleecing. You're positively brilliant, Sergeant. Ah, oh, it ain't nothing. It is when you do it. Did you find the phone number of the professor? Uh, yeah, right here. Professor Leonardo, fortune teller, and clairvoyant. Okay? Oh, want to use the phone? Uh, sure. Only leave a nickel. I wish I had your nose full of them. Professor. 
Professor Leonardo's Psychic Sanctuary. Uh, my name's Applenocker, Harold Applenocker. I'd like to make an appointment with Professor Leonardo. Just what seems to be your problem? Well, uh, you see, it's like this. I, I have a thousand-acre hog ranch in Kentucky, and last week my brother Oni got lit up on juniper juice and fell in the water. It was a pretty deep one, and he done drowned. I was wondering if you could fix it so I could talk with him. Who recommended you to us? Ain't nobody recommended nothing. I just looked it up in the phone book. Well, the professor is rather busy, and his time is expensive. I'm afraid... Oh, shuckins. I ain't worried about money or nothing. I make 40000 a year just off in the hogs, not to mention the still I got going in the back on the hills. Still? Yeah, I got it camouflage. Only time a revenue ever got suspicious was when he saw the moon on the door. It was backwards. The price is $50 a reading and 100 if the professor is able to contact your brother. Fine, fine. I'm going to be busy at the stockyards this afternoon, and uh, I'd like to drop around this evening if I could. How would 8 o'clock be? Just dandy. Goodbye, then, Mr. Applenocker. Uh, bye, you all. Hey, what's going on? I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to have my fortune told, Sergeant. If you want to want to come along, you can put your shoes if you want to. Come along, come oh, on, George, come you're along. you're nuts. Oh, you're just lonesome. Bye, y'all. I left the 5th Precinct and headed for 975 Park Avenue. The way the case looked to date, I was going to be working that night, and my lovely redhead would be unhappy if she had to sit home. Sometimes you get a case that's fun, and this looked like one of those times, so I decided to take Helen with me to Professor Leonardo's. Rick, a fortune teller? Yeah, he brings the dead back, too. Want to go? If he doesn't dig up some of your old jokes. Oh, you are a vicious female. <laughs> Just for that, old Harold Applenocker is going to show up alone. Harold Applenocker? Yep, raise hogs. You know, this little thing you went to market. <laughs> Rick, that tickle. Don't you and Sergeant Otis ever wear shoes? Oh, I like to run around in my bare feet. It's hot. Oh, it's only 90. What would you do on the Sahara? Don't answer that. What time are we due at this spook parlor? Oh, 8 o'clock. That's two hours. In the meantime, let's start a little seance of our own. First, you start by holding hands. Rick. Yes. Oh, are you Mr. Applenocker? Oh, yep, that's me, and this here's my girl, Little Bell. Howdy! Yes. Well, won't you come in? Professor Leonardo isn't back yet, but if you'll just be seated in here, he should be in at any moment. Well, just look at this here room. What are all them figures all over the wall? Uh, them's... Uh, <laughs> those are the signs of the Zodiac. Hey, look at there, Harold. That's a goat. Well, so it is. Bless my little pointed head. Used to raise goats, too, along with the hog. That's the professor now. Good evening, professor. Good evening, good evening. Oh, this must be Mr. Applesocker. Uh, Apple Knocker, professor. And this here's my girl. Lulu Bell. Yep, that's right. Howdy. Yes. <clears throat> well, Mr. Applenocker, I understand you want me to contact your dear departed brother. Well, he wasn't so dear, but he sure done departed. Fell in a pig waller. Of course. Now, if you just take these chairs around this table... Where do you want them to go? No, no. I mean, sit in them. You right here, Mr. Applenocker, and you right next to him, uh... Uh, Lulabelle. Yes, Lulabelle. Howdy. Yes, howdy. I, I mean, if you please, turn off the lights. Yes, Professor. Hey, Lulabelle. Yeah? This is fun, ain't it? Yeah. Now, I must have complete silence, please. <laughs> Did you laugh, Mr. De Lulabelle? Yes, Lula Bell. Howdy. Uh, never mind. Now, silence, please. I'm going into a trance. I call to the world beyond. I wish to speak to the spirit of only Apple Hanger. Duh, Apple Knocker. Correction, the name is Apple Knocker. <laughs> Lula Bell. Howdy. I feel your presence. Who are you, spirit? Speak. I'm only Apple Knocker. Well, Arnie, how the deuce are you? Please, you break the contact. 
Well, ain't it okay if I ask him a few questions? It's not the usual procedure, but we seem to be establishing a precedent tonight. Go ahead. Hey, Orny, you remember Lola Bell, don't you? Yeah, howdy, Lola Bell. I'm very happy to make your acquaintance again, Orny. <laughs> Mr. Applenocker, you must not laugh at the spirits. Uh, the apple hunker. Apple hunker? And Lola Bell. Yes, yes, I know. Howdy. <laughs> now, wait just a moment. What's going on here? Turn on the light. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter? These two people are laughing. Oh, I'm sorry, Professor. But I think you've been taken for that well-known ride. You mean this is some kind of a practical joke? I don't know how practical it is, but it sure got a laugh. <laughs> Professor, their accents. Yeah, they went out when poor Oni jumped up from the pig waller. Oh, I see. Well, look here, young man. I don't see the humor, and it's going to cost you just $100 for this laugh. Oh, it is, huh? Yes, so you're going to walk out of here on crutches. That's the funniest thing you said all night. What do you want, anyway? I just wanted to find out how phony you were. Now, you ought to be ashamed taking advantage of old ladies like Mrs. Van Dyke. Professor. Shut up. Who are you? The name's Diamond. Look me up sometime. I'm in the phone book under detectives. Come on, Ellen. I've got to go see the old girl and wise her up to this louse. <laughs> Helen and I left the professor and his witch and went out on the street. I hailed a cab and put Helen in it and sent her home to wait for me. Twenty minutes later, I was ringing the doorbell at the Van Dyke residence. I stopped ringing and tried my knuckles, and that's when I noticed that the door was ajar. I pushed it open and walked in. I stopped cold in my tracks. The hair on my neck jumped off and hid in the corner. Lying on the bed was what looked like a body. I couldn't tell because it was covered with a sheet. I was sure of one thing. Whatever it was, it was bleeding all over the place. And the first word that came to my mind was murder. I pulled the sheet back and took a look at what could only have been Mrs. Myrna Van Dyke. She was about 60 and she was wearing a quilted house coat. She didn't have to worry about trying to button it because it was pinned together at the neck with a long knife. Well, Diamond, you sure can dig them up, can't you? Huh? Oh, Otis, how did you get here? After you left the station, I called the lieutenant and told him you'd been in and you was acting screwy. He told me to tell you. Now I'm glad I did. Oh, mess, isn't it? Yeah, stabbing through. Looks like she was getting ready for bed. That's a towel around her head, ain't it? Could be her hair, but I doubt it. It says Adam's Hotel on it. Uh, let's take a look around. Oh, hey, got a load of this. What? Over here on the dressing table. Hey, ain't that a wig? It sure is. I want to look at the body again. You can't do that. You ain't supposed to touch anything. I'm just taking off this towel. Hmm, well, well, well. She's bald. Yep, nearly. Now, Otis... Check on Professor Leonardo and Dr. Langley. Uh, they the guys you picked out of the rogues gallery this morning? Yeah. I already did. The doc lives on Child Street, apartment 209. You mean you did all that by your little lonesome? Well, when I talked to the lieutenant, he told me to, just in case. You continually amaze me, Sergeant. Yeah. Hey, now call the wagon and get the coroner over here. Then get some of the boys to pick up the phony professor. Where are you going? Over to the good doctor's house. The body's been dead about an hour. That would, uh... Oh, that would make it between seven and eight. Now, you see if the professor's got an alibi, and I'll check back here. Hey, I don't know whether I'll let you go or not. Sergeant. Yeah? Bye. I went out and grabbed another cab for Charles Street. It was dark out, and the heavy fog was rolling in and staking a claim on the city. By the time I reached the doctor's, it was thick enough to be sliced up and sold in large economy cartons. The doc didn't answer my knock, so I went in anyway. I stumbled into a little two-room joint that looked like a chick sales architectural achievement. The doctor was not home, and neither were his clothes and toothbrush, so I started casing. I tore the place apart and came up with a big fat zero, but that was before I looked in the waste paper basket. Among the trash, I found a rental bill for a hangar and an airplane at the flyaway airport on Long Island. I grabbed the phone and called Sergeant Otis. Yeah? Otis, this is Diamond. Oh, the boys are here now. You were right about the time of death, around 7.30. What about the professor? Uh, we sent a car over to pick him up, but he skipped. We got some dame, though, and she told us that the prof was giving one of them C answers from 7 to 8. Did you check it? Yeah, and you was. Good. Now I'll check and see who gets the dead woman's money in, a, in the event of her death. Well, how am I going to find a lawyer this time of night? Just find him and meet me at the flyaway airport on Long Island. Okay. Did you get the doctor? That's what I'm going to do now. And if this fog keeps up, I've still got a good chance. Sometimes a case starts off like a party and ends up like a funeral. 
this was one of those times, and when it happens, you're never really prepared for it, so you've got to work fast. I used my last ten bucks, uh, besides the two hundred the girl had given me, and got to Flyaway Airport in a hurry. The fog was so heavy, I had to almost kick it aside, but I finally found a row of hangars and started looking. I reached the last hangar when I spotted the plane. It was sitting on the strip, and as I moved nearer, I could see the man. Who's that? Who is that? I got a gun out, Doctor. So just stand the way you are. Who are you? What do you want? I want that little suitcase you've got. I want to take you back to the police. Police? Oh, what on earth for? Mrs. Van Dyke is dead. Been murdered. Oh. Oh, now, come on. Stop that. Well, I, I know nothing about the killing. I swear I had nothing to do with it. What's in that suitcase? Why, just some clothes. Not the Van Dyke collection of jewels? Of course not. What would I want with them? Miss Nancy Van Dyke seemed to think you did. Oh, that's absurd. Here, here, you can look at the bag if you like, sir. Well, I'd like. Let's take a walk over here where we can see some light. If you insist. Where were you between 7 and 8 this evening, Doctor? Why, I was at home. Ah, now, you're a two-time loser. If you're lying, they'll wash your mouth for 20 years. You know about my record, do you? Looked it up this afternoon. Well, I suppose I may as well tell you. I wasn't home until nearly 8. Where were you? Mrs. Van Dyke's apartment. I was supposed to put her jewels in the downstairs vault. What happened? She was dead when I got there. You sure she was dead? Yes. She was lying on the bed under a sheet. Pulled it back, saw she'd been stabbed in the throat. I left, packed, came out here. I knew I'd be accused, but I didn't do it. Hold it. Here's the light. Well, if the jewels are in this bag, you're going to be in a tough spot. You're welcome to look. Thanks, Lord. Oh! Whatever it was, it caught me across the back of the head, and I went down like a dead palm tree in a hurricane. It wasn't the doctor who had lowered the boom, but someone who had sneaked up in the fog and gotten around behind me. I wasn't knocked out, and I could still hear things, so I just lay there and listened. Oh, thank goodness you came along. He was going to take me to the police because someone had killed Mrs. Van Dyke and stolen her jewels. He thought I had them. What are you doing? No! 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 I rolled over and looked at the doctor. He was very dead. I got up as fast as I could and started after the killer, but in that fog, it was like looking for a hangnail in a mine shaft. I went into one hangar after another, and I guess if you keep after it long enough, sometimes you get lucky. I went into the last hangar and stopped to listen. Okay, you, come on out. If I have to come in after you, it's going to be the hard way. Well, you're the boss. Now, why don't you stop it? You can't see me any better than I can see you, but I've got the door covered. Now, come on out. If I guess right, that's one big sergeant, and he's so stupid he's liable to shoot you. Diamond! Diamond, where are you? In here, Otis. Watch your step. We're playing cops and robbers. Yeah, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Uh, oh, cop. You all right, Otis? Yeah, but this cement's hard. Crawl over here. Okay. Hey, who, who's shooting? Well, one of two people. Just shot Dr. Langley back on the air step. Yeah? Why don't you blast him? I guess I'll have to. He doesn't want to come out. Uh, Otis, uh, uh, crawl over about 12 feet and make him shoot. Me? Yeah, I want to get a good line on him. He's behind those oil drums, and I've got to stand up to do it. Oh, all right. Hey, Diamond, now? Yes, Otis, now. Okay, like I said, you're the boss. I've been... Hit. Come on, Otis. Good shoot. Uh, glad you liked uh, it. Uh, well, how about you, Professor? I'm not happy. I got all three of them. He uh, won't be around long. Well, uh, why did you hit me, and why did you kill the doctor? I wanted the bag. I thought the jewels were in it. Aren't they? No, I opened it back here. I thought the doctor was double-crossing me. Well, if you ain't got the jewels, why'd you try to kill the old lady? I didn't. Oh, come on. This ain't no time to lie. He isn't lying, Otis. You told me yourself his alibi was good. Hey, that's right. Then who did? The one who would benefit most by the death of the woman. The one who had a perfect setup because two con artists could be blamed for it. Let's go. Yeah, what about this guy? How do you feel, Professor? Oh. Like I said, Otis, you keep. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Mr. Diamond. 
You come to see the bathing suit? I hope it comes in stripes. What? This is Sergeant Otis. Homicide. Homicide? Has someone been killed? Your aunt. Oh, no. Isn't that touching, Sergeant? Yeah. But that horrible doctor. We've got to arrest him. Why would he want to do it? Why, for the jewels, of course. Now, now, put your hat on. You must have known that the doctor was going to get the jewels tonight, so you killed your aunt, knowing he'd get there and wouldn't have an alibi. Why, you're insane. The trouble was, he got so scared he ran off without him. So he had no motive. But it was a professor. Strike two. He didn't have them either. You're crazy. You can't prove a thing. I didn't stab my aunt. Uh, oh, who said she was stabbed? <laughs> well, well, I just... Something else tipped me to you. The minute I took a good look at your aunt, I knew it couldn't have been a man who'd done the job. Why not? You're just presuming. Because there were no signs of a struggle. Your aunt must have known the killer pretty well. She knew the doctor very well. Well enough to meet him with a towel around her head and her wig in plain sight on the dresser? What? Yeah. And I got in touch with a lawyer and he said you was the sole heir to the estate. Were, Sergeant. Oh, yeah. You were the sole heir and I'm arresting you because I were there and saw the wig. fun at the fortune teller. Yeah, he's going to have to think up a new racket. Like contacting the living. What? No, forget it. What's to eat? I'll go look in the icebox. Bring some milk, will you, dear? Mm-hmm. If you'll play something. I'll try. Oh, no, not again! Oh, swell. Can't you get on the night shift or something? I can't get anything around here, especially sleep. Now, please, will you kindly shut your big fat face... What do you mean? I haven't sung anything yet. Oh, but you will. I just know you will. Well, if you insist. Oh, no. Please, please. I'm a nervous man. Oh, it calms you right down. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I'm under your spell, but how can I help it? Don't blame me. Can't you see when you do the things you do? If I can't conceal the thrill that I'm feeling, don't blame me. Oh, that's pretty. Don't stop. Oh, I, I must. Food looks too good. Did I hear you talking to someone? Mm-hmm. Listen. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I don't hear anything. Oh, that's funny. It was there a minute ago. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I still don't hear anything. Rick, who are you calling? Sergeant Otis. I'm afraid the guy next door has just cut his throat. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Ted Osborne, Peggy Weber, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. And now, Dick Powell. Friends, I want to remind you of the wonderful group of programs NBC has on tap for tomorrow afternoon and evenings. Shows like Hollywood Calling... Guy Lombardo, Four Star Playhouse, and the Ethel Merman Show. For the best in radio listening tomorrow and always, keep your dial turned to your favorite NBC station. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at this same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> This program has come to you from Hollywood. Theater Guild on the Air returns tomorrow night on NBC.
Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Now, Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, if you've ever got a few idle minutes and you need a good chuckle to keep you going, just turn to the personals in any of the local papers. Now, I'm a guy with a strange sense of humor, and it really takes something right out of left field to get a spasm out of my funny bone. Well, just listen to this one out of the Little Rock Bugle. Oh, yeah. Bachelor, sincere young man, four feet ten, 190 pounds, handsome, out of work for a year, desires to meet a woman who can straighten him out. <laughs> See what I mean? If this guy does find a woman who can straighten him out, she'll probably do it with a flat iron. Oh, and, uh, and get this one. Young man with large personality... Desires to meet woman with big bank account and small sense of humor. Object, murder. Oh, excuse me, that's merger. Oh, and here's a real wizard. Attractive, intelligent girl, 30 years old with bubbling enthusiasm for life. Neither smokes, drinks, nor stays up late. Vegetarian and hates comic books. Would like playmate who enjoys active recreation. Hmm. There'll be a month of fasting after that one. Oh, yeah, I knew I had something else. That case I got mixed up in last week. If you think those personals are silly, will you hear about this? It all started about 11 o'clock one morning in my office. Mr. Richard Diamond, private detective? Uh, I was out with a hula dancer last night. Wait, I'll look in the mirror and tell you. Come on in so you can see, too. <laughs> my name is Jerome J. Jerome. Well, I'm not going to ask you what the J stands for. You are Mr. Diamond, aren't you? It's my face all right, but I'm sure the rest of me is on vacation. Don't you feel well? I don't feel at all. Ever danced the hula for six hours straight? I'm a past master of all forms of dancing. Care to waltz? What? Forget it. What can I do for you, Mr. Jerome? It's not what you can do for me, Mr. Diamond. It's what I can do for you. Well, that's a switch, but let's give it a whirl. What can you do for me, Mr. Jerome? I'm a millionaire, Mr. Diamond. Well, bless your little pointed head. <laughs> I'm also a G-man. I knew this would jump the track sooner or later. Tell me, if you're a G-man and a millionaire, where do you work? The U.S. Mint? I write songs, too. By the light of the silvery moon, I Mr. want to... Mr. Jerome. Yes, did you like it? You didn't by any chance write Swanee River? No, I believe Stephen Foster wrote that. You don't say. Yes, he stole the melody from me. I think we'd better waltz after all. Oh, Mr. Diamond, that's ridiculous. I'm glad somebody noticed. But you take a good zippy foxtrot now. Oh, now, wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Oh, you follow beautifully. Oh, I went to Vassar. Now, slow down before I pick you up and stuff you into a bottle. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, now, would you mind telling me how long you've been hiding out with the squirrels? Squirrels? Oh, I have a mink farm. You should do well. Look, Mr. Jerome, I think maybe you better go soak yourself in some hot tar or something. I came here to do you a favor, Mr. Diamond, and I do not intend to leave until you hear me out. Oh, well. Okay, what is it? You need a bodyguard. Operator, give me Bellevue. Mr. Diamond, please, there's no need to call Bellevue. Oh, stop being so narrow-minded. They'll give you a nice, quiet room, all by a little old lonesome. Well, go ahead and call them if you want to, but it will do you no good. Why not? They'll just think you're crazy. I'm on the staff there. Oh, yes, I should have known. I think you're making fun of me. I came up here because I knew of your reputation as a detective, and I want to help you with your work. You, you get in trouble, don't you, all the time? Uh, habitually. Well, I want to protect you. Now, that's nice, but I really don't need a bodyguard. Hmm... Early stages of schizophrenia, also a slight persecution complex. Have you seen a good psychiatrist, Mr. Diamond? It's certainly a thought. Well, when do I start work? Well, you see, it's like this. I'm awfully sorry, but I have my own nutcracker. Oh, no, no, no. I mean as your bodyguard. I'm afraid the requirements are too tough. What are they? Well, first you have to find a freshly murdered corpse. It's kind of like a treasure hunt. Oh, I've got that. 
You got what? A freshly murdered corpse. That's one of the reasons I came up to see you. I thought you'd like to know. Oh, well, now, I'll tell you what you do. You go back and see if the corpse is still there. If it is, call me at once, okay? All righty. I'm off. Amen. Uh, Mr. Diamond? Yes? Remember, hopping hop toads have no hair. Oh, no. Mr. Diamond? Huh? Oh. I thought you'd better know something. I can only be your bodyguard for a week. <laughs> I'm getting married. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? It's Miss America. But don't breathe it around. I want time to check her measurements. I'll send you a fruitcake. Just bring it in. You're invited. Goodbye. Diamond's Rest Home. We specialize in nervous disorders, ingrown scalps, and the world's largest bowling alley. <laughs> oh, don't laugh. If you'd seen what just walked out of here, you'd go back to yo-yos. Well, what did just walk out of there? I'm not sure, but he had lovely blonde hair. He... It? Yeah, all over him. Rick, what in the world are you talking about? I'm talking about nothing in the world. Come on, tell Helen. Well, I've got to get it all straight first. If I figure it out, I'll come over and we can throw sesame seeds at each other. Oh, I'd love to. When will you be here? As soon as I shine up my elk's tooth and lock the office. Bye. Well, I usually get some screwy ones, but this one was the topper of the season. I had a hunch that Jerome would be back, so I locked the office and did a quick sneak down the back stairs. I grabbed a cab, and ten minutes later, I was sitting in Helen Asher's study at 975 Park Avenue. Do you think his story about the body had any truth behind it? Well, he told me he was a millionaire, a G-man, owned a mink farm, and was going to marry Miss America. <laughs> now, tell me you think there's some truth behind it, and I'll have you committed. Well, all right, but if he continues to pasture you, you... You ought to call the authorities about him. Yeah, I guess I'll have to. Poor little man. Mm. It's a poor little man like that who ends up hanging his grandmother on a meat hook. Oh, he doesn't sound dangerous to me. Uh, sometimes the harmless ones work themselves right into a storm. Now, take me. You'd never guess that somewhere in the back of my head a square knot is being tied. Rick, now stop that. See? You didn't know it, but at high noon, I grow fangs and long claws. Now, stop it. You do that every time a good-looking girl walks past. <laughs> <laughs> you complete <laughs> idiot. <laughs> Rick, the phone's ringing. Oh, I hope it's happy. It might be something important. Oh, Rick, you're mussing my hair. Uh, now, now, stop that and answer the phone. Oh, you woman are fiend. Uh, Harold Applenocker's happy home for hogs. Rick. Who is this? What's the matter with you all? Ain't you got your ear trumpet tip right? I know it's you, Diamond. No, it ain't. This is old Harold Applenocker. I'll let you talk to my gal, Lula Bell. Say hello to the lieutenant, Lula Bell. Howdy. Now, Diamond, you stop that. I just got back from my vacation, and things are already so confused I may turn in my batch before the day is over. Well, come on down to the hog ranch, and I'll cook you up some hocks. Now, come on, Diamond. I'm not in the mood for any of your wild humor. Oh, what's the matter with you, Walt? Did you catch any fish? Oh, wait till I tell you. I got one that was so big... Is that why you call me? Huh? Oh, oh, no. Some guy's been pestering me for the last half an hour. Wants to know where you are. Says he's an old friend. Oh, his name wasn't Jerome J. Jerome, was it? Well, that was the first name he gave me. The last time he called, he said he was a G-man. That's Jerome. Want me to tell him where you are? You do it, I'll handcuff you to Sergeant Otis. Oh, don't say that name to me ever again. Why, Walt, you sound bitter. That hornet had worked nights just messing things up in homicide. Lieutenant Waldo is taking calcium shots. The chief has locked himself in his office. Won't even open the door for food. Well, if Jerome calls again, tell him I've joined the South Siberian Balloon Corps. Now, wait a minute. Well, what do you want now, bonehead? Uh, it's that Jerome guy. He wants Diamond again. Says he found the body right where he left it. What? Diamond! Now, you wait a minute, Walt. What are you doing? Oh, oh, picking up my eardrum. You better watch that yelling. You'll have an office full of hogs. Keep Otis out of this. And I'll yell if I want to. Now, you get down here and explain about this body. Walt, I don't know anything about the body. The Jerome guy is off his trolley. Yeah? Well, if there's the smallest possibility of a corpse turning up and you're involved, it'll turn up. Walt, you say it, but you don't mean it. I don't, huh? You get down here in ten minutes, or I'll have a warrant out for you, and I mean that. Now, step on it. Now, by heaven, I'll forget modern police procedure and drag out the rubber hose. Why don't you use Sergeant Otis's tongue? You could beat an elephant to death with it. I'm not kidding. 
I've heard two words, diamond and body. And that means overtime in this department. Now get down here. All right, but you're mean. Oh, and diamond. Yes? Pick me up some bicarbonate on the way over, will you? I'll get you something. But don't spill it on your car. It'll take the paint off. Bye. Rick, what was that all about? Oh, Levinson's got heartburn again. That nut that wandered into my office told Otis about the body he says he's found. Oh, Walt didn't believe him, did he? Walt's been a cynic ever since we were introduced. I'll see you later this evening, honey. All right, Rick. What do you want to do? Helen. What? What you said. <laughs> I had a mental picture of Walt eating his way through his desk, so I got some bicarbonate at the drugstore and hurried over before he got to the wiring and shorted out the whole department. As usual, the king of the forest met me in the squad room. Well, you're in Dutch, Shamus. I guess you're right, Sergeant Otis. How about lending me your wooden shoes? Oh, uh, what do you mean, wise guy? They ain't wood. And why do you use a crowbar instead of a shoehorn? Yeah, very funny. You better go on in. Lieutenant's liable to start breaking things. I hope he doesn't use his bare hands. Yeah? Why? Well, your head's liable to get in the way and you'll be crippled for life. Uh... All right, Walt. Stop chewing on that desk. Here's your bicarbonate. What are you talking about? Now you listen to me, Diamond. That's like telling a man to turn up his hearing aid in a bombing. You can stop being cute. That guy, Jerome J. Jerome, phoned just before you came in, and he sticks to his story about the body, but he won't tell us where he is. You don't really believe him, do you, Walt? He's nuts. Well, he did say something about playing quarterback for Notre Dame. But if you're mixed up in this, I can't take any chances. Oh, don't be an idiot, Walt. This little guy, Jerome, came waltzing into my office this morning and... Uh, Lieutenant. Oh. What is it? Uh, that guy, Jerome's on the phone again. He wants to talk to Diamond. Rick, pick up that phone and find out about that body. Oh, now, come on, Walt. You can use the extension in here. Go on. I promise you, you'll be sorry. You pick it up and say hello. Not to this guy, you won't. You'll come back with hopping, hop toads have no hair or something. Hello, Jerome. Oh, Mr. Diamond. Good, 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 good. I've been trying to get you for some time. The body's here, all right. Where, Jerome? Anyone here? No, Jerome. Well, I thought maybe they had the line tapped. They do that, you know. Yes, Jerome. Now, where are you? I'm at the Osterham place. And if you don't want this corpse, I'm calling in Hawthorne of the death squad. Jerome, please. Now, where are you? The Osterham place on 74th Street. I'll be right over and don't let the corpse get away. Oh, it won't. I'm sitting on it. Oh. Well... Did you find out where he is? Oh, he said the Osterham place on 74th Street. What the devil's that? The Osterham place? That's old man Hoster Osterham's home. You know the eccentric old millionaire that died last year? Oh, how did Jerome get in? It's been turned into kind of a museum. The old boy had quite a collection of rare antiques. And when he died, he left the house to the city as sort of a show place. You mean he's open to the public? Yeah. Well, oh, well, let's go. Jerome's probably found a mummy for us. <laughs> On the way over, I told Walt about Jerome's sweet little visit in my office, and the lieutenant was all for stopping off for a straitjacket. When we got there, we looked out of the squad car at an old three-story brownstone. But more interesting was the sign that hung from the door. Closed Saturdays. And you guessed it. It was Saturday. We got out of the car and went up. Well, don't just stand there. Try the door. I'm with you. Got an axe? Ring the bell. If Jerome's in there, he'll probably answer. Oh, anything to make the police force happy. Mr. Diamond. What is that? That is Jerome over in the window. You will have to climb in here. Come on, Walt. We can't do that. Who's that with you, Diamond? Oh, uh, this is Lonely Levinson, Jerome. He collects bodies. Oh, good. He'll just love this one. Climb in. Coming on? Oh, go ahead. If there's a corpse in there, it's in the line of duty. I'll give you a boost. I can make it. Watch your real old fat baby. You shut up. <laughs> there. All right, Red Heart, you're next. Up, up, and away! Oh, I'm glad to see you both. I was getting tired of sitting around with her. The conversation was so one-sided. Sitting around with who? Her. Rick. Yeah. Do I qualify, Mr. Diamond? Mm, young girl. Been dead quite a while. Uh, uh, Jerome. Yes, boss. Oh, oh, Ricky, how you found her? Well, this room is supposed to be sealed up. Sealed up? Yes, the building is a museum. Uh, not a very good one. I have much better things in my apartment. Uh-oh, we're I... losing him. Uh, uh, Jerome, how you found her? Oh, 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 oh. Well, when the building is open to the public, they take you on tours. When we passed this room, we noticed it was sealed. 
I asked why, and the guard said it was because the late Mr. Osterham had stipulated in his will that the rest of the house could be shown but not this room. It was his private study. And he said if he ever wanted to come back, he didn't want a lot of people cluttering it up. Uh, who broke it in? I did. You did? Don't they have burglar alarms in this museum? Mr. Diamond, Lonely Levinson has an extreme case of supersensitivity. Does he always snap like that? Only when he hasn't been fed. Why did you break in? You should be careful, Mr. Lonely Levinson. You bite someone. Have you been checked for rabies? Now you listen to me. Walt, Walt, Walt. Uh, uh, Jerome, why did you break in? Well, it's perfectly obvious. When the guard told me the story, I played along with him. Of course, I knew it was just a trick to throw me off. Yeah, of course. Oh, would you mind turning your head? It's much better if you just chew on that curtain. Well, I, I waited until they closed the place. Then I came back, jimmied this window, and found the body. Then I came to you, Mr. Diamond. <laughs> Simple? Oh, sure. Rick, what are you doing? Oh, just looking at the dead girl. Come here. Ah, did you find something? No. Oh, got on an anklet. Name is, uh... uh strike a match, will you? Oh, wait a minute. There. Oh, Adelaide. Looks like she's been dead quite a while. Yeah. Hmm? But Jerome, when you found... Hey, Jerome. What? He's gone. Oh, we're a couple of swell sleuths. He's not out on the street. Must have climbed out and run for it. I'll send out a general on him. Yeah, I would if I were you. A guy like that shouldn't be running around loose. He's allowed to wind up on Stromboli. Well, Walt put out a general alarm on Jerome and then called in the rest of the experts to give him the dope on the dead girl. I didn't wait around because I had a hunch that Jerome would find me again. I was right. Because at that moment, he was sitting in my office behind my desk. Diamond Detective Agent, sir? Rick? Who is this? Oh, now, stop clowning. This is Helen. Never heard of you. Why don't you dames leave me alone? <laughs> uh, by the light of the silvery moon. I guess I'll have to write some new lyrics. Oh, dear. Yes, what is it? Well, you sure got there in a hurry. Who is this? Now, you stop that, Diamond. You know very well who this is. What do you want, stupid? Stupid? Yeah, it rhymes with Cupid. Could do a song on it. Like to hear my latest? I've been working on the railroad all the living long day. What kind of a song do you suppose I could write with stupid and Cupid? Uh, oh, hello, Mr. Diamond. Hey, what's going on? Well, hello, Jerome. Taking my calls for me? Yes, and wait till you hear the pixie I've got on the line. <laughs> Here. Uh, thanks. Hello, Walt. Rick? Yeah, you were talking to Jerome. I just came in. I might have known it. Don't let him out of your sight. Uh, of course not. Now, uh, what did you find out? Oh, oh yeah. The dead girl is one Adelaide Smith. Had a record. Blackmail artist. Been dead about three days. Working for a Patrick Mahaffey attorney on Pine Street. She was strangled. Mm, blackmail artist, huh? Very smooth, or used to be. Any line on Mahaffey's background? We're checking into that now. Well, find out one thing more for me, will you? If I can, what? Uh, when that museum was open to the public. Well, that's easy. I'll call you back. Uh, hold on to that Jerome guy. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, uh, Walt. Yeah? Jerome's gone again. What? Bye. Oh, uh, sorry to bust in, but you seem to be missing your secretary. Come in. Come in. My secretary just walked out the other day. I haven't had time to get another from the agency. Are you uh, Patrick Mahaffey? Yes. What can I do for you? Uh, was your secretary's name Adelaide Smith? Why, yes. How did you know? Oh, from the police. They just put a tag on her down at the morgue. Good Lord. She, she isn't. She certainly is. The morgue is very choosy about its tenants. Oh, that's terrible. What was it, an accident? Well, if it was, the insurance companies are going to have to set up a new system. She was strangled. Oh, how horrible. Uh, yes. You, uh, you're an attorney, aren't you, Mr. Mahaffey? Why, yes. Are, are you from the police? I just left them. What kind of an attorney? Why, just general law. Ever do anything you could be blackmailed for? What? Why, why, of course not. Ever have any business with the Osterham estate? Mm, no. No, I never handled any of the Osterham business. Why? Oh, uh, oh, nothing. I'll see you later, Mr. Mahaffey. <laughs> Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt Diamond, what did you find out about Mahaffey? Rick, there's something fishy. You gotta stop going to these cheap restaurants. Oh, be serious. That Mahaffey guy was executor for the Osterham estate. What? Yeah, funny coincidence. Coincidence, my shoulder holster. 
I just left him, and he told me he'd never even heard of the Osterham estate. Now, why would he do that? He's certainly smart enough to know we could check. Maybe he wanted time enough to skip. You think he's mixed up in the killing? Oh. Did you find out when the museum was open to the public? Yeah, the city completed the alterations two days ago. And if it means anything to you, that room was sealed up on the last day. Oh, thanks, Walt. And something else. We checked in the dead girl's bank account. She had 22000 in it. A lot for a secretary, huh? Yeah, but not too much for a high-class blackmailer. Do one more thing for me, Walt. Find out if Osterham had any heirs. Now, what good will that do? I want to find out just how many people would know about that sealed room before the public got wind of it. Okay, I'll have my happy picked up right away. No, no, no. Don't do it yet. I want ten minutes with him. Where, uh, where's his house? I got it right here. 93rd Street, West End Avenue. But I don't see why you won't let me grab my happy. We know he's lying. You just check on that will. I'm going to throw you a killer. <laughs> I left the phone booth and headed for West End Avenue and Patrick Mahaffey's residence. Strangely enough, it was on the west side of town. And when I got there, I spotted a green sedan in front of the house. I started up to the front door and Mahaffey met me halfway. He had a suitcase and he was in a hurry. Oh, it's you. Uh, your memory's getting better. Come on, you don't want to leave right now. Let's go back inside. But I have to catch a plane. I'm leaving town on business. Oh, I'll bet you are. Let's go. Now, wait just a minute. You have no legal right. Do I have to show you my biceps? Oh, uh, well, all right. But make it brief. I'm late as it is. Now, just what is this all about? I thought you said you didn't have any business with the Osterham estate. Why, that's right. I checked. Oh. Hmm. Just exactly what was your capacity? Well, I, uh, I handled the incomes on the trust account. I was also the executor of the will. You wouldn't be handling it now, would you? When Mr. Osterham died and I executed his will, my job was done. Were there any heirs? Two. Neither of them were able to hear the reading. Who did hear it? Just an official from the city. Why weren't the heirs present? Because one of them couldn't be found. The other one was in a kennel. In a kennel? A cocker spaniel. He received $10,000. Oh. I bet he rolled right over on his back. Who was the other heir? Mr. Osterham's nephew. He hasn't been heard from in ten years. He went to France to study hat designing, but hat jobs were very scarce, so he just vanished. He was rather eccentric. Oh. Now we come to the jackpot question. What you got in the bag? What? You look a little green. Open it up. Now, look, you can't do this to me. It's against the law. Where's your warrant? I got a fistful of them, see? Oh. All right. There. Dump it out. But I've got to catch a plane if I dump, dump all this... Dump it up... out. Well, well, well. Yes. It's a lot of money, isn't it? Sure is. Isn't it lovely? Well, I'm glad you like it. Go ahead. Take half. I was hoping you wouldn't say that. Why not? Because I'll hate myself for the next two years. Put it back in the bag and let's go. But I'm offering you $100,000. You must be a fool. Oh, this is a very elementary deduction. Come on, you can figure it out and sing sing. I don't think so. You should have looked in my pocket, too. Oh, I hope that's an old pipe you're pointing at me. I hate to disappoint you. It's a thirty-eight. <laughs> now you're turning green. Now you better answer it. It's the police and they know I'm here. All right, but you say one thing wrong and I'll have to shut you up permanently. Yes? Is Diamond there? Yes. Let me talk to him. All right. You were right. It's for you. Go ahead, talk to him. But I warn you again. Hello? I'm getting tired of dialing. Everything all right? Just dandy. What did you find out? There were two heirs, and get this. One of them was a... Cocker Spaniel. Yeah, how did you know? What else? Well, that guy Mahaffey's a crook. We checked and found out that there's only about 10000 left in the trust fund. The bank says Mahaffey had power of attorney, and he'd drawn out about 200000 You got him there with you? Yeah, but it's all in the way you look at it. Oh, it's like that, huh? Let's see if you can stall him. There ought to be a prowl car nearby. Goodbye, Walt. Did you get the information you wanted? Yeah, you killed the girl. Probably because she found out you were dipping into the till. You paid her 10000 and got her over to the museum and strangled her. I took the money, yes. But you're just guessing about the murder. Uh-uh. No one else but you knew about that closed room until after it was sealed and the public was told. The girl was killed the day before the room was sealed. You figured she'd never be found, but a little guy named Jerome J. Jerome went in and found the body. And if I'm right, little Jerome is really the missing heir. Impossible. Wasn't the museum rigged with a burglar alarm? Yes. Well, we found Jerome inside and the window open. He'd climbed in, but the alarm hadn't gone off. Simple. A member of the family might still have a key. He found the alarm and disconnected it. I don't believe it. But you must, Mr. Mahaffey. What? No, it can't be. Oh. Well, <laughs> you really throw a beautiful left jab, Mr. Diamond. Oh, thanks for turning his head, Jerome. Now, would you mind telling me something just to... 
sort of clear things up a little? You mean, am I really cracked? No. Like Mr. Mahaffey said, uh, just a little <laughs> eccentric. You see, I found out the money was missing, so I looked up the girl. She told me for 20000 she'd show me the thief. She told me to meet her at the museum that night, and the thief would be there. When I got there, she was dead. Well, I knew I couldn't solve the case myself, and if anyone found out who I really was, I might be held. So I became Jerome J. Jerome and hired Richard Diamond. Correction, I was not hired. Correction again. You'll receive a very substantial check as soon as the estate is settled. And thank you. Thank you. Oh, you might do me one more favor. If you know anyone who would like to buy a hat, I have got some dillies. I'll speak to Hedda Hopper in the morning. Well, it, it's lovely, but... But you don't like it? Well, yes. Uh, well, what's the matter? I don't know what it is. You don't know what it is? It's a hat. A hat? Certainly. Here, here, give it to me. Now, look, you put it on this way, <laughs> see? <laughs> what are you laughing at? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. I might even do a Hildegard if I got the right bookings. A pair of long gloves. <laughs> All of a sudden, my heart sings <laughs> when I remember little things the way you Rick, used now to. stop it. I will not. I may have found a way to make a million. You're just jealous, that's all. I've got the hat and I'm pretty. Just sing a song and finish it for a change. Oh, I'd love to. I don't know from nothing, baby. All I know is I love you. I don't care for nothing, baby, if I knew you cared for me, too. So won't you make your mind up, baby, tell me that you love me, please do. For I don't know from nothing, baby, all I know is I love you. We bought a sponsor, all I know is I love you. Yeah, I finished it. Are you happy? Oh, well, yes. But where did the band come from? Did you like it? <laughs> yes, it was great. Well, if it's great, don't ask questions. Uh, thank you, Von Monroe. Uh, honey, the name is Diamond. Oh, Mr. Monroe, I just love your record. No, no, baby, the name is Diamond. Mr. Monroe, ever since the first time I heard you sing, I've... Come here, I want to tell you something. I'm sorry, that. Racing with the moon, sailing through the midnight blue. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in the cast were Wilms Herbert, Joseph Kearns, and Stanley Waxman. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the current screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is John Storm inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> You don't have to go to Alabama. You don't have to eat ham hocks and butter beans. All you have to do is enjoy Phil Harris and his ever-loving wife, Alice Fay, when they return to NBC tomorrow for 30 minutes of Southern Pride Joy lend an ear to Phil Harris, Alice Fay show, returning tomorrow on most of these same NBC stations. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows.
Now, Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, this business I'm in can get pretty silly sometimes. I can go along for a whole month and get by on nothing but meals at the automat and a dozen laughs a day. The funny ones usually pay just as well as the tough ones, but eventually somebody starts something that's about as funny as an open grave. So then I put on a long face and start carrying my 38. I don't worry about those times because I don't think about them. I just know they'll be around, and I know I won't have to bother about it unless I get my hundred a day in expenses. That's uh, the equalizer. As long as I get that ever-loving loot in my little hot hand, Lucifer can walk in with a machine gun and I'll arm wrestle him for the price of a hot dog. Last week, I stopped in the middle of a real yocker and realized that I'd been giggling overtime. That's right. The cycle had caught up with me, and the label on my future had changed from fun time to trouble, and no guarantee as to the date of expiration. Uh, what started all this? Well, one morning on 53rd Street, a couple of guys were just pulling up in front of a garage. This the garage? Yeah. Go on, drive in. Here comes a guy. Yeah, this is big luck for us. The guy coming is the guy I want. I don't want he should see me yet, so you keep talking to him and I'll get out this sign. Tell him to look at the motor or something. There's something I can do for you, mister? Yeah. Take a look at the motor. It's been missing. It sounds all right. It don't drive like it sounds, so take a look at it. Okay, sure. I race it once. Huh? I said race it once. He down here so well. Huh? Hello, Billy boy. Where did you come from? How did you get here? One at a time, Billy. I came in the car, got out the other side. You're looking good, Billy, real good. What do you want? How did you find me? Can't you ask just one simple question? You get so all mixed up, Billy. Look, leave me alone, please. Sure, Billy, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> all alone, you louse. <laughs> Diamond Detective Agency, our 30-day test revealed that not one single case of throat irritation was due to strangling. Oh, Rick, you're awful. Oh, how can you say that? I'm lovely, I'm engaged, now you steal wool. Oh, you idiot. Ah, you Pete. Hello, honey. Hi. Am I going to see you tonight? Sure, what'll we do? You get here about eight, I'll think of something. Oh, let's stay in. I've got that awful broke feeling again. Oh, is business bad, Rick? Well, it's pretty bad, but it gives me a chance to get some exercise. Exercise? Yeah, I found a Japanese beetle in the desk the other day, been giving me judo lessons. I'll just pretend I didn't hear that. Don't knock it. Vaudeville's on the way back. Leave it alone. Let it live. Helen. I'll see you about eight. Uh, uh, wait a minute, honey. I think I forgot to shut something off. People are running in. Clients? I'll find out. Oh, uh, would one of you gentlemen mind dropping a few hundred dollar bills on the floor? Well? Uh, I'll call you right back. I don't think they're spendthrifts. All right, Rick. Bye. Bye, honey. Well, now, lads, what can I do for you? Your name Diamond? Yeah. Would you mind closing the door? I've got a beetle that'll break my arm if he catches cold. Hey, this guy's screwy, boss. Shut the door like he says. You got a beetle, huh, funny man? Yeah, and I'll bet you eight to five he can throw you. Well, if you have got a beetle, he must be running around your head, but I ain't got time to find out. You know something? I, uh, I don't think we're going to get along. You may be right, funny man. It depends. On what? And whether or not you turn the bundle over to me. Look, Rockerhead, if you're looking for your laundry, you got the wrong bin. I don't like the way this guy talks. No, but first we ask him nice. We want the bundle, funny man. You just said that. I say it again for you. Then if you don't get it, I make you understand. Like how? You couldn't point out Clyde Beard in a lion cage. Here it is. Now try hard. I want the bundle. I know this will throw you, but what bundle? He's going to be difficult, boss. Shut up. Look, Shamus. Some of my friends think I'm kind of good-natured. But sometimes I fool them and get nasty. You should be ashamed of yourself. You want to know what bundle? I tell you. Maybe you snap out of it. The bundle the dame gave you. The 200,000. 200,000? 
200,000 what? Girdles? That does it. Burns, see why the Shamus is lying. Now, wait a minute, Buster. You go on the muscle with me, and I'll tear off your biceps and stuff them in your fat face. Burn. Yeah? Oh, nuts. Why is it a 38 always changes my mind, and I want it to be so virile? I'm going to use this gun unless you tell us where you got the 200,000. Now, this is getting silly. No, it ain't. Mm. Uh, well, it's getting bloody, see? Hey, now, what's going on? I told you, funny man. I want what you got. Well, what I got hurts, and you're welcome to it. You sure ask for it? No. Oh. Come on. You save your head from getting squashed, and me and Vern save a lot of time. Where you got the dough? Look, I didn't know what you were talking about when you started, and I'm just as stupid now. You are that, funny man. Vern? Hey, wait. Now, oh, oh. A gun barrel can cut you up pretty bad. You want to see how bad, or do you want to tell us? You think I like the massage? I tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't like to be kept waiting, you. I don't like it none, see? Now you spill your gut so my boy chops you up like hamburger. Open your yap and sing. Sing, you hear me? Okay, but you won't like it. I can't begin to tell you. Close his lousy mouth. Close it good. Oh, I knew you wouldn't like it. Oh, oh, oh. Now, funny man, you got a wise crack? You gonna still make like a hero? Answer me, funny man, or I step on your face. Boss. Shut up. But, boss. Yeah, 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 what do you want? He don't hear you. He's out. Huh? Oh. Well, what did you sap him so hard for, stupid? Maybe you turned him off for good. Nah. He'll be around in a couple of minutes. Then I can work on his ribs. He'll tell us where he's got the dough. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. You don't know what? He's got the dough. You sure know that? Yeah, the dame says she'd give it to him. You think uh, maybe she crossed you? You think she skipped? I think maybe we'd better find out. This Shamus is pretty stubborn and pretty clean. I think we find out. How? You watch. I'll search the joint, then we'll get out of here. What about the Shamus? Ah, he'll make it all right. I want him around for a while. After we find the dough, you can put him back to sleep. Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond? Hmm? Mr. Diamond, wake up. Oh, it's all right, honey. I'm not coming in. Mr. Diamond, wake up. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh. Oh, what a nice sweater. How do you feel? Well, a quick comparison might be a garter snake and a log jam. Well, you don't look very comfortable. Why don't you sit up? I'm afraid my eyes might fall out. Oh. Better? Yeah, yeah. Know any shaggy dog stories? I could use a laugh. How did you get like this? It wasn't easy. How long have I been here? I just came in. I was going to call the police when you started mumbling. Mumbling? Yeah, she said something like, Oh, it's not so late, honey. Can I come in for a drink? <laughs> you must have been dreaming. Uh, I'm glad I woke up. She probably didn't have a drink in the house anyway. Uh, pardon me, honey, but I gotta run some water over my bumps. You don't look so bad, considering. Oh, well, considering what? The people get run over by trucks every day? When you start feeling better, I'd like to talk business. Well, well with business, I straighten right up. What's on your mind? Oh, that sweater. I want you to guard something for me. Why? You're the type that goes bear hunting with a switch. Is that supposed to be nasty? Well, take a guess. I just get mauled up by two gorillas, and before they get nasty, they mention some dame and some money, and you know anything about it? Why should I? Well, I wake up, and there you are. I thought maybe you'd stop by to see if the boys get a gold star for the work. I don't know anything about it. Now, do you mind if I sit down? No, no. I'm sorry. I haven't got anything more comfortable. Termites just walked out of my couch. What do you want guided, lover? I can't tell you what it is, but it's in a locker at the 42nd Street subway. I want you to pick it up and keep it with you until I call for it. I get a hundred a day in expenses, and when I don't know what I'm doing. The fee looks like a skyrocket. Here's five hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. When I pick up the uh, item, you get five hundred more. Ooh. And I'll be back in two days. Well, I was going to start looking for the guys who gave me this headache, but a thousand dollars makes me impatient. <laughs> You, uh, uh, got the key to the locker? Yeah, right here. By the way, do you work nights, Mr. Diamond? Well, not in the office. Don't you think I ought to know your name? You get the item and I'll introduce myself in two days. And I do keep a drink in the house, Mr. Diamond. She got up then and walked out of the room like Eve with half an apple. I put some iodine on my face and headed for the 42nd Street subway. All the way down, I kept thinking about those two mugs who'd worked me over, and for the life of me, I couldn't guess why. 
I didn't know it then, but if I could have guessed, it probably would be for the life of me. I reached the subway and went down. I found the locker, opened it, reached in and pulled out a small black leather bag with a lock on it. Out of curiosity, I tested the weight and finally decided I must be guarding a sack full of spider webs. I tucked it under my arm and turned to go. But sometimes things don't always work out the way you plan them. Okay, Shamus. Let's have the bag. Oh, when am I ever going to make Eagle Scout? I should have smelled something. Hello, Vern. I'm in a hurry. If you're wisecracked, you get dead. Give me the bag. Where's your friend? Out collecting heads? I guess I got to kill you. I guess again. Here's the bag. Okay. I should make a hole in you just because you ain't honest. You had the dough all the time. You mean in that bag? Oh, now, don't tell me it ain't in it. Well, if it is, Buster, it's all in one bill. Feel the weight. Hey, it is too light. Why, you lousy, no-good gumshoe. This time I don't play around. Frank wants that dough, and you're going to show me where it is. Oh, I wish you'd get yourself a twenty-two. Those big guns make dents in my back. I'm going to count three, and you're going to tell me where the dough is. Or I'll kill you all over the place. You could make it a hundred, could you? It's so much fun when you pass fifty. Be funny. You're only killing one guy. One. This never happened when I went on next to closing. Two. Oh, now, wait a minute. Look. You look. It's your last chance. Drop it, Byrne. You're boxed up. Hey, who's that? The Marines. Why, you dirty... Oh. 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 Rick. Rick, are you all right? Oh, Walt, I know you're bashful about these things, but you're going to be kissed. Oh, now, stop that. Otis. Have your boys keep the crowd back. All right, all right. Keep back. Come on. What about the gunner? You shot him good, Lieutenant. Well, I'm glad you noticed your mallet head. Now, what about him? He's dead. How did you find that out? Twenty questions? Oh, yeah? Well, I guess we saved your life this time. Well, I hope I can do the same for you sometime, Sergeant, but science will hate me. Oh. Now, don't you start blubbering again, Otis. I couldn't stand it. Go get the wagon like a good boy. Okay, Lieutenant. Now, what's this all about, Rick? Believe me, Walt, I don't know. How did you get here? We got a call from a dame about ten minutes ago. Said you were coming down here and some guy was going to kill you. Well, well, well. Now, don't you well, well, well me. I want to know what this is all about. Let's go down to headquarters and I'll tell you just what I know. Raleigh, you coming? You you mean you're going to cooperate? Well, certainly. Oh, Otis. What's the matter, Walt? I feel a little faint. Would you mind helping me up the stairs? I think I've been working too hard. Walt and I left the subway and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. On the way over, I told him about the girl and about the two hoods who had worked me over in my office. When we reached the station, he shoved the rogues' gallery at me, and I started going through the miles of photographs. Well, the guy we shot in the subway was one Vern Geronda, small-time torpedo, but we can't find out anything else. Can't you find the other one in any of those pictures? Well, I've looked through them all. All I know is his name is Frank. Maybe he hasn't got a record. Here, try this stack. Dates back to the year one. Well, you can bet on one thing, Walt. The girl who called you was the girl who was in my office. She was the only one who knew I was going down to the locker in the subway. But how did she know this Vern Geronda was going after you? Well, she must have known he was going to tail me and that he was after something. Something that could have been in that black bag. It was a plant because she knew it was empty. I think she'd planned that when when this Vern caught me with an empty bag, he'd get rough enough to shoot, and if you were there, you'd have to stop him. You mean she wanted him dead? Well, that's my guess. Dead or in jail, but out of the way. That 200,000 is probably behind it. Walt. Uh, did you find something? Yeah. This is the other guy who came into the office. Yeah? Let's see. Hey, what do you think you're doing? What's the matter with you? This is the man. You're crazy. Now, you listen to me. If you're trying to start one of those routines Oh, again... now, wait a minute. You asked me to pick out the hood that was in my office, and this is the boy. A little younger, maybe, but you know darn well I wouldn't make a mistake on identification. Now, this is screwy. This is ridiculous. Where's my bicarbonate? Oh, what is wrong with you? Rick, that's Frank Purcell, and he's been dead for two years. What? Oh, wasn't he the guy who went over a 50-foot cliff with his whole gang? That's right. The car burned. The only guy they didn't find in the wreck was Billy Crump. He disappeared completely. Well, this one got out of it, too, and stayed around long enough to pay me a visit this morning. And his first name was Frank. Oh, that's impossible. The boys chased them right after the holdup and shot out one of their tires. Watched the car go over and saw it turn. Didn't they knock over the payroll at the Martin shipyard? Sure, got away with 200... Uh, 200,000 dollars. Lieutenant. Huh? Oh, yeah. What is it? Uh, I'm not killing down the garage. That that guy was just identified as being one for armed robbery. Killing? Yeah, pretty bad. Somebody shot up a guy that worked in the place. Well, who was it? Her name was Crump. What? Yeah, Billy Crump. Stuck up some shipyard about two years back. Oh, and... shut up. 
Well, uh, I was only telling okay, you. Okay, okay. What else, Anna? He has a wife, lives at 64th Street, apartment 205. That's all. Well, don't just stand there, you applehead. Go get the car. Oh, oh, oh yeah, Lieutenant. Come on, Rick. I'm waiting. All right. All right, I apologize. Oh, you really don't have to, Walt. I was as confused as you were. Was? But you're not now? No, I don't think so, Walt. But let's get over to see Mrs. Crump. She can do a lot of straightening out. I hope Mrs. Crump is in. Oh, uh, I forgot to tell you, Lieutenant. She calls herself Stewart, Mrs. Edna Stewart. What? Yeah. Her husband used her alias instead of Crump. Oh, well, that's all right, Sergeant. Maybe when you start pounding a beat again, you'll think of those little things. Uh, 205, wasn't it, Walt? How about it, Sergeant? It was 205, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. 205, that was it. I remember. <laughs> I might make a few months. Shut up, you... Walt. Hold it down. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold this. Yeah, Lieutenant. Shut up. Here it is, Walt. I'll give it a knock. Go ahead. Mm, looks like no score. Try the door. Why, Walt? Without a warrant? Now, don't you start that again. If Frank Purcell is still alive, we're going to grab that 200 grand. We've got to work fast. Besides, I'm not trying the door. You are. Well, it's open, unstained, and honest. I suppose you'd like me to trip you just so you can say you fell in by mistake? Oh, come on. Pick up your big feet, Otis. That would be hard, even for Samson. Oh, yeah. Now, you listen to me, wise guy. I'm getting sick and tired of... Ooh, holy cow, then. It's a body. Rick, how about it? Quite. Mrs. Crump. Mrs. Crump, Mrs. Stewart, the girl in my office this morning, no difference. I figured she might be the one in your office when I heard Crump had a wife. She must have had the 200 grand and Purcell killed her for it. Well, you can bet the cash wasn't in the apartment because she was too smart to keep it here. Well, there's no signs of a struggle. From the way she's lying, she was probably sitting at this desk. Uh, writing pad on the desk, Lieutenant. Keep your paws off of it. Well, she was writing something. Hmm. Went through to the bottom sheet. Now, yeah, numbers. Otis, start casing the place and have a conscience when you pass the icebox. Uh, okay, Lieutenant. Too many numbers for a phone. Walt, Walt, what are we looking for? Why, Purcell and the 200,000. Okay, now, we don't know where Purcell is, but that 200,000 had to cool off until Crump could spend it. So? Now, where would be the safest place to keep that much cash? The numbers. Safety deposit box. You have just won yourself, Sergeant Otis. I should cut my throat first. Now, it's a cinch Purcell has gone down to the safety deposit box. Hey, uh, I found a couple of plane tickets, Lieutenant, and, and it looked like they'd started to pack. Yeah, hey, let me see them. Uh-huh. Two for Mexico City and good for the first. That ties it. Would you mind whispering in my ear, or am I asking too much? Walt, when Mrs. Crump came to my office, she made it very clear she'd be back in two days. That's the first of the month. I don't know how long she'd been there before I woke up, but she was interested in my office, and she was coming back in two days. Now, if she wanted to hide something, the best place would be somewhere that had already been searched. Uh, uh Otis, do you think you could dig up a safety deposit box under the name of Crump or Stewart? Here's the number. Mm, I can try. Stout fellow. Now, Walt, if Frank Purcell did kill the girl and then headed for the deposit box, I don't think he found much. And the only other person that Mrs. Crump contacted and that he suspects is uh, yours truly. Uh huh. And he'll tell you, or worse. I hope so. But I want ten minutes alone in my office before he catches up. Now, what is get going and call me at my place? Right. Now, Walt, I'm going to walk around for about half an hour and see if I can pick up a tail. Then I'll lead him to my office. I'll get there at uh, exactly 2.30. You get there ten minutes later. I think I'm going to need help. I still wish I knew what you were up to. Now, as soon as Otis finds that deposit box and tells me if Mrs. Crump was at the bank around 11 this morning, I'll tell you the whole thing. And if I'm lucky enough to stay alive, you'll have Frank Purcell to fill in the details. I left Walt and started walking. If Purcell was after me, he was too smart to let me spot him, so I just kept going until I'd used up the half hour... And I was on my way up to my office. Purcell wouldn't follow right away, so that gave me the ten minutes I wanted. I went in and looked around. Nothing had changed. Desk, chair behind and chair in front. Small closet with sink, hat rack, and bookcase. I went to work in the bookcase first. Nothing. So I took the desk apart. I kept going. Closet, under the rugs, still Nothing. I took a breather and tried to reason it out. 
If I had suspected something in the beginning, where would be the last place I'd look? Something I never use. I didn't have a vacuum cleaner, so that was out. Then I remembered something. Something the girl had said that morning. Do you work nights, Mr. Diamond? I looked up at the big light bulb hanging from the ceiling. A little lost weekend, but it was worth a try. I walked over and snapped on the light switch. Ah, score for Diamond. With the light on, the bowl became transparent, and lying at the bottom, I could see the outline of a large bundle. I forgot to smile because the footsteps coming up at the hall sounded like company. I turned off the light, went over to my desk, and sat on with a very comfortable 38 between my legs. Well, good afternoon, rocker boy. Did you forget your bucket of blood? I forgot something, sure, funny man. I forgot to leave you dead. Don't look so unhappy. You tried. I've been getting a big run around all day. So I brought me something to slow things down. You want to see it or do I keep it in my pocket? Well, if it's a mouse, I'll scream. In this pocket, I got six ways to kill a louse. If you ain't seen a louse, just grab a mirror. Oh, my George, my George. That was a good one. What's the matter? Was the deposit box empty? Oh, you know about that, do you? I figured you was working with a dame. Well, uh, you got a silent partner now. You're right. Last time I saw her, she was speechless. I'm going to do the same for you, funny man, but I make a deal. You say no or even maybe, and I'll kill you where you sit. You say okay, and I'll let you keep going till you choke on one of your jokes. You tell me if I'm right, and I'll give you a quick answer. You've been after Billy Crump ever since the shipyard robbery because he got away with the money. You finally found his wife, and she got scared. She bought two tickets to Mexico. I'm going to do it. Great. You tell a good story. When Mrs. Crump saw all that lovely cabbage, she got greedy. She got a hold of you and made a deal. Yeah, she was a pretty smart chicken. I knock off her husband, Billy, and she splits the dough with me. And if I guess right, at 11 o'clock this morning, while you were killing Billy Crump, she was grabbing the 200000 So that's how it goes. But after we rubbed out Billy, she called and said the dough was planted with you. She wanted the dough herself. She used me to lead you to the subway. Right. Where were you? Upstairs. I figured something was up. Well, nice little plot. You kill her husband, the cops kill you and your torpedo, and bless her little heart, she winds up with a pot of gold. Now, she winds up dead. The dough wasn't in the box, so she planted it somewhere. We saw her coming in here after we worked you over. Now, I think she stashed the bundle here while you was out cold. So, uh, do I get it, or do you die? What are you going to do about that big, bad policeman outside the door? I'm going to laugh at him because he ain't there. Walt, stop snooping. Come on in. Hi. Well, what do you know? You wasn't kidding. This might mean a promotion, Purcell. You want to turn around and be a good boy, or do you want it the hard way? I stay the way I am. You're in a tough spot, Mr. Copper. If this funny man's a friend of yours, he's going to get it the minute you try your luck. Rick? Yeah, Walt? He's got a point. I might be lucky and get him just right, but it's a long shot, and if I miss, he'll pull the trigger on you. You're pretty smart for a copper. Walt? Yeah? The way it looks, we could be here all night unless somebody gets shot. That's the way it looks. What do you think, Purcell? Like I said, the cop guns me, I gun you. <laughs> Silly, ain't it? Be a lot sillier if I had a gun. Funny man, that would be a riot. Well, start laughing, pal. Oh. Ah, you sure ruined that desk. Ah, well, I couldn't help it. At the gun between my knees, I, I move, he shoots. Had to try it right through the desk. Oh, what are you sweating for? Me? I could use you for a shower. How's Purcell? Unhappy. How about it, Purcell? I ain't giving odds. Hey, funny man, you know something? You ain't so funny. Oh. Uh, get the phone, Walt. Yeah? Lieutenant? Oh, no. Yeah? Uh, I found the box. The crump dame was in the bank at 11 o'clock this morning. I found it pretty quick, huh? Hooray for you. Wait a minute. Rick, you were right about the... De Hey, where did he go? Who, oh, Lieutenant? King Kong. Now, you get your big fat head over here. Lieutenant. What is it? Okay if I turn on the side ring. Oh. Here's the iodine and bandages, Miss Helen. Oh, thank you, Francis. 
Stop squirming, Rick. Oh, honey, I know what's coming when I leave here. I'm going to look like an advertisement for a snappy funeral. You baby. It's just a little iodine and bandages. Oh, get her. You use enough iodine to stain an elephant and so much bandage you could roll up a herd of mummies. All right, then get infected. I am infected. Now, Rick, stop come that. Here, come here. <laughs> I've had a tough day. I've been beat up, shot at, and been insulted by Sergeant Otis. I, I need some relaxation. I want to play. Uh, should I leave, miss? You stay right where you are. I think there's a wolf loose. Uh, Francis. Yes, Mr. Diamond. Have you studied your lessons on how to be a private detective? Oh, yes, sir. I'm up to Chapter 8. But have you read Chapter 8 yet? Uh, well, no, sir. Oh, that's too bad. I was going to give you some first-hand advice on that chapter tonight. Oh, oh, I'll go read it right away, sir. Sure. Uh, may I, Miss Helen? Go ahead, Francis. I can't win. Oh, this will be jolly. Now, come here, you. But Rick, stop it. Get away from that piano. No. You are my sunshine, my oh, only sunshine. No. You make come me on, happy. Come on, come oh, on, Well, you know what they say about music soothing a savage beast. Oh. If you don't like it, you sing something. Oh, what for? You don't even look a little wild. Sing something. I'll get as wild as you want. Oh, now there's a statement. Go on. All right. Little girl. You're the one girl for me, <laughs> little girl. You're as sweet as can be. Just a glance at you meant love from the start, and oh, what a thrill came into my heart, little girl. With your cue. Little ways, I am yours for the rest of my days, and this great big world will be divine, little girl, when you're mine. Oh, mine. Okay, honey, now, now get wild. Uh. Come here. Ah, a little wilder. <laughs> there you go. And Mr. Diamond, I'd like to ask your opinion. It is in Chapter 8 that Hamas... Oh. oh. <laughs> well, look at that. And I'm not blushing. <laughs> oh, I must be getting used to it. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Ellen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Gene Bates, Robert Carroll, and Ted DeCorsia. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Now here is Dick Powell. Uh, say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been enjoying our show, and I sure hope you have... Be sure to listen on Monday evenings beginning October 3rd instead of Saturdays. Did you get that? Beginning October 3rd, we will be heard on Mondays instead of Saturdays. And check your local paper for the exact time. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. The Judy Canova Show returns to most of these NBC stations next Saturday in this time period. Richard Diamond, private detective, moves to Monday evenings beginning October 3rd. Next week, tune in at the same time for the Judy Canova Show and hear Richard Diamond, private detective, Monday nights beginning October 3rd. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. The Ethel Merman Show, previously scheduled for this time, will be heard at a new time and date to be announced shortly. Transcribed is Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective.
Hello there. This is Diamond. Hey, I got a beef. I went shopping for my girl, Helen Asher, the other day. You know, stuff for dinner. This town's gotten hotter than the blast furnace in Death Valley, so you gotta pick out things that make for a cool meal. Like salads, cold cuts, beer. Real picnic style. Well, I figured I could whip up a fancy tossed salad or something. Until I got around to the tomato counter. Have you glommed onto the price of tomatoes lately? Now, what's with that? So the cost of living is inflated. So a T-bone makes like it just arrived direct from the Sultan's classiest cow. Okay, a T-bone, I can understand. But what's with a tomato? When it costs so much, it should be hanging from a charm bracelet instead of lying in a salad bowl. Who needs it? So I bowed from the waist and figured you could still do a lot of things with a plain head of lettuce. Oh, uh, I got another beef, too. Why can't people start their killings in December when it's cool? Now, about a week ago, I got mixed up in a case, and before it was over, I took so many salt tablets, I am now the best-seasoned private detective in New York. It started last Tuesday morning about 11 o'clock in an apartment on the Upper East Side. Ginny? Yeah, genius. No cracks. No cracks. We're both waiting for old Gibson to turn us into the cops, and you say no cracks. This whole rotten mess is your fault. How did I know the old goat wouldn't fall for it? Well, he didn't, so we better start packing. What for? Because I don't want to play hostess to a lot of little men in blue. I'm allergic to handcuffs. Relax, will you? They won't find us. They can trace me from the other apartment. How? Gibson don't know your real name. Do you leave anything in the other place that will lead him here? No. Cleaned out everything except the clothes. I didn't have time to move them. <laughs> I noticed you got away with a mink. What do you want me to do? Leave it behind? No, no. We can hock it. Hock it? Yeah. You want to blow town? Takes cash. Cash I ain't got. You're telling me. Look, baby, if Gibson does go to the police, I'll have to hock the coat so we can blow this joint, eh? <sighs> All right. You go get rid of it, and I'll start throwing some things in the suitcase. Uh, who's that? How would I know? Maybe it's a landlady. Oh, I forgot. The paint in this floor today. Yeah, I saw the paint isn't 206. They'll probably start in this room in a couple of hours. Okay, okay. Duck that coat. I don't want the landlady to spot it. Yeah. Yeah, but... Gibson. So you really are married, huh? Who is it, Hawk? Hello, Virginia. Mr. Gibson? Yes, I waited around in front of the other apartment and followed you here. I wanted to be sure to send the police to the right place. Look, uh, Mr. Gibson, look... You look whatever your real name is. I don't like being blackmailed or threatened. But please... No, Virginia, my mind's made up. In a way, I'm sorry for you, but you didn't think about me. I'm past 60, and I'm tired of being made a fool. Look, why don't you give her a break, Mr. Gibbs? No, I'm not asking for me. That's very noble of you. You should have thought about that a few hours ago when you accused me of making love to your wife. You're not really married. There is no need of displaying your indignation. There'll be plenty of time for that when the police arrive. Huh? Yeah. Come in. Hey, how dare you? Take your hands off me. Look, you ain't calling nobody. You gonna listen to me? You take your hands off me! What are you gonna do, Hog? I'm gonna change his old goat's mind about calling the cops. You can't threaten me! No! Oh, oh you struck me! How'd you guess? Hog, take it easy. He's an old man. Your concern is misplaced, my dear. I can take care of myself. What? Why, you. Give me that chain. I'll be glad to give, give it to you across your shoulders. Give me that. Hog, be careful. Hit me with a chain, will you? No, young. I'll set you up for good. Oh, Hoppy! Uh, Hoppy! Uh, Idiot. Huh? You big stupid idiot. Look what you've done. All right, so what? No better next time. Throw some water on him. Why did you hear me? Throw some water on him. What's wrong? Uh, come on, come on, Gibson. Come on, come on. Holy cow. You see? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, sh- uh, shut up, shut up. <laughs> Gotta get him out of here. Why'd you have to hit him with a cane? Now you're in trouble. I'm in trouble. We're in trouble, baby. We, we. Stop that crying all over the place. Help me get him out of here. Oh, we're gonna do it. It's broad daylight. Yeah. Can't get him out of the building like this. We'll have to wait till the night. We can't leave him in here. Why not? The painters. What do you mean? What? They'll be here in a little while. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now what, genius? Shut up. Shut up, will you? Gotta think. Diamond. 
Diamond Detective Agency, murders financed while you wait. Oh, you idiot. Oh, is this Toodles Asher, the belle of Park Avenue? Ah, oh, this is Helen Asher, the girl that goes steady with the Diamond Detective Agency. Ah, uh-huh, sounds like a fine organization. Are they reliable? Very seldom. Oh. I'll tell you better as soon as I find out what I'm going to do tonight. You're going to give your butler the evening off, and the Diamond Detective Agency is going to march through your front door, single file, and show you a shortcut to spend the bottle. <laughs> what time does all this begin? How long will it take you to pucker? About two seconds. Well, I won't get there until eight. Don't hold it, or you'll end up looking like a Yubangi. You're terrible. Yeah, but I'm pretty. So is a baboon. Oh, well, what you said. You won't be late, will you, Rick? I don't know. After that last crack, I think I'd better start going steady with King Kong. Rick. No, I'm mad. Ricky, I love you. Only because I can hang by my tail and my fangs have that toothpaste smile. I think you're the most wonderful man in the world. Well? I think you're the handsomest, the strongest, the smartest. Well, all right. Now tell me something I don't already know. Rick. Bye, baby. See you at eight. Bye. A, I'm adorable. B, I'm so beautiful. C, I... Now, look, honey, I can't make it till 8 o'clock. I got a fan dancer who's a client. She wants to go out and trap an ostrich this afternoon. Is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Huh? Oh, yeah. Is this Mr. Diamond? Yeah, what's the matter? You sound like you're standing on a body. Oh, Mr. Diamond, please, you've got to help me. I I just don't know what to do. Now, take it easy. Who is this? <gasps> what's wrong? I thought it moved. What moved? The man sitting in my chair. Well, that happens now and then. Why shouldn't he? Oh, well, because he's dead. What? Yes. Yeah. I came home this afternoon from girls' camp, and when I unlocked my door and went in, I found this, uh, corpse sitting on my Heppelwhite. On your what? Heppelwhite. I don't know how he could have gotten there. Heppelwhite? No, the dead man. What about Heppelwhite? Who? The guy this corpse was sitting on. Oh, no, 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 no. That's a chair. Heppelwhite's an old antique chair. Oh. Uh, Oh, now I'm so confused. Well, move over, honey. Now take it easy and give me one thing at a time. Who's the dead guy? Well, I don't know. I never saw him before in my life. Okay. Now, why haven't you called the police? Well, I thought about that, but I'm a school teacher, Mr. Diamond, and I was afraid of the scandal. I read a lot of detective stories, and the first thing that came to my mind was calling a a private eye. Private eye. Mm-hmm. You had the biggest ad in the phone book, so naturally... Naturally. Well, give me your name and address, and I'll be right over. Oh, um... Esther Blodgett, uh, 419 East 79th Street, uh, apartment 108. Okay, Esther. Now, don't let anyone in and don't touch anything. Oh, oh, I know that, silly. After the initial shock wore off, I found myself in complete control. (gasps) What's the matter? I'm so nervous. I just lit a cigarette. It tasted so good, I offered one to the dead man. Well, if he takes it, remember how you did it. I'll be right over. Hmm. Apple white. Oh, is Walt going to have fun with this? Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Hello, Otis. Let me talk to the lieutenant. Diamond? No, this is Black Beauty. I just did a mile in 112, and I want to report that I've been doped. Very funny. I thought so. I didn't win the race, but I was the happiest horse on the track. Now, put the lieutenant on the phone. Uh, Lieutenant Levinson. Diamond, Walt. I don't want any. You take your killings to another precinct. Oh, now, don't be a sore head. Giving you business is just my way of showing my friendship. Can't we just be buddies at a distance? I'm getting tired of chasing corpses. Well, grit your teeth and get over to 419 East 79th Street, apartment 108. Homicide? Yeah. A dame named Esther Blodgett reported it. She lives there. Who's dead? Well, I don't know. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. A guy named Heppelwhite. Heppelwhite? Uh, You ask Esther about it. She'll put you straight. Are you coming over? Yeah. Bye. As I went out of my office, I thought about Esther Blodgett and wondered how mad she would be when the police turned up. I had to call them whether she wanted a scandal or not, because homicide comes first in my book. I'm an ex-cop, and I still follow the rules. It's not a conscience. I just like staying in business. So when someone turns up with a killing, I always let Lieutenant Walt Levinson know about it. I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was standing in Esther's apartment along with Walt, the dead man, and Heppelwhite. Oh, you're a swell fella, you are. What's the matter, Walt? I've been going through that Heppelwhite routine for the last 10 minutes. I just found out it was a chair, that one right over there, the one that stiffs in. Mr. Diamond, why did you call the police? I thought you'd ask that. Because that man's been murdered, Miss Blodgett. That's what good citizens do when they find a dead man in the apartment. But, but, but the scandal? I'm a school teacher. What will my students' mommies and daddies think? Honey, just confuse them with that Heppelwhite routine. 
What did you find out, Walt? Not much. The coroner will be here in a few minutes. Looks like someone gave him a pretty good beating. What's that all over his clothes? Uh, isn't that blood, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, he's been bleeding all right. I mean that brown stuff, Walt. Looks like lint or something. I noticed that, too. I don't know what it is. We'll have the lab analyze it. Uh, tell me, Esther, you said when you came in you unlocked the door. Yes, that's right. Are you sure it was locked? Why, yes, it, it has a catch lock. Besides, you have to turn the key and then use the other hand to turn the knob. Did, did you touch anything? Open any windows? I touched nothing. Hmm. Well, there's a good one, Walt. Yeah. A corpse sitting in a room with the door and all the windows locked. Do you always lock the windows when you go out, Miss Blodgett? Well, I've been away for several weeks at a girl's camp. Aren't you a little old for that sort of thing? Oh, I I've been counseling one of the teachers who goes along to take care of the young girls. Mm, what do you think, Rick? Well, he wasn't killed in this apartment. No, no signs of a struggle. There's only blood around the chair and on the body. He must have been carried in. And there would be blood trails on the floor. Not if he was carried in something. You uh, say you never saw this man before, Esther. Never in my life. Hmm. Any identification in his wallet? Yeah, name's Gibson. Leland Gibson. No money taken either, so that eliminates the robbery angle. Any address? Yeah, he's got an old driver's license. 12 East 64th Street. Pretty classy district. Judging by his clothes, he was well fixed. Tailored. Good store. And as soon as the coroner arrives, I'm going to check this apartment building. Maybe somebody heard something or saw something. Uh, well, uh, let me check the 64th Street address for you. This is a police job. Why do you want to check it? Oh, because poor Miss Blasey looks so unhappy. I am, Mr. Diamond. I am very unhappy. She was? So she's unhappy. If you want to check the place in your own, go ahead. But I'm sending some men over anywhere. Mr. Diamond, I like you. Well, thank you, Esther. No. I, I want to hire you to catch the killer and, and free me from this awful policeman. Awful policeman? Do you know how I got this way, Miss Blasey? Oh, I'm sure it wasn't easy. Good for you, Esther. I got this way because of this, this private detective. Just call me Blue Eye. Ever since he stopped working with me and left the force, I've gotten mixed up in more screwy cases than an alcoholic in a whiskey truck. There isn't one week that he doesn't turn up with one or two killings. My, he gets excited, doesn't he, Mr. Diamond? And in his spare time, he intimidates my sergeant. Just call me Rick, dear. I've taken enough bicarbonate in the last year to stop Vesuvius erupting. And if he doesn't give me a little peace and quiet, I'm going to end up solving a killing of my own. Rick, my, that's a nice name. How did you ever get to be a school teacher? You don't look the type. Are you listening to me? Oh, what makes me so different? I've seen signs on highways that say it better than I can. What are you two babbling uh, about? You mean the ones that say, uh, danger, stop, look, and listen? Well, that fits, but I was thinking about curves and soft shoulders. Oh, no. Now you listen to me, Diamond. This is serious business. A man's been killed in soft shoulders. I uh, mean, Miss Blanchett's apartment. If you want to take her on as a client, go ahead. But any questions from here on in will have to be gotten down at police headquarters. You are taking me in, Captain? Lieutenant. Yes, you'll have to come down for questioning. Rick. You go along with the big bad policeman, dear. I'll have you out in no time. Well, all right, if, if you say so, but this has never happened to me before. Oh, now, that's unfair. Oh. Walt, stop blubbering. Yes, Walt. what is it? Oh, you get out of here. Oh. Otis, where the devil is Otis? I left Walt jumping up and down in front of Esther and the corpse and headed for 12 East 64th Street. It was an old brownstone in one of the wealthier districts. And when I rang the doorbell, I got another surprise. Yes? Yes. Don't tell me you're a school teacher. I beg your pardon? You forget it. It's, uh, it's the landmarks that threw me. What do you want? Oh, do you know a Mr. Leland Gibson? Yes, he's my father. Now, just who are you? Name's Diamond. I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you, Miss Gibson. It's Father. Something's happened to Father. May I come in? Oh, I'm terribly sorry, yes. Now, please, what is it? What's happened to Dad? Well, uh... He's dead. Oh, no. No. Uh, look, I know this is tough, but you've got to help me. The police will be here any minute. The police? Yes, your father was murdered. Oh, I knew something like this would happen. You did? Well, tell me about it. Well, I, I don't mean that I expected Dad to be... <laughs> okay, now, just take your time. Cry it out. I, I'm sorry. Have you a handkerchief? Uh, sure, here. Thank you. Now, think you can talk about it? Dad left the house about three weeks ago and moved into a hotel. Did you have a fight or something? Oh, no, no. Everything was fine, but... No, no, hang on. Things 
Couldn't have been better. And he was in wonderful spirits when he left. No arguments, no hard feelings? He didn't leave mad? Oh, no, no, nothing like that. Then, uh, have you got any idea why he suddenly packed and moved into a hotel? Well, I'm not sure, but I think it was a woman. A woman? Yes, he... He told me one day that he'd met someone he liked very much. The day after that, he moved to the hotel, but I never saw her, and he never said anything more about her. Weren't you a little worried? Naturally. Father isn't a young man, and he... I mean, wasn't. Now, just one more question. What hotel did he move to? It... It was the Adams on Madison Avenue. He used to go there three nights a week for dinner and a game of bridge before he decided to move in. Well, thank you. Are you all alone? Yes. Got any friends you can call? A few, I guess. Well, call them. It's better not to be alone. And ball your head off. It'll do you some good. I'll, I'll send you your handkerchief, Mr... A diamond. A Richard Diamond. It's in the book. For some reason, I've got a talent for leaving people emotionally disturbed. Walt hops around like a rabbit in a cabbage patch, and Otis always tears his hair out by the hands full. Miss Gibson was less active about it. She just tried to smile and shed enough grief to fill the tub. I grabbed another cab and headed for the Adams Hotel. Yes, sir. Do you wish to register? No, but I want to find out about someone who did three weeks ago. Oh? Yeah, oh. Uh, Mr. Leland Gibson. Why, yes. He's staying at the hotel. From now on, that's past tense. Ah? I uh, don't understand. He hasn't notified us that he's leaving. Well, that might be a little difficult. If you'll run down to the morgue, I think you'll find out you're stuck with an empty room. The morgue? Yeah. Mr. Gibson has taken over one of the slabs, rent-free. Oh, my goodness. What happened? He's kind of dead. When did you last see him? Early this morning. He left the hotel around ten. Know where he was going? Why, no. Do you remember him having any visitors in the last three weeks? A girl, I mean. No. Are you looking for a girl? Uh, yeah. Mr. Gibson's daughter seems to think he was running around with a woman since he moved into the hotel. Oh. You say that like you knew what I was talking about. It was common gossip around the hotel. What was? Well, Mr. Gibson has been coming to the hotel for many years. He used to eat dinner here three nights a week and then play bridge with some of the hotel regulars. Now, about a month ago, we took on a new waitress. Uh Uh-huh. Now, it was very obvious that Mr. Gibson was quite taken by her. Uh, So much so that he moved into the hotel and ate at her table every night. Oh, what was her name? Virginia Pelgrim. Uh, Quite good-looking. About 5'3", dark brunette, very well... uh... Mm, I like to see her. That's impossible. She left the hotel about a week after Mr. Gibson arrived. Oh, so wasn't Mr. Gibson unhappy? Oh, no. He, He was rather happy, in fact. I believe he wanted her to move so he could see her more often. Now, what makes you say that? Some of the things she said in the kitchen to the other girls. Do you know where she might have moved? No. But uh, you might check with the flower shop. Mr. Gibson used to send flowers every day. Well, thank you. Well, I wasn't sure just where I was going, but Virginia Pelgrim was my best lead, and maybe she could tie the Gibson murder up with a silk ribbon. I talked to the flower clerk, and he gave me the address that the flowers had been sent to every day. It was a nice apartment in the village, and the landlady stuck her nose out like she was trying to smell me instead of see who was calling. Yes? I hope that door doesn't slam shut sometime. You'll have a bloody nose for weeks. What do you want? Roll out an eye with that nose, and I'll show you my badge. Aren't you cops ever polite to anyone? Well, there's a face that goes with it. I'm looking for a girl, about five foot three, dark brunette. You're not in the wrong place. Her name's Pelgrim. Oh, uh, she lives upstairs. She does, huh? Is she in now? No. Went out this morning. Hasn't come back. And she probably won't. She have many visitors? Only a couple. Men. That figures. Ever see an elderly man, gray hair, about 60? Sure, every day. Know his name? No. You said she had a couple of visitors. Who else? Another man. Younger, kind of greasy. Only came around a few times. Old man was there this morning, had an argument. Could you hear what they said? I don't snoop. Anyone else? No. Who paid her rent? She did. Cash. Mind if I take a look at her apartment? Got a search warrant? No. Then you can't. Okay, thanks. You've been charming. I left the old bat and headed back to the school teacher's apartment. If I was right, I'd seen setups like this before. But there was still the problem of finding out how Gibson was killed and how he got into a locked room. 
When I pulled up, I saw the wagon, complete with corpse and coroner, pulling away for the morgue. And when I went in and knocked on the door, I was certain that they'd forgotten one of the bodies. Oh, it's you, Shamus. Why, Otis. They're leaving without you. Who is? The hearse. Shouldn't you be lying down or uh, something? Now oh. you stop that Rick and get in here. Hello, Walt. What's new? Well, Rick. Well, Esther, has Otis been using his rubber hose on you? Oh, no, no, but I was getting lonesome. I'm glad you got back so soon. You are. As soon as you two stop rolling your eyes, maybe you can tell me what you found out, Mr. Diamond. Yeah. Walt, send Otis down to the station for a search warrant. Then tell him to get over to 9 West 12th Street and see what he can find in the Miss Virginia Pelgrim's apartment. Who's Virginia Pelgrim? The only person who was mixed up with a murdered man. There was another man who used to see her, but I can't find out who he was. All right. Otis, go get the warrant. Yeah, Lieutenant. Thanks, Diamond. A pleasure, Sergeant. What did you find out, Walt? There were 11 people in the building at the time of the killing. None of them ever saw the guy before. Here's a list of the names. Three people on this floor, five on the second, and three more on the third. Have you talked to the landlady? Certainly. She doesn't know any more about it than the rest. What about that funny brown lint on the dead man's clothes? We're checking on that right now. The lab said they'd call me. Did the landlady say she had a key to this apartment? Sure, sure, but she hasn't used it but once since Miss Blodgett was away at girls' camp. When did she use it? Three days ago, when she had let the painters in. And she says that the windows and door were definitely locked, because after she aired the paint smell out, she locked them herself. Painter, huh? Yes, and I've been looking. You know, I think they did a terrible job. Why, the kitchen Esther. alone... Uh, yes, Rick? Uh, later, dear. Uh, yes, Rick? Walt, did they paint the whole building? They finished the second floor today. Oh, I'll get it, Miss Blodgett. Probably the lab. Rick, yeah. do you know who did it? Yeah. I got a hunch. Oh, I see. you're wonderful. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Lab, Walt? Yeah. That lint you spotted on the dead man's clothes is from the mat that they put under rugs. Mm-hmm. Walt, you were on all the floors. Did one of the apartments have a rug missing? They were all missing from the second floor. The tenants took them down to the basement when the painters moved in. Any off this floor or the third? No, just the second. Well, your killers are on the second floor, Walt. How do you figure? Well, let's look at what we've got. Dead body in a locked room. Blood on body and floor around body, but nowhere else in the room. Carried in. In a rug. Bullseye. Oh! This is so exciting. Uh, Esther. Uh, sorry. Yeah, but uh, how does a dame called Pelgrim figure into it? There's no Pelgrim listed in this building. Well, there shouldn't be if I'm right. The dead man met Virginia Pelgrim while she was working as a waitress in his hotel. She gave him a pitch and he fell. He put her up in an apartment so he could see her more often. So what? I think she was working with another man. A man who was seen around her apartment by the landlady. And how did the body get over here? The guy the dame was working with probably lives here. What about the motive? Well, my guess is that Gibson was being blackmailed, and he followed the girl here. He was probably going to yell cop, so they killed him. Okay, now what about the locked room? Explain that. I'll let the landlady of this building explain it, Walt. Go ask her one question. Who had this apartment before Miss Blodgett? Uh, uh, Esther... Oh, I'm sorry, Esther. Well, I can tell you that. A, um, a Mr. and Mrs. Austin, they moved to a smaller apartment and let me have this one. It's more rent and they couldn't afford it, I expect. Uh, this is a better apartment, though. It has very... Esther, uh, hmm? what apartment did they take? Oh, uh, it's on the next floor, apartment 209. Mm, according to this list of people who were on the second floor at the time of the killing, the Austins are the only couple. What did Mrs. Austin look like, Walt? No, oh, about... Five foot three, dark brunette, very, very well... Oh, say no more. Come on, Walt. Uh, may I come? Uh, no, Esther. You stay here. I'll be back later and discuss the better features of your nice little apartment. Yeah? I want to talk to you again, Mr. Austin. Why? Told you everything I know. Where's your wife? In the back. We're coming in. Okay, you don't have to shove. Who is it, Hall? Ah, them cops again. Well, hello, Virginia. Do I know you? Where's your rug, Mr. Austin? What? It's down the basement. Miss Pelgrim, how long have you been married to this man? About three. Hey, how'd you know me? Shut up. Know your name? You might as well tell the lieutenant everything. Why did you lie about knowing Mr. Gibson? I didn't. I, I never saw him before in my life. I didn't tell you the dead man's name was Gibson. How'd you know that? Don't answer that. Oh, shut up. You and your husband killed Mr. Gibson and carted him downstairs in a rug. Why'd we do that? Because the painters were on their way to paint your apartment. You had to get him out of without being seen. You dumped him in Miss Blodgett's apartment because you knew she was out of town. And you used to live there, so you still had a key. Um, you shut up. We've got enough to hold both of you on. The rug will have bloodstains on it. Oh, get out of the way. Get out, Walt. 
Why, Walt, you're so rough. Yeah. I, I didn't kill him. Harvey did. I didn't kill him. Okay, okay. You can tell me all about it down at the station. Hey, where are you going? Well, it's 6.30. I got a date. Well, what about Miss Blodgett? She's going to get lonesome again. Ah, she was born that way. I've got to see a girl who's going to hold a pretty interesting class of her own. Bye. Don't you look comfortable. Where's Francis? I gave him the night off, like you suggested. Ah, you're cute. <laughs> I've got a cool dinner in the library. School day, school day. You sound happy. Well, I was just thinking about a school teacher I knew once. Hmm, that looks mighty toothy. Sing for your supper. What? Got a new tune on the piano. Oh, honey, I'm hungry. You sing first, and then you can eat. Oh, oh all right. What is it? Right here. So in love. Oh, okay. Strange, dear, but true, dear, when I'm close to you, dear, the stars fill the sky, so in love with you am I. Oh, keep going, I'll get it. Even... Without you, my arms fall about you. You know, darling, why so in love with you am I? Some girl asking for you. Oh, some girl. Well, well. I told her there was no one here but the piano tuner. Oh? She leave her name? Uh huh. Heppel White. Heppel White? Yes. Hmm. Who's she? Uh, come here, baby. No. I want to know who she is. I said come here. No, I. Oh. Oh. Ricky. Mm hmm. Who's Heppel White? Oh, it's just a chair, baby. A cute blonde chair. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell, transcribed. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Georgia Ellis, Tony Barrett, Joan Banks, and Norman Field. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards. Now, this is Eddie King reminding you that Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the bestseller novel, Mrs. Mike, and inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday night brings some of the week's best radio entertainment when you tune for the stars on NBC. Stay tuned every Saturday for a great lineup of programs, including Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, and Grand Ole Opry. All the best on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. I've got a little office near 53rd Street on Broadway, 8th floor. My business? Trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, take your pick. If you come up with something unusual, a new kind of trouble, drop around and see me. Because I'm known along the big street as a shamus, a gumshoe. Or to the guy on Park Avenue as a private detective. If you happen to be stuck with your problem, 
For $100 a day in expenses, I'll chase it around until I can catch up and break its back. I average about 20 fast rounds a week with old man trouble, and so far, the decision's been on my side. But uh, don't misunderstand me. It's my business to beat him, but I respect him. Trouble goes to work with every trick in the book. So I play it the same way, and believe me, when I put him away for the count, I don't clap my little hands in glee. I know he's just taking a rest, and he'll be back again with some new stunts. Want to know how he works? Well, the other day, I was on the way to my office. I stopped at the corner newsstand, 53rd and Broadway, to buy a paper and to say hello to an old friend. Hi, Mr. Diamond. Well, hello, Jeff. How's the newspaper business? Oh, swell. How's the detective racket? Oh, swell. Hey, you don't sound too happy. Jeff, I couldn't be happier if my hair was on fire. Take my advice, son, when you grow up. Be sure and get a job that pays off every week in that little white envelope. Don't ever become a private detective. It's like a penny getting lost in a gum machine. Well, I'm going to stick to the newspaper business. Good for you. Say, I was just about to go across the street to Mary Lou's and get some ice cream. How about it? Can I buy you a cone? Now, that is a beautiful idea. Let's go. Aren't you coming to work a little late, Mr. Diamond? Well, uh, you see, Jeff, I, I was up kind of late. Research, you know. Yeah, I know. I see him going into your office all the time. That blonde last week stopped traffic all the way to 42nd Street. Yeah, she was lovely. Got tired of social standards and shot her husband right through his morning cup of coffee. Was that the one in the headlines? That's the one. Oh, hello, Jeff. Hi, Mary Lou. Take a seat, Mr. Diamond. Well, what did you and your friend have? Well, I'm going to have a double strawberry. How about it, Mr. Diamond? Sounds great. Two double strawberries. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Diamond, Mary Lou. His office is in that building across the street. Oh, how do you do? Mm, how are you, Mary? Well, all right, I guess. Business could get better, and I wouldn't mind at all. <laughs> Here are your cones. This is on me, Mr. Diamond. Oh, no, no, put it away. Oh, now, come on. I asked you over, and that makes it my treat. Here's a five, Mary Lou. Mr. Diamond's money isn't any good today. Tell you what I'll do, Jeff. Give me a five a minute. Sure, here. Now, if you can tell me whose picture's on this bill, you can buy the cones. That a deal? That's a deal. Lincoln. <laughs> well, what's the matter? That's right, isn't it? Hmm? Oh, yeah. What's wrong? Where did you get this bill, Jeff? Well, I just made change for it a few minutes. Hey, what's the matter with that dough? <laughs> you two act like you've never seen a $5 bill before. Well, this fin's counterfeit. What? That's right. Good job, too. You sure? Yep. One of the best, in jo best engraving jobs I've ever run across. Paper's not too good. Oh, that's swell. That's real great. I get just out of a whole five bucks. Who gave it to you? I remember the guy, all right. He came by just before you did. Made change for him, the heel. Yeah, five bucks is a lot of papers. I'll say it is. Well, maybe you're wrong. You could be. <laughs> Not Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective. Used to be a cop. Look, Jeff, mind if I take this bill along with me? Nah. What good's it gonna do me? Well, it's not so bad. Here, I'll give you a good five for it. No, sir. You only learn by mistakes. I made a big one, so I'm out five. I'll get along. Look, it's worth the five. I'm just buying it from you. Uh, sure, Jeff. Uh, go ahead and take it. Uh-uh. Thanks a lot, Mr. Diamond, but I just can't. Okay, Jeff. Maybe I can find the guy who slipped this to you. Maybe we can get your five back. What are you going to do? Ah, uh, take a run down to the 5th Precinct. See how much of this stuff is floating around New York. Now, uh, I want you to do something for me, Jeff. Sure, anything. I want you to keep an eye out for the guy who gave you this phone. I'm way ahead of you. Well, now, that's what I'm afraid of. I want you to promise me, if you do spot him, not to do anything until you get in touch with me. Promise? Yeah, okay. Well, I'll be at the station. Ask for Lieutenant Levinson's office. Right. Uh, here's for the ice cream, Mary Lou. Good ice cream, too. Oh, thanks. I make it here. Right in back. Take a quart home some night. I always do, but it generally has a cork in it. I left Mary Lou's ice cream parlor and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. I don't usually start something like that, but when a kid gets fleeced out of a whole day's pay, I get a little hot under the collar. I walked into the squad room and spotted Sergeant Otis putting shine on his big shoes. Oh, it's you, Diamond. Now, what good is that going to do you, Otis? You can lose a whole can of polish in the cracks. What do you mean? My shoes ain't cracked so bad. Well, maybe not, but I've seen bacon that look better. Uh, uh. If you want to see the lieutenant, go on in. Thank you, Sergeant. Until we meet again. Uh, why don't you stop trying to be so funny? Sergeant, I'll do it if you'll do something for me. What? Cut off your head. That face could start a Harry Carey epidemic. Uh... Hello, Walt. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now, what the devil's the uh-huh about? 
What do you mean? That bilious explosion you just popped up with. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Sound like you just swallowed a whole pineapple. Why? What do you mean, why? Who's dead? Huh? The body you said you found. The body I said... Uh-oh, no, no, Walt. You're not built for it. Who? No, Walt. It's my routine. It won't work for you. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, sure you do. You wanted to know who's dead. Well, I'm not going to tell you. Huh? Don't try to be cute with me. You know what it's all about. I'm not going to be the fall guy. You just hunt for the body. Wait a minute. I don't know anything about a body. You wanted to know who's dead, didn't you? Sure, but that was just a gag. Okay, have your fun, but I'm not going to tell you. Tell me what? Who's dead? You mean somebody really is? What are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about what you just said. Now, who's dead? That's a stupid question. Why is it? Well, if you don't know who's dead, what the devil are you doing in charge of homicide? Go on over to the robbery detail. Now, you wait a minute. You said... Yes, Walt? Oh, get out of here. I did not. I never said, oh, get out of here. When I came in, I said, hello, Walt, and you said, "Uh uh-huh. Then I said, what do you mean, "Uh uh-huh? You wanted to know where the body was. I did not. I said, who's dead? Why? Oh, no, 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 please. I'm an old man. Oh, Walt, get away from that window and take a look at this. Oh, please. Do I have to? It'll probably explode. Now, be a good boy and open your rude eyes. All right, but I just know I'll be sorry. Yeah. Hmm? You don't owe me any money. Well, if I did, I'd make sure to pay off on this stuff. Why, what's wrong with... Where'd you get this? Some guy slipped it to Jeff, the newsboy. He got change for it. Oh, that certainly is a nice stunt. Well, maybe the guy didn't know he was passing counterfeit. I doubt it. You don't give a newsboy five bucks for a paper. Okay, tell me about it. The stuff's been flooding the city. We can't get a lead. Picked up a couple of passes, but they won't crack. How do they work? Look, Rick, this isn't my department. The Treasury boys are working on it right now. Why don't you go over and talk to them? Well, if you want to be snooty about it. Now, you wait a minute. Diamond. Yeah? Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Is Mr. Diamond there? Wait a minute. Rick, it's for you. Yeah, wait just a minute. Here, Diamond, and if you're mixed up in something... Walt, be quiet. Hello? Mr. Diamond? Yeah, Jeff? Yeah, I just thought of the guy who slipped me the phony bill. He went into the bar next to the ice cream parlor. You stay where you are. I'll be right over. I'll be at the stand. Rick. Yeah? Please. Walt. Yeah? Bye. <laughs> Jeff. Oh, Mr. Diamond. He hasn't come out yet. He's still in the bar. Come on. Where are we going? Leave your papers for a second. I want you to point him out. Okay. He's a big guy. You better be careful. Big guys always make me careful. You want me to go in with you? Just stick your head in the door and point him out, and then go on back to your papers. If I start bleeding, I'll scream. See him? No. Yeah, there he is. Over in that booth. Well, well, well. You know him? Yeah. Go on back to your stand. Oh, golly, Mr. Diamond, can I... No, Jeff, go on back. Okay. Hello, Walker. Oh. What do you want, Shamus? Well, I'll have a talk. Mind if I sit down? Does it make any difference? Not much. Then sit. You, uh, passed a phony five spot this morning. I did? Well, shame on me. How many more you got on you? I don't know what you're talking about. You want me to turn you upside down and shake it out of you? Diamond. Yeah? Boo. Walker. Yeah? Oh, hey, you... Let go! Oh, I busted my arm. You want it back? Yeah. Yeah. Now, now let's see your pockets. Okay, okay. Get on your feet. I want to see what you're doing. All right. Okay, dump him. Hey, hey, what's going on here? Just relax, bartender. I'm taking care of some business. Well, there ain't going to be any rough stuff in my joint, so you better relax, sonny. Yeah, make this guy take his big paws off of me. He's trying to shake me down. Oh, yeah? You want me to call the cops, sonny? Maybe that's not a bad idea. How about it, Walker? You want him to call the law? I don't care who he calls. Just get out of my way, Diamond. You're not going anywhere. No, no, I told you to lay off, sonny, and I meant it. Let him go, you hear me? Look out, he's making a break. Just let him be. Get out of my way, Pop. Too old to lose another set of teeth. I ain't turning you loose until that guy makes the street. Sorry, Pop. You better take a chair. <laughs> Mr. Diamond, what happened? You see which way you went? Yeah, there it goes around that corner. Stay at the ice cream parlor, Jeff, so I can get you if I need you. I took off like a seagull in the hurricane. I turned the corner and spotted my man jumping into our cab, so I did the same. He led me across town to a little dive on 13th Street and got out of his cab. 
My boy parked up the block, and we watched while Walker looked around for a tail. When he was satisfied he'd given me the shake, he went in. I paid off my cabbie and followed. It was another bar, and Walker wasn't anywhere in the room. I sat down, ordered a beer, and waited. After about ten minutes, I saw a couple of guys wander out of a door in the back. A couple of minutes later, a couple of more wandered out. So I wandered in. It was a small-time gambling setup. The kind you can throw in the back of your car if the cops come. I started getting that lousy feeling again. You don't just walk into a place like that unless someone wants you to. And if they do, it's usually because they got it fixed so you stay around. Maybe permanently. What are you tailing me for, Diamond? Why? Make you uncomfortable? Yeah. That's a cozy setup. Good way to get rid of bad money. Pay the winner off with counterfeit. I think we'd better go back to my office. Oh, I don't know. I might have a little fun here. I'll bet if one of those guys at the table knew he was going to be paid off in counterfeit, he'd just about tear this place apart. And you too. Diamond, don't be stupid. Oh, something new's been added. Yeah, and it makes so much noise when it goes off. Let's go back to my office, huh? For some reason, I just can't think of a good argument not to. This way. Have a seat. My uh, ankles get lumpy when I sit down. Bad circulation. And stand on your head. Uh, it doesn't work. I keep talking to toes all day. How'd you get onto this setup? Oh, luck. You passed a bad bill to a newspaper boy. He spotted you for me. You know what happens to you? No. As a matter of fact, I was thinking what's going to happen to you. What do you mean? Treasury boards, homicide, fifth precinct. And tomorrow we're taking a full page ad in the time. You should do a big business. You're lying. Okay. I think I'll sit down while you wrestle with it. You mean the team I know about this place and me? The only way they'll get to know you any better is when they give you a room number at Sing Sing. Oh, you mind if I put my feet up? Oh, go ahead. He kept asking questions, not waiting for answers. He was good and worried. And as long as I could keep him that way, the longer I was going to keep on breathing. I don't believe one rotten thing you said, Diamond. Okay. He kept trying to convince himself that I was lying. He wanted to shoot me in the worst way. He moved around behind his desk and sat down. Bless his little heart. I had both feet on the front of his desk, so I shoved out his heart. I pinned him against the wall with the desk and jumped up to get better leverage. I shoved so hard the front of the desk nearly cut him in two. He was stuck and he couldn't use his arms. I I can't breathe. You want to tell me about it? I I don't know a thing. Okay. It will look pretty silly from the waist down. Come on, Walker. If I mash you anymore, they'll be able to use you for wallpaper. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now leave the gun in your pocket. When I pull the desk back, put your hands on top of it. You try a stunt and you end up in half. <sighs> okay. What do you want to know? Who's the big wheel behind the counterfeit ring? You give me a chance if I tell you? No deals. I can't blame you for trying. All right, you try it. Now, you want back in the vice? No, 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 no. I'll tell you. Walker. Walker. He died with his head rolled back and his eyes staring up like he wanted to starve for trying. Whoever shot him had been out in the alley and had nailed him through the window. I looked out, but the killer had disappeared. So I put in a call to homicide, and finally Walt and his boys arrived. Diamond, don't you ever get tired of corpses? Well, of course not. I just do my bit and then try to make you happy. Hey, you want me to call the wagon and get the corner downhill, Lieutenant? No, Otis. I thought we might all sit around and wait for the dead man to say something. Oh, uh, I was only asking, Lieutenant. Well, start using that mallet head of yours, you mallet head, and make a report. Okay. Now, Diamond, I want to know how you got mixed up in this thing. Well, the dead man was the one who slipped the paper boy the 45. I tailed him, and he was just about to tell me who was behind the ring when he got a hole in his head. Oh, he was going to tell you, was he? Just like that. What did you do, set his clothes on fire? No. We were playing truth and consequences, and he fibbed, so I... Now, you stop that. This guy was the only link we had on the counterfeit ring. And you have to fix it so he dies. Rick, there's enough phony money floating around New York right now to start another Black Friday. This is the best setup we've run into since Dad Foster operated in 1937. Dad Foster? Yeah, Dad Foster. You remember hearing about him. Yeah, is he still doing time? No, he served his sentence and he's gone straight ever since. How do you know? Where is he? He runs a little saloon on 53rd Street. 53rd? Thanks, Bob. Oh, now, you wait a minute. Who the devil are you calling? A quiz program. I want to win an elected chair. Oh. 
Mary Lou's ice cream parlor. Is uh, Jeff the newsboy there? Why, yes. It's for you, Jeff. Thanks. Hello? Jeff, this is Mr. Diamond. I want you to do me a favor. Sure, anything for you. Okay, now, you know the saloon next to the ice cream parlor? Yeah. You know the bartender? Yeah, old guy. Buys a paper from me every night. All right. Now, stay in the parlor and keep an eye on the front of the saloon. If the bartender comes out, find out where he goes. But for Pete's sake, be careful. Sure, Mr. Diamond. I'll do what you say. Is something up? Well, could be. Now, if anything happens before I get there, call Lieutenant Levinson. I'll tell you all about it when I see you. Getting to be a pretty important fellow, Jeff. Phone calls now. Oh, that was Mr. Diamond. He wants me to stay here and keep an eye on the front of the saloon. Okay? Oh, sure, of course. But why did he want you to do that? Oh, it's something big, I think. Something to do with the bartender that works there. The bartender? Yeah. I'll just sit up in front here and keep an eye out. Uh, look, Jeff, watch the store for me, will you? I've got to go in back and pack some ice cream to be sent out. Sure. Mary Lou! Mary Lou! Guess I'd better get it myself. Mary Lou's ice cream parlor. Can I talk with Mary Lou? She went in back. I'll get her for you. Just a minute. Thank you. I tell you, it's getting too risky. That diamond's a private detective. Yeah, he came in the bar and started to rough up Walker. Well, that stupid Walker should have been more careful about passing out that money. What if Diamond catches him and makes him talk? He caught up. <laughs> but he didn't make Walker talk. What do you mean? I took care of Walker. I got a good shot at him from the alley. Well, maybe it's better like that. But look, if we don't... Hello? Yes? Mary Lou isn't here. Get off the line. What? What? Yeah, get off! Get me the 5th Precinct Police Station. It's a matter of life and death. I'll connect you. Oh, golly, please hurry. I'm ringing. 5th Precinct. Is Mr. Richard Diamond around there? He said to call Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, Diamond isn't here. That is the lieutenant. You know where I can reach them? Yeah, but that's about set on. Who's this? I'm a friend of Mr. Diamond's. I'm in an ice cream parlor. Ice cream parlor? Look, son. No, uh, no. I just heard someone say that they'd killed a man named Walker. And I think I know who's behind the counterfeit ring. What's the address? It's... Uh, 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 Hello. Uh, Hello, kid. Uh, What's wrong? Uh, Hello. Good lucky we came out this way. I wonder how he heard us. He walked back and opened the door. What are we going to do with him? Well, we'll tie him up and gag him. There's a closet in the back, and we can put him in there until he's safe to take him out. No. Hey, but he's making too much trouble the way he is. <laughs> Okay. I can get him back there. You better go on over to the bar in case someone shows up. All right. Later tonight, I'll take the kid down to the river and teach him how hard it is to swim when he's dead. Listen here, young fella. If you're back here for trouble... Dad, I'm back for a lot of trouble, and I think you're going to help me out. You'd better leave, Sonny, or I'll call the law. Why don't you? What do you want? I want to know how long you've been back in the counterfeit racket. Now, look, Sonny, I've been going straight for a long time. You know something, Dad? I don't think so. Let's get down to the station and talk about it. You got a warrant, Shamus? I got a nasty disposition. You want me to show you? No. You want a gun, Dad? Why... What difference does it make? I'm going to look at it. A guy named Walker got dead from a gun. Now, let's let, let's see it. Sonny. Uh, what is it? I can't show it to you. Yeah, why not? Because I got it under the bar, pointed right at your belly. If I drag it out, it might scare the customers. Oh, it's like that, huh? It sure is. You see that door there in the back? I know. Uh, that's a good boy. You just keep walking along your side of the bar and don't try anything. I just had my floor scrubbed. It'd be a shame to spill you all over. Okay. Open the door. Go on now. Up the alley. You shoot Walker? I might have. Now, 
Where you got your printing presses? You're just full of questions, aren't you, Sonny? Okay. Stop here. Behind the ice cream parlor, huh? Well, well, well. Mary! Uh, make mine hot fudge with the nuts. Mary! But just a minute. Say, what's the idea? I got you... Oh. Oh, good afternoon. I'm selling a new brand of Indian nuts. Great for banana splits. What's the shamus doing here? He's too smart. I gotta cut off his education. Are you crazy? This guy's got friends. That kid was calling the fifth precinct, remember? Kid? Yeah, your your little news hound. What did you do with him? He's all right until tonight. We got him locked up. Dad, I think I'll make you eat that thirty eight. I don't think so. No difference if I kill you right here. Oh, hold it, Dad. We can't have a gun going off back here. Even if we could hide the shamus, they'd find the presses. Oh, so that's it. Those ice cream machines, the cover-up. Ain't he smart. What do you do? Ship the stuff out in ice cream cartons? What's with you? You want a tour of inspection? Oh, now, take it easy. He won't be smart for long. Well, how are you going to do it? We're going to take a walk, aren't we, shamus? Oh, I have the most horrible instep. I'll never make it without skates or something. You'll make it. Come on, the car's on front. Hi. Hey, what's happening to the street? Oh, Dad. Well, yeah, now, there, it's only some drunk come out of the bar the wrong way. Funny, I didn't see him in Oh, here. this is very confusing. If this is 53rd Street, somebody's stolen some buildings. Oh, hi. Hello. Now, take it easy, Shamus. I'm putting the gun in my pocket, but it's still right in line with your belt. I'm going back inside. No, 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 no. Play it straight. Just like we were talking. Well, you're pretty unsociable, to say the least. What's the matter? Can't you even say Hello. I'm lost. Uh, sure, sure. You're you're in an alley. The entrance is right out there. Oh, yeah? Oh, would you mind showing me? I seem to be a little confused. Now, look, it, it's right up there. Just keep going. Hey, where'd you go? Oh, no. Oh, there you are, Lieutenant. Lieutenant. Get the cop. Look out, Walt. Get the go, Walt. Come on, Dad. Give me the gun. Let go of me. Let me go, you lousy cop. You got him, Rick? Come on, play. Get me. There. Now you will. Let Just take go. it easy, lady. Hey, what's going on? Otis. Yeah? Go out and start walking around the block. Huh? You hear me? Go on. Okay, but I don't get it. What do you want me to walk around the block for? I want you to get used to it, because that's what you're going to be doing for the rest of your time on the force. Oh. In Flatbush. Flatbush? Yes. No. <laughs> Mr. Diamond, thanks for the dinner invitation, but where are we going? Well, I'm going to introduce you to Miguel. She's a redhead, Jeff, so no cracks about my office research. Oh, sure. But don't you think you should have called her first? How do you know she's got enough dinner? Jeff, this girl's got more steaks in her deep freezer than a bullfight arena sees in a year. Here we are. Yes? Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Good evening, Francis. Uh, This is Jeff, Francis. He's going to have dinner with us. Hi. Oh, Hi. Uh, come right in. Uh, Miss Asher's in the study, Mr. Diamond. Thank you, Francis. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yes? You know the various items that you've left with me for safekeeping? Oh, uh, 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 look, Francis, I promise I'll get them out of hock as soon as I get a paying client. Oh, no, no, it's not that, sir. I didn't really want to hold them as security in the first place. But as long as you insisted in it's such a fine collection, I'd like to show them to... Well, to my girl, sir. Why, sure, Francis. I didn't know you had a girl. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. She's the upstairs maid in the apartment below us. Oh. I'm afraid I told her a wee fib to get acquainted, as it were. She thinks I'm an undercover agent, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to prove it. Well, well my gun and the bad should do the trick. And uh, if it doesn't work, just get under a cover. <laughs> oh, my George, that was the real... <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, come on, Jeff. We're not appreciated. Rick. Oh, hello. Hello. Hello, and this is Jeff, the boy who's helping me send Dad Foster and company back to prison. Jeff, this is Helen Asher. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Jeff. They had him locked up in the closet for a couple of hours, and he looked kind of hungry when he got him out. Uh, how about it, honey? You think you can grind up another cow? Oh, well, there's plenty for Jeff and me, but you've got to make up for three things. Three things? Yes. First of all, you haven't called me in two days. Second, you're half hour late for dinner. And third, well, I'll tell you later. Uh, I'll leave the room if you want me to. No, no, Jeff. You stay right here. 
You're going to literally see a man sing for his supper. Helen. All right. Come on, Jeff. We'll go dig into those nice, fat, juicy steaks. Oh, boy. Steaks? Uh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. My taste buds just started whipping each other. My vibrato may sound like a machine gun, but I'll do it. I thought you were kidding. Is he really going to sing, Miss Asher? No, I'm not going to sing Miss Asher. <laughs> I'm going to do a little song I used to sing with hip boots and a gondola. Oh. You're breaking my heart cause you're leaving. You've fallen for somebody new. It isn't too easy believing you'd leave after all we've been through. It's breaking my heart to remember the dreams we depended upon. You're leaving a slow dying ember. I'll miss you, my love, when you're gone. I wish you joy, though teardrops burn. But if someday you should want to return, please hurry back and we'll make a new start Till then you're breaking my heart Mr. Diamond, did you really sing in a gondola with hip boots on? Yeah, that's right, Jeff. Well, I know you don't need the hip boots anymore. Will you loan them to me? What for? I want to wait out of here. <laughs> well, get him. For that, you get two desserts. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Tommy Bernard, Sammy Hill, Lou Krugman, and Polly Bear. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> Saturday night brings you some of the week's best radio entertainment when you tune for the stars on NBC. Stay tuned to NBC every Saturday evening for a great lineup of programs, including Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, and Grand Ole Opry. All the best on NBC. Stay tuned now for Victor Mature and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, I like to say that. Hello there, this is Diamond. I don't know why. Maybe it's just because I say it all the time. Hello there, this is Diamond. You know, I think it sounds kind of, well, pretty bad. Of course, I'd rather say, hello there, this is I've Got a Sponsor, Diamond, but that's silly, too, because if I had a sponsor, I wouldn't have time to say, hello there, this is Diamond. I'd be overshining his shoes. Confused? Well, so am I. Want to get really mixed up? Let me tell you what happened last week. This is real silly. So silly, it wound up with murder. I was sitting in my office thinking about June Allison when the phone rang. 
Diamond Detective Agency, no other corpse can make that statement. Oh, Rick. Don't believe it? Just listen to what one of our satisfied customers has to say about Diamond. I've been buried now in 30 years. Rick. Hello, Helen. <laughs> you idiot. What are you doing? I know this will throw you. Nothing. No washing today? Finished an hour ago. Oh, uh, by the way, I got a beef. A beef? Yeah, those socks you knitted for me shrunk so much I need four more pair. Well, if they shrunk, what do you want with four more pair? Going to start a new fad. Going to wear them on my toes, you know, toe socks. Well, if I knit you four pair, that'll only give you ten altogether. Oh, <laughs> by George, you really pulled off a speedy, didn't you? Well, howdy. <laughs> Wasn't half as bad as some of those ghastlies you come up with. All right, Smarty, now, what's on your rear mind? Why don't you do me a favor? Like, for instance? No, for instance. I told you a friend of mine would come up and see you, and I want you to do what you can for him. Mr. Diamond. Uh, hold it a minute, honey. Yeah? Mr. Diamond, I was told to look you up. I am Renee. Rick, what is it? Helen. Yeah, what's the matter? Something just tiptoed into my office. I got a hunch you know about it. Oh, maybe that's Renee. That's what it says. If you are, Mr. Diamond, I wish you'd please pay a little attention to me or aren't you interested in a potential client? Uh, hold it a second, honey. Uh, uh, sure, I'm always interested in a potential client. What did you do, lose your wedges? I beg your pardon? Forget it. I've got Miss Asher on the phone now. She just told me you were coming up. Oh, well, please say hello to Miss Asher. She's such a darling. Yeah. Uh, honey, Renee says to say hello. Says you're a darling. Oh, well, say hello to Renee. He makes my hats for me. I'll get the story from him. Call you later. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Rene... Your full name is Benet. Rene Benet. How do you do? How are you, Mr. Benet? Mr. Diamond, I have a problem, and Miss Asher seemed to think that you could help me with it. Well, it depends. Cigarette? No, thanks. I never use them. Depends on what? You don't even know my problem yet. Look, I don't care if you swipe John Frederick's toupee for $100 a day in expenses. I'll grow a mattress on his skull. Mr. Diamond, I can see that you don't know much about hats. You are so wrong. Oh, am I? Well, it may interest you to know that John Fredericks are two people, Mr. John and Mr. Fredericks. Look, uh, Mr. Bernay, I don't care if they're patrol number three of the Brownies. Can you afford a hundred a day in expenses? Mr. Diamond, I am the new sensation in hats. You must look lovely. Okay, Mr. Bernay, I take it you can afford me. Now, what's your problem? I want you to prevent the theft of my three latest creations. Hats? Creations, Mr. Diamond. Okay, creations. Why do you want them protected? Why, because someone is going to steal them before my fall showing. How do you know that? Because on similar occasions, the same thing has happened. Twice, to be exact. The designs were stolen, and two weeks later, that low-life George Marchand had his showing, and my hats were the high point of his show. What did you do? What could I do? I couldn't prove it. If I attempted to expose him, he would have said that I was lying. Everybody knows how much we hate each other. I'd have been a laughingstock. Do you think he had the hat stolen? I'm sure of it. And I'm also sure that someone in my salon is responsible for the actual theft. You know definitely? No. No, but I suspect my partner, Gerald Winters. He's always been jealous of my ability. Oh, Mr. Diamond, couldn't you open a window or something? It's frightfully hot. Oh, uh, it's, uh, it's the air conditioning. I keep a bag of red lip jumbos up in the vent. Sometimes they get stuck. Red lip jumbos? Pistachio nuts. You like hats? I get hung up on pistachio nuts. Perhaps you should see a psychiatrist. I did. What happened? I sent him five pounds of pistachios just yesterday. Oh. Oh, well, here's my card. I'll see you at my salon, Mr. Diamond, in about an hour. Oh, oh, and something else. I don't want my partner or the help to know that you're a private detective. What am I supposed to do, buy a hat? Well, I'll, I'll tell them that you're a designer from Hollywood. That way, whatever you say will be all right. See you in an hour. <laughs> Richard of Hollywood is coming here to look at our new line. That's correct, Lillian. Never heard of him. Well, that's not so surprising, Gerald. There are a lot of people I'm sure you've never heard of, especially the more famous ones. I don't like that. Oh, don't you? Well, I'm overjoyed that you're sure of one thing, at least. Now, don't you two start fighting again. I've never heard of this Richard of Hollywood either. Well, he's a, he's a new man, works for the studios. He's made quite a sensation the last year or so. Well, I'm sick and tired of temperamental artists. I'm going back to my office. Well, why don't you do that, Gerald? Keep the books in the black, dear Potter, while I work to pay for your salary. You know, Rennie, someday I'm going to strangle you with one of your own hats. Why don't you buy yourself a barbell instead? Then the next time you get into a bathing suit, there'll be no doubt that you have muscles. Oh, this boy. 
How can you two continue like this? It's frightful. Lillian, my love, I would rather join forces with a cobra than to keep on with Gerald. But he has an iron-bound contract that assures him I'm worth at least 50000 a year. I'm helpless. Yes, come in. Oh, Miss... <clears throat> I mean, uh, Richard, come in, come in. Uh, thanks, thanks. You better go out and pour some water on your partner. I just ran into him. Gerald, what do you mean? Well, I was looking for you, and he came up and introduced himself. You told him your name? Told him I was a hat designer from Hollywood, so he pointed out your office and said something about my lily white hands. And what happened? I didn't like the remark, so I shoved one of them down his throat. <laughs> oh, wonderful. This I'll have to see. I put a feather in his mouth. He can't miss him. Uh, uh Rene, uh, don't you think... Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> Stupid of me. Lillian, this is uh, Richard of Hollywood. What? Uh, oh, 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 yeah. Is something wrong? Oh, no, no, no. How do you do? Uh, this is Lillian Richmond, my junior designer and chief model. Now you two think of something clever to talk about. I want to see Gerald, bloody nose, feather and all. Cigarette? You look nervous. Oh, thanks. So Gerald was the victim of uh, a collision? Uh, yes. Do your friends call you Richard? Well, it depends on how friendly they get. Then sometimes they come up with some real hair curlers. What do your friends call you? I prefer Lillian, but sometimes they call me Lil. Well, Lil sounds more interesting. That's when they call me Lil, when things get interesting. You don't act much like a hat designer, Richard. More like you should be playing football. Oh, well, I, uh, I started by designing helmets for Notre Dame. I understand you work for the movies. You with any particular studio? Hmm? Uh, oh, no, no, no. I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, with an independent company. Real Square Productions. We make training films. Training films? Oh, 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 that was simply wonderful. I had to pour a vase of water on him. Several customers were so frightened they left, but it was worth it. And, and how are you two getting along? Arisha uh, was just talking about football. He was explaining the merits of a short pass. Oh. Well, if you don't mind, Lillian, Mr. Uh, uh, Richard and I have some business to talk over. Not at all. Get him to tell you how he started by making helmets. Maybe you'll get some new ideas, Rene. Helmets? <laughs> oh, my goodness. See you later, Risha. I'll wear my muzzle. Isn't she lovely? She has about as much conscience as a tiger in a chicken coop. Okay, now, uh, now, what about our business? Oh, of course. Now, here's a retainer. I trust that 500 is enough to start on. My landlord will think so. What do I do? Well, I've told everyone that you're going to be with us until the fall showing. You want to see how I work. Perhaps take some designs back to Hollywood with you. Now, all you really have to do is to get to know the people that work for me. Now, be here from nine in the morning to six at night and keep those designs from being stolen. Oh, by the way, where are the designs? They're in my safe here. Tomorrow they go to the designing rooms and that's when the situation becomes acute. We'll have nothing to worry about until tomorrow, so I'll see you tomorrow in the morning at nine, Mr. Diamond. Okay. Oh, uh, in case you need me, here's my card. I'll write my home number on it. For some reason, when I get a client, they always run into silly little things like murder or something. You just might need me. See you in the morning. I left Rene and headed for my apartment. I had suddenly found myself in the horrible position of a man with a steady job. Nine in the morning until six in the evening. Now, I'm a guy who can get along without too much sleep, especially when the situation calls for it. Like the little blonde dancer that works over on 52nd Street. There was a situation. But this time, I figured a good night's rest wouldn't do me any harm, so when I got home, I fixed a bite to eat, took a hot shower, and climbed into my little old sack. Is it? It's Lieutenant Levinson. Oh, well, bully for you. What time is it? It's 4.30 in the morning. Goodbye, Walt. Now, you wait a minute. I'm just trying to make things easy on you. And what was that hello honey for? Oh, I was dreaming. What do you mean, make things easy for me? At 4.30 in the morning, nothing's easy. I wanted to let you get here under your own steam. I know what a shock it'd be if I sent Otis down there to drag you out of bed. Oh, yeah. Horrible. I don't late eight the fire. The Dracula was loose again. Hey, what do you want me there for? Well, I 
I know you won't be surprised, but there's been a Ritter O killing. Well, so what? So you're mixed up in it. Now get down here. Now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who's dead? A guy named Benet. Auto accident. Rene Benet? Yeah, I guess that's the way you pronounce it. You see, Otis, your mallet head, you were wrong. It's pronounced Benet, not Benny. That idiot was calling him Rene Benny. Well, how did you know I was working for Benet? Your card was found in his pocket. I'm at 125th Street, so come on up as fast as you can. Well, as soon as I get my football helmet off. Football helmet? You sleep in a football helmet? Well, I do. Don't you? Bye. I left the apartment and took off the address Walt had given me. It was way uptown on Riverside Drive. It was cold and the fog had begun to drift in. I found Walt over near the prowl car and he briefed me. Rene Benet had been killed in an automobile accident. His car had crashed over a hundred foot viaduct. He went through the guardrail up there, Rick. Oh, wonder what he was doing way up here. Certainly wasn't headed home. Maybe he was going to see someone. Oh, uh, maybe. Better check and see if he knew anyone out this way. Now, you wait a minute. You think something's wrong? Could be, huh? He had a partner who might want him out of the way. Oh, it's a mess, isn't it? Yeah, pretty badly burned before the fire boys got here. Wait a minute, Otis is over there with him. Otis! Probably warming his feet. He couldn't warm those big things on an atom bomb. Otis! Yeah, Lieutenant? Yeah, Lieutenant, yeah, Lieutenant. Did you find anything? Yeah, there's been a fire. Oh. Get over here! Walt, what about that card you found in his pocket? Why didn't it get burned? It was in one of his suits over at his apartment. I put in a call, checked his license plate, found out who he was, where he lived, and sent a couple of boys over. They came up with your card. You know how they all love you. Hmm. Anything else in the apartment? Nothing yet. We'll get a report. Uh, here I am, Lieutenant. He's getting smart. Oh, hello, Shamus. Otis, get the car started. We'll go back to the station and wait for a report about this accident. Uh, yeah. It, the Lieutenant. No. No? That's right. You touch that siren and I'll throw you out of the car. Oh, uh, guy can't have any fun anymore. <laughs> going to get that report at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, I know it's 6.30. I always yawn like this when it's 6.30. Oh, maybe this is it. Yeah? Uh, I got that report, Lieutenant. Take the marbles out of your mouth. What did you say? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a little sleepy. Maybe you'd like me to sing your lullaby. Oh, that'd be silly. Well, then make sense. Uh, I got that report. Uh, Benny... Uh... Benny. Okay. Uh, he died from the fire. Autopsy showed he had a slight concussion, but not serious enough to kill him. What about the car? It wasn't tampered with. It was something funny, though. A steering wheel was smeared like someone had been wearing gloves. No prints. Uh, Benny didn't have on any gloves. How'd the fire start? A uh, cigarette in the upholstery. A uh, cigarette in the upholstery. Okay, Otis, I'll call you if I need you. Go on back to sleep. Did you hear? Yeah. Benet was murdered. What makes you so sure? Walt... Otis said he had a slight concussion, but not enough to kill him, right? Okay. You're going to tell me that he was unconscious the whole time it took that fire to start? Ordinarily, a cigarette smolders a long time. Then why didn't he get out of the car? Because he didn't have time to wake up. Someone helped that fire along, got it burning in a few minutes, and then pushed the car over the viaduct. Ah, that isn't enough. Okay. How's this, then? Benet didn't smoke. Now, that I'll buy. But how do you know? He told me. I offered him a cigarette in my office this morning. Well, who do you think did it? Well, I know he had two enemies. His partner, Gerald Winters, and another hat designer, a George Marchand. I'll have them picked up. No, no, no. Let them alone for a while. Huh? Let's have some breakfast first and then go down to Rene's salon when it opens. Quite a store. Yes? Oh, oh, good morning. How's Richard from Hollywood? From hunger. Richard from Hollywood? <laughs> All right, Walt. Oh, I wish Otis was here. He'd love this. <laughs> well, whose side are you on? Now, Walt, this is Lil, uh, uh, Lillian Richmond, Walt. Lillian, this is Lieutenant Levinson. Lieutenant? Homicide. Oh, well, I hope he's just in to buy a hat for his wife. I'm not married, Miss Richmond. Well, to buy a hat. Lillian, I just called Renee's apartment to... Oh, what do you want? Walt, this is Gerald Winters. Who split his lip? He ran into a fist. Where were you between three and four o'clock this morning, Mr. Winters? What do you want to know for? Uh, Gerald, this is a lieutenant from Homicide. I think maybe something's happened. What could have happened? 
I was in bed from 11 o'clock till late. Besides, what's a policeman doing with the great Richard from Hollywood? Did someone see one of his creations and strangle to death? Where were you around for this morning, Lillian? Also in bed, but I can't prove it. Why? Bernays been killed. What? You don't seem too upset, Mr. Winters. No? Well, you're right. As a matter of fact, I'm not. How did it happen? Car went over the viaduct. Burned to death. Well, then why ask us where we were? It was an accident, wasn't it? No, it was not an accident. Mr. Winters, what happens to you now? You take over the firm? Well, Yes, it, it all goes to me. I think you'd better come down to the station, answer a few questions. Oh, no, no you don't... Well, this is absurd. I I hated Rene, but I'd never kill him. Rick, do me a favor and go over to this uh, George Marchand. Talk to him until I can send Otis down to pick uh, him up. You you aren't a hat designer, are you? Bingo. You went another split lip. No, no, no. Lay off him, Rick. Come on, Mr. Winters, let's go. I knew he wasn't. I just knew that man couldn't be famous in Hollywood or anywhere else. Well? Mm-hmm. Police? Private detective. The name's Diamond. Mm-hmm. Did you ever play football? Yeah. Stop back after you see Marshawn. I'd like to find out more about the game. Strong line and a good backfield. You've played it. <laughs> Good morning, good morning. What can I do for you? Uh, George Marchand? Yes. Mm, well, I'm from the police, Mr. Marchand. The police? Your competitor, René Benet, was killed last night. What? He was burned to death in his car. Oh, but this is horrible, horrible. But what has René's death to do with me? Well, we think he was murdered and we're trying to find a good motive. Mr. Diamond, it's true that René and I were enemies. Everyone knew it, but to think that I would take his life is utterly absurd. Yeah. Where were you about four this morning, Mr. Marchand? Well, I, uh, I was in bed, asleep. Everybody sure had a dull evening. How well do you know Gerald Winters, Renee's partner? No, oh, just slightly. How about Lillian Richmond? By reputation only. Uh, one more question. When's your fall showing, Mr. Marchand? In two days. Well, be sure to be around for it. The police get very unhappy if a murder suspect catches the first plane for the border. Murder suspect? See you later, Mr. Marshall. I left Marshall counting his pulse and wondering just how much I did know. And if he could have seen what was going on in my little old mind, he might have grown a few white hairs. I grabbed a cab and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station in Walt Levinson. Needless to say, he was not happy. Oh, now you wait a minute, Diamond. I'm satisfied with Gerald Winters. He's the only one who had a motive. The only one who had a motive that you can see. Too many things point to someone else. Give me a for instance. Oh, you always want a for instance. Well, hang it, you're trying to convince me that Winters isn't the killer, aren't you? Yes, I am, all. Then I want a for instance. I want to know your reason. Well, Winters and Rene hated each other. Even as partners, they really wanted each other out of the way. Are you crazy? You just gave me the best reason for hanging on to Winters. Walt, when Rene was killed, he was ten miles away from his apartment going in the other direction. So what? Did you find out if you knew anyone who might live out that way? Even if he didn't know anyone out that way, I still say, so what? The killer went for a drive with him, got out there, hit him over the head, poured gasoline on the seat, and dropped a cigarette. Pushed him off the viaduct. And Winters smokes. I know. I sent a whole carton down to a cell to make sure. You're right about how the killer did it. But do you think Rene would have taken a drive like that with a man he hated, knowing how much a man hated him? Huh? And another thing. It was pretty warm yesterday and last night, wasn't it? It certainly was. Lousy weather. Okay. The killer wore gloves. Isn't that a little strange on a warm night? So he slipped on some gloves. Didn't want to leave any fingerprints. No, no, no. The killer was driving. The report said there were absolutely no fingerprints on the steering wheel. If Rene was in the driver's seat, there would have been a few of his anyway. We couldn't tell whether he was in the driver's seat. He could have been thrown aside when the car crashed. But I don't get this glove angle. You want to catch a killer? Now, what kind of a remark is that? Well, come on. Oh, where are we going? Down to Rene's shop. We can get in through a window I noticed in the alley. There are some designs in his safe, and Walt, the killer has to get them out tonight. There you are, Lieutenant. It's Jimmy. Rick, I don't like this. Busting into a place without a warrant. Oh, go on. Climb in and watch out for the burglar alarm. All right. Come on, Otis. Okay. Here, I'll give you a hand, Diamond. Oh, well, that ought to be easy for you, Otis. Yeah, why? Well, you could hold on with the other four and still have one left over for that me. Oh, 
Is that so? You two lay off. Come on, Rick. Show me where to go. Right over here, in Renee's office. What makes you think the killer hasn't already stolen the plans? I wouldn't have done it the night of the murder. That would have shown a motive. Wouldn't have done it today. Too many people in the shop. Uh, go on in. Mm, gee. Spooky. I can't see a thing. Walt, watch this. Boo. Ah, <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake, Sean. Now lay off, Otis Diamond, and where do we hide? Just sit on anywhere and be quiet. The first person through that door is our killer. That clock is going to drive me crazy. You want me to shut it off? How do you shut off a clock, stupid? Bust it. Oh. Rick. Yeah. I still don't understand why that glove angle is so important. Well, as a single item, it's not so important. But along with the rest, it was the first thing that gave me an idea of the killer. Lieutenant. Yeah? I think I got it. I did. Oh. Rick, it's three o'clock. I don't think your killer's going to show. Yeah, I'm getting stiff. Hold it, Walt. Hmm? I think we have a customer. Otis, get up and stand next to that light switch. Flip it on when I tell you. Yeah, right. <clears throat> okay, Otis. <gasps> oh, hello, Lillian. <sighs> Oh, you startled me. What's this all about? What are you doing here? Waiting for you. For me? I, well, I don't understand. I, I was just coming over to, to pick up some of my sketches. I forgot them this afternoon. So you waited until three in the morning? I had a date. Yeah. Otis, go out and drag in her date. Now, you wait just a minute. I don't know what this is all about. But go you ahead, know Otis. Right to... You're right. Mr. Diamond, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Sure, lover. Point by point, it goes something like this. Renee Benet was killed by somebody new and trusted. He never would have gone for that riot otherwise. Benet didn't smoke. So the killer was an amateur and started the fire with a cigarette. The killer wore gloves, and it was too hot that night for a man to wear them without looking suspicious. Are you saying that you think that I... Did you kill Benet? Yes. Sure you did. Come on, you, you get in there. take your dirty hands off of me. Yeah, here he is, Lieutenant. This is the guy in the car. You little... What is this all about? You better ask Mr. Diamond, although I don't think he'll make much sense. He just accused me of killing Rene. What? Good morning, Mr. Marchand. I thought you didn't know, Lillian. Well, prior to this evening, I did not. I, I called her because I, I wanted to talk to her about Renee's day. Ah, you're lying. Today at your shop, you call me Mr. Diamond. How did you know my name? Well, you told it to me. No, 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 no. You're fibbing again. I just said I was from the police. Only one person who knew both of us could have called you, and she also knew I was on the way over to your shop. Didn't you, Lil? The name is Miss Richmond. Now prove that I killed Renee. You've got no motive. Well, the designs are enough to start with. You probably suspected I wasn't a hat designer. And you knew you had to work fast if you were going to get those designs to Marchand here before this fall showing. That's not true. Lillian never gave me any designs from Rene. You know, of course, Mr. Marchand, that if we stick your girlfriend with a murder rap, you're an accessory before and after the fact. Mm, what? Sure, maybe you'll, uh... Maybe you'll get to sit in a nice electric love seat and hold hands. Oh, but I had nothing to do with the murder. Well, you knew about it, and you knew who did it. That's enough to put you away for 20 years. Being mixed up in the actual motive might get you lied. No, 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 no. She was the one that did it. She knew Winters would be blamed for it. George! Yes, she stole the designs for me because she wanted to ruin Benet and take over his salon, but I did not know she was going to kill him. Why, you... Dirty little man, you did know it, you did know it. You helped me plan it if I got the best sketches for you. I'll tear Never your order. eyes out. Get him away from me. Come on, lady, let's go. Okay, haul them both out of the car. Rick, I don't know how. Rick. Oh, no. Rick. Oh, why does he always disappear like that? What's that you're playing? That's a new thing. Kind of pretty. Don't cry, Joe. Well, sing it. All right, but uh, 
But you know that gripey neighbor in the other apartment building. Oh, don't pay any attention to him. You don't hear any of the other tenants yelling for you to shut up. Well, maybe they're not as forceful as the grouch. <laughs> you see, honey, I, uh, I got a couple of letters. Letters? Mm-hmm, from the people in that building. Most of them like the singing, but a couple feel the same way the grouch does. Well, there's only one way to find out what all the people in the building think. Uh, how's that? Open the window and sing so they can all hear you. Uh, okay, I'll buy it. You open the window. Don't you think maybe this is silly? Rick, I like you to sing when you come over here, but I don't want you to do it if no one else does. Now, go ahead. Okay. Don't cry, Joe. Let her go, let her go, let her go. Don't cry, Joe. Let her go, let her go, let her go. You've got to realize this is the wind-up. You'll feel much better once you make your mind up. Don't cry, Joe. Let her go, let her go. Let her go. No reaction yet. Maybe they all took poison. Well, give them time. We'll find out soon enough. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, come on, let's go to the kitchen and case the icebox. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, High Aberback, Kay Brinker, Clark Gordon, and Jay Novello. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday Night brings you some of the week's best radio entertainment when you tune for the stars on NBC. Stay tuned to NBC every Saturday evening for a great lineup of programs, including Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, and Grand Ole Opry. All the best on NBC. Stay tuned for Irene Dunn and Hollywood Star Theater on NBC. Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, surplus homicide, surplus hand grenades, black market embalming. Oh, Rick. Oh, Helen, what's with you? It's what's with you I'm worried about. What do you mean, what's with me? You know what's with you. Now, you stop that. That's my routine. I want that which you pilfered from the living room the other night, and I want it back, and I want it right away. Oh, but Helen, baby... Don't you baby me. Now, you get it down here. But I can't leave the office. I just got in. I haven't even washed out one sock. Rick, it wasn't fair when you stole that picture, and I've been embarrassed about it ever since, and I want it back. Oh, but honey, don't be that way. It, 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 it looks lovely. Can you see it? Well, sure. Got it right on my desk. Now, Rick, I won't have it. Now, look, if anybody asks about it, I'll, I'll say it's me. You never were a baby. You started with a beard and a low whistle. Honey, honey, I had a baby picture just like it once, and believe me, 
From the way you're facing in the picture, you couldn't tell the difference between us. I'm lying on a rug. You probably had yours taken on spikes. Now, you bring that right over or I'll tell everybody your middle name. Helen. I'll see you in 20 minutes or I'll take a full page chat in the time. You wouldn't. 20 minutes with the picture. Bye. Helen. Oh, dandy. Mr. Diamond? Uh, yes, but I'm afraid you'll have to come back. I, I've got to take care of something that might mean my whole future as a private oh, detective. I'm sorry. I won't keep you, but... Well, could you tell me the name of another good detective? Uh, there aren't any. Goodbye. Oh, please. I don't know where to go. Oh, now, well, wait a minute. I, I'm sorry. Something's really wrong, isn't it? Oh, well, that's all right, Mr. Diamond. You go on. I'll find someone. Ah, uh, look, I, I really didn't know you were in a tough spot. I, I've got enough time to listen. Oh, thank you. Who recommended me? My son. Oh, I've heard about you for several years. My name's Kirby. Mrs. Lenore Kirby. How do you do, Mrs. Kirby? Just how did your son know me? Well, he didn't know you well, only by reputation. Mm. He was a private detective also. Kirby? Bill Kirby? Yes. Well, um, now, tell me what's worrying you, Mrs. Kirby. Well, I don't know quite where to start. William, Bill, has been acting strangely for the last month or so. What exactly do you mean by strangely? Well, he's changed. He's begun to act nervous and irritable. When his sister or I would try to find out what was wrong, he'd get angry. He got steadily worse. And then one morning, Gloria... Gloria? Uh, my daughter, Bill's sister... Oh, go ahead. Well, she went into his room. He was asleep, so she started to hang up his trousers. When she turned them upside down, a lot of money dropped on the floor. Oh? Well, what do you mean, a lot of money? Well, Gloria said there must have been several thousand dollars. Mostly hundred-dollar bills. Did he have another source of income? I mean, besides the private detective business? Oh, no, no. At least mm. nothing I know of. Mm -hmm. We're not wealthy, Mr. Diamond. Bill supports us with what he makes, and Gloria works as a secretary in a law firm, and I try to keep my house in order. Of course, I haven't been terribly well since the children's father died ten years ago. I see. Then what happened? Well, Gloria started to put the money back in Bill's trousers, and he woke up. They had a terrible argument. Bill accused her of snooping, and she accused him of doing something illegal. And the next day... Bill packed his clothes and left the house. He took a small apartment on 110th Street. Uh-huh. Now, uh, uh, what is it you want me to do? Oh, well, there's more to the story. Bill continued to send me money to keep the house going, much more than he'd ever contributed before. I went over to his apartment several times and asked him about the money, and every time there'd be an argument. Did he give you any kind of an excuse? No, he just said he'd run into a good thing and that as long as it was helping out with the house, I shouldn't ask any questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, then what happened? Well, three days ago, Bill came over to the house. I could tell he was terribly worried about something. He gave me a package, told me to hide it until he came for it and not to open it. Then he disappeared. He didn't go to his office or his apartment. And I haven't heard from him since. Did you call the police? Well, I didn't want to. He's mixed up in something. Oh, Mr. Dunn. I'm sure something's happened to my boy. I just know it has. Look, uh, uh, Mrs. Kirby, I admit it sounds a little fishy, but you never can tell. Maybe it's a, a, a girl. Could be a lot of things. Uh, where do you live? 984 Amsterdam Avenue. Oh, thank you. Uh, now, you go on home. Take it easy. I'll let you know if anything turns out. All right. I'm sorry I don't usually cry like this. Oh, Mr. Diamond, about your fee. Mrs. Kirby. Yes? Do you cook? Ah, uh, yes, I'm considered quite a good cook. Well, if I do anything for your son, I'm a sucker for corned beef and cabbage. Now, go on home, and I'll keep in touch with you. Goodbye, Mr. Diamond. And God bless you. I'm afraid he knows me too well. Goodbye, Mrs. Kirby. <laughs> Funny how you can run into a situation like that. Any other time, it's got to be a hundred a day in expenses. But that's because trouble doesn't usually bother me. There's too much of it around, and everybody's a stockholder. 
Then the little old lady walks in with a bucket full of heartache, and you realize the hundred a day in expenses is only the difference you carry around to make up for that big cold world outside. I put my merit badge away, grabbed Helen's picture off the desk, and headed for 975 Park Avenue. Well, you're late. I was just going to call the papers, but I wasn't quite sure how you spell your middle name. It's, um, C-H-O... Here's the picture. Thank you. I didn't know you had a mole in your... Rick. Aren't you coming in? No, no, I'm not. I'm mad. Won't even let me keep your little old baby picture. Now, about that mole... Now, you stop that. Why can't you come in? Well, I got a client right after I talk to you. I got to go down to the 5th Precinct and do some checking. Will I see you tonight? If you'll tell me about the mole. Now, Rick. See you at 8. Mm, bye, mole. A Sam. A baby. I left Helen and started down Park Avenue. Every private detective must get a license before he can operate. And the police department has to issue it. So I headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. When I walked in the squad room, I spotted Sergeant Otis looking like he was headed for the elephant's graveyard. What's the matter with you, Otis? You're greener than a new lawn. Oh, hello, Shamus. I don't feel so good. No, as a matter of fact, you don't. A little pudgy around the shoulders. Ah, oh, come on, lay off. I tell you I feel sick. Let's see your tongue. Huh? Oh, uh... Mm-hmm. Well, how's it look? I don't know. But be careful who you show it to. Somebody's liable to think it's poisonous and kill it with a stick. Uh... Hello, Walt. Oh, no. Okay, I'm too tired to be scared off today. Who's dead and where? Not today, Walt. And what are you so tired about? We had a killing this morning. I've questioned every suspect in the whole state. Nothing. Who got dead? Maybe you knew him. A shamus. Uh, Kirby? What? Hey, how the devil did you know that? Just a guess. Guess my 38. Do you know something? I don't know anything, Walt. Kirby's mother was just at my office. Oh. Yeah, oh. Well, you don't have to get sore. I'm not sore. Just wondering who's going to tell Mrs. Kirby. Otis went over there a little while ago. He saw the sister. The mother wasn't home yet. Oh, that's why he looks so bad. Yeah, I guess so. Wouldn't you? Okay, where's the body? Downstairs. You want to take a look? Not especially. I told his mother I'd do something for him, and right now I don't seem to be able to think of a thing. Get the killer. Help me. Okay, let's go down and take a look. Four slugs in him first, though. What kind of a gun? Twelve-gauge shotgun. Used a deer load. Anything on him? Just the usual identification. Okay, let's put him back. I don't know why he got knocked off. No motive, no nothing. The mother has quite a story. Yeah? She told me her son... Hi, but... Oh, no. Yeah? And here comes Malicious. Hey, we just got a call. Kirby's mother and sister just got beat up. Something awful. What? Come on, Walt. Well, this is crazy. First the son gets it for no apparent reason, then the rest of the family get beat up. I think I can tell you why the mother and sister got beat up. Yeah, why? Probably the package Kirby left with his mother. What package? I'll tell you about it on the way over in the car. Okay, Otis, okay. Come on, step on Lieutenant. it. Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, this time you can use the siren. Oh, boy. Hello, Mrs. Kirby. The doctor tells us you won't allow them to take you to the hospital. No, I'm not leaving my house. It'll take more than two cheap hoodlums to drive me out of my house. Well, the doctor says you'll be all right, but I think the hospital might be safer for a few days. This is Lieutenant Levinson, Mrs. Kirby. How do you do, How Lieutenant? do you do? I know you don't feel much like talking. Oh, no, that's quite all right. I'll be glad to help in any way that I can. Were they after the package your son left with you? Yes, but I didn't give it to them. I almost did when they started to hit Gloria. But I knew they had something to do with Bill's death. And you knew the package was important, too? Yes. Oh, where is the package, Mrs. Kirby? In the bread box. In the bread wrapper. Pretty cute. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant? 
Go in the kitchen and bring me the loaf of bread in the bread box. Uh, you want some sardines, too? Otis, just the bread, please. Oh, okay. Mrs. Kirby, the two men who came here, do you think you could identify them? Oh, yes. It would be hard to forget them. You're sure you don't have any idea what kind of trouble your son was in? No. Uh, here's the bread, Lieutenant. Yeah. Hey, it's a shoe. Is this one of your son's shoes, Mrs. Kirby? No, no. He wears a much smaller size. No, that isn't his shoe. I don't get this. Nothing in it, just a shoe. A big one. What size is it? Uh, hey. What's the matter? Well, the shoe size on the inside. It says 6B and then five numbers after it. Oh, if that's a 6B, Otis wears matchboxes. Oh, yeah. Otis. Oh, Okay. I don't understand. Why would Bill leave a shoe and act like it was so important? Because it probably was very important. Uh, you think these numbers could be? Let's see. Well, if these numbers do mean anything, it sure isn't going to be easy finding out. Here's something, Walt. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Shoe's got new heels on it. It's been half-soled. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Take the shoe down at the station. Give it to the lab. See what they can find out. And then get the boys out and check every shoe repair shop in the city. I want to know where the shoe was half sold. Okay. Mrs. Kirby, you're sure you can't think of a thing that might give us a tip about your son? No, nothing, Mr. Diamond. Rick, I'm going down to the station. Find out about that shoe. Then I'll send our rogues gallery over so Mrs. Kirby can try and pick out the two guys who worked her over. Oh, uh, check with me if you find out anything, will you? Right, Walt. Mr. Diamond, there's no reason for you to go on with this case. My son's dead. You can't help him now. I'm sure your business is very important. Mrs. Kirby, I said I'd do something for your son. Well, I was a little late. Now I'm going to do something for me. There's a killer loose and two slobs who beat up women. I'm a little unhappy, Mrs. Kirby, so I've got to square this beef the only way I know how. First, I'd like to talk to your daughter. <laughs> It's tough, and I don't like to stick my big nose in when it is. But you want something done about it, don't you? Yes. Then think real hard. Can you tell me anything about your brother that might be connected with his death? No. No, Mr. Diamond. I've thought and thought and thought. I, I just can't understand it. Well, you may have been looking for the wrong thing, a reason or a motive. That's not what I want. What do you want? Something you might not even realize. Something that might not seem important, but is very important. Now, try to think. When you first began to suspect that your brother was in trouble, did he mention any names, talk about any places? No. Not that I can remember. What did he do when he wasn't at his office? Oh, please. Please, I don't know. I just don't know. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Mom and I appreciate what you're doing, Mr. Diamond. Right now, it's hard for me, but I'll try. Okay. No places. No names. Did he have a girl? No, he didn't have a girl. He led a fairly simple life. Had a regular routine. Routine? Mm -hmm. Mom used to worry about it sometimes. Said he didn't have enough fun. Didn't know anybody. What kind of a routine was this? Well, the usual thing around the house in the morning. He'd go to work. On his way home, he always stopped at a bar on Columbus Avenue for a beer. And home. Dinner. Read until... 10.30 or 11, go to bed. Nothing else? No, he did that every day. At least up until the time when he started acting funny and I found all that money. I see. Well, thanks. I, I'll let you know if anything turns up, Gloria. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. I hope you... Yeah. <laughs> I left the Kirby house and walked out on the street. It was getting near six o'clock and a light breeze was blowing the night in. It was turning cold, so I flipped my collar up and started for Columbus Avenue and the bar that Bill Kirby used to stop in for a beer. I turned on 88th Street and picked up speed to shake the chill out of my ankles. Hey, you. Yeah? You diamond. So what? So where's this shoe? Oh, you're going to find it harder working me over than a couple of women. Working you over, maybe, yeah. Killing you? Everybody dies easy. Give me the shoe. Where's your friend? Move it.
in this alley, I'll give you an introduction. I'm busy. You're going to be busy getting dead if you don't get in the alley. I got my gun in my pocket. I bet you shrink four feet when you aren't carrying it. What? Okay. Think you get him? Yeah. But it don't look like he's got the shoe on him. Yeah, but he knows where it is. Tell me, boys, is it fun beating up women? <laughs> More fun beating up those gum shoes. Ain't it, Danny? Sure. You want to tell us where the shoe is, Shamus? Right now, it should be in the police lab. Hey, Danny, you think those cops really took it out of the house? I don't know. I couldn't see. Time and I still think the old dame gave it to you when she went up to see you at your office this morning. What did you kill her son for? Who said I killed him, friend? Kirby got smart about the shoe like you did. He got dead for his trouble. How do you feel about your future, friend? Pretty good. The cops will figure that shoe out. Not unless they know what they're looking for. He ain't got the shoe on him, Bart. I think he's telling the truth. Let's go tell the boss. Yeah, what do we do with the gum shoe? Oh, I'm surprised at you, Bart. Give me your sap. Hey, now, wait a minute. For what? <coughs> okay. You gonna knock him off? I get a salary for killing. The boss ain't paying me to knock this guy off. I want to save him in case he thinks I should later on. Let's go. <laughs> It isn't easy coming out of a fast beating. When a guy works, you're over slow. You don't go to sleep right away. Not until he wants you to anyway. Then he taps you with a good one and that's it. When he does it in a hurry, the first one's enough to stun a dragon. But for some reason, he decides you need a few more. And friend, that's when coma sets in. When I finally pull myself out of it... My watch said 7 o'clock, and my head felt like a balloon with rice in it. I finally came around to a reasonable way of thinking and headed for the bar on Columbus Avenue. Yes, sir? What? Li- Holy Ike. Give me anything with nerves in it and tell me where your phone is. Sure. You're a mess. Yeah, I know. Been advertising a popular cigarette. Been stepping out of thousands of store windows all over the country. Now, where's your phone? Uh, right over there, the end of the bar. Hey, you want us to put some plasma in this drink? Oh, that was a gem dandy. Oh. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick. Rick, where the devil you been? Playing patty cake with the two Garnifs who worked over Mrs. Kirby and her daughter. Well, we've been trying to get you. Otis been calling blondes all over town. Mrs. Kirby and her daughter identify the two hoods. First name's Bart and Danny? Yeah, Bart Franchetti and Danny Miller. We have a pickup out on them now. They hurt you bad? Oh, I'll make it, but I'm going to ache for a while. What did you find out about the shoe? Well, we really got some fast action on those half-soles. Figured if Kirby picked them up in a shoe repair shop, it must have been somewhere in his neighborhood. We were lucky. We were right. Little shoe shop on Columbus Avenue. Columbus Avenue? What address? 695. Why? Because I'm in a bar right across the way. Huh? Can't see the shoe store now because it's too dark, but Kirby's sister told me he used to come in here for dinner. He could have watched it then. Oh, stay there. I'll be right over. Here you are, mister. Thanks. Uh, say, uh, did you know Bill Kirby? The Sharmers? Oh, sure. Uh, what do you mean, did I know him? He's pretty dead. Oh, no. He came in here every day, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, for a beer. Uh, but come to think of it, I ain't seen him since he left... The... Uh, left you what? Uh, uh, nothing, nothing at all. Now, wait a minute. If Kirby left you anything, let's have it. Uh, uh, if Kirby's dead, I'll turn it over to the cops. You want the badge? Oh, well, okay. Why didn't you say so? I got in the cash register. He told me if anything happened to him to turn it over to the law. Okay. Here. Just an envelope. Thanks. Uh, what is it? Hmm. A name and address. Uh, oh, look. Uh, Lieutenant Levis will be here in a few minutes. Tell him I've gone to this address, 18 North River. Uh, that's down near the docks. Yeah. And tell him I've gone to find a guy named, uh, James Willis. <laughs> Honey, is Mr. Willis in? Yes. 
The emergency hospital's on the second floor. I always go around this way. It makes people notice me. Which is Mr. Willis's office, dear? Right over there, but I'm afraid you can't... Here's the badge, baby. Oh. And don't ring him. Yes, sir. Well, 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 well. James Willis, when did you change your name from Koslick? Now, look, Diamond, I've got a good job here. I never could have gotten it if the company had known I was James Koslick and I'd done time. In the shipping business, huh? What's an old-time safe cracker like you doing in the shipping business? You're not a cop anymore, Diamond. You helped put me away once, but I've quit the rackets, and I'm doing fine in a legit way. Now you can leave. What is your company ship? We're in export and import firm. We ship and receive everything. Now get out. What is your company import that might interest two professional thugs like Bart and Danny? What? I don't know what you mean. Where do you have your shoes fixed? Little place on Columbus Avenue, maybe? I don't know what you're talking about, and I don't intend to sit here and listen to you and your riddles. Miss Williams, will you please have one of the watchmen sent in to show Mr. Diamond out? Yes, sir. But two gentlemen wish to see you. They say it's very important. Well, I can't see anyone. Well, I think maybe you better. They seem very deaf. Miss Williams, I don't... Ow. What's the matter, Mr. Willis? Diamond, let go of my hair. Tell her to show the gentleman in or I'll make sitting bull look like a piker. Go on. Send the two gentlemen in, Miss Williams. Okay. I'm going over here behind the door. You be a good boy. You nearly pulled all my hair off. Well, what's the difference? The way things look, the state might have to shave your head anyway. Hey, Willis, we want to talk to you. Well, what's the matter? You sore because we came up here? Hey, what's with that guy? He just sits there holding his head. Good evening, boys. Hey, hey, look who's here. Yeah, it's the Shamus. And he looked pretty. You fools, you... Two blundering fools. Now, wait a minute. If you're worried about Diamond, we'll take care of him. I told you I could never be seen with you. You know how we're all watched when the gold shipments come in? Oh. Oh, that's it. That's what the shoe was all about. Yeah, you smart one. Shut up. I've got to think. You got the confidential shipping report and put it in that shoe in some kind of code so it could be picked up. Then your dear little boys were going to try to hijack the gold. Well, well, well. Want me to shut him up? No, no, are you crazy? That secretary saw him come in. Take him out the same way. I'm going to be stubborn. Yeah? Oh, okay. Isn't it silly what a little 38 can do? Let's go. All right. But look, as long as I'm probably going to end up in the river, would you mind telling me one thing? Yes, I do. No, that's swell. That's really swell. Kirby recognized you going into that shoe store. He remembered you had a record, so he probably tailed you. Found out where you worked and went back to take a look at that shoe. He found the same thing wrong that I did. The numbers weren't a shoe size, and he probably thought it was crazy when you left only one shoe. So he took the shoe. You always were a pretty smart cop, Diamond. Danny. Yeah, boss. Before you kill the smart cop, pull his hair out. Pull his hair out? By the roots. Now take him out of here. Was Kirby blackmailing you, Willis? Yes. Being stupid, he didn't know what the shoe was for, but he knew it was worth something. Now, please, Danny, get Mr. IQ through that door. Move. Okay. Oh. Yeah, what's funny, Shamus? You boys are in for a big surprise. Oh, Mr. Willis must be free here they till now. Just keep walking, Shamus. Nothing, nothing's wrong. Oh, are you gentlemen through with Mr. Willis? Yeah, Fatso, go on in. He'll see you. Uh, thank you. Let's go, Shamus. Oh, uh, one more thing. Yeah, now what? Duck, Rick! <laughs> Thanks, Walt. And you take it easy, Bart. I ain't going from the gun. I ain't doing nothing. Please, don't shoot. Walt, James Willis is really James Koslick. I'm going in after him. Well, here, Cat, you'll need a gun. Is he in there? Out the window. I went over to the window fast and spotted my man just dropping down off the fire escape. The building fronted on a long dock, and Willis had 50 yards to go before he could find cover. Then I said that stupid thing. Willis! In the name of the law! Stop! Well, he didn't stop in the name of the law, so I rested my arm on the windowsill and led him about two feet. At 50 yards, a running man can be hard to hit with a 38. Sometimes. You get him, Rick? Yeah. See you down at the station. Uh, how do you like it, Rick? Uh, no cream. Twelve lumps. Right. Say, I had a phone call from the president of Continental Shipping where that Willis guy worked. <coughs> What do you make this coffee out of, gunpowder? He says there's always been a standing reward of $1,000 for the apprehension of any person attempting to rob their shipment. Uh-huh. Uh, hey, Diamond. 
Miss Asher phoned. She wants you should call. Thanks, Otis. Thanks? What's wrong with you? You heard him, Otis. He said thanks. Okay. He must be sick. More coffee, Rick? Yeah, I'll have another cup. Hello? Hi, honey. Rick, where are you? I thought you were coming over. Well, baby, I've, uh, I've got to stop by and see a nice old lady named Kirby. Her son got killed. Oh, I'm sorry. Will I see you later? Uh, no, I don't think so, honey. I'm, I'm a little tired. All right, Rick. Well, I don't sound too unhappy. I'll see you tomorrow night. Well, all right. But you always sing to me, and I wanted you to sing tonight. Well, I haven't gotten any letters from the apartment building next door yet, so I'm going to lay off one week and see if the tenants miss the singing. All right, Rick. I'll see you tomorrow night. Goodbye, baby. Bye, Rick. Well, I think I'd better get over to Mrs. Kirby's, Walt. Well, don't you want your coffee? Yeah, give it to Otis. What are you going to tell Mrs. Kirby? I mean about her son and the blackmail. Well, what are you going to tell Continental Shipping? Well, you caught him. You get the thousand. Oh, Mrs. Kirby's pretty broke. Uh-huh. Kirby was the one who really spotted the play. Yeah, but if I say anything about the blackmail... What blackmail? Huh? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, come to think of it, that... It was another case, wasn't it? See you later, Walt. Uh, Rick. Yeah? Oh, nothing. Be a good boy. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Stephen Dunn, Peggy Weber, and William Johnstone. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Sandville. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Saturday night brings some of the week's best radio entertainment when you tune for the stars on NBC. Stay tuned every Saturday for a great lineup of programs, including Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, and Grand Ole Opry. All the best on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Why aren't you at the office? Now, don't confuse me, dear. One question at a time. Come on in the study and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, now stop being so mysterious. You never come over here at this time of the day. Read some of these. What are they? Letters. Read them. All of them? Well, there must be at least a half a hundred. Well, close. Fifty-three. And those are only about one-tenth of the pile that's in my office. Oh, Rick, are these... Yeah. The lovely, dear, sweet tenants in that gorgeous building right next to this one. They like your singing. Uh, read a couple. Me, me, me. Ho, ho, ho. De, 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 de. Dear Mr. Diamond. La, 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 la. Rick. Go on, go on, go on. Well, stop sounding like a whole quartet. All right. Dear Mr. Diamond, I live in the building across the way from Miss Asher's apartment. Right over there. At least once a week, I sit in my living room and listen to the sounds of your melodious voice. Da, me, ni, <laughs> 
Last week, however, I waited for seven straight days, but without result. You did not sing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Please, <laughs> Mr. Diamond, for the sake of my family, continue to sing at least once a week. Hmm. I'm beginning to nag my husband, and yesterday I took the rubber bone away from my French poodle. Everybody <laughs> shall be exalted. You see, it's getting to be a real problem with me, and if you want to save me the $25 a day, I would have to pay my psychiatrist sing. La Yours expectantly, Mrs. Louise Cartwright. Rick, are they all like this? Well, certainly not. Some of them are really desperate. Now, here's the one I saved out. Read this one if you really want to get a charge. Oh, 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 oh. me, 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 me. My me. dearest, Mr. Diamond. Me, me. Go on, well, go on, go on, go on, go on. I have been listening to your beautiful singing. What? What do you mean, what? Oh, uh, what you just read. I've been listening. No, 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 the last part. Your beautiful singing? Yes, I'm in a chanted evening. Oh, you sure. Go on, finish it now, finish it. Well, she's been listening to your beautiful singing. Oh, yes. Um, and many times I've seen you going into Miss Asher's apartment, and I think you are as beautiful as your voice. Oh. What? Now, you said that. Turn off the steam and read the last part. I wouldn't miss it. Last week, I waited and waited, but you didn't sing. Everybody shall be exalted. (laughs) I know you were in Miss Asher's apartment, and you certainly had the chance. If Miss Asher is the one that that won't let you sing, come over to my apartment. Mm -hmm. I have a piano, and I just love it. 977 Park, apartment 303. Hmm. Signed, your most ardent fan... Ellen. Uh, Mademoiselle from Armitage. Rick, what are you doing? Open your window. Don't you think it's a little stuffy in here? The air conditioning's on. Rick, now stay away from that piano. Oh, no, I knew it, I knew it. Ellen's right. You really don't want me to sing. At 11 o'clock in the morning? No. I want you to sing tonight when it's more romantic. Oh, shame on you. Me? Yes, you. You want to deprive those poor, discouraged people of a little honest, simple pleasure? You want that woman to take her dog's bone away again? <laughs> you idiot. Oh, no telling what'll happen. Those people might not leave their apartments for days. It'll get to be like a prison camp. Think of it. No food. They won't leave the building even to go out and get an orange or a lime or something. And you know what? What? Scurvy. Oh. <laughs> They'll be dying like flies. Well, go on. What's the matter? Dying like flies. <laughs> I wonder who thought up that bright little simile. I've got a big green fly in my office that's so tough he carries a man swatter. Oh! <laughs> well, you think it's funny, do you? <laughs> think what'll happen if those poor people stay in that building, withering up with scurvy, you fiend. I... I know it. Yes. It's just that... Well, I don't want to share your tonsils with anyone. I'm selfish. Me, me, me. You're more than that. You're antisocial. All right. All right. You mean? Yes. Sing. Stop, fellow. A hundred and one pounds of fun. That's my little honey bun. Rick. Yes? Did you hear something? Oh, I think so. Try it again. <coughs> All right. A hundred and one pounds of fun. Rick. Mm, yes. I heard it. That's a grouch. Rick. Yes. There's an enemy in the camp. Well, what do we do? We can't just let those people die over there. Sink him. You mean? Yes. Sing. It's your duty. You're right. It's no longer a matter of personal pride. I must defeat the grouch at all costs. For those thousand starving tenants. Thousands? Big rooms. <clears throat> Stand back. Good luck. Thank you. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. He's weakening. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. He's nearly down. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. You are my sunshine. There he goes. You are my sunshine. Rick. Victory? Decidedly. Bull Run was never like this. All right. Now sing Honey Bun and save those poor people. A hundred and one pounds of fun. 
That's my little honey bun. Honey bun. Bun. Rick. Good grief. <laughs> bun. Rick. I don't know. I can talk all right, but the minute I go up, something happens. I hope you didn't hurt it. La, 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 la. Oh, Rick. Oh, now, isn't that ridiculous? I can't help laughing, but it isn't really funny. Come on, let's go get you some warm milk or something. Mm, me, la, da, i Now, stop that. Give it a rest. Oh, if that grouch only knew, I may never bother him again. Well, he's the only one that doesn't like it. Poor guy. Poor guy, now, that's a silly thing to say. Well, honey, he doesn't like it, let's face it. He'll probably get so desperate he'll have to move. Okay, let him. I wonder what he's doing right now. I'll bet he's planning something fiendish. You think he's going to start shooting burning arrows? I wouldn't put it past him. Now, let's take care of that throat. Well, sometimes silly things like that happen. I come on like a big baritone and lose my voice. Helen has to feed me hot lemon juice and honey for about three hours. And the grouch across the way in the next apartment starts thinking up the ten best ways to eliminate Diamond. Think I'm kidding? Well, let me tell you. I didn't know it then, but that fast course of You Are My Sunshine with my own lyrics started more trouble than a hopped-up mouse in a herd of elephants. While Helen fed me the tonsil cure, old Grouchhead was dreaming of a cure of his own. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I work in the daytime, try to sleep at night. He sings at night. I switch to the night shift. He sings in the daytime. Oh, I'll fix him. I'll fix that diamond. Yeah, phone book. Phone book. Uh, detectives. Private detectives. Ah, look at that. Richard Diamond, private detective. Full page ad. Wouldn't you know it? Now, look at that slogan. Whoever you are, whatever you do, if you're too dead to walk, we'll come to you. Ugh. Must be other detectives in here. Ah, oh, here's one. Pat Kosak. Uh, you are my sunshine, eh? Oh, Diamond, I'll fix you. I'll fix you good. Is this Pat Kosak? Yeah, for employment. Uh, haven't I heard of you before? I doubt it. Probably that Shamus in Frisco. He's always stealing my stuff. Uh, uh, well, my name is Ernest Lumpkin. Happy Halloween, Mr. Pumpkin. No, no, no. Lumpkin. Lump. Okay, okay. What can I do for you? Well, I've got a problem. It concerns another person in your line of work. You mean another Shamus? Yes. He uh, sings. You mean Diamond? Oh, is he a friend of yours? A competitor isn't a friend. Uh, Diamond gets more clients than anyone in the business, so he isn't even a competitor. He's a capitalist. Uh, he can advertise. People go to him instead of me. I hate him. Oh, uh, Mr. Koslack, hey, you're not alone. The name's Kosak, Mr. Dumpkin. Uh, Lumpkin. Lumpkin Dumpkin. You want to hire me? But uh, you don't even know what I want you to do. Can you pay me 50 bucks a day? If you can do the job in one day. For 50 bucks, I'll steal a Chrysler building and bring it over to you on a motor scooter. What's your address? 977 Park Avenue. And hurry! <laughs> Feel now. Oh, scalded. I'll be eating Zymol trochies for a week. Oh, now it wasn't that hot. Wasn't it? Honey, that lime water was so hot, Alibaba could have boiled his 40 thieves in it. Well, your speaking voice is all right. Every. Oh, well, I think I've swallowed the bear rug. Where are you going? Well, I can't sing, and I'm going to see you tonight anyway, so I, I think I'll drop down to the 5th precinct and drive Sergeant Otis out of his mind. Oh, Rick, that poor man. He called up last week when Lieutenant Levinson was looking for you, and he sounded like he was dying, and you were responsible. Honey, when Otis dies, everybody will be running around in spaceships. He got through the Stone Age all right, didn't he? Bye. I left Helen and headed for the 5th precinct police station. It was one of those good afternoons. The sun was leaning on three o'clock, and now and then a cool breeze would sail through my sinus and pump my lungs full of that easy, good-to-be-walking-around feeling. I had just about everything. Good job, good girl, and a 4 report from my insurance company. When I reached the station, I hopped up the steps and bounced into the squad room. Sergeant Otis was sitting, sitting over in the corner, making out the weekly report for the commissioner. Hello, Otis. Uh, oh. What do you want, Shamus? Well, really nothing. I just came by to see if I could borrow one of your shoes. I'm going sailing. Oh, that's very funny. You know, someday, Gumshoe, you're going to run out of gags. 
Then what are you going to do? Well, I could set you on fire. That's sure to be a good uh, chuckle. Hmm? Oh, yeah. And Lieutenant in? Yeah. Otis, uh, you want to know how to catch a crook? Ah, wise guy. Eat a lot of spaghetti. Oh? Uh, how can I catch a crook that way? Just open that big mouth and say, oh, yeah. You'll lasso him. Hello, Lieutenant Levinson. Lieutenant Levinson? Well, how do you do, Mr. Diamond? Now, what's with the formal routine? Oh, I can't help it. Every time I leave Otis, I feel like I've just stepped out of a gorilla cage. Oh, why don't you leave that poor guy alone, Rick? Oh, he's used to it. If I started treating him like a human being, he'd get so confused, he'd probably cut off his tail. <laughs> Think what would happen, Walt, when he wanted to go to sleep at night. No more hanging upside down. Oh, brother. What's on your mind? Oh, I just thought I'd stop by and chew the fat. Well, go ahead. I already did. Shoot a whole pound right off Otis. Walt, are you sure he's a mammal? Now, you listen to me. Otis is a nice fella for a hammerhead. He can't help it, so stop tearing him down and tell me what you really want. Walt, I'm surprised at you. I just wanted to stop by and say hello. Hello. Where's the body? Now, look, there's no body. Just a nice chat, that's all. Okay, but I warn you, I won't stand for any routines. And if you're mixed up in something, I have to find out the hard way. So help me. I'll put you away so far, they'll have to pipe air into you. Walt, you do. Do what? Love me. Oh. Would you like to wear my cig alf pin? Right, for Pete's sake, what's the matter with you? You've been growing poppies in your office? Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, what is it, Otis? Miss Asher on the phone for Diamond. Okay. Phone for you, Rick. Alan. Oh, thanks. Fifth precinct. Remember our motto? A corpse in the morgue is worth two in your basement. <laughs> oh, no. It's true, Walt. It's true. Oh, that wall just jumped out of the window. No, honey, there's a cast system around here. When Walt feels like jumping out of a window, he throws Otis out first to see if it hurts. Oh. How are you, baby? Hi. Rick, uh, Mr. Jones called and said it was very important that he see you at once, said it was a matter of life and death. Jones? First name John? Well, he didn't say. He just gave me an address and asked you to come over immediately. 137 River Street. He called me at your apartment? Uh-huh. Hey, I never saw that. How'd he get the number? Uh, no telling. Well, I'll go on over. Maybe he'll turn out to be a good client. Call you later, baby. Oh, uh-huh, your throat. Oh, la done, I'm open. Goodbye, Rick. Hey, you really sound terrible. Uh, I'll see you later, Walt. Huh? Oh, uh, well, uh, thanks for the brilliant conversation, sweetie. Walt, just because I didn't have a corpse hidden out someplace, you get mad. All right, see if I care. Oh, now, wait a minute. No, no, I understand. Well, you can just get someone else to play jacks with. I'll send you Sam Spade. Uh, now, Rick. Uh. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Why haven't you got that report in here? Uh, I've been eating spaghetti. Spaghetti? Yeah, and that diamond's a liar. I can't lasso nothing. Maybe you have to be a cowboy. Thanks, Gabby. Keep the change. One thirty seven River Street, the address Helen had given me over the phone, was an old deserted warehouse. Now I want to stop right here and say I admit it was pretty stupid to wander into an empty warehouse like that. But I figured that this Jones guy must be in some kind of trouble to leave a message like that with Helen. The place was as empty as a fairground in the winter. I put my hand on my thirty eight and kept moving toward the back of the building. Then I saw a door. A sign on it said, John Jones. Enter. And wouldn't you know it? I did. Hey! hey what's going on? Where am I? Let me out of here! Come on, Mr. Lumpkin. Let's get out of here. Let me out of here! But I don't understand. He's liable to stay in there forever. I don't want him to stop singing like that. Somebody will come along. I promise you that. I just want him to stay in there for half an hour. That's all. And uh, Now, wait a minute. I want to know just what this is all about. You want him to lose his voice, don't you? Oh, I love it. Well, when he went through that door, he started losing it. How? Well, what's behind that door? An ice box. Come on, Mr. Grumpkin. Well, that's exactly where I was, in an ice box. Not a very big one, but a very cold one. The kind a company might have to store fresh meat and drinks. I tried breaking down the door, but it was a foot thick. I struck a match and looked around. Lots of ice, no way out. So I turned up my collar and sat on the wave. <laughs> I don't know how long I sat there, but I guessed it to be about 20 minutes. 
I could tell because my feet had frozen up about 20 minutes worth. Then I heard that lovely sound. Rick. Rick, you in there? Yeah, yeah. Hand me an ice pick. I want to get my, my feet uncrossed. How in the devil did this happen? Well, I think one of the frozen food companies got a new idea. What's the matter, Diamond? Forget oh. your sleigh. Shut up, Otis. Hey. You think you can walk, Rick? Yeah, sure, but I, I might squeak a little. Ooh, got a Bunsen burner handy? <laughs> Otis. Oh, okay. How did you find me? We got a call. From a guy named Jones? Yeah. Said he was in danger and that you were coming down to meet him at the warehouse. Said he saw two guys lock you in this icebox. Oh, dandy. Did he say where he was? Yeah. Here's the address. Thanks. Hey, where do you think you're going? Oh, I feel better now. I'm going over to find Jones. Well, you might get in trouble. Well, if I can find the two guys who locked me up, you can bet on it. Well, I'm going to send Otis along with you. Otis? I thought you wanted me to keep out of trouble. Oh, now, wait a minute. I can keep you out of trouble, Diamond. Oh, Otis, you couldn't find an elephant in an elevator. Uh, but come on and bring your head with you. This is the address where that Jones guy said he'd meet you. Ah, I'm Mandelbaum, Swedish massage. Hmm, this guy really picks up some great places to hide out. Come on, Otis. Speak first, or the rest of you will never get out of the car. Oh. Hey, hey, Diamond. You think while you're talking with this guy Jones, I might get me a rub down? Otis, to rub that stomach of yours, it would take a gallon of baby oil and an octopus to get anywhere. Hey, it smells kind of good, don't it? Like a pine tree, maybe. Otis, how would you remember? The last time you smelled a pine tree was when you used to run with a pack. Now listen here, Diamond. You gotta lay off. I don't go around... Yeah, here. what can I do for you? Holy cow. Get the biceps. Oh, I'm looking for a guy named Jones. Oh, yeah? Who wants him? The name's Diamond. Oh. Well, Mr. Jones is expecting you. I think he's back in the steam. Which way is it? Uh, straight back. I'd show you when I gotta give a guy a rub. Come on, Otis. You must be at the end of the hall. That's a pretty bright observation. Seeing as how there's only one door and it's at the end of the hall. Yeah, yeah, that's the steam room. How do you know? Oh, by this little window in the door. What do you see? Steam. Then by golly, it must be the steam room. Hey, I can't see nothing. Uh, Mr. Jones? Hey, ain't that some guy lying over there on the bench? Uh, looks like it. Mr. Jones? Hmm. He don't answer. No. Oh, just look, I'm going over there. Keep the door open. I don't want anyone to lock me in this place. Oh, okay. Mr. Jones, I... Well, hey, Otis. It's just a bunch of towels rolled up to look like somebody. Yeah? Uh, hey! Hey! Otis, what's the matter? Uh, diamond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you? Right over here. Well, what are you doing there? I told you to stay by the door and keep it open. Well, I did stay by the door until I got pushed. Pushed? Oh, no. Yeah. You know something? What? I think we're locked in. Oh, 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 oh. oh shut up, Otis. Ah, oh, but I don't feel so good. What are we going to do? Oh, why don't you be happy? It's the only chance you'll ever get to sort off some of that blubber. Yeah, you want I should look like one of the atrocity pictures? Otis, you could lose 300 pounds and still weigh in with King Kong. Yeah, there's no time to get nasty. Well, relax. Read a magazine or something. What do you mean? Just what I said. Read a magazine. Isn't that one right over there? Yeah. Oh, oh for Pete's sake. How can I read this thing, Shamus? The pages is all stuck together. You couldn't read the first line of an eye chart anyway. Just look at the pictures and shut up. Okay. Hey! What's the matter? This magazine. Take a look at this. What is it? It's one of them movie magazines. Uh, uh, movie Stars Parade. So what? Well, get a load of these pictures. Ain't that you? Let me see. Well, how about that? Some guy acting like Richard Diamond, private detective. Well, it looks like you. Ah. Uh, no, it's that Powell guy, that actor. Carry it up. Oh, no, no, it's a good magazine. Give me that. Oh, hey, what'd you do that for? If it hadn't been for that juvenile, I could have been in pictures myself. Now, try kicking in that little window again. Ah, uh, it's no use. That glass must be bulletproof. Oh, swell. First an icebox and now a steam bath. I'm going to start thinking I'm in California. Well, don't just sit there sweating. Do something. My uniform's shrinking. Well, maybe now it'll match your head. 
I just can't figure this. If someone wants to well, someone wants to get rid of me, why did they do it the old-fashioned way? Oh, don't say that. Uh, how long do you think we've been in here? I don't know. A diamond. Yeah? My socks just disappeared. Well, go kick on the door again. It's your turn. I don't think I can make it. We've been in here for days. Hey, look at your watch. It's all steamed up. I can't tell. You think there'll be anything left? Just your shoes, Otis. It'll take a blast furnace to get rid of those. <laughs> Wait a minute. What's the matter? I thought I heard somebody outside. Yeah? Hey, hey, help! Help! Shut up. Here. Hey! Hey, what's going on in here? Who closed the bowl on the door? We're saved. Uh, would you mind helping us out, old man? We seem to be a little limp. Hey, where's Mr. Jones? Hey, what are you doing in here with your clothes on? Trying to get them steam clean. <laughs> oh, fresh air. Now, would you two guys mind telling me what this is all about? Maybe you better tell us, Buster. I don't know what you mean. Who locked the door on us? How do I know? I give a guy a rub. When I come back, I find the door bolted. Hey, where's Mr. Jones? You sure he was in the steam room? Sure. He comes in and says he wants a steam. You should show up. I should send you back. I told him I was going to give a rub to stay in long as he liked. Did he ask you how long the rub would be? Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, he did. Uh, I said it'd be about half hour. I don't get it. I don't get it. He wanted me in that steam room for just a half an hour. He wanted me in that icebox for about the same time. What's with this? Diamond. Look at this uniform. Oh, I think it's lovely, Otis. You should always wear knickers. <laughs> This is stupid. Didn't the guy at the steam room tell you what this Jones guy looked like? Well, from the description, could have been anyone. Look, I'm just as mixed up as you are. Well, we'll keep after it. Just don't worry, that's all. Hey, Diamond. Miss Asher just called and I told her what's been happening. You mean you know? No, but I told her anyway. She said you should come right over because she had dinner for you. And she wanted to take care of you. <laughs> Isn't he lovely, Walt? <laughs> Think what that head is going to look like in a bottle. Oh, now you got him sore. It's going to be horrible around here. Well, isn't it always? Now well, I'm going on over to Helen's. Keep after that Jones guy and let me know if you run across anything. How are you, Mr. Clumpkin? Lumpkin. Okay, how are you? Uh, come in, come in. Well, I'm going to friend boil for a You think it did the trick? Look, when Pat, uh... Yeah, Cossack. Yeah, Cossack. Well, when I do anything, the results are guaranteed. I just tailed Diamond from the station. He went into his girlfriend's apartment across the way. Oh, goody. <laughs> Let's see what happens tonight. I'm staying home from work just to hear him not sing. Yeah. About my 50 bucks. Oh, look. He's never in that apartment more than 10 minutes before he starts singing. If he goes over 15, you get your 50. Come on. What are we going to do? Raise the window. I don't want to miss the lovely silence when he opens that big bazoo. Be. Don't know what I've been through. Oh, yes, I do. And Mommy's gonna make it better. Here's a nice drink. I don't want a nice drink. Oh, it's strong enough. Well, put it in a dirty glass. You just drink it. Okay. Ah, oh, wow. My throat. Ah! You hear something? No, why? Nothing. Your throat's still pretty bad. Don't know. Me, 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 me. Oh, hey, it's pretty good. That sounds great. Oh, no! Now, I heard something then. Yeah, so did I. It's a grouch again. Give it to him. Oh, you bet. I feel mean. A hundred and one pounds of fun. That's my little honey bun. Get a load of honey bun tonight. I'm speaking of my sweetie pie. Only 60 inches high. Every inch is packed with dynamite. Her hair is blonde and curly. Her curls are hurly burly. Her lips are pips. I call her hips. Whirly and whirly. She's my baby. I'm her pap. I'm her booby, she's my trap. I am caught and I don't want to run cause I'm having so much fun with honey bun. Oh, that does it, that does it. Hey, what's going on over there? You're close back. Okay, but don't hit me again. You can keep the 50 bucks. Said he wouldn't sing again, huh? Said you fixed it. Well, I'll fix you. No, not that. Put down that chair. Don't hit me again. Hello? Yes, Rick? 
You know, that ice box and that steam bath were the best things in the world for my throat. Yes. After you lost your voice this morning, I didn't think anything was going to help. But that ice box and that steam bath really did. Diamond! Oh, hello, Mr. Lumpkin. Did I hear you say you lost your voice this morning? That's right, Mr. Lumpkin. Then didn't think I was going to get it back either. Good night, Mr. Diamond! You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Jack Crucian, and Stephen Dunn. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was previously released over the National Broadcasting Company for listeners in the United States and has been re-released to you men and women overseas by the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, a corpse to fit every pocketbook. Rick? Oh, hello, Helen, baby. Uh, Let me sit down. Rick, what's the matter? (sighs) You sounded like your arches just broke. You got the right idea, baby. Oh, but your geography is cockeyed. Are you really hurt, Rick? Oh, believe it or not, I was trampled by a herd of horses. Oh, Rick, you idiot. Now, tell me what did happen. Okay, one horse. He ruined me for life. You went horseback riding? Oh, I don't believe it. Yeah, I want to see my bull legs. You actually did. Uh-oh. Took a girl to get you to ride a horse. But it was some slinky blonde. No, baby, it was a Palomino. And look, let's get off horses. I- I've had enough to last me. What's with the early call? Early? Rick, did you just get in? It's after 11. I was dreaming of you, baby. You wouldn't have wanted me to stop just to get into the office. It's probably a whole harem. Uh, Helen, you got to stop that peeking. You read the morning papers? They come out in the morning. Now, you stopped that. Did you read them? Well, oh, didn't have a bet down. Why? You on the society page again? Oh, much more exciting than that. The police commissioner's house was robbed of $50,000 worth of diamonds last night, and his gardener was murdered. What? I thought that would fetch you. Better get a paper. The commissioner's statement's written in blood. Yeah. And if things don't wind up fast, tomorrow's statement will be in Walt Levinson's blood. It'll be his case. Now, you stay out of it, Rick. This thief cuts throats. Oh, yeah, I'm scared. Are you, Rick? Well, I'll come over tonight and I'll frighten you at close range. Say eight. I'll practice my knee knocking so I'll be in good form. And stay in. No nightclubs. At the sound of the castanets, Francis can open the door. It'll be me and my knees. See you tonight, baby. Bye. Is this the Diamond Detective Agency? Just like it says on the door. Come in and close it gently. My Japanese beetle's still asleep. Asleep? He's got a better union. Sit down, Mr... Uh, Burton, Phineas Burton. Uh, what can I do for you, Mr. Burton? Well, I want to hire you if it's agreeable. Well, for a hundred a day in expenses, I'm pretty agreeable. Well, that's fine. I have a package I want you to deliver to a party in Philadelphia. Hmm. You can get a messenger for five bucks, or if you're hard up, a carrier pigeon for a handful of popcorn. Why a detective? Well, I'm perfectly capable of judging for myself what I need, Mr. Diamond. Now, here's three hundred dollars. There will be two hundred more for you after you make safe delivery of the package. Why? Why? Three-letter word meaning why you want to pay me for five days when the trip to Philly and back can be done in a few hours. Well, Mr. Diamond, I simply want you to drop everything else and take this job immediately. And that is my reason for the added payment. Oh, all right. I'll take your money. Just as soon as you tell me what's in the package, who it goes to, and why it's so important that I take it personally. Uh, well, I, I can't tell you that. Okay, it's your problem. Now, where did I leave my soap chips? Uh, do you have to know? Of course. 
How can I do any washing without soap? I mean about this package. Oh, no, no. I can recommend another agency who will do it for 25 bucks and no questions. Oh, very well. Uh, Mr. Elliott will meet you at the Philadelphia Station Information Desk at 2 o'clock today. Oh. I will wire him your description and he will make the contact. As for the package, it contains some very valuable papers, which Mr. Elliott is afraid his wife will try to intercept. I see. Uh, he commissioned me to find the best man I could to bring the package to him. Oh, you must have read my ad. You'll have to leave immediately. Mr. Elliott is very anxious to get the package. Now, you call me at the Astor when you return, and I'll send over the rest of the money. Uh, good day. It may be at that. What? Forget it. Burton left the package on my desk with the money. He was a thin guy, had a funny pot that made him look as if he'd swallowed a basketball. He pushed it out the door and waddled after it. When a guy insists on throwing money in my lap, I get suspicious. And when I remembered the robbery of the night before, I got that lousy feeling again. Now, paragraph 4, section B, rule A of the detective's code of ethics says, quote, Upon receiving money to deliver package, detective must never open same. It is unethical. Yeah, who's ethical? Well, surprise. No wonder basketball had been nervous. At the bottom of the box were five pretty little diamonds. About ten grand worth of a guess. Of course, it may have been that Burton thought diamonds should belong to diamond, but my bet was on a frame-up. A frame that cost the real heisters ten grand out of fifty. But was aimed to get him a nice picture to fit the frame. Me. Yeah? Is this Mr. Diamond? Oh, hello, Burton. Something on your mind? Oh, I happened to be in the store across the street, and I noticed you hadn't left yet. Uh, you will leave right away, won't you? Just as soon as I arrange things, Phineas. Well, remember, it takes an hour and a half to get to Philadelphia. I, I don't want you to be late. I'll bet you don't. Well, it was just to make sure uh, you understand. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I understand. You can dribble your basketball home now. I beg your pardon, Skipper. Bye. <laughs> Burton's call ended nearly all doubts. I was being framed all right, and the trap required my leaving for Penn Station right away. I dropped the diamonds into what was left of a quart of milk I had for lunch the day before, put the bottle on the floor by the wastebasket. Then I took the package, rewrapped it, and went out to hail a cab. I made one stop at a toy shop, then headed for Penn Station. As I entered, I saw a pair of familiar figures. Rick! Okay, what's the gag? I got the tip, but even you wouldn't joke about this case. Now, Walt, I might joke about mass murder, but never about the commissioner being robbed. Is he making speeches yet? Yeah, that's okay, Shamus. This is one time when you're one diamond too many. Why, Otis, you're becoming a wit. Eh, why not? You're halfway there. Oh, Lieutenant, he's picking on me again. You deserve it, Otis. Now, shut up. Rick, I know the tip was phony, but the commissioner was there when it came in. I had to act on it. Tip? Well, don't be smug. I've got one, too. Fifth at Hialeah. Now, don't start that. It was a tip that you were taking the commissioner's diamonds out of town. Oh, now, Walt. And don't, oh, now, Walt me. I said I knew the tip was phony, but with the commissioner taking scouts all down the line, no, I didn't No, 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 no. Don't apologize, Walt. I know. Come on, Sergeant. Show me a good frisk, and I'll recommend you to all my criminal friends. Oh. Yeah. yeah, he's clean, Lieutenant. Now, Rick, let's see that package, and then you can go. This? Oh, no, no, I can't. It's secret. Don't play games, Rick, please. Oh, all right, but it's going to spoil my surprise. Well, okay. Give me your word it's got nothing to do with this case, and I won't bother to open it. No, 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 I'm hurt. I absolutely insist that you open the package right now. But, Rick, you know I trust Lieutenant you. Lieutenant Levinson, do your duty. My purity must not be suspicioned. Oh, anything to get this over with. You were, uh, hmm... What? It's only a pair of dolls. Uh, you were expecting maybe my gallstones? Oh, dolls. <laughs> the Shamus place with dolls. <laughs> Better read the tag, Gordis, before your ears get any longer and they draft you for a mule team. Tag? Sure. But what? The, to my beloved Otis from his Ricky. Oh. Rick. Now, don't be a grouch, Walt. The other one's for you. For me? Oh, no. I'm sorry, Walt. I couldn't resist it. Anyhow, you spoiled my surprise to Otis. It was our anniversary. What? Our anniversary? We ain't even related. Oh, you don't remember? Oh, Otis. Well, Tennant, can I go back to traffic? I can't stand much more. Oh, shut up, Otis. Rick, if we weren't such good friends, I'd... I'd... Walt, hey, now you're upset. Upset? Why should I be upset? 
Just because two hoods lift 50 grand in ice from the commissioner, or because it's dumped in my lap with the murder of the gardener, or that I'm given 24 hours to break the case and then get a tip that leads me to a friend who decides to play games and wreck my side to be on repair? Now, why should I be upset? Oh, that's a... Here you are, Lieutenant. But take it easy. That's a second bottle of bike cob today. Walt, you rate an apology and I make it. I'll do better than that. I'll help you if you'll let me. Well, I can sure use your help, Rick. I haven't got a single lead. You want to look at the corpse first? May as well. Has he got a record? No. And the commissioner swears he was honest. Probably stumbled onto the thieves and they had to put him away. How about the rest of the servants? They were all out. The commissioner and his wife were at a party. They'd given the entire staff the night off, but... I guess perhaps the gardener returned a little early. Yeah, well, let's go down and take a look at him. I've got a personal interest that makes me want to crack this case. Uh, client? Call him an ex-client. I'll explain him later. Come on. Uh, here he is, Rick. Mm, nasty cut. How was it made? Well, it... Could have been a sharp knife, but it's a safer bet that it was a razor. Mm. Remind me not to go to his barber. What safe cracker's got enough nerve to pull his job off? Well, I got three guys that could fit the job, but not one of them has ever been known to carry a weapon of any sort, much less a razor. Correction. One dealer, that gardener's playing a lousy joke on us. I suppose this could have been the first time one of them carried a razor. I don't buy that, neither do you. Give me the names. I want to talk to them. Maybe I can get a lead of some sort. Sure. Here they are. And please, Rick, call me if you get anything. If I can find the nickel. Bye. As far as I could see, I had three things to match up. One, the careless barber. Two, the safe cracker with nerve enough to rob the police commissioner. And three, the reason why I was picked as the pigeon. I gave up the idea of hunting for Burton, the guy who came into my office... He was probably a flunky and not worth running down. So I checked the names I got from Walt, grabbed a cab, and headed for the Bronx. The first turned out to be an ex-con trying to go straight by working in a Bronx hash house. The second was likely, but he'd kissed his wife with a beer bottle and spent last night in jail. At the third address, down in Greenwich Village, I met a landlady with gin-loaded tonsils and a cute mustache. She tipped me that my third prospect, Vincent Mayer, might be playing pinochle at Pietro's which turned out to be a cafe with a 30-foot bar, three tables, and a back room. Hey, uh, barkeep. Yeah? What'd it be, Fred? Milk. No chaser. Milk? Who makes it? Oh, you mean like from cows. Never carried the stuff. Where can I find Vince Mayer? Why don't you ask me, handsome? Well, hello, baby. Now, do I look like a baby? Uh, no. My name's Jean. What do they call you? Take your pick. Call me Rick. Hey, you talk funny. But you're awful nice. Too nice to be hunting for Vince Mayer. He's a bad boy, Rick. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to be a hero. Where is he? In the back room. There. The guy with the light hair. But be careful. Thanks, baby. I'll buy you a palace. Eighty mil, Joe, twenty clubs, twenty spades, and forty pinochle. What? No diamonds? Hey. Uh, well, 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 look who's here. What do you want, Shamus? Vince, the ice man, isn't it? Well, now, let's see. Sing Sing, class of 38. Where's your school tie, Vince? The name is Mr. Mayor to you, Diamond, and privates are not welcome here. It's a closed game. Yeah. Move on. Give me a reason. You want to play dead? Oh, come on, Vince. You're not going to get upset just because I think you robbed the commissioner? You did, didn't you? I told my story to the cops. I'll bet. But you didn't answer my question. And here's another. Who's your barber? You're asking for it, Diamond. I was brought up right. Now, let's get off this cat and mouse kick. I want some answers, Vince. Do you? That's right, Junior, I do. All right. Call him, Joe. Hey, what? what? Oh. All right, Joe. Stop it, stop it. That's enough, Joe. All right, now drag him out in the alley. Uh, Vince, uh, can I, uh... Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe it'll teach him not to get so nosy. But keep that razor in your pocket. I will, honest. This is gonna be real fun. Come on, Shamus. Here's where I do some road work on your liver. <laughs> Here, Mr. Diamond. I only wish my brother could see you. When I came to, I was curled up around a 
round metal object I couldn't see, and I felt as if I was smothered in a mountain of cotton. And getting out of it was like trying to shovel sand with a pitchfork. I finally managed to move and wished I hadn't, for a company of Bengal lancers began target practice on my side. So I quit trying and lay still for a long moment. Then a voice came fizzing through the cotton at me. Hey, hey, mister, are you alive? Not if I'm not, you're an angel, and this is a harp. Well, I'm sure no angel. And that's the garbage can. So I guess you're not dead. Matter for debate, Jeannie. Oh, help me up, will you? Sure. Here. <sighs> hey, can, can you stand? Practically anything after this. Ooh. Hey, you hurt pretty bad. Come on, lean on me. My place isn't far. I'll take you there so you can lie down. Best offer I've had today. Lead on, Angel. There. Now, how do you feel? Uh, I never use language like that in front of a lady. Oh, I'm no lady. I'm a waitress at Pietro's. I heard the noise in the back room. When you didn't come out, I took a look. Ooh. Gee, does your head hurt, baby? Like all my relatives who are inside digging for gold. With luck, I can open my eyes and they won't fall out. You know, we might have had a lot of fun together if you weren't all banged up like this. I'll take that remark up with you later, honey. I'm not usually the kind of guy who runs out on pretty girls, but I only wanted to get my hands on the gunner who tried to kick my brains out. So I took Jean's number, filed it under, uh, uh, for later investigation, and stumbled out into the street. My head was clearing, but it was as slow about it as a dummy doing a strip tease. Maybe that's why I didn't notice when I came out of the house that I had two guys for company. Hello, Diamond. Huh? Huh? When Pietro told me Jane had run out, I thought I might find you here. She always goes for guys like you. Well, she has taste. I'm glad you came around. I have a few things I want to discuss with you and Joe here. Uh, hold it, Chamas. Or I'll show you how easy it is to get rid of your troubles. Now, now, that's a pretty little gun. Aren't you stepping out of character, Vince? You're supposed to be a smart one. You're getting on my nerves. Yeah? Well, put the gun away and I'll quiet you down a little. You want me to mess him up again, Vince? And what's with you? Come to do your job over again? I may at that. Yeah? Well, you got 32 teeth, sonny. Want to try for none? Why, you... I got some questions I'd still like to have answered. Why was I picked as pigeon? Why me? You're getting a little too smart, Diamond. Now, listen. I know you got wise to Burton, so it figures that you still got the package. Now, I got no reasons to give you $10,000 worth of diamonds. I want them back. Oh, dandy. I've got big news for you, Buster. You're not going to get them. Don't make any mistakes, Diamond. I'll use this gun if I have to. Ah, go eat a tombstone, Joe. Yeah, how's your stomach ache? Oh. Wait a minute, Joe. Oh. Now, Diamond, look, you can have a choice. You bring the rocks to me at Pietro's in an hour and we'll forget the whole thing? Or don't. And I'll send Joe with a few friends to call on you. And for the last time. For a few sick minutes, I leaned against the wall, wondering if I wanted to live. One thing I was certain of was that Vince Mayer was never going to get those diamonds back. Or was he? An idea began to percolate in my head to the tune of an old rhyme about a goose and a gander. And I got inspired enough to sit up and forget my aching ribs. When it simmered into a full-scale boil, I grabbed a cab, went back to my office, and got the diamonds out of the milk bottle where I'd hidden them. Then I headed for the village fast. I was soon banging on a door there like a drummer playing Bob. It ain't my cripple. I got the bruises to prove it. Come on in. Are you really recovered? What? Oh, no, not that much, Angel. Then? I need some answers. What do you know about Vince and Joe? Not too much. Enough to dislike them plenty. That Vince got me canned for leaving Pietro's to take care of you. That's why I'm back home. I know he's a smoothie, and he... I think he's a big-time jewel thief. Uh, that much I know. How about Joe, the dog-faced boy? Ah, uh, him, he's just a punk. I think his real name is Fancy or uh, Fanchetti. Franchetti or some such thing. Franchetti? Yeah. I don't know why, but they call him Joe the Barber. Oh, Joe the Barber. Yeah. Isn't that silly? Mm. If he cuts hair, he doesn't. But I'll lay eight to one. This guy works on throats. Thanks, Angel. You've tied up my three points. 
What are you talking about? Your friend Vince Mayer lifted 50 grand in ice from the police commissioner last night, and his accomplice, Joe, gave the gardener a shave. You, you mean murder? On the button. The gardener's throat was sliced from life to death. And now, baby, look. How would you like to earn $100? Sure. Is it legal? Well, uh, no. I'll take it. Now, where is he? Will you tell me where's Rick? I know where I'd like him to be. I'm worried, Otis. Seriously. Rick is in this thing up to his ears. You mean he was in on that job? Don't be stupid, Otis. Of course not. Rick's no crook. But he's mixed up in this case some way, and I'm worried. He should have called me by now. Gee. Hope he hasn't tangled with that razor guy. I thought you hated Rick. Oh, you know I was just talking. I know, I know. What a mess. Rick in danger and I can't find him. The commissioner's spouting love all over the city hall. Why the devil did it have to be the commissioner's house? You know, it's kind of funny at that. The commissioner himself. <laughs> you knucklehead. For two cents, I'd... Maybe that's him. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Walt, Rick. Rick, I was... Where the devil have you been? I'm taking care of some arrangements. Arrangements? Never mind, just listen. I was picked as a pigeon, and some of those diamonds were planted on me this morning. What? I've traced your hoods. They're Vince Mayer and Joe the Barber Franchetti. Now, you come to Pietro's in half an hour, and you'll catch him with a pile of the diamonds on him. Rick, what is this? Well, Vince had it figured as a double barrel gag, Walt. First on the cops by raiding the commissioner's house. Second by dumping a few of the rocks in my lap and tipping the police so I'd take the rap. Well, why you, Rick? Well, Joe's name, Franchetti. You remember, I sent his brother Tony to Sing Sing a few years back. Oh. I knew he had a brother, but until now, Joe stayed out of Manhattan. I get it. Okay, what's the play? Well, I'm I'm going to take the package back to Vince. Give it to him in Pietro's. A girlfriend will be raising so much fuss, no one will notice me. Then as Vince and Joe leave, you nail him with the diamonds. And no alibi for having him. Right. You said uh, half an hour? In front of Pietro's. <laughs> Take a peek, Angel, through the window. There's my party at the back table. Now, you know what to do. Yeah. I keep yelling until you get back to me. Right? As rain. I'll make it a good one. I got good lungs. Let's go in. Okay, over to the bar. Lock, Rick. There he is now, Joe. I told you he'd show up. Hello, Diamond. You got something for me? That's right, Vince. Okay, let's have it. Hey, what's going on over there? Stop, stupid dame. Yeah, do you want the package or not? Oh, yeah, give it to me. Come on, Joe. Let's scram out of here before that dame brings her cops. Yeah. That's an easy way of getting back to ten grand, ain't it, Vince? Shut up, come on. Take it easy now. Okay, okay. We're okay now. Let's split up. Hold it, Vince. What? Let's have a look at the package. The uh, cops! Levinson, what are you doing? The here? package, Vince. Hey, what are we going to do? Shut up. You, uh, got a warrant, of course. Of course. Otis, take the package. Yeah, Lieutenant. <laughs> you can't arrest me. I don't even know what's in that package. It was given to me by a friend. Now, don't use the term so loosely, Vince. Why, Walt, what are you doing here? Hello, Rick. I've captured a criminal. No. Yes, and he was carrying a package of his loot. Why, I bet it's part of that diamond robbery. Hey, what is all this? Diamond, you just planted that package on me. Me? Why, stranger, you're telling a fib. You just know that's downright immoral to something. Uh, this is ridiculous. Lieutenant, he gave me those diamonds and Pietro's not five minutes ago. I didn't lift them from the commissioner. Didn't you, Vince? Why, then I must have made a mistake. You can prove your story, of course. Sure I can. Bartender saw Diamond slipping the package. Oh, now, Vince, you think that bartender was going to be watching you when a lovely girl is practically tearing up the joint? Boss, the dame yelling. She was a plant. Yeah, but this is a frame-up. Diamond, you can't get away with this. Please, don't talk to me. I never associate with common criminals. A frame? You dirty double-crossing copper. Look out, Rick. He's got a razor. Mm. Oh, my arm. Now, don't cry, Joe. This is for you. Oh. Ooh. Wow. What a punch you got, Shamus. Well, that does it. Come on, Vince. Otis, load that killer into the car and pick up that razor. Yellow to... Want a lift, Rick? Yeah, no thanks, Walt. I'm going to go home freshen up. Yeah, you look like you could use it. Hmm. I 
left Walton, headed for my apartment, where I grabbed a stomach full of vitamins and planted myself under the hot shower. It felt so good I fell asleep. And if Walt hadn't phoned, I'd have probably become the only man in history to drown in the shower. Walt shocked me wide awake with the news that he was holding a thousand-dollar reward for me. I gave him my nicest thank you and made a mental note to drop by and give half of it to Jean to make up for her losing her job. Around about 8 o'clock, after I'd taken care of dividing the reward, I steered for 975 Park Avenue, made it with no trouble, and rang the bell to Helen's apartment. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Miss Asher's expecting you, sir. She's in the library. Thank you, Francis. Uh, how's your health? Oh, my, my health, sir. It's a very good, thank you. Well, now, this may come as a shock, but, uh... Francis, uh, about the money I owe you. Oh, don't fret about it, sir. It will test. I'm going to pay you what I owe you. You're going to? Oh, dear. Oh, perhaps I better sit down. Oh, my word. Now, oh, there, there, Francis. Rip, darling, is that you? It ain't Tom Swift, baby. Come on in the library. Well, okay. But it'll do you no good, my dove. I'm a cripple, a battle-torn veteran. I don't want your muscles, Rick. I'm blue, and I want you to sing to me. Oh, Helen, baby, I don't want to sing. I want Rick, to... I'm blue. I need cheering up, not be nice and sing. Well, okay, honey. Uh, how's this, huh? I can see No matter how near you'll be You'll never belong to me but I can dream, can I? Can I pretend that I'm locked in the bed of your embrace? For dreams are just like wine, and I am drunk with mine. I is a sad affair There's much disillusion there But I can dream Can't I Can't I adore you Although we are oceans apart I can't make you But I can dream, can I? Oh, there. Still feeling blue, baby? Oh, Ricky, come here. Ah, here I am. Oh, now I'm contented. You in my arms, my bills paid off, and, and my bills... Oh, for Pete's sake, I forgot Francis. Francis? What are you talking uh, about? C- come with me, I'll show you. Now, there he is. Francis, Francis, you all right? Oh, oh, yes, sir. I think so, sir. Rick, will you tell me what's going on in my own home? Well, honey, I paid Francis off, and the shock of having to give back my gun and badge undid him. Oh, well, are you feeling better, Francis? Uh, not very much, Miss Asher. It's that badge and license. Will you miss him that much, Francis? Uh, well, sir, to be very honest, there's a waitress in a tea shop down the street with whom I've been, uh, if you'll pardon the expression... Having a fling. Francis, you? Uh, oh, that's not the worst, Miss Asher. I'm afraid I've been a bit of a fraud with her as well. In fact, with several of the waitresses there. Now, wait, wait. Uh, where does my badge and license enter into it? Did you hock them for crumpets? Oh, much worse, Mr. Diamond. You see, to all the waitresses of Miss Tuppingham's tea shop... I am Richard Diamond, oh. private detective. Oh, oh no. Yeah. 
You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum, William Conrad, Tal Avery, and Bob Carroll. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's story was written by Herb Purdom and edited and directed by Blake Edwards. See the Richard Diamond picture story in the December issue of Movie Stars Parade. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Listen tonight to NBC for a star lineup of entertainment. Every Saturday on NBC, you can hear such stellar programs as Hollywood Star Theater, Ralph Edwards' Truth or Consequences, Your Hit Parade, A Day in the Life of Dennis Day, The Judy Canova Show, Grand Old Opry, and Songs by Morton Downey. There's always a program of interest on NBC, so keep tuned here. Shortcut to Death with Fred McMurray is next on NBC. <laughs> Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, the Smiling Gumshoe. Rick, Sign yeah. up for our new contest and win yourself a beautiful all-chrome, pre-tested, genuine electric chair. Oh, lovely. What do I have to do? Just tear off your scalp and send it along with 25 words or less why you love Richard Diamond. I can do it in two words. What are they? You're pretty. Oh, you win, you win. Where do you want the chair sent, madam? 975 Park Avenue, but I think I have AC current. No problem with the Jiffy Toaster chair. It works on any current AC DC. And we have it in three speeds 45, 78, and long playing. Oh, no. Oh, Rick, that's awful. Hello, baby. Hi. What are you doing? Oh, nothing. What's with you? Oh, I just thought I'd call and find out if I'm still going to see you tonight. Yes, ma'am. We gonna stay in? Well, I thought I'd have Francis fix dinner and we could sit around and listen to records or something, but if you'd rather go out, I... No, 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 baby. I think that would be lovely. And so does my bank account. Oh, broke again? Not quite. A little bent. I hope the next client I get has a big, fat trust fund. Well, don't you worry about it. I'll see you around eight. Okay. Bye, baby. Bye. Oh, uh, now, let's see. Six shirts, four pairs of socks, and... Hey, how did that get in there? Well... Oh. Okay, okay. Yeah? Well, what's the matter with you? You lost up my laundry. What are you talking about? Today isn't Tuesday. Okay, Walt, so it isn't Tuesday. Nothing's happening around this place. I felt like doing some washing. Why don't you put it away and come on down here? I'll give you something to do. What do you mean? You sound like you're surrounded by Sergeant Otis's relatives. I got a big headache. I think maybe you can help me with it. Trouble? All over the place. You don't have to, but I'd like to, well, sort of kick it around with you. Sure, sure, sure. I'll throw a few more things in the soak and I'll be right down. Oh, thanks, Rick. Hey, it's really serious, isn't it? Now, what makes you say that? Look, Father... Every time your ulcers hold a rally and you want me to come down and join in, you say, thanks, Rick, just like I'd laid an egg or something for you. Oh, you think you're pretty smart, don't you? Sure. If I listen to everybody who thinks I'm not, I'd wind up playing mumbly peg in a straitjacket. I'll be right over. Well, that's the way trouble can get in the way of an otherwise quiet afternoon. Walt doesn't usually call me like that, but when he does, I know things are bound to get pretty rough. I tossed all of my shirts into soap, closed up the office. Twenty minutes later, I was walking into the squad room at the 5th Precinct Police Station. I spotted Sergeant Otis hopping around like a crapshooter on his 10th pass. Well, what's with you, Otis? Uh, oh, don't bother me now, Shamus. I gotta get these reports into Lieutenant. Well, well, get you. What's the matter? Did you suddenly discover you were working for the police department? Uh, now, that's very funny. Ha, ha, ha. 
Okay, you got a laugh. Now beat it. The lieutenant expects you. Well, all right. But for Pete's sakes, Otis, stop acting like that and don't bust into the lieutenant's office like that. You swear you've been doped and start an investigation. Shama, someday I ain't even going to bother to answer you. Sergeant, the day you don't open your mouth to say something stupid, the whole world will start singing. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And while I think about it, why don't you start combing your hair? What's the matter with it? Looks like a mattress after the lions got through with it. Oh. Hello, Walt. Hello, Rick. Sit down. Oh, maybe I should have worn black. Hmm? That or a propeller on my hat. First I run into Otis, acting like he was shot out of a cannon. Then I waltz in here and you give me that big hello like you just discovered a body in your desk. Lan Jacoby is back in town. Le- what? Yeah. Oh, but... But we got an indictment on him. Got him deported six years ago. Look, Rick, there's no mistake. One of our stoolies brought us word. Oh, but that's crazy. Jacoby knows the feds will pick him up in a second. How'd he get back in? Who knows? Florida, maybe. Last we heard, he disappeared in Italy. And about six months later, we got a report he was seen in Cuba. Oh, are you just going to take the stoolie's word for it? Uh, what else have you got? I got three bodies to date, and they're all very dead. Jacoby? It's got to be. Why? Well, the first two are the guys that turned state's evidence and helped to put Jacoby away. You remember them, Ross and Kreisel. Jacoby swear he'd get him someday. Who's the third? The stoolie who gave us the tip. Walked out of the station and somebody with a Thompson scattered them all over the front steps. Right in front of the station? Yeah, it'll be in the evening papers. The commissioner is very unhappy. How about the feds? Are they working on it? Up to their necks, but nobody can find out how he got in or where he might be hiding out. Oh, here's something else that makes us sure it's Jacoby. In this town, there are at least five of Jacoby's old mob. The minute this thing broke, we started to check. They've all disappeared. You think they're organizing again? Oh, Walt, come on. Rick, now. I don't know what to think. That's why I wanted you to come down. You're one of the guys who worked on the Jacoby case. You remember a lot about it. Well, sure, but... Oh, now you can't tell me Jacoby is going to try to start operating again. It's a one-way pass to that little green room up at Sing Sing. I know it, I know it, I know it. But you tell me. I don't know how to figure it. You can't find anybody else who's seen Jacoby. No, just the stoolie. He's going to make a swell witness. Yeah. Uh, Lieutenant. Yeah? Uh, we just got a report on the teletype. Jacoby? Uh, yeah. Florida reports the body of a man found out in the Biscayne Keys. Uh, they check and find out he was a Cuban. Uh, charter boats for fishing trips. And the immigration boys check with the authorities in Cuba, and it turns out that this dead guy took a party of two out for a trip and never uh, showed up again. Wait a minute. You said a party of two? Yeah. A dame and a guy. Well, what makes you think the guy with the dame was Jacoby? Because the description fitted Jacoby exactly. And the feds say that Jacoby married a dame in Italy. And the dame that got on the boat fits the wife's description. Mm -hmm. Well, Rick? Uh, That's ridiculous. Okay. We now agree on two things. Leon Jacoby is back in the States, and it's ridiculous. Will you give me a hand? I need somebody who really knew Jacoby. Hey, Diamond, did you really know Jacoby? Sure, sure, Otis. We used to go out and shoot dumb police sergeants together. Oh, hey, Lieutenant, why don't he ever give me a straight answer? Because it wouldn't fit your crooked head. Now go out and dig up some more reports. Mm, okay. All right, Walt. Now let's let's say Jacoby's going to start operating again. He's made sure of one thing. Nobody who's seen him is alive enough to testify. So? So this. I'll eight to five, Jacoby's going to make a quick haul someplace and do one more killing. You expect the killing? Uh, I expect an attempt. He's gotten two of the guys who put him away. He's just got uh, one more guy to tag. He said he'd do it himself and with a knife. That means he's got to find you. Yeah. The haul must be really important for him to risk coming into the States. He probably needs money to keep going, so he'll pull off the job and then try to get me. And he'll leave the country the same way he came in. Nobody can ever swear they saw him. Except the five guys in his mob. I think he'll kill every one of them, too. That's a lot of doing. Jacoby's a lot of killer. Now, we've got to find out where at least one of those guys is. We'll find Jacoby and try and stop the slaughter. Yeah, but you've got to watch your step, Rick. There's no telling when he's going to pull off the job and try to go to work on you. Look, I'm not happy about it. I'm really the guy who's responsible for putting Jacoby away, and I know him pretty well. He's got a vendetta, Walt. And guys like Jacoby don't figure they're their brother's keeper. The score is two out of three is one to go. He'll try his best to kill me and even it up. Well, where do you say we start? Ah, uh, I know. Oh, give me a list of the five guys you think are with Jacoby and all the information on them you got. It is right here. All right. Put two of your best men on these three guys at the bottom of the list, and you and I will start with these two on top. Okay, but I hope we find Jacoby in time. Walt, so do I. The way he uses that knife, I'll have to have all my clothes made out of bandage. 
called assigned two of his best men to start checking on the three names at the bottom of the list, and we took off for Flatbush. Our first man was a hoodlum named George Vale, and one of his favorite hangouts was a pool hall on Church Avenue. Snooker or straight pool? We want to talk. You want to talk? Go over to the park. Get yourself a box. Oh, look, your wise cracks can only give you a hollow mouth. Show him the badge, Walt. Oh, cops. Well, well, what do you want? You know a man named George Vale? No. Nope. Let's go. Hey, wait a minute. Look, I'm not going to fool around. The answers here will be a lot easier. We know Vale comes here a lot. If you don't want to tell us about him, the boys at the station have got time to help your memory along. You can't haul me in. What's the charge? Withholding police evidence. It can get you a couple of years. Let's go. Hey, wait a minute. Okay. Okay what? Oh, wait a minute. I just want to be sure no one sees me talking to you. Okay. I don't know much. Vale ain't been in here for a couple of days. Where does he live? I don't know. I swear I don't, but... I do know it's in the neighborhood. Sometimes I see him coming out of a little delicatessen across the street with a bundle of groceries. Let's go, Walt. Yeah. Oh, uh, thanks, Sporty. It's guys like you who make the police department such a happy little group. So, good afternoon, gentlemen. You own this place? Yes, there's something wrong. Does a man named George Vale come in here much? Oh, something is wrong. I told Mama that George was a no good. Then he does come in here. We're a policeman, maybe. Yes, we're policemen. Now, would you mind telling us, please, if uh, whether... Mama! Mama, Oh, she must be out and back. I want to show her. She liked this George Philly. He was always with the flat three. Now I want to show her what happens to that no good. Mama, uh, Please, please. We haven't got much time. Oh, I'm sorry, gentlemen. You must excuse an old man in so little excitement. So, now what can I do for you? Do you know where George Vale lives? Sure, sure. I'm sending him over stuff lots of times. It's up two blocks, but he ain't there. How do you know that? Because his wife, she's coming in for the last couple of days. Uh, she said he was out of town on business. He's got a wife? Sure, sure. A blunt. Uh, she's not bad looking. Well, <laughs> You know. Yeah, yeah. So what is Bayo's exact address? Uh, here, I'll write for you on a piece of paper. What time you got, Rick? Uh, 2.30. Uh, dear our gentlemen, I hope you catch him for whatever he's done that no good. Uh, we'll have to ask you not to mention this to anybody. Not even to Mama. Well, okay, to Mama. But you tell Mama to keep it a secret. Oh, oh, a secret. Well, maybe I'm not telling you for a couple of days yet. Come on, Walt. Are we going down to see Vale's wife? No, I got a better idea. Well, don't you think she'd know where Vale is? Maybe, but she's not going to tell us. But if we throw a scare into her, she might tell her husband something. If she knows where he is. Get Otis down here with a recording outfit. We'll wait until we see her leave the apartment and bug the place. No sense in tailing it. If Vale is with Jacoby, he wouldn't give her the address. Maybe he didn't tell her anything. Maybe he just took off. Eh, that's a chance we've got to take. Maybe uh, he gave her a phone number where he could be reached. On the way down to the Vale address, put in a call at the precinct. Right. KXKB to KQAR. I'm at the corner of Flatbush and Church. Have Sergeant Otis report to me on a code three and tell him to step on it. Walt finished his report. We both went over and talked with the landlady in Vale's building. She told us that Mrs. Vale was still in her room and gave us an accurate description. Also, she agreed to pull down her window shade when Mrs. Vale left the building so that there wouldn't be a chance of missing her. Then we went back to the car to wait. In about 15 minutes, Otis showed up carrying a small portable recorder. Uh, here you are, Lieutenant. All right. Get uh, in the back seat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we going to wire somebody's apartment? No. I just thought it might be fun to play cops and robbers. Uh, now relax. We might be here for quite a while. Uh, not so long, Walt. Look. Hmm? There goes the landlady's signal. Yeah. Mrs. Vale should be... There she comes. Now, yeah. Otis, get set. Hmm? we got to go up there and plant a bug before she comes back. I'm set. i got four cars at the intersections just in case she's got a car. If she walks, i got four men to tailor, depending on her direction. Uh, she's crossing the street. KXKB to KQAR. Car 79314. Stand by. Rick, you notice. Get up there with a the bug. Right. Come on, Otis. Yeah. Right with you. Attention. The suspect is turning into Church Avenue, heading for New Lots. Long, five feet four, wearing checkered coat and carrying a black band. In here, Otis. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a room. The landlady said she'd unlock it for us as soon as Mrs. Vale left the building. 
Bingo. Go on in. Okay, okay. Now, plant it just like you knew what you were doing, Sergeant. I'll take the box down in the basement where we can listen. Give me five minutes and then give me a quick test. Well, how long have I got to set it up? Who knows? Don't worry about it too much. If Mrs. Vale comes in, just tell her you're, you're selling tape recorders. Oh, she won't believe that. Otis, with your face, you'll have to believe something as stupid as that. I dropped the wire out of the window and went out and down into the basement. It was a slipshod way of wiring a room, but we were in a hurry and it would have to be enough. I set it up and waited for Otis to start crooking. Okay, Diamond. I'll start counting. One, two, three, four, five... Uh, Six. Hey, I think I hear something coming. I'm going out the window. I'll see you in the basement. Oh, for Pete's sake. Gee, she nearly caught me. I come down the fire escape. Well, come on in. Yeah. How's it working? All right. Listen. Hey, she ain't got a bad voice. You probably got me plugged in with Morton Downey. What are we going to do? Just sit here and listen? The lieutenant's going to give Mrs. Vale a scare, Otis. Then we're going to listen. I don't get it. Shh. That's Walt. Who's there? The police, Mrs. Vale. Huh? Oh, well, wait just a minute. Hey, it sounds pretty good, Don. Shut up, Otis. See if it works. Hello, operator. Evergreen 33349, please. Yeah. Hello, George there? Oh, Tom and Mary. Hello, honey. Oh, look, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know, but this is one of those times. Yeah, a cop was just here. Yeah, cop. Murder. I don't know. No, I didn't let him in. Huh? Oh, I never thought of that. Okay, I won't call again. Bye, baby. Okay, Otis. Stay here and keep this thing going. I gotta get back to the lieutenant. Did it work? Yeah, like a dream. She called Evergreen 33349 and talked to George. I'll check the number. You start driving north, so we'll be in the general exchange area. KXKB calling KQAR, code 600. We headed across town while Walt put in a code to the precinct. In less time than it takes Sergeant Otis to say, oh yeah, we had our address. Well, wouldn't you know it, another pool hall. Yeah, a guy must like the game. Hope he's in. Pretty crowded, I don't... Oh, yeah. yeah. There he is. He sees us. He's going for the back door. Let's grab him. Right. Hey, let me go. All Take right. your hands off me, Joe. You're busting my arm. Just take it easy, Vale. All we want to do is talk to you. Come on, outside. Okay, okay. Go on, Vale. In the car. Quit shoving. I'm going. Walt, how are you? Now, Rick. Where did that shot come from? Got Vale in the chest. Yeah, across the street. Stay down. Yeah, look. Look, Vale, you're not going any place now. We know you're working for Jacoby, and we know he's close. The guy who just shot you is working for Jacoby, too. You're not going to cover up for a louse who just fingered you, are you? Jacoby's looking for you, too, Diamond. He's going to cut you up bad. Where's the hideout, Vale? I'm going to put in an 800 on this, Rick. I want this whole area surrounded. Come on, Vale. Where's Jacoby? All right. Fifty. Uh... Fail. No oh, swell. Repeat. Code 800 from Central Park West to 10th. From 59th Street to 64th Street. KXKC. Now at Pool Hall, 9th Avenue, 60th Street. Okay, Rick, what's with Vale? Yeah, nothing. Dead? Yeah. Gave me half of Jacoba's address. 455 and then made the trip. 455? 
Well, come on. There can't be too many 455s within walking distance. What about Vail? Yeah, I'll call him for the wagon. Go ahead. I'll I'll start checking apartment numbers. Now, you wait a minute. You better take it easy. Jacoby would like nothing better than to have you go knocking on his front door. If I know Jacoby, Walt, he's got the radio on and he knows just what you're doing. Besides, that finger man will tell him about Vale. Somebody's got to find him before he makes a break. He's done enough killing. Well, if you do run into something, you wait for the boys. Walt. Yeah? Bye. <laughs> I took off and started checking addresses that began with 455. The first was cold turkey, nothing but a married couple who looked like they were in training for Madison Square Garden. I moved on. Somewhere in that neighborhood, Leon Jacoby was listening to his radio. Car 3, code 800, 455 to 61st Street. Car 16, 17, and 18. Shut it off, James. But Leon, Avenue, same it's around code. in this whole area. Shut it off. All right. All right. I wish the boys would get back. All right, take it easy. Take it easy. Yeah, who is it? Eddie, boss. Okay. Boss, the cops... Come in, come in, come in. Two cops picked up Bill in the pool hall. Oh, so that's what it's all about. That Bill will talk. No, he, he won't. What do you mean? Well, I waited across the street. Got Bill when he came out with the two pigs. Oh, you did, huh? <laughs> Well, well, you did me a favor, Ed. When I figured you didn't want anybody around that would might squeal, you know, fail, wife and everything. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you know what else you did, Ed? What? Well, uh, no, what? When you plugged Vail, you brought the whole New York police force right down on my neck. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I... I gotta return the favor. Well, what do you mean? I, I, I just didn't think. No, you didn't. Leon, come on. We gotta get out of here. Will you shut up? Hey, now, wait a minute. What's with you? I got a present for you, Ed. Huh? Leon! Huh? No, 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 boss. Put that knife away. Sure. No, no. Oh, Leon. Oh. oh, Leon. Oh, no. No. What's the matter with you? What did you do that for? I'm in a tough spot. I go faster alone, baby. Alone? Yeah, baby. You mean... Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You'd leave me. Look, I got no choice. You know how it is, kid. One might get through, but two, no chance. Uh, nothing to say, baby? Yeah. Go on, get out. Just like that, huh? Then what would happen to you? You might help the, kipe, uh, the cops find me, huh? Tell me, aren't you a little scared? No. Just sick. I've been sick since we got here. I wish I'd known what you were really like. I'd have laughed at you when you asked me to marry you. Oh? Well, go on, baby. Laugh now. Maybe it'll help. Well, go on. Laugh your head off. You ain't nothing funny. <laughs> You're trying not to act scared. Jacoby don't scare you none, huh? <laughs> now I laugh. You're scared plenty because you think I might kill you. Well, say something. Don't just stand there. You're scared. You gotta be scared. Everybody's scared of Jacoby. <laughs> you slapped Jacoby. Okay, baby. Nobody slapped Jacoby. Not you, not the cops, not anybody. Maybe you like to beg me not to kill you, huh? Go ahead. Go ahead, go on, beg. Oh. Okay. I think about you when I'm back in Forenzi, baby. Yeah. I'll river there at you. Jacoby, hold it. What? Stop, Jacoby. <laughs> Jacoby had waited six years to get a crack at me, and it looked like he was going to finally get his chance. The alley was a dead end. I stopped and listened. The back of the alley was stacked with boxes, and along the sides, garbage cans. He could have been hiding anywhere along the line. I'm coming in, Jacoby. You want to give it up, or do you want to play? The block's surrounded. Okay, okay, I ain't got a gun. Come on out. All right. Oh, no, oh, no, only don't shoot, Diamond. Walk over here. 
Hey, you see, I ain't got a gun. I don't shoot, please. Shut up, slob, and start walking out. Why you gotta act like that for, huh, Diamond? Come on, Jacoby, move. So, what do you cops got against me? What'd I do, huh? Nothing, Jacoby. Not a thing. Start moving. Well, why you gotta get so tough? Well, maybe you're scared. Scared to death. Now, if you don't hurry up and move, I'm gonna shoot you full of holes. I'm so scared. All right, Diamond, all right. I ain't got no gun, so you can push me around like that. What are you gonna do to me, huh? Why, not a thing. Haven't you heard? The city went out and bought you a yacht. They like the way you kill people, so they're gonna give you the yacht and send you back to Italy. Now, walk out of that alley. Okay, okay, okay. Now, you dirt. <laughs> Over here, Walt. Over here. He pulled his knife on you, huh? Yeah, I didn't think I'd see it. Well, you're lucky you're dead. Yeah, well, I expected it. There used to be an old saying six years ago. When Leon Jacoby wants you dead, he'll use a knife and you'll lose your head. Now, he should have remembered I keep up on slogans. That's an awful story. Well, you wanted me to tell you about it. But it's so terrible, and you're so lucky. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. You'll certainly know better next time. Oh, I'll never make the same mistake again. Well, I should hope not. Imagine being in such a hurry you've forgotten through your socks in with all those lovely white shirts. Mm, plaid now, baby. Did the color run that much? Sweetheart, when I got back to the office, it looked like Picasso had been in my wash basin. My shirts are ruined. Well, don't you fret. Mommy's going to buy little old Rick a whole new batch tomorrow. Oh, no, no, no. Really, I couldn't. Uh, it's just against my principles to take anything from a woman. It is, huh? Uh, definitely. What's that song you're playing? 16 neck, 33 sleeve. What? <laughs> oh, you oh. idiot. <laughs> oh, I bet. I dropped a real old hint. Well, I'll drop a little old hint, too. Very subtly, of course. Sing. Oh, baby, you're the subtlest. Climb aboard a butterfly and take off on the breeze. Let your worries flutter by and do the things you please. In the land where dollar bills are falling off the trees. On a dreamer's holiday. Every day for breakfast there's a dish of scrambled stars. And for luncheon, you'll be munching rainbow candy bars. You'll be living a la mode on Jupiter or Mars on a dreamer's holiday. Make it a long vacation. Time there is plenty of. You need no Reservation. Just bring along the one that you love. Help yourself to happiness and sprinkle it with mirth. Close your eyes and concentrate and dream for all your worth. You will feel terrific when you get back down to earth from a dreamer's holiday. Baby, you're the craziest. What? Now, where did you pick up that expression? Oh, I get around now and then. I know a couple of musicians. Oh, I bet they all play lead kazoo. Come here. What do you want? I want to lay one on you. What? Oh. <clears throat> what do you think of that, Pops? You want the honest truth? Uh-huh. Mm, solid. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg. Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, David Ellis, Gene Bates, Edmund McDonald, and Charles McGraw. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. 
Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Sunday evening means stellar listening on NBC. Tomorrow, be sure to hear the American theater's foremost acting couple, Alfred Lunt and Lynn Fontaine, in the whimsical comedy, The Great Adventure, on the Theater Guild on the air. And for another great adventure in comedy tomorrow, remember to hear the Phil Harris, Alice Faye show, Great Entertainment Sundays on NBC. Next, it's Death in the Rain with Maureen O'Hara on NBC. Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Oh, good evening, Mr. Diamond. Evening, Francis. You look like you're going out. Yes, sir. Miss Asher wants me to go down to the delicatessen for some cold cuts. Oh, where is Miss Asher? In the study, sir. Well, I'll see you later, Francis. Why don't you bring back some roll mop? Roll mop, sir? Herring with the bends. Very toothy. Uh, yes, sir. Ali, Ali, and free. Red. Hi. Hi. Well, get the silk thing there. Lounging pajamas. Yeah. I guess we're going to stay in, huh? Uh-huh. I just sent Francis out for some food. I uh, met him at the door. Look, I've got to do a few things in the kitchen. Why don't you stretch out on the couch and take it easy until dinner's ready? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm pretty tired. Might rock out. No, a little sleep might do you some good. Here, read a magazine if you want to stay awake. Hmm? Oh, swell. Gory detective. Who sends you these things? The corpse of the month? Mm-hmm. Pretty bad. I won't be long. Okay. Oh, no. The case of the bloody... Oh! <sighs> it was going on 11 o'clock, and the fog encircled the old house like a thin, wet blanket. Oh, swell. The figure of a man crept stealthily across the gravel of the garden path. Oh, these riders really dream it up. Hmm? Hmm? Mr. Diamond? What? How did you get in here? I followed you from your office. Shh! You left the door unlocked when you came in. Well, now, look. I know I shouldn't have come into someone else's house, but, but this is a matter of life and death. Hey, stop pulling down the blinds. I don't want anyone to see us talking. Well, you're on the eighth floor. Who's chasing you? A herd of monkeys? Please. Please, you must listen. Now, look, if you got troubles, come to my office in the morning. Tomorrow morning may be too late. I'm supposed to die. To try, try breathing. You expand your chest. Take a lung full of air. No, no, I... Yes, it does wonders. Keeps you around for days. You better get out of here. Please, Mr. Diamond, don't give me away. Please. Uh, yeah, baby. Uh, wait a minute. I'm talking at that desk. Oh, bless you, Mr. Diamond. Yes. I thought I heard you talking to someone. Talking? Oh, no, no. Must have been reading out loud. This is swell literature. Hmm. The case of the grisly ghost. Oh. I like to keep up on the exploits of a private detective. You don't tell me anything about your cases. Oh, I'm modest. Hey, you got your coat on. Where are you going? Oh, Francis just called. He's had a flat tire. I'm going to pick him up in the other car. Uh, don't you want me to do it? Oh, I'm not going to let you out of this house. I'll be right back. Okay. Read the grisly ghost. It's not bad. Bye, baby. Bye. Okay, Spider-Man, you can come out now. Oh, thank you. Now, what the devil's going on? I told you my life's in danger. I need help. Tell me about it. I haven't time now. Come to this address in about an hour. My name's Leeds. Leland L. Leeds. Oh, for Pete's sake. I must get back before they miss me. I don't want them to know I got out. Say I called you and told you to come over. Here's the address on this card. Please don't fail me, Mr. Diamond. Now, wait a minute. My fee's a hundred a day in expenses. Of course, of course. I'll have a check for you. Goodbye. He went out like an undertaker stealing a can of embalming fluid. And I poured myself something just about as strong. 
Helen would scalp me for leaving, but for some reason, nutty little guys like that interest me. I left Helen the note saying I'd be back later and took off to the address Leland L. Leeds had given me. It was out of town about ten miles, but after hunting around for a while and running up a good-sized taxi fare, I finally found the house. Yes? Uh, uh, yes. I, I, I got a call from a Mr. Leeds at this address. He asked me to come over. My brother? I don't know. Well, it couldn't have been. He's very sick. He's upstairs sleeping. Well, he was just coasting off to Dreamland when he called me. I, uh, I think you'd better let me in. Oh, a detective. All right. Just, uh, what did my brother tell you, Mr.? Uh, Diamond. He said his life was in danger. I'm Nina Leeds. I think you'd better come into the living room, Mr. Diamond. Dr. Miller can explain things better than I can. Sure. Roger? Mm Hmm? This is Mr. Diamond. He's a detective. Oh? Lee just called him. This is Dr. Miller, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Doctor. How do you do? You from the police? No, no. Private stuff. Oh, I see. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm afraid you made a trip for nothing. Oh, here are the drinks. Uh... Oh. George, uh, this is Mr. Diamond. He's a private detective. What? Mr. Diamond, this is George Brodeen. How are you? Well, fine, thank you. Anything wrong? I don't know. Lee phoned Mr. Diamond and told him he was in danger. How did you know that, Doctor? I told Miss Leeds what he said, but not you. I'm Mr. Leeds' doctor. He's having a nervous breakdown and suffers from an extreme persecution complex. If he called a detective, I'm sure he must have said something like that. That's quite correct, Mr. Diamond. What do you do, Mr. Brodeen? Why, I'm with the New York Museum. I'm a friend of the family. I've been watching Lee break up for the past month. Mm Mm-hmm. May I talk to your brother, Miss Lee? I don't think you can. I gave him a very strong sedative. Let me get you a drink, Mr. Diamond. When Lee wakes up, you can talk to him. Sure. We went into the bar and she got out a big bottle and two glasses. I forgot all about Leland L. Leeds for a while and started uh, concentrating on his lovely sister. It was easy. Champagne? Uh, Sure, but I've run out of slippers. I've got a small foot. Might take you a long time to get enough. I drink fast. It's the open toes that bother me. I like the patter. Where'd you come from? Same place you did, lover. Experience Alley. What do people call you after they get to know you better? Oh, different things at different times. For now, you can call me Rick. And later? Oh, you'll think of something easier. It's like that when you haven't got much time to talk. Here's to later, Rick. Uh, yeah. What does a doctor specialize in? Involved as a brain specialist. Mental disorders, mostly. It's Lee. He's off again. Maybe he's been listening to Sam Spade. Come on. You'd better stay down here, Nina. I'll take care of it. I'm going up. Lee needs me. Uh, George, get my bag. It's in the hall. All right. You'd better not come in, Mr. Diamond. I think I'd better. <laughs> Lee. Lee. Lee, what is this? I saw the blood again. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm glad you came. Now, calm down, Lee. Everything's going to be all right. Get away from me. He thinks I'm insane. You all do. You want my idol and you stop at nothing. Now, there's no sense in this much self-indulgence. Uh, here's not... your bag, Roger. Thanks. What are you going to do? Just give you something to make you sleep. I don't want to sleep. I'll wake up and see the blood again. There's no blood. It's just your imagination. You're overwrought. You think I'm crazy. But I saw it. I tell you, I saw it. Now, this won't hurt. No, I... I, I don't want to sleep. Please, Mr. Diamond, help me. Lee, do what Roger tells you for my sake. Come on, come on, come on. The injection should take hold. I'll get up. Just a minute. I, I, I won't go to sleep. Lee, please. Then leave Mr. Diamond with me. I want to talk to him. Well, I guess it'll be all right. Don't stay too long, Mr. Diamond. I want him to rest. Okay, Doctor. Remember, he's not at all rational. Come on, Nina. I'll see you downstairs, Mr. Diamond. Hey, what's the idea, Leeds? I, I'm locking the door. I, I don't want anyone coming in. It, it, pardon me for walking around in circles. I, I've got to stay awake. Uh-huh. Those people downstairs are uh, trying to drive me crazy. They must have been working overtime. And they're after my idol. Your what? My idol. That carved image standing on the night table. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Here. Here, look at it. Look at it. Well, that's dandy. How many box tops did you have to save? Mr. Diamond, at this moment, you are holding $100,000 in your hand. I am? Last month, my grandfather passed on and left his entire estate to my sister and me. Among the effects was that idol. It was left to me. What is it? Platinum? Oh, no. No, Mr. Diamond. That is the lost idol of King Tut. I always wondered what happened to it. Oh. Oh, then you know the legend. Well, uh, I'm a little, little hazy on it. Maybe you'd better bring me up to date. Oh, of course, of course. It was supposed to have been buried with King Tut. However, 
The story goes that a slave absconded with it before they sealed the tomb. And that makes it worth a hundred thousand? I guess so. Uh, you guess. You don't know? I only know what my grandfather told me before he passed on. He told me its value and said there was a curse on it. Uh, what does it say? Crime doesn't pay? Well, Mr. Diamond, it seems that on the first night of the new moon, after one has gained possession of the idol, he will die. Next week, Tom Swift and his electric grandmother. You don't believe me. Oh, sure. No, you don't. You're just like the rest. But it may interest you, Mr. Diamond, to know that one month after the idol was uncovered and my grandfather gained possession, he died. It was a new moon. How old was he? Seventy-four. Oh, well, that couldn't be it. Now relax and tell me why you came to me. What about your fee? Oh, forget it. You can just buy me a broom to ride around on. Good night, Mr. Leeds. Remember, Mr. Diamond, it's a new moon. You don't have much time. Oh, brother. Did you talk to him, Mr. Diamond? Uh, you might call it that. Now do you understand? Your point's well taken, Doctor. What about that hunk of stone? Maybe if you gave him a teddy bear? Oh, the idol he's got is absolutely worthless. His grandfather had the same unusual ideas about it. Is there such an idol? Oh, there's a legend, but no one has ever found even the slightest clue that it's a fact. Now, I've examined Lee's idol, and it's certainly not worth more, oh, any more than the granite it's carved from. Hmm. Well, I'll be saying good night. I hope he gets better. Can I get you another drink, Mr. Diamond? You certainly deserve something for your trouble. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, goodbye, Doctor, Mr. Rodin. Thanks, Miss Leeds. I wish I could make this up to you. I'll uh, take a rain check. It'll be raining a lot this month. Uh, yeah. Well, good night, Miss Leeds. Good night. I went out and got a cab. As far as I was concerned, the frightened little man in the nightshirt was going to end up modeling straitjackets, and the private detective would only add to the confusion. It was 8 o'clock, and I told the cabbie to take me to 975 Park Avenue. Helen would be angry, but it was worth going back to. A couple of hours with her could make a guy as contented as a bear that had just cornered the honey market. We pulled up in front of Helen's apartment, and I paid the cabbie. I was just going in when a small convertible skidded to a stop in front of the building. Mr. Diamond... Mr. Diamond! It was Leland L. Leeds again. And you could still see part of the nightshirt under his top coat. He leaned out of the car window and called. Over here, Mr. Diamond. Please, I must talk with you again. I'd had enough of the jumpy little man with the idol, so I started into the apartment without answering. He called again, climbed out of the car, and started to cross the street toward me. I looked back just in time to see the other car swing in toward me. back into the street and looked after the disappearing car. The lights were off and I couldn't get the license number. It was too far away. I leaned down with the little man in the nightshirt. He was pretty far away, too. He was dying and hurt. Mr. Diamond? Yes, Leeds? Take the idol. When you left, I... I found out why it was worth all that money. They... They didn't want me to tell you, so... So they... They followed me and... And ran me, ran me down. It's... It's in my coat pocket. I... He died lying on his back in the street. Several people were coming out of the building, so I reached into his pocket and pulled out a chamois bag. I guess the idol was inside, so I put it in my coat and went in to call the police. Oh, Mr. Diamond, Miss Asher's been worried. Hello, Francis. Tell her I'm back and let me use the phone. Certainly, sir. She's upstairs. Is something wrong, sir? You look worried. A man got hit by a car. I've got to call the police. Oh, my goodness. Is he hurt badly? Bad enough to get buried. Oh, my goodness. Homicide, Sergeant Otis. Otis, let me talk to the lieutenant. Is this Diamond? No, it's the Beaver Boys. Now put the lieutenant on the phone. And what do you do with all those tired jokes? You can't keep using them. I give them away to idiots. Want to start a collection? Oh. Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, this is Diamond. I got a body for you. I go off duty in 20 minutes. Call back then. Lying out in front of Helen's apartment, 975 Park. 
Rick, my stomach is bothering me. Why can't you be a good boy and stay out of trouble? Take some soda and get over here. Take some soda? Every time you call, I end up taking enough to give an elephant the hiccups. Well, you're a fine one. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick. I didn't know you were on the phone. Uh, wait a minute, Walt. Hello, baby. I'm talking to the lieutenant. Hmm. Aren't you afraid you'll catch cold in that thing? I'm mad at you. Oh, you're cute. Hey, what's going on? Uh, just Helen. If you could see her, your ulcers would start popping like chestnuts. Uh, say hello. Now, uh, the law sends you his greetings. Hello to the law. Uh, she says... I know. I heard it. Now, what about the stiff? His name's Leland L. Leeds. He got belted by a car. It was too far away to get the number. What makes you think it's a job for homicide? Get over here and Helen will give you the story. I've got some work to do. But uh, wait a minute, Rick. Oh, you're getting lazy. What's the matter? Don't you want to find out things for yourself? Rick, what happened? Francis told me some man got hit by a car. Right on your doorstep. Oh. Let's go into the other room, baby. I'll tell you all about it. We went into the warm study and Helen poured me a tall drink. I briefed her on what had happened earlier in the evening and she sat down next to me. There's something about red hair that does things to me. It smelled fresh and clean, and with her that close, I could have been sitting in the middle of the Arctic and still kept my temperature above 102. Rick, do you have to go back out there? Well, somebody's got to tell his sister, and in a way, I feel a little responsible. Are you going to give her the idol? Hmm? The idol. The thing you took from poor Mr. Leeds' coat. You could at least show me what I'm playing second fiddle to. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I nearly forgot about it. Oh, here it is in a chamois bag. Oh, what an ugly little thing. And that's supposed to be worth all that money? Well, that was what leads, uh... Hey, something's missing. Yeah, one of the eyes. Must have come loose when the car hit him. Probably in the bag. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Rick! Yeah. Well, it was painted over. You'd never guess it unless you pried it loose. Why, it's as big as a marble. Is it real? Well, you've got enough of them around, you tell me. It is. Rick, I think it's a pigeon blood. Why, it's worth a fortune. What are you doing? I'm scratching the other one. Well, Mr. Leeds wasn't so squirrely after all. This is ridiculous. You only read about things like this. Two pigeon blood rubies. No wonder he thought it was worth $100,000. He said he found out tonight. He must have been scratching at them. Oh, then it wasn't just a hit and run. I don't know. Baby, I don't want to get hung up with a lot of explanation to Walt. Rick, what are you doing? Taking the other eye out. There. Now, now here. Hang on to these and don't let them get out of your little hot hand. When Walt gets up here, tell him what I've told you. Well, will you be back? An hour ago, I laughed at a little guy when he told me he was going to die. He said it was a full moon and he had a curse on him. I'm still a skeptic, but I'm a new boy when it comes to voodoo. I've got to hurry over there before the whole bunch of them turn into bats. <laughs> I went down in the service elevator and out on the street. The wagon was driving off with Leeds, and Walt and Otis were going into the building when I slipped up to the convertible and got in. Leeds had left the keys in the ignition like I figured, so I took off and headed across town. Twenty minutes later, on a lonely stretch of road, I started counting suspects. All three of them could be in on it. Dr. Miller, who said Leeds was insane. George Brodine, a man from the museum who said the idol was worthless. And that lovely sister... I didn't notice the car pulling up behind me until it was too late. It was doing a good 70, and as it swung around to pass me, the guy at the wheel cut in sharp and hit me broadside. Hey, look out! I went through a white fence and over an embankment. The car rolled, and somebody dropped the night on my head. I went to sleep. I don't know how long it was before I started coming around, but when I tried to shake myself back, it was like pulling my head out of a barrel of molasses. It stuck to my eyes and plugged up my ears. I tried to claw the stickiness away, but my hands were like two baseballs. I moved my shoulders and felt the stiffness in my back. It spread out to my hands and down to my feet. I opened my mouth and took in a lot of air. I finally made it. Someone was trying to get me from the highway, so I pulled myself clear of the wreck and started moving in a circle, keeping whoever it was at a good distance. I was too pushed around to put up a fight, so I made it back to the highway and walked along until I found a little gas station on the road. The joint ain't open. 
And then your lock's busted. No, it ain't. Then I floated through the wall. Where's your phone? It ain't for public use. Try isn't. Okay, wise guy, the joint isn't open. The phone isn't for public use. And you isn't so big you can't get tossed out on your face. And you isn't so wealthy, five bucks won't make a difference. Oh, why didn't you say so? Phone's on a wall. Thanks. You know the Leeds family? Yeah, they get gas here sometimes. Hello. Evergreen 34369, operator. How far is the house from here? I'm a little turned around. About a half a mile. Hello, Francis? Is Lieutenant Levinson still there? No? I'll just tell him to get out to 19319 Jackson Heights Boulevard. I've got a killer for him. Yeah, oh my goodness. Now hurry it up. You a cop? Shamus. What do you take for the use of your car for an hour? My wife would kill me. I'll drive you wherever you want to go. He gave me a lift in his old sedan, and ten minutes later I was ringing the doorbell to the Leeds house. I was glad the girl answered. She made me feel better right away. Oh, Mr. Diamond, come in. Thank you. Where are your friends? Raj and George. They went out to look for my brother. He disappeared right after you left. I'm terribly worried. Oh, uh, have you got that drink? I could use it now. Certainly. I don't know why Lee ran off like that. He shouldn't have been driving in his condition. Were Roger and George together when they left to look for Lee? No, they took separate cars. Why? Has something happened, Mr. Diamond? Have you heard from my brother? I guess I'd better give it to you straight. Your brother's dead, Miss Leeds. I'm sorry. Dead? Oh, no. He was hit by a car. It's all because of that horrible idol. That stupid, horrible idol. If my grandfather hadn't told Lee it was worth that much money, this never would have happened. Did you think it was worth anything? No, of course not. But we couldn't convince Lee. Now he's dead. <laughs> would you please answer that, Mr. Diamond? Sure. You take it easy. <laughs> Nina, I... Oh, what are you doing here, Diamond? Did you find Lee? Why, no, no, I didn't. I've gone to every place I thought he could possibly be. I even looked up your address one over there, but the building was closed. You better go in and see Miss Leeds, Doc. She's pretty upset. Upset? Lena, what's wrong? Oh, Raj, it's Lee. He's been killed. What? That's right. But how did it happen? Bingo. I'll tell you as soon as I let Mr. Brodine in. There, there, Lena. Just put yourself on. Come in, Mr. Brodine. Well, Mr. Diamond, what are you doing here? I think I'd better have a sign made. The doctor and Miss Leeds are in the living room. Has something happened? Mr. Leeds is dead. What? This is the most surprised household I've ever run into. Roger, is this true? I guess so. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Nina. Is there anything I can do? No. No, thank you. Where did this happen, Mr. Diamond? In front of 975 Park Avenue. Car hit him. I was with him when he died. Oh, this is terrible. I thought at first it was an accident. But I'm not sure. What do you mean? When I left to come out here, someone ran me off the road, nearly killed me. Who would want to kill Lee and then try to kill you? (laughs) Probably a coincidence. Certainly, certainly. Probably just a drunk. Could have been. Lee gave me this before he died. A chamois bag. What's in it? The idol. Well, that awful thing. What do you want done with it, Miss Leeds? I don't care. Just get it out of this house. What are you going to do? I don't know. You want the thing, Doctor? Why, what for? That's a good question. How about you, Brodeen? You want it? Oh, well, what would I want a worthless piece of stone for? Well, as long as no one wants it, may I use this fire poker, Miss Leeds? What are you going to do with it? The idol is worthless. It's caused a lot of trouble for you and your family. I'm going to break it up. No! Give me that, George! Well, Brodeen, you're sure getting grabby. All right, now all of you stay right where you are. Well, for a museum collector, that's a pretty modern gun. Yes, and I know how to use it. George! This is the hokiest case I've ever been on. Even the dialogue's bad. I suppose you think you're pretty clever making me show my hand like that. I read Gory Detective. I found that the idol was really worth all that money, but I had to make the killer tip himself. You did. Mr. Diamond, do you mean my brother was really right all along? In a way, yes. He believed what his grandfather had told him. But it wasn't until tonight when he scratched one of the eyes of the idol that he knew for sure. Scratched one of the eyes? That's right. Pigeon blood rubies, painted over. Now I'm leaving you. That's good, but you're minus something. Minus what? A couple of rubies. I took them out of the idol. You're lying. Take a look at the bag. What? They're gone. 
I'll kill you for this. Give me the gun, George. Look out. He's going to shoot. Give me the gun. All right, everyone. This is the police. He shot Diamond, all right, Lieutenant. Put the bracelets on him, Otis. Sure. Come here, you. Not him. Put him on Diamond for disturbing the peace. Pin the medal on the other guy. No, no, no. Sure no. thing. How do you like that, wise guy? <laughs> oh, no. Rick? Oh, I'm dying. Ricky? Oh. Rick, wake up. Uh, 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 all right, all right, George, drop the gun. Rick, you've been dreaming. Mm-hmm. Oh, hello. Oh, you were having a big, fat nightmare. Oh. I came down from upstairs and you were asleep on the couch with gory detective. Oh, well, well, I started reading some story and I got mixed up with Egyptian idols and the rubies. I got shot. That's the case of the ruby eyes. That was the craziest dream. I solved the crime and got shot six times for my trouble. Oh. Oh, Lieutenant Levinson and Otis came in and arrested me for disturbing the peace. After you were shot six times? Yeah. <laughs> Otis loved it. That wasn't in the magazine. I worked out my own ending. Move in. That's pretty. What are the lyrics? Well, uh, an awful lot of them. <laughs> Sing them. Okay. I'm sitting high on a hilltop. Oh, I remember that. Tossing all my troubles to the moon. It's from Thanks a Million. Where the breeze seems to say, don't you worry. With Alice Payne. Things are bound to pick up pretty soon. Here neath the sky on the hilltop, seems to me the world is all in tune. I forget all the bustle and hurry. Tossing all my troubles to the moon. Someone will love me And everything will be just grand Just so the stars up above me Continue doing business at the same old stand It's mighty sweet in the evening When I've had a busy afternoon Sitting high, high, high on a hilltop Tossing all my troubles to the moon. Sing it again, Rick. I'm sitting high on the hill. Oh, Rick, the grouch. Yeah, listen to that. Where the breeze seems to say, don't you worry. Hey. <laughs> how do you like that, wise guy? Oh, that's really awful. Yeah, well, maybe you know how I feel when you open that big basso of yours. You mean I sound like you do? Look, Diamond. What do you think the rats keep jumping out of my window for? Well, maybe if you had some plastic surgery. <laughs> and your crummy jokes are as bad as your crummy singing. So please, save the world from a horrible fate and cut your throat or something. Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you all about... Oh, I'm sitting high on a hilltop, tossing all my troubles. Hey, you! Shut up! We want to hear Diamond. My dear public. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Peter Leeds, Yvonne Patey, Stephen Dunn, and Jack Crucian. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written and directed by Blake Edwards. Portions were transcribed. Dick Powell soon will be seen in the screen version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Now, this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's on NBC tomorrow? 
Detective story fans will want to hear Madeline Carroll and Basil Rathbone in the detective melodrama, The Amazing Dr. Clitterhouse, tomorrow on Theater Guild on the Air. And for more detecting, listen tomorrow for The Adventures of Sam Spade. He'll present his most humorous caper of the season. Yes, you'll enjoy both Theater Guild and Sam Spade tomorrow on NBC. Next, it's Free Ride to Danger with Dorothy McGuire on NBC. NBC.